Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that as the adrenaline starts to flow, the voice will pick up. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if it gets better, I'll put this aside and just talk, but we'll see what happens. <clears throat> and I presume that by tomorrow or so it'll be improved. Uh, incidentally, as a, in, in general, if, if you would like to raise questions or objections or bring up points or whatever, please feel free to do so, uh, even more than usual, because it gives me a chance to rest my voice uh, while I listen to you. Uh, so at any point in the course of uh, discussion, if you can't hear or you don't understand or you think it's completely wrong or you have some other idea, uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, interrupt. And, uh, and uh, if I feel that it's taking us too far off the track that I'd like to get to, I'll ask to put it aside and come back, or otherwise we can simply go on. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to follow pretty much the course that uh, was suggested for Luigi, uh, start at a fairly general level and proceed towards more specific uh, questions and issues as time and as shared interest uh, permits and suggests. Uh, starting, I, I want to talk about what is, what is called the cognitive revolution uh, that began in the 1950s. Uh, when I suggested the topic, I also suggested that quotes be put around the word cognitive revolution, uh, suggesting a certain skepticism uh, about its revolutionary character. The uh, skepticism has two aspects to it. Uh, one, I'm not convinced that it was as much of a change as many other people think. Uh, in my opinion, in many ways, it picked up and recovered uh, uh, ideas, uh, even technical ideas, uh, that are much older that we can trace to what might be called. Uh, and it didn't always improve on those. In fact, in some cases, I think there's been regression. Uh, <clears throat> So it's not, in my opinion, as revolutionary uh, as it has been held to be. The, the, this er the, the earlier tradition had been entirely forgotten by the 1950s, even in scholarship that was not known and not understood. That is, scholars knew the books, but they didn't understand what was in them. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> and to my, in my opinion, that's still more or less the case. I don't think that the riches of the first cognitive revolution have yet been appreciated or understood, except in certain corners of scholarship. Uh, the second uh, aspect of skepticism is that I, my own feeling is that the cognitive revolution uh, has taken from the very beginning uh, a rather dubious path, uh, maybe a wrong turn, uh, and that the directions in which it's proceeding should be seriously reassessed from their very origins. And here I would go back further, in this case of the study of language and mind, uh, back, say, to Frege, where I think already there are some intellectual moves made uh, in the study of language and mind that are quite dubious and, and that have had uh, questionable effects, in my view, negative effects on contemporary theory of uh, uh, reference and many other topics. Now, when I speak of the cognitive revolution, I don't mean to be referring to specific work in, say, uh, you know, the neurophysiology of vision or uh, the study of uh, uh, reasoning uh, under uh, complex conditions and so on. A lot of that work is very respectable uh, scientific work. I'm thinking of the more reflective and considered aspects of the uh, cognitive revolution, uh, those that fall roughly within ph philosophy of mind or uh, the parts of the so-called artificial intelligence that are concerned with the general nature of the issues uh, rather than constructing an expert system that will solve some technical engineering problem and so on. So I'm really thinking about uh, when I refer to the cognitive revolution with skepticism, it's at the general level. It's where it intersects with and in fact falls under, one might say, contemporary philosophy of mind and philosophy of language. <coughs> Well, that's the skepticism. I'll come back to trying to fill in the fill in the blanks. Uh, are you still hearing hearing me? Yes. <laughs> okay. If not, wave your arms or something. Uh, the the study of language and mind 
as everyone knows, uh, goes back several millennia, uh, back to classical antiquity, it's often been assumed that these two inquiries, the inquiries into language and into mind, are intimately related, uh, that language is a mirror of mind, as Leibniz put it. Uh, if that is the case, then the study of language should provide a unique insight into human thought, and that's often been uh, thought to be the case over the last several thousand years. So there have been repeated convergences uh, between the more technical study of language and the more general study of mental events, uh, actions, and processes, and so on. Now, this convergence uh, took, has taken place in these two cognitive revolutions. It took place about 40 years ago uh, at the origins of what is today commonly called the cognitive revolution. And contemporary linguistics, the linguistics as most of us know it and practice it, uh, developed as part of that cognitive revolution and, in fact, has been a... Uh, a significant factor, maybe a major factor, in the development of cognitive science uh, since the modern origins. And uh, this same convergence, in fact, uh, took place during what I called the first cognitive revolution of the 17th century, which was, in fact, part of the general scientific revolution of the period, the Galilean revolution. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the, the, the convergence took place in ways which are rather strikingly similar to the convergence of the 1950s in a number of respects. Uh, one respect uh, was the uh, stimulus to the scientific imagination that was by automata. Now, in the 20th century, of course, it's been computers. Uh, in the 17th and 18th century, it was the remarkable uh, automata that were constructed by skilled craftsmen. Uh, starting with extremely complicated clocks and reaching up to uh, the creations of people like Jacques de Vaucanson, uh, you know, a duck digesting food and, and that, sort of, that sort of thing. And these uh, autom in both cases, both in the 17th and 18th century and currently in contemporary discussion, the uh, apparent achievements of artifacts raised an obvious question. Uh, namely, whether humans are not simply more complex uh, machines, more complex artifacts. Uh, that was a topic of very lively debate uh, then, as it is today. Now, the Cartesians, <coughs> notoriously, the Cartesians uh, offered a negative answer to this position. They uh, said, no, humans are not more complex uh, artifacts, although uh, Descartes tried to show that a very substantial part of what humans do including all the way up to perception and uh, sensation, is just a complex watch or a complex machine. Uh, and the same is true, he, he argued, of all of inor uh, the entire inorganic world uh, and the entire organic world uh, up to the level of, uh, metaphorically speaking, we might say human humans below the neck. You know, and that is a metaphor, of course. Uh, <clears throat> but he also argued that certain aspects of uh, human intelligence lie beyond the scope of any conceivable uh, artifact. Uh, and he appealed specifically to language in this connection. That's where the convergence took place. Uh, crucially, if you look at, say, Discourse on Method and other, uh, other Cartesian discussions, uh, he appealed to normal aspects of language use as evidence uh, of the kind of phenomena that in principle could not be incorporated within an automaton even of the most complex uh, and highly articulated uh, kind. Uh, specifically, he referred to a collection of properties that normal linguistic behavior manifests. Uh, we can call them, though he didn't call them this, uh, we can call them the cre creative aspect of language use. Let me call them that. This is a collection of properties which includes the fact that normal language use, I don't mean poetic discourse, just ordinary interaction among people, uh, is uh, unbounded. People are always saying new things and hearing new things that have never been said before in the history of uh, the human species. Uh, and this goes on constantly and unrecognizably. You have no way of knowing, in fact, whether they're new or not, because they all sound familiar, even if you've never heard anything like them before. Uh, so n normal speech is unbounded. On the other hand, it's obviously not random. It's not just some device producing things with a random element in it. 
uh, it's coherent, <clears throat> it's appropriate to situations. On the other hand, it doesn't seem to be caused by situations. In fact, it appears to be completely uncaused. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't influences, but uh, it seems to be a paradigm example of the general matter of freedom of the will. Uh, if you had a complete description of your internal state and of the surroundings that you're in, still, the Cartesians argued, and phenomenally they seem to be correct, uh, still you could choose to say something other than what is uh, uh, suggested, maybe even strongly uh, pressured by the internal state and the, uh, uh, the external environment. Like I could right now start talking about the weather in Boston, let's say, or any other topic, and I'm not going to do it because it would be inappropriate, but I could perfectly well do it and it would be completely coherent and I could find topics that none of you would be able to even understand, you know, what's happening in my family or something like that. Uh, and all of that's always possible and we know that it's possible. Uh, even given my internal state completely described and my surroundings completely described, uh, I can start doing anything. Uh, this, of course, is a much more general problem. Uh, as the Cartesians emphasized, uh, a, uh, well, in their formulation, a machine is uh, compelled to act in a certain way, up to randomness. Up to randomness, a machine is compelled to act in a certain way by the arrangement of its parts and the stimulus situation. Uh, hum a human being, in contrast, is only incited or inclined to act in a certain way <clears throat> and may choose not to. It may choose in a way to act in a way contrary to its inclinations. So you can choose to act, say, suicidally, uh, and people sometimes do, <clears throat> or in, other, or in uh, all sorts of other ways. That kind of phenomenon, <clears throat> which is manifested most clearly in the normal uh, uh, use of language, Descartes argued, lies beyond the bounds of any possible automaton. <clears throat> so the fact that language is unbounded, stimulus-free, not determined by internal state, even though heavily influenced by it, uh, uh, appropriate situations, but not caused by situations, in fact, apparently uncaused, uh, not random, uh, evoking thoughts in others that they might have expressed the same way. Uh, as they understand once they hear the expression. Uh, that collection of properties, call it the creative aspect of language use, uh, is, Descartes argued, <clears throat> kind of a litmus test, like a, just as litmus test is a test for acidity, these properties are a test for some <clears throat> other aspect of the world, for some property of the world that, it, that does not fall within mechanism. Now those arguments are not inconsiderable. And I don't think they change at all as we move from the uh, uh, complex artifacts that excited the imagination of the Cartesians to the contemporary artifacts uh, that uh, we use, contemporary computers. Although they're radically different in all sorts of respects, uh, exactly the same reasoning applies. Uh, <clears throat> the difference between appropriateness to situations and caused by situations uh, appropriate use <clears throat> versus random, arbitrary intrusion into deterministic uh, uh, systems, that seems to remain. The automata that we have are either deterministic or, ran or have elements of randomness. They could be then probabilistic in their behavior, but none of that matches in the least the properties of ordinary human behavior, so it appears. Now, we could be completely wrong about this. Maybe we're being misled about the facts but these facts, as the Cartesians argued, seem as obvious to us as anything could be uh, on immediate inspection. Uh, and as Descartes again argued, it would be absurd to deny that which appears obvious to us, since we, simply on the grounds that we may not have intelligence enough, or at least we do not now have intelligence enough to understand it, that would simply be irrational. <clears throat> and he therefore argued, and I think we're still in this situation, uh, that we have to take these things very seriously. Well, that was the uh, uh, Cartesian response to the first question, the question whether people are simply more complex automata. Their argument was, yeah, everything is just a complex automaton except certain aspects of human behavior, language being a paradigm case. Uh, those issues again arose in the second, in the second cognitive revolution and the contemporary debate about uh, 
the Turing test and uh, you know, the kinds of things, say, that Roger Penrose, for example, looks at in his recent book, if you've seen that, and so on. Uh, the vast debate about the uh, Chinese room, uh, Searle's Chinese room and the uh, philosophy of mind and artificial intelligence literature. Uh, all of this is a contemporary version of it. In my view, <coughs> re a case of regression, however, I think it's extremely misguided, seriously misguided. Whereas the first, as the question arose in the 17th century, it was a very sensible question. Uh, maybe the answers didn't make any sense. But the question was sensible and the framework was sensible. I'll try to suggest later that the contemporary framework makes no sense whatsoever and is completely off track. Uh, and in fact, in my opinion, uh, Turing, in his original paper in 1950, already pointed out why it was off track. That is, it's been following a line that he suggested people not follow, but I'll come back to that. Uh, <clears throat> if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll come back and fill in these details later. Well, a second uh, uh, similarity between the first and the second cognitive revolution uh, is that in both cases there was great interest in uh, computational theories of the mind. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the great scientific achievement of Descartes, his major contribution to modern science, was the development of a computational theory of vision. Uh, he overthrew the classic, the neo-scholastic, prevailing neo-scholastic theories of vision, uh, which had a very mystical character to them, kind of common sense in a way, but mystical. Uh, at the time, it was assumed that, say, if you see a, a cube, if I see a cube rotating in space, there's a cube rotating in space in my brain. Okay, so somehow the form of the thing out there, by some mysterious process, gets into my brain and it's in there. And that's what vision is. It's picking up the form of the object and, and duplicating it somehow. But Descartes ridiculed this idea properly uh, and offered, uh, not only tried to show why it was absurd, but offered an alternative theory. Uh, the alternative theory that he uh, presented uh, was a real scientific breakthrough. You can't use it in his form, but it led to modern or neurophysiology based modern biology, the modern biology of uh, cognitive processes. Uh, he, he, argued, he asked, <clears throat> in order to undermine this view, he suggested that we consider the case, <clears throat> consider the case of a blind man with a stick who's tapping on some object in front of him with a stick, say a chair, uh, and he's getting a, se a sequence of stimuli in his hand and, uh, and from this sequence of stimuli, he sort of figures out that it's a chair that he's perceiving. Uh, well, obviously, the image of the chair isn't getting into his brain. The only thing that's getting into his brain are some pressures against his fingers. In, so there's a sequence of pressures on the fingers from which his mind is somehow constructing the image of a chair. Well, Descartes argued that that's exactly what normal vision is. Uh, in fact, given Cartesian physics, he had to assume that there's a solid connection between your, the retina and an object that you see. There's like a, a rod, you know, a rigid rod that extends from your eye to the thing you see. And as you move your eye around, it's exactly like tapping on a chair with a stick. It just happens to be that you're getting stimuli on your retina instead of in your hand. But the picture's the same. Uh, and he therefore argued that uh, normal vision is just uh, the, interpre the computational interpretation by the, by the mind, by the brain, in fact, this is automat automata for him, so by the brain, uh, of a sequence of pressures on the retina, so you, which is exactly like what the blind man is doing. Well, that leads to a kind of a computational theory of vision. It's the inner resources of the mind that determine what you see. Uh, so he argued for, he didn't do the experiment, but we could do the experiment now, and his guess was right. Uh, he argued that if you take an, an infant who's never seen a geometrical figure, let's say, and you present the infant with uh, a triangle, of, you know, like I draw a triangle on the board, what the child will see is a distorted Euclidean triangle. Because, of course, what you've drawn is not a real triangle. I mean, you know, two of the lines don't quite come together, and one of them's got a curve, and so on. Uh, the child, in other words, will not perceive a perfect example of what it is, which is some crazy, completely crazy figure, but it will see it as a distorted triangle, even though it's never had any experiences. And the reason, Descartes argued, 
is a thought experiment, of course, but it's correct. You know. uh, the, the reason he argued is that the mind operates by the principles of Euclidean geometry, and when a sequence of stimuli hit the retina, the child's mind creates the Euclidean, you know, the abstract figure, and that's what's seen. And then you sort of notice that what's out there is kind of a distorted version of it. Uh, and he argued this is true generally of perception. That whole picture seems essentially correct, and it's been picked up. It, it, in fact, was a scientific breakthrough and led the way to a serious inquiry into uh, the biology of vision and perception generally. In fact, that, I su suppose, is Descartes, well, at least one of his leading scientific contributions. It opens up modern physiology. Now, similar ideas have reemerged in the uh, 20th century cognitive revolution and <clears throat> have led to uh, quite a productive work in some of the same areas that were, in fact, strikingly the very same areas uh, that were explored in the 17th century, primarily uh, vision and a few other sensory modalities uh, and language uh, and a little, a little bit in other areas, con con conceptual development, reasoning, and so on. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, in the area of language, the Cartesian revolution did lead uh, at once to efforts to apply this kind of computational point of view. It wasn't regarded then as computational. We would regard it as computation. This computational point of view, <coughs> which views uh, a, a, a mechanical device from a certain abstract perspective, that's about what it amounts, you know, where it's doing, it's carrying out. You view it as having the property of a computational device. That's a, a collection of states and properties that a device could have. Uh, and uh, so, so this account that I gave of the infant seeing the uh, uh, triangle could be redescribed as a kind of a software matter, if you like. Uh, that conception reemerged, somewhat reformulated in the 20th century. In the Cartesian period, it uh, set off quite important studies of language, in fact, revolutionary studies, uh, developing what was then called rational and philosophical grammar, which just means science, rational and philosophical just means scientific in our term. So that would be scientific linguistics. Uh, it, it led to uh, uh, a conception of universal grammar, meaning properties of language that are common to language generally, not to specific languages. Uh, and of course, that would be a core part of any scientific approach to the study of language or anything else. Uh, it also led to the first, first real studies of the vernacular. Uh, that was kind of unusual at the time. You weren't supposed to study Latin or something like that. Uh, but there were direct, for the first time, serious investigations of actual languages that people speak. The vernacular languages, French, for example. Uh, uh, the, the very fact that Descartes wrote in French was considered remarkable and a real breakthrough. Uh, and this has all sorts of political aspects to it as well. Uh, 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 all of these were uh, important achievements, later forgotten, but reconstructed in many ways uh, in the 20th century cognitive revolution. Well, the second cognitive revolution has indeed led to real advances in certain areas, uh, strikingly the old areas, uh, vision, language, a um, couple of others, I mentioned a few. It's not so clear to me at least, that it has led to any real progress at what you might consider a second level, uh, the level of reflection about the nature of the disciplines uh, that are concerned with what was traditionally called mental acts and faculties. And that's the question that I want to come back to as I proceed. Uh, some of these questions are substantive, some historical. Uh, I'll start, let me just start with a couple of words about the second cognitive revolution, the one in the 1950s, the one that contemporary linguistics was part of and came out of, and then go back to a kind of a general look at the whole topic. Uh, the, uh, the, none of these things have a starting date, of course, but uh, G uh, George Miller, who was one of the leading figures in the, mod in the, in the current birth, or I would say rebirth, of cognitive psychology, uh, he, in a retrospective talk on this recently, traced the cognitive revolution, as it's often called, to a meeting that took place in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, forgotten whether it was at Harvard or MIT, uh, in 1956, 
it was a meeting of the Institute, Institute of Radio Engineers, the IRE. And in fact, most of this work developed within an electrical engineering framework uh, in the 1950s. Uh, at that meeting, there were uh, several, there was a kind of a con an unexpected convergence uh, in, of different things, you know, which in retrospect, you, you could say, he argued, uh, set off the cognitive revolution, or at least sort of gave it some kind of form. Uh, there were papers on uh, um, the, uh, ex uh, human, uh, human uh, information processing, human psychology, using new ideas like signal detection theory and uh, uh, information theoretic ideas and so on. There was a collection of papers on those topics. Uh, there was the first paper on generative grammar that had been given publicly, uh, a paper of mine, which sort of outlined some of the basic ideas that later became generative grammar. Uh, there was also an important paper on uh, problem solving and reasoning. That was by uh, Newell and Simon. I don't recall anymore which one of them gave the paper, but Alan Newell and uh, Herb Simon gave their first exposition of their paper on uh, uh, a, a, prog a program for uh, proving theorems in elementary logic, which was uh, one of the things that set off contemporary uh, artificial intelligence. I should say that Newell and Simon don't, didn't follow the path that became conventional, uh, but this kind of set things off and was considered a major, if not breakthrough, at least stimulus uh, to uh, contemporary artificial intelligence, which hadn't really been formulated yet at that time. Well, that was a collection of papers. They came from different sources. They proceeded in different ways. There had not really been much communication among the people who had given them. Actually, they were even given in different sessions. Uh, but uh, uh, they had some shared ideas, and that was sort of obvious at once. Uh, one shared idea was a certain kind of shift in perspective that was common to all of them, a shift in perspective from a, what we might call an externalist point of view to an internalist point of view. That is, the psychology of the time, the study of humans of the time, was externalist in that it was concerned with what's outside the person. Uh, it's concern, it was concerned with behavior, that is, what, you know, some action that's going on, uh, or maybe the products of behavior. So linguistics was the study of products of behavior, was the study of texts, sounds, words, you know, arrangements of words, structures of sounds. And that was true of both European structuralism and American structuralism, different in many respects, but both of them externalist in this respect behaviorist psychology paradigm example. You're only interested in what's outside the mind. In fact, it's a kind of a point of principle that you're not supposed to look at anything else. Uh, <clears throat> the shift that took place was from this externalist point of view to an internalist one, in which what you're interested in is precisely what's going on inside the mind-brain, inside the mind, where we think of the mind now as just some set of properties and states and uh, processes of the brain, ultimately to be related to the brain sciences in some fashion. So use the term mind, but without any metaphysical implications. Uh, the, uh, the topic of inquiry shifts totally. Instead of the topic of inquiry being behavior and the products of behavior, the topic of inquiry is what's going on inside the mind. Uh, behavior and products of behavior are just data, and not particularly privileged data. I mean, if they happen to be useful, okay. Uh, data in itself is of no, you know, you never know whether it's any good or not. Data becomes significant when it becomes evidence. Evidence is a relational concept. Evidence for, you know. So data be moves into the sciences when it becomes evidence for something. And the something is something about the nature of the world. In this case, the nature of the mind. In my, in my opinion, this, is, this shift is a shift from um, sort of natural history or, you know, r rock collecting or something like that to the beginnings of what might turn out to be science. It's kind of a shift from natural history to natural science where data and the products of behavior and uh, behavior and the products of behavior are simply data, useful if they're useful, otherwise throw them out. Most data are useless uh, uh, and not particularly privileged. Uh, if you could find evidence from, say, electrical stimulation of the brain, that would tell you something about language that's just as good, maybe better, than uh, evidence about 
you know, the way people interpret sentences or what they, what they do with words or whatever. Uh, data is just data. It's of no interest in itself. Well, that's, that's you know, it's, intellectually speaking, that was an enormous shift. And it was very controversial. And indeed, it remains very controversial today. Uh, in fact, if you take such criteria as, let's say, government funding, uh, for whatever that's worth, overwhelmingly government funding, at least in the United States, goes to the externalist work, the statistical analysis of texts, uh, you know, organization of data, you know, that kind of thing. Very little of it goes to the internalist work, uh, which is, in, in my view, the only kind that even merits being talked about seriously, other than maybe for some engineering application, which rather low-level engineering application that might be useful. Anyhow, that's a personal view. But it was clearly a shift of perspective. And it was taking place at one or another level in all of this work. And I don't want to exaggerate, because uh, among many of the people in the cognitive sciences, they regard the shift of this shift of perspective as dubious or wrong. But at least there were hints of it in all of this work. And uh, you can see, maybe better in retrospect, that a move was taking place in that direction. Again, in my opinion, that's a move from natural history, rather boring natural history, uh, to a potential natural science. Maybe it's not there yet, but you can at least see how it might emerge. Uh, a, second, <clears throat> a second set of shared ideas uh, in this range of papers at this uh, IRE convention uh, was in um, uh, what you might call computational representational theories. That is, looking at mental activities uh, and mental faculties, uh, what the brain is doing, in other words, looking at it as a kind of software problem. Now, to look at it as a software problem is to take a certain abstract perspective toward the functioning of the machine. You know, it's a, it's a perspective that sometimes makes sense, sometimes doesn't make sense. Whenever you're studying some physical object, sometimes a particular abstract perspective makes sense, gives you insight, sometimes it doesn't. That's what science is about. And in this case, there was a, a kind of an intuitive shared feeling with anybody saying it, that viewing the brain as abstractly, of course it's purely abstract, uh, as having hardware properties and software properties would be useful. Now remember, this is totally abstract. I mean, even if you look at, even in the case of a computer, we distinguish hardware and software, but you know, you can't pull out a particular piece of the computer and say, I'm hardware. I mean, everything is just hardware, you know. To say that a computer uh, is implementing some software is to view it from a certain abstract perspective, uh, which may make sense, may not make sense. Uh, and in the case of the brain, it, the questions may make sense or may not, not make sense, much as looking at the planets in terms of kind of rational mechanics in which, you know, you have mass points observing uh, Newton's laws or something may make sense or may not make sense. Uh, it's, it's a matter of to be discovered, not to, not to be stipulated. Now, the, this point of view was kind of liberating, uh, as it had been in the 17th century. Now, in the 17th century, they didn't talk about hardware and software. But again, in retrospect, I think it makes a lot of sense to reinterpret uh, Descartes' uh, uh, overthrow of the neo-scholastic theory of vision in terms of the picture that I just presented as, in effect, adopting a computational representational point of view and separating the, uh, uh, the software aspects, the computational aspects, uh, which give, give you these idealized figures and so on, from the hardware properties, like the sequence of stimuli on the finger or the brain and so on. Uh, and in fact, in contemporary work, it's often looked like that, like that. So if you read, say, you know, work in the David Marr School, for example, uh, the distinction is made quite explicit and correctly. I mean, it's led to a lot of progress, uh, <clears throat> which is the only mark of correctness. Uh, the, uh, now, this is a double-edged sword, in my opinion. I think the move to, a, to, the, to the position where you look at, the, at mental proper problem activities as software problems had it well, was liberating and, you know, should it was a move that should have been made. On the other hand, it can also be extremely misleading. Uh, and in, in my opinion, it has long become more misleading than helpful, uh, particularly in philosophy of mind. Uh, in fact, here again, I think that the current, especially those areas of philosophy of mind that are kind of around artificial intelligence, including 
inquiry into the Turing tests and so on, have been seriously misled by the uh, metaphors. I'll come back to that. So you know, analogies and metaphors and abstractions are okay, but you don't want to want to make sure that you don't get carried away by them uh, into directions where you shouldn't follow them, and that's never easy to know, of course. Well, that's the uh, uh, <clears throat> that's the general background uh, th that I have in mind. I'll try to fill it in as we proceed. Uh, let me now approach the question from a, an even more general point of way, if, point of view, if you like. Are you still uh, hearing me back there? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm still being able to articulate, so I'll continue. Uh, l let me now try to approach this from another perspective, you know, kind of orthogonal, uh, and ask how one might proceed uh, to study human beings altogether. Well, there's one obvious idea. An, an obvious idea is that you should study human beings as if they're part of the natural world. And that would seem kind of obvious, I, surely controversial traditionally, contrary to the religious teachings and all sorts of other things. Uh, but in the, say, post-Galilean period, it should be possible to entertain the idea that you should study human beings as part of the natural world. Now, that doesn't mean that when you study human beings, you're going to find what you find when you study rocks, obviously. But uh, that's normal. It just means that the method of approach should be as if they're part of the natural world. Uh, meaning what you should do is search for intelligible explanatory theories that give you some insight into what these objects are about and what they're up to and how they're constituted. Uh, and you should uh, uh, try, you should hope, as in the other, other areas of natural sciences, you should hope that ultimately this inquiry will be integrated with other aspects of the natural sciences. Typically, over the centuries, parts of the natural sciences proceed in isolation. You don't know how to integrate them with one another. And when you can integrate them, it's a big discovery. So when, say, biology was sort of more or less incorporated in biochemistry about 40 years ago. That's a real breakthrough. When it became possible for physics to understand for the first time such things as why a, you know, a, a solid object can exist, which was sort of incomprehensible to the physics of the 19th century, when it became possible to understand, to kind of incorporate within physics uh, elementary properties of the world, like uh, states of matter or uh, uh, you know, the properties of solids or the color of sodium or uh, uh, you know, the character of the periodic table. In other words, the quantum theoretic revolution. That's a real revolution. You know. uh, nevertheless, quite often in normal science, ju things just can't be integrated because you don't know how to integrate them. So they proceed separately with an eye to eventual integration. That's norm normal science. I mean, it's you get these miraculous moments when things get integrated, but uh, it's not, not the norm by any means. Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, this, this approach that says let's study humans the way we study anything else, uh, let's call it, call it naturalistic. By calling it naturalistic, I mean to try to focus attention on the character of work and reasonable goals and to abstract away from the question of success. So maybe it's completely unsuccessful. Now, that's another issue. Uh, that, so I don't want to use the honorific term science for it, but just like science, you know, in the way it, it, it works. Uh, uh, that, by, say, by calling the work naturalistic, that's what I mean. I want to abstract away from questions of actual success. <clears throat> uh, well, that's a kind of a common sense idea. A naturalistic approach would claim that it has no burden of proof to meet at all. It doesn't have, it's self-justifying. Uh, it, it need give no justification. Maybe there's some reason not to adopt a naturalistic point of view to humans, but that's what needs justification. You'd have to give an argument for that. So the burden of proof is on anyone who questions this idea. So a naturalistic picture would assume. Uh, and I, I think that that's correct. I mean, so I, unless there's some reason to the contrary, I've never heard one. Uh, it seems to me we should agree that unless some, uh, some argument is given, which hasn't yet been given, uh, there's no reason not to study humans the way we would study rocks or bees or anything else, expecting to s discover totally different things, of course, as when we study solids and liquids, we discover totally different things. Uh, well, there are questions, interesting questions, uh, as to how naturalistic inquiry ought to proceed. 
So what are the criteria of rationality for science? And what about the reality of theoretical entities? And does it make sense to claim that a vector field, which is a mathematical object, has mass and so on and so forth? I mean, there are such questions, all kind of interesting questions. Uh, but now, if one is interested in getting answers to those questions, not just harassing emerging disciplines, then the place to ask the questions is where there might be a chance of getting an answer. And that's the way you proceed if you're rational. You have some question you'd like to answer. You look at the area where you might find an answer. Now, in this case, that means physics, not psychology. You're not going to find any answers to these questions in psychology. You might find some answers in physics um, for the, just the obvious reason. The depth of understanding and the uh, degree of success is so qualitatively greater, you know, by orders of magnitude, that there really are guides to inquiry into these questions. Whereas in the emerging disciplines, you at half time, you don't know what you're doing at all, you know. Uh, so there's just going to be nothing around that's going to guide inquiry. I mean, if you could ask these questions in physics uh, in the Galilean period, you would have gotten all the wrong answers. We know that. In fact, you know, Galileo had a very hard time convincing anyone and uh, had a rather sad fate, uh, <clears throat> precisely because not enough was understood about these questions so that what he was trying to do was intelligible. I mean, you can only get some insight where there's been some advances. Uh, so therefore, the attempt to raise these questions about fields like psychology and linguistics seems to me just a form of harassment. Uh, it's of no intellectual interest. Now, you can understand why philosophers do it. Quantum physics is hard. You want to raise questions about quantum physics, you've got to study hard, and you've got to learn things, and you've got to think about things, and so on. If you want to raise questions about psychology, you can do it off the top of your head, because nothing much is known, so it makes life easier. Uh, but that's not a good reason uh, to harass psychology, I don't think. So insofar as these uh, general questions arise, uh, I think we can dismiss them. General questions about, uh, unless again, unless some special reason is shown to show that psychology and linguistics you know, have some special methodological problem that, say, physics doesn't have, uh, unless that's the, an argument like that can be given, General questions about, say, induction or indeterminacy or all of these things, we can forget about. They all arise in physics, and if anything arises in physics, we can forget about it. If you want to get an answer to the question, look over there, where they really understand something and there might be some hope of, uh, of moving forward through some insight. There's no point raising these questions here where so little is understood. So I'll put those, I'll put those aside unless there's an argument. Uh, incidentally, this throws out, by this decision, I've thrown out an awful lot of contemporary philosophy, uh, maybe unfairly, but I think fairly. Uh, a lot of it, in my view, is just harassment, harassment of emerging disciplines. Uh, <clears throat> so let's put that aside. And the criterion I want to use is this, to restate it. If some general methodological consideration can be shown to hold of language and psychology, but not of chemistry and geology, then we'll consider it. But if it holds of chemistry and geology, we'll forget about it. Okay, that's, that's the working criterion that I'd like to suggest, and I think it's a rational one, uh, based on the assumption that if we ask questions, we do it because we want answers, not because we're trying to harass somebody. If we want answers, we'll look at the place where we might find answers. That's the logic of the criterion I'm suggesting. Well, a naturalistic approach to humans, then, will put aside any general methodological issues that just arise in the course of rational inquiry generally, uh, and will simply take for granted what is done in normal science with all of its uncertainties and equivocations and problems, uh, uh, always with an open mind, of course, like, you know, maybe somebody will come up with a real methodological question. Uh, but, and then it will proceed to study humans in the way that you study anything else try to find an intelligible explanatory theory that gives you some insight and opens up new paths of investigation and leads to new kinds of empirical question you hadn't thought about before and so on, that, that sort of thing. Well, that's the naturalistic approach. Uh, an alternative approach which rejects naturalism, uh, we, we might call, although I'll qualify this, uh, let's call it dualistic. A dualistic approach says that humans just aren't part of the natural world. Uh, and you have to study them in some quite different way. Now, here we have to be a little more careful, uh, because a naturalistic approach could lead to a certain kind of dualism. So, for example, Cartesian metaphysical dualism, 
in my view, was completely naturalistic. That is, it was the outcome of a way of looking at human beings naturalistically, and it led to a conception that humans have some special property, just like acids have some special property that bases don't have. There's nothing dualistic about chemistry because it says acids are different from bases, and you can tell the difference by a litmus test. And there's nothing non-naturalistic about Cartesian metaphysical dualism if it says that there's some special property that humans above the neck have, and there's a litmus test for it, namely things like the creative aspect of language use. I mean, that can be wrong, but it's not non-naturalistic. So dualism, I don't mean dualism and naturalism to be exclusive categories. There's a form of dualism, namely metaphysical dualism, the traditional form, which could follow from a naturalistic approach and could even be right. In fact, let's have a look at how it... So, so the, the kind of what I mean by sort of pernicious dualism, irrational dualism, is a kind of epistemological dualism, not metaphysical. One that says we're not allowed to study human beings the way we study other things. There's a law, which I state, which says you're not allowed to approach humans by the same procedures of rational inquiry that you apply elsewhere. That may seem to be a crazy point of view, and I mean to suggest that it is indeed a crazy point of view. Uh, but I'll also suggest that it's the overwhelmingly dominant one in philosophy of mind and cognitive science. In fact, maybe almost universal. So I want to take a strong position on that controversial position. So therefore, I'm putting it in the craziest possible form. And then what I'll try to argue is that the actual, what actually is done, in fact, falls under this rubric. That, that's the path I want to follow, just to look ahead. Well, all right, let's go back uh, to traditional dualism and say, take the Cartesian form, traditional Cartesian metaphysical dualism, and remember the way it worked. Uh, in outline, Descartes argued sort of as follows. He had a conception of the physical world. He gave a conception of physics. The conception of physics is what was called in those days the mechanical philosophy. Philosophy is just a word for science. So philosophy means science. So the mechanical philosophy meant me mechanics. And mechanics was co a kind of a common sense mechanics. It was a sort of contact mechanics. Things can influence one another if they're in contact. That's the crucial idea. Like, I can't move the moon by moving my arm, let's say, because they're not in contact. That's just common sense. It happens to be wrong, but it's common sense. Okay. So that's common sense contact mechanics. <clears throat> and Descartes gave a kind of you know, sketchy account. I mean, it's not a, it's not a detailed account. <clears throat> but a sort of sketchy account of how you might cover all of the phenomena he claimed of the inorganic world, the organic world, most of things about humans, everything except these few things that I mentioned, in terms of the mechanical philosophy, in terms of a kind of contact mechanics. Uh, well, all of that's... Com and then he said, look, here's these phenomena that are around, like creative aspect of language use, which don't fall under this, uh, therefore, we need a new principle, completely rational. We need a new principle because they're not covered by the mechanical philosophy. Within his framework, the only way to set up a new principle was to introduce a new substance, but that's part of the framework with which he approached it. So you introduce a race cogitans, another principle, thinking substance, which has other properties. And then uh, from a naturalistic point of view, you have two questions. First of all, what's its character? What is it? You know, uh, What is the race cogitants. Uh, nobody actually knows whether Descartes had an answer to this. Uh, if you look at his major book, the Traité du Monde, you know, this big study of the world, there's only three volumes. There was a fourth volume which was supposedly devoted to the mind, and legend has it that he destroyed that volume after he heard what happened to Galileo. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Maybe all the secrets are in there, like Fermat's Last Theorem or something. Uh, but in any event, there's nothing much around that from the theory of mind. But that would have been the problem. One problem would have been, okay, if you've got this separate substance, tell us what it is. You know. The second problem would be the standard unification problem that arises in the sciences altogether. That is, show how this theory relates to other theories. Now, in the terminology of that day, it meant solve the interaction problem. Show how mind and body interact. You know, That's uh, the way in which the standard unification problem of normal science is stated in terms of a two-substance theory of the structure of science. 
And remember, a two-substance theory of science is perfectly rational. I mean, it may be completely wrong again, but most theories have always been wrong. There's nothing irrational about it. Uh, and uh, we can, I think, without doing serious violence to, in fact, maybe even providing some understanding to the history, rethink it in this form. So we have a naturalistic approach, which claims to show that a whole range of phenomena of the world fall under contact mechanics, so identifies some phenomena that don't fall into it, invokes a new principle, then should proceed to study that new principle, developing a theory of mind, which would be like a theory of chemistry or genes or something, uh, and then show, solve the unification problem, show how it falls in with other parts of the theory of the world. Uh, and it looks as if that's what Descartes was trying to do in principles of philosophy and traité du monde and all that sort of stuff. It's, uh, these are the parts of Descartes that nobody ever reads. The parts of Descartes that people read are things like Discourse on Method, which was like a research grant proposal. I mean, it wasn't serious. He was saying, look, support me. I want to work on this topic. Or the Meditations, uh, where he's trying to answer questions that philosophers raised about all this. But from Descartes' point of view, the, I mean, you know, as much as you can reconstruct, it seems that what was important was the science, you know, dioptrics, things like that. And the other stuff was thinking about the nature of the science. Well, since the science is mostly, in fact, almost all, maybe all, outmoded, you, know, you don't study it. But for that matter, nobody much studies Galileo either, because uh, it's done differently and better. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't important to him, you know. Uh, what remains is the talk about the science. And since there's been no progress in that at all, you can make perfect, perf perfectly good sense to read, say, Discourse on Method. But I think one should read it recognizing that for Descartes, this is peripheral. Uh, it's not central. If you want to understand the project, you have to look at it his way. When you reconstruct it his way, I think you find a very naturalistic project, which ends up with metaphysical dualism as a serious proposal serious proposal about the nature of the world, which could very well turn out to be right, like other serious proposals about the nature of the world. Well, uh, so again, this is dualism, but it's not non-naturalistic. It's naturalistic dualism. Maybe wrong, but, nat but naturalistic within the spirit of science. Well, all of this has been ridiculed, especially in the modern period, uh, as the idea that there's, as Gilbert Ryle put it, a ghost in the machine, and then you're supposed to laugh a ghost in the machine. Isn't that silly? Uh, but that mistakes the problem completely. One's expectations, including his, you had a ghost all the way down. That is, even ordinary matter and the most elementary dynamics had ghostly properties. It wasn't just the mind. Everything is ghostly. So Newton, Newton showed that Contact mechanics amazingly just didn't work. Uh, uh, it was true that you could influence things at a distance. Now, Newton, and the scientists of the day, including Newton, incidentally, thought that this was absurd. Uh, Newton himself called universal gravitation an occult property. He said anyone with any brains at all can see that it's inconceivable that something can influence something that it's not in direct contact with. Yet we seem to have to assume that. Uh, well, not from his point of view, I mean, some the major scientists of the day, people like, say, Huygens and others, just threw it out for this reason because it was idiotic. Uh, Newton was himself torn by it, you know. He realized that it's just got to be right because it was such a spectacular breakthrough. On the other hand, it made absolutely no sense because it was inconsistent with the mechanical philosophy. And what, in fact, happened is he didn't get rid of the ghost in the machine, but he just showed that all of all properties of matter are ghostly. It's all a ghost. You know. It's all unintelligible, all the way down to terrestrial motion and planetary motion, uh, which is a big, big problem and remains a big problem. Uh, and it led to a new, it led to a totally new way of looking at science. Uh, this has been pointed out repeatedly. And, uh, Bernard Cohen, who's maybe the major Newton scholar, uh, points out, I'll just quote his version of it, he said, by, uh, by entering into this paradoxical world, uh, he said, Newton <clears throat> set forth a new view of science in which the goal is to find the best theoretical explanation irrespective of any intuitive notion we may have 
of ultimate explanation. Uh, so uh, uh, the point is there is a ghost in the machine, uh, and that's just the way the machines are. They're ghostly. You can't do anything about it. The mechanical philosophy appears to be wrong. Although it's self-evidently true, it just seems to be wrong. Uh, from this point on, we must uh, find his quote. Uh, we must be satisfied with universal gravitation. Let's call it UG for short. I'll come back to that. <laughs> we must be satisfied with UG and that it exists even if we cannot explain it in terms of the self-evident mechanical philosophy. That's just where we are. Science means accepting UG if you have evidence for it, uh, and it, is, it provides you with uh, an intelligible scientific theory, even if there's no way of accounting for it in terms of what's self-evident, namely the mechanical philosophy, which you just have to admit is wrong, uh, even though it's self-evidently true. Uh, at the, from this point on, people's intuitions about what must be true become irrelevant. They just become irrelevant. So if the way to deal with universal gravitation is through curved space-time, okay. If the way to deal with the universe is through weird quantum mechanical effects, too bad for intuition. Uh, if the world really has, it's made up of, uh, you know, infinite one-dimensional strings and ten-dimensional space, okay, got to stuck with that. Time has a beginning, fine, time has a beginning. Whatever lunatic idea people will come up with tomorrow has to be evaluated in its own merits. Does it yield insight and understanding? Uh, does it help us come to terms with the nature of the world? If it does, it satisfies the conditions for rational inquiry, irrespective of our intuitions. Uh, the Newtonian revolution, in fact, even earlier, the Galilean revolution, I think that's its essential content. You know, its kind of general content is sort of that. From then on, you're off on a totally new path. That's why it's really the one real scientific revolution in human history. It just set inquiry off on an entirely new path, and that's where we are. Uh, we have no other criteria. Common sense criteria are irrelevant. Now, we can't get out of our skins. I mean, you go out in the evening and you see the sun set, and no matter what you know, you still see the sun set. And when you see the moon near the horizon, it's just bigger than when you see it up there. You can't not see the moon illusion. So we see the world in terms of the way we are. You know, can't help it. Just like we intuitively feel that the mechanical philosophy must be true, because how could it not be? Uh, but we have learned, we have come to recognize that the way we see the world is just another fact to be explained about the world. So if we see the sunset and we see the moon illusion and we believe in the mechanical philosophy, no matter how much we try not to, uh, that's just a fact about the world. In fact, it's a fact about a very special part of the world, namely the human mind-brain and the way in which it acts and conceptualizes and constructs and so on, and we'd like to come to understand that. And in order to do it, we have to make a kind of an intellectual wrench. We have to take ourselves out of our skins and look back at ourselves uh, kind of reflexively as part of the world. And that's hard, but, you know, that's what it means to take a... To, to study human beings naturalistically. So that's the move one has to make to study human beings naturalistically. And then the way we look at things in common sense no longer provides a criterion for intelligible explanation, but rather is just a phenomenon to be explained. Now, there's a real problem here, which you can see right off. Whatever the right, you know, the, the working notion of intelligible explanation is again something that's inside our skins. And we're stuck with that. Uh, that that's, a, a real, that's something like a real paradox. We can only, whatever our capacities to carry out rational inquiry may be, say some corner of our brain, which let's just call it the science-forming faculty to dignify ignorance with a title, but there's some part of our brain that enables us to carry out rational inquiry, and it uses its own resources and its own criteria, which may be as misleading as the moon illusion. Maybe it's always systematically leading us away from the nature of the world. If we're creatures of the world, that would not be in the least surprising. But there we can't do anything about it because we're stuck with those. That's as deep as you can go. You can't go beyond those. So if we're systematically misled about the world because of the way our science-forming faculty happens to be constructed, that we can't do much about. But we can overcome the moon illusion. 
uh, it's hard, but we can overcome it. We can't stop seeing it. We can't stop seeing the sun setting. We can't stop believing in the mechanical philosophy. Newton's intuitions are, at least my intuitions, uh, but that part you can throw out. The, the part that's guiding our search for intelligible theory, we can't throw out. There's no way to get out of that. And there you are approaching something which is kind of like classical paradox, maybe. Uh, but we have to recognize from the naturalistic point of view that we are just a particular organism trying to understand the world, and we've got to do it our way because there is no other possibility. Well, <clears throat> uh, with uh, so, so anyway, with getting past through metaphysical dualism, we, we've now abandoned metaphysical dualism, but abandoned it in a very special way. It's not that there's a ghost in the machine, it's that the machine has ghostly properties all the way. You know. Maybe it has even more ghostly properties above the neck. If so, okay, but that's just another fact. However, it's already unintelligible to common sense down to elementary dynamics. Uh, that's Newton's basic discovery. Uh, that's why contemporary discussion ridiculing the ghost in the machine is completely off track in my opinion. It's just missing the point of what happened. Uh, there was no criticism made of, of uh, the Cartesian theory of mind. You could argue that's because it wasn't substantive enough, maybe. But in any event, it survived all of this intact, such as it was. What did not survive is the theory of the machine. Contact mechanics was thrown out. And the common sense of the next scientific generation is that the mechanical philosophy is wrong. Actually, it took a long time for this to settle in. You know, for a couple hundred years in physics, people were trying to find mechanical explanations. And it really wasn't until probably the 20th century that that was given up. You get as late as people like Poincaré. Uh, he was arguing that the uh, molecular theory of gases we adopt only because, as a computing mechanism. And the only reason we adopt it is because we're familiar with the game of billiards. So it's kind of convenient computing mechanism. And efforts to try to explain things in terms of, you know, ether and stuff like that are an attempt to carry out the mechanical philosophy. And it was a long time before. It was really this, this century before Newton's insight was basically incorporated into the sciences. Uh, and it's harder, maybe, even to do it in the emerging sciences. But anyhow, I think in retrospect, uh, that's the way we have to look at it. Well, if this is correct, then one... So I'm being kind of anachronistic when I say that the 17th century exorcised mechanical philosophy. It did in principle. It didn't yet do it in fact. It left a big residue of unhappiness and confusion that took centuries to sort out. But looking back, it seems fair to say, you know, abstractly speaking, that Newton exorcised the machine. He got rid of the mechanical philosophy. Uh, uh, footnote, it's an anachronism to say it that way, but I think an accurate historical reconstruction. And I'll continue with historical reconstruction. <coughs> Well, one consequence of eliminating the machine is that we've gotten rid of any notion of body or physical or material. There no longer is any notion of the material world. Remember, Descartes could be a dualist because he had a notion of body. Body, he didn't, not a very clear notion, but at least a general notion. Body is defined by the mechanical philosophy, by, by contact mechanics. That's body. Okay. Now, Newton showed... That's not the way body works. So therefore, we have no conception of body. In fact, it's just the world, whatever it is. You know. If the world has mental properties, that's part of the world. But there is no notion of body. Unless somebody comes up with a new notion, and nobody's ever done that, unless somebody comes up with a new notion of the physical, talk about physicalism or materialism or eliminative materialism or the mind-body problem and so on, it just seems to be meaningless. Now, if this is correct, something very curious has happened because people are talking about it all the time. There's all kind of stuff right up to the present about the mind-body problem. And there are theories in the cognitive sciences, say the church ones, called eliminative materialism, which says we shouldn't study the mind, we should just study the material world. Uh, and there are there's a lot of questions about physicalist reductionism. Can we reduce things to physical terms? In fact, you know, this is just this is, uh, universal philosophy in, in, in these areas. But I don't, know, I, I don't understand it. Maybe somebody can explain it to me. It seems that once we have lost the notion of physical, none of this discussion is even meaningful. It doesn't mean anything. You can't have 
pr a problem of reducing things to the material if there's no notion of material, and there is no notion of material. Uh, well, what is it? I mean, somebody could say, well, it's what they teach over in the physics department. But the people in the physics department are the people tell you that's not true, because they expect two years from now to be teaching something else, you know, at least if the subject's still alive. So that can't be true. Uh, and, and there is no other notion. Uh, all we have is the world with whatever properties it has. There's no notion of material world or physical world. Uh, hence, all of the problems of reduction have disappeared. The problems of elimination of study of the mind in favor of neurophysiology or something don't mean anything. They're just purely a rational statement saying instead of studying this part of the world, let's study that part of the world if you want to. But that doesn't make any more sense than saying uh, since solids are hard to study, let's study liquids. Maybe, okay, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's of no more interest than that. Uh, unless somebody can come along with uh, a theory, with, with a concept of the material to replace the Cartesian concept which has been thrown out the window. And as far as I know, nobody has even addressed that problem, let alone offered an answer to it. And if so, again, let me try to put it in the strongest terms, virtually all the discussion in the field is not just wrong, but meaningless, literally without meaning. It's talking about a problem that's unstatable. No. That's the strongest version of the position I'm trying to take, so let me put it in the most outrageous form possible. The whole field is not wrong, but meaningless, talking about something that it can't characterize, namely uh, something that presupposes a notion of the physical which has been abandoned since the 17th century. That's the strongest version of this particular thesis. Well, uh, uh, with metaphysical dualism now unstatable, because we don't have any body anymore, uh, notion, notions like eliminative materialism and so on lose sense, uh, and the kind of natural conclusion to draw from Newton's demolition of the theory of matter, and that's what it was, uh, is to, the, the natural conclusion is to say that human thought and action, say creative aspect of language use, are just properties of organized matter, because that's all there is, you know. There's nothing else, so they're just properties of organized matter. And in fact, that conclusion was drawn sporadically, but not, not too long after. Uh, it was drawn first by Lemaitre, and it was about a century later, no, half a century later, and it was considered totally outrageous. Uh, in fact, his work hasn't been revived until this century. Uh, Lemaitre was driven out, he was a doctor, he was and he said, his argument was, look, thought must be just a property of organized matter, because there isn't anything else. He was driven out of France, uh, driven out of Holland, he finally survived, thanks to the protection of Frederick the Great, for some reason. Uh, about a generation later, in more tolerant England, uh, the same idea was developed by the eminent chemist, uh, Joseph Priestley, a major 18th century scientist, uh, who argued that, um, let's see if I can find his quotes, uh, he argued, and I'm quoting him now, that thought in humans is a property of the brain. It's the necessary result of a certain organization. It's like electricity, magnetism, and the powers of attraction and repulsion. That's what he compared it to. Nobody really understood those things. But whatever electricity, magnetism, and the powers of attraction and repulsion are, these ghostly properties that matter has, thought is just another one of them. It's another one of those ghostly properties, uh, and we have to uh, investigate it in these terms. Uh, another 18th century version <clears throat> is that the brain secretes thought the way the liver secretes bile. You know, that's kind of the image. Actually, if you look at people like John Searle today, he seems to be saying something more or less similar to that if I understand him correctly. Well, that looks like the right move, mainly because there's no other choice. There doesn't seem to be any other move you could make. I mean, since all there is is a world which has ghostly properties all the way down to elementary dynamics, uh, there's nothing to say except that properties of attraction, propulsion, and uh, electricity, and magnetism, and later on quantum effects, and thought, and whatever else is around, anything that's going on, is just some property of the world, some property of the way matter is organized, where matter now has no meaning, it's just whatever there is. Some property of whatever, of how whatever there is is organized has these features. And a naturalistic approach to humans would ought to proceed that way. 
Well, that leads us to the next question. How can organized matter have these properties? Well, on that question, progress has been essentially zero. Uh, we don't know any, any, we have nothing to say about how organized matter can have such properties as the creative aspect of language use. In that respect, we're exactly as much in the dark as the Cartesians were. Uh, it's not that matter and mind are different kinds of things. That can't be because there doesn't seem to be any such kind of thing as matter. So therefore, matter and mind can't be different kinds of things, there being no matter. Uh, so they're not different kinds of things, but if we think of those terms as descriptive conveniences, describing certain aspects of the world, you know, namely humans above the neck versus everything else, then it seems that matter and mind pose different kinds of problems to human intelligence. That appears to be the case. Maybe they'll be shown to be wrong. Like there was a time when electricity and magnetism, and for that matter, universal gravitation, also posed total mysteries. Maybe we just haven't learned enough. But for now, you know, it seems reasonable to suppose that matter and mind, though not different kind of things, do pose different kind of problems to human intelligence. Well, if that turns out to be true, it would not be in the least surprising to a naturalist. Remember, a naturalist perspective assumes that humans are just part of the world, they're not angels. You know, they're just another thing in the world. If they're a thing in the world, they're going to have certain cognitive capacity, like rats. I mean, a rat can do certain things and it can't do other things. I mean, it's very lucky for a rat that it can't do lots of things, because if it wasn't incapable of doing lots and lots of things, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be capable of doing anything. There's a relation between logical relation between scope and limits. If you have the capacity, if you don't lack the capacity to do many things, you can't have the capacity to do anything. Very simple reason. The capacity to do something requires articulated structure. And if you have articulated structure, it's going to rule out all sorts of other things. I mean, the point is obvious in the case of physical growth. An embryo has particular genetic instructions, very rich genetic instructions which are going to allow it to become a chicken. But that very structure is going to prevent it from becoming a monkey. Okay? So lucky for a chicken that it lacks the capacity to become a monkey, uh, because if it didn't lack that capacity, it couldn't become a chicken. And the same thing, assuming a naturalist, you know, assuming that the world doesn't change somehow when you move to cognitive function, the same thing's going to be true about cognitive function. So rats happen to be very good at solving what are called radial mazes. Okay. A thing like this, <clears throat> where you stick the rat in the middle and it's got food out here. These are kind of like spokes of the wheel. And the trick is to learn how to go down each path exactly once. Like remember, you didn't move down that path before. And in order to make it as hard as possible, the experiment will rotate the thing so the rat can't be using olfactory cues, you know, remembering he smelled his way down there or something. Uh, rats turn out to solve that very fast, probably faster than humans. So they're really good at, all, at radial mazes, but they're horrible at other mazes. Uh, so for example, I don't know if it takes a right, right, left, left maze, a turn right, turn right, turn left, turn left. Uh, rats can't, I think they can't do it at all. But if they can, it's certainly extremely hard. Humans can do it quite easily. Uh, if you were to, say, set up a prime number maze where a rat has to turn right every prime number of branch points, obviously the rat would never do it in a million years. And the reason is it just doesn't have that concept, doesn't have that concept in its head. A rat can do a lot of things we can't do, you know, like it can build a nest and find its way home and solve radial mazes and all sorts of things uh, because it has special capacities. Uh, but it can't do things like a right, right, left, left maze, which humans can do. And as I say, it's kind of lucky for a rat that it can't do all these things because that means it has the structure to do other things. Well, if humans are part of the we just to introduce some terminology, we might distinguish for a rat between what we could call problems and let's call it mysteries. By problems for a rat, I mean uh, areas of, of uh, uh, challenges, say intellectual challenges, that can in principle be resolved within the rat's cognitive space. 
It's got the concepts for it. it. May take a long time, but it's got the concepts for it. By mysteries, I mean things that are just outside its cognitive space altogether, like a prime number maze or probably a right, right, left, left maze. Okay. The the analogy in in uh, say embryology would be that becoming a chicken is a problem for a chicken embryo. Becoming a monkey is a mystery. It just hasn't got the capacity to do it. You can't change the nutritional environment of the cell in order to make a chicken a monkey. You know, actually, nobody knows that. It's just taken for granted. I mean, rational people looking at the world just assume that they have no real knowledge of it. You know, to explain it. It's just sort of so obvious that nobody even talks about it. I'll come back to that fact because it's interesting that in the study of cognitive development, people aren't rational that way, the way they are in embryology. Uh, that's part of the epistemological dualism I'll come back to. Anyhow, in the areas where we can all be rational without too much trouble, like chicken embryos and rats, uh, the distinction between problems and mysteries is quite clear. Notice it doesn't have to be a sharp distinction. It could be graded and there could be all sorts of other dimensions and so on. But as a first approximation, it makes sense to distinguish these two categories. And it may even be very sharp. Uh, well, if humans are part of the natural world, the same is going to be true of humans. That is, there'll be problems and there'll be mysteries. There'll be intellectual challenges that are within our cognitive reach, at least in principle. And there'll be others that are just not within our cognitive reach, in principle. And the, we're, if that tr is true, if there are certain things we can't understand, we should be very happy about it, because that's a consequence of the fact that we can't understand anything at all, okay, for just reasons of logic, the same as the chicken embryo. Well, uh, in theory, we can find out something about this. I mean, looking at looking at ourselves from a, you know, abstracting from our skins and looking back at ourselves, we could carry out an investigation that might set the boundaries of those things. For example, we might discover that there are certain kinds of intellectual constructions that humans are capable of setting up. Like humans, if you look at science, let's say, there are certain ideas that keep cropping up. Like we can study input-output systems. We can study deterministic systems. We can study probabilistic systems. We can study systems with a random element. Uh, there's a number of things we can do. And if something can be put into those frameworks, we can deal with them. On the other hand, it may very well be that the creative aspect of language use just doesn't have those properties. It's an aspect of the world that just lacks those properties, exactly as the Cartesians thought, in which case it would just be a mystery for us. Free will, in other words. Uh, the same might be true of the, the question, problem of consciousness. In fact, all the old chestnuts, you know, all the questions everybody's been worrying about for thousands of years, where you never make any progress at all, I mean, literally zero, people don't even have bad ideas about it. Like on some areas, you have bad ideas. But in these topics, you don't even have bad ideas. It just looks like you're bumping into a blank wall. I mean, you know as well as you know anything that you're aware of some things, not of others. Uh, you know as well as you know anything that you have a range of freedom of choice of action. You can choose other than what is impelled by... You, you know that the Cartesians were right in saying that whereas a machine is compelled, a human is only incited and inclined and could decide to resist those in inclinations. You just know that as much as you know anything. It just looks like a total mystery. There isn't any idea, however bad, as to how that might happen. I mean, there are ideas about you know, quantum mechanics and so on, but they're not, they don't even reach the level of bad ideas uh, because they always introduce random elements. And we know that this is not random. It's no more random than it's determined. Uh, it's somehow appropriate, but not random. In fact, it's just uncaused. Not uncaused in the sense of random, but uncaused in the sense of undetermined, but appropriate. And what that means, nobody has any idea. We can recognize it. We have no problem recognizing it. We can pick it out all the time, you know. Uh, uh, in fact, pretty easily. We have the foggiest idea what it is. Well, it could be that we're facing something like a right, right, left, left mass, uh, 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 maze for a rat. Uh, in other words, it could turn out to be true that the domain of the mental for humans is just a mystery. Uh, and hence not metaphysically different, because there are no metaphysical differences, but epistemologically different, part of our mystery space, not our problem space. It's been, there's, a, there's actually a book coming out by uh, an Oxford philosopher now at Rutgers named Colin McGinn, 
<coughs> arguing that uh, it's impressed that tradi that philosophy is just the study of mysteries in this sense. Uh, that's why philosophy is hard because it's the study of mysteries. You can never make any progress. Actually, there's a traditional view of philosophy which would make this almost tautological. Uh, one traditional view of philosophy is that it's what's called the mother of the sciences, meaning things are philosophy as long as you don't understand them. As soon as you begin to understand them, they become science, then philosophers don't worry about them anymore. Uh, so in, in the contemporary period, say, people like John Austin, Oxford philosopher, strongly advocated that, and the person who developed the theory of speech acts, uh, and he argued that he, he was you know, Oxford philosopher, but he said what he was working in was pre-science, the theory of speech acts. And whenever it came to be understood enough, it would go off and become part of the sciences, and then they wouldn't talk about it in Oxford common rooms anymore. They'd really work on it. You know. Uh, well, if that's what philosophy is, if it's the mother of the sciences, then by definition it's the study of mysteries. You know. So its problems really are kind of hard in some special sense. Now, notice that what's a mystery for a rat may not be a mystery for us, and conversely. So, uh, so the notion of problem and mystery is organism dependent. It's a, just a fact about particular organisms. Okay? So it's really problem and mystery sub O, oh, where O oh, is some organism. It's, there's, no, I, there's no absolute sense in which something or something's a mystery, presumably. Like, how could be a Martian for whom what's a mystery to us is trivial? Maybe he's watching us all the time and wondering why we always make the same dumb mistake when we study mental phenomena, just as we can watch a rat and wonder why it always makes the same dumb mistake when it's running a right, right, left, left maze. Uh, and and, and we, things that are mysteries to the Martian might be trivial to us. There's no commensurability necessary in this space. Uh, but nevertheless, it's something like that. Something like that has to be true from a naturalistic point of view. That is, again, if humans aren't angels, if they're part of the natural world, then this is going to be true. Now, we don't know what the boundary is, but we know it's there. Uh, and in fact, coming back to the question of the natural sciences, it would seem that the natural sciences are a sort of a ch a ch an accidental convergence, purely chance convergence, between some properties of the world and properties of our cognitive space. So somehow, by some pure accident, it turned out that if <clears throat> this is the properties of the world and this is the set of things that are just problems for humans, there's some area of convergence in there. There's no reason why that had to be like that. You know, and this, I mean, I mean there, there's, been a, there's a long discussion in the sciences, or philosophy of science, trying to argue that it had to be like that. I think this goes back first to Charles Sanders' purse about a century ago in the early post-Darwinian period. Uh, Peirce argued that he, he asked, well, scientists have always been asking the question, how come science is so successful? It's kind of a miracle, you know, like Einstein, not, not foolish scientists. Einstein asked the question, how come, you know, the human mind is capable of understanding the nature of reality? Well, of course, that presupposes that humans are capable of understanding the nature of reality. And the evidence for that is very slight. I mean, in fact, what it seems to be, what seems to be the case is that through the general obscurity, there's a few little points of light that have broken through, and that's what we call science. But most of the questions that the Greeks asked, let's say, are just as obscure today as they were then. You know, I mean, a few of them, you know, a very small number of them have been answered. Uh, so, first of all, the fact, the fact to be explained doesn't seem to be a fact. Uh, the fact that humans have this amazing capacity to understand the nature of the world just doesn't seem to be true. Most of what's going on, we haven't a glimmer of understanding about. Uh, but the, uh, so since the fact isn't a fact, we really don't care what the explanations for it are. But the explanations that have been offered from Charles Sanders' purse up to people like Stephen Hawking in his recent popular book on time are always the same mistaken explanation, namely that uh, the reason for this fact, which is not a fact, uh, is evolution. Uh, we, uh, evolution selected us to be able to solve problems, and therefore we're able to solve problems. But that doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, there was nothing in the history of the human species that gave a reproductive advantage to ability to solve problems in number theory, let's say, or in uh, quantum theory. 
In fact, human evolution took place in hunter-gatherer societies. Nothing's happened since then. Uh, and there's no reproductive advantage, even in modern societies, but certainly in hunter-gatherer societies. There's no reproductive advantage to the capacity to solve problems in the advanced sciences. I mean, it's sort of triviality. Uh, and that's all evolution's about. It's just about reproductive advantage, not about anything else. In fact, it's, it's even been, I mean, serious evolutionary biologists have been trying to ridicule these notions for years, have even argued only half, uh, you know, half jokingly that there's a repro that there's a selective advantage for stupidity. Uh, uh, Dick, Dick Lewontin, who's one of the best, uh, population geneticist at Harvard, one of the main modern evolutionary biologists, trying to debunk all kinds of s stories about cognitive development and so on, suggested that if you really look back at hunter-gatherer societies, where all of human evolution took place, uh, and if, if you consider the people who, for some genetic reason, were more adventurous or more imaginative or whatever, chances are they'll get killed, although they'll be good for the tribe. That is, while all the dumb, unimaginative guys are sitting around the fire, this imaginative guy is going to be out trying to figure out a way to catch the saber-toothed tiger. You know, Well, you know, maybe he'll succeed now and then, in which case it's good for everybody sitting around the fire. But over time, it tends to be bad for him because he often fails and the saber-toothed tiger gets him. You know. So there's a reproductive advantage to being passive, stupid, unimaginative, and so on. And therefore, he argues, well, there ought to be a tendency in that direction. As I say, this is only half serious, not, not entirely unserious, incidentally, uh, but uh, merely an effort to debunk the idea that you can learn anything about the evolution of cognition. Dick Lawton's major point is that nothing within any you know, scope that we can dream of, there's nothing possible that anybody will ever be able to say about the evolution of the language faculty or the evolution of cognition. And, Certainly not the evolution of the science forming faculty. Uh, it's just hopeless. It's got to be just some physical configuration that took place for whatever reason. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I think that's correct. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of work on it, but the work looks, looks vacuous for those kinds of reasons. Uh, in any event, it looks as if it's reasonable to suggest uh, that science, as we know it, is just a kind of ray of light which accidentally happened to break through because of some chance convergence between our problem space, which is par part of our nature, uh, and the world, which is whatever it is. Uh, and already by the 17th century, big, big paradoxes were arising because our problem space is sort of wedded to the mechanical philosophy, and we had to give it up uh, uh, and move to some other parts of our mind, which have whatever properties they have, which may be systematically misleading us uh, and may be leading us away from inquiry into the, uh, uh, into the uh, mental. Now, in the post-Newtonian era, if this is, suppose this is true, I mean, suppose that certain aspects of the mental, like, say, creative aspect of language use, lit, the litmus test for the mental, for the Cartesians, so not something trivial. Suppose that that really turns, into, turns out to be, in fact, a mystery for humans. Well, we're just stuck with it. You know, that's the way we are. We're stuck with it the way we're stuck with the moon illusion. Uh, and maybe it's a problem not only for our perceptual space, but even for a mystery, but even for our cognitive space, in which case we'll never have any understanding of it, just as we have no understanding of most problems. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't deal with these things in our normal lives. Like in our normal lives, we're always dealing with things, more or less successfully, that we haven't any conception of. Uh, we do it by what's called intuition, which is just a name for what we can do, but without underst any understanding of how we're doing it. And virtually everything that goes on is by intuition. Uh, fortunately, we've got all these capacities, whatever they may be, but to, to gain a scientific understanding of them is something else. That that we will be ever be able to do so is, I think, kind of unlikely. And in fact, you might even argue it's a good thing. You know, it's nice that we don't understand ourselves too well. Uh, could be awful if we did understand ourselves too well. But anyhow, it, it just looks plausible to assume that most of our humans above the neck will just never understand. Uh, we can begin to pick particular, we'll be able to do it. We can do all kind of things. 
uh, but we probably won't be able to understand it, at least so it looks. And certain aspects of the metal appear to look like that. They just appear to be in the mystery space. Again, that could be wrong. But uh, let me stress again that this could be a research topic. You could imagine, investigate, in fact, it could come out of cognitive science. Uh, it could come out of cognitive science that humans are capable of constructing certain kinds of conceptual structures, like determinism and randomness, say. And those are going to deal with certain types of phenomena. And if you can show empirically that certain kind of arrays of phenomena don't have those properties, too bad. Then you're in the mystery space. That's a conceivable discovery about human beings, conceivable empirical discovery. Without paradox, we could discover what's a mystery for us. We couldn't solve it, but we could find it and find out where it is. Uh, and a, a large part of the so-called mind-body problem could ultimately fall uh, into that area. Uh, again, not metaphysical because we can't state it. Well, with metaphysical dualism unstatable, uh, is there another kind of, of dualism? Remember, metaphysical dualism falls within naturalism. It's, it's just a form that naturalistic inquiry takes. It reaches metaphysical dualism along the line, say, that the Cartesians followed, and then it's exploded because the world disappears. The machine disappears. So we're left without any form of metaphysical dualism. We have no matter anymore. Is there any other kind of dualism that we could construct? Well, the only other kind is irra irrational dualism, epistemological dualism, uh, which says you're just not allowed to study humans or humans above the neck uh, by the methods of rational inquiry. You're not allowed to study humans naturalistically. Now, as distinct from metaphysical dualism, this is a completely irrational position as far as I can see. It has no saving graces at all. Uh, what I want to show, I'll, I guess I'll stop now and come back to that, is that however irrational it may be, it's pervasive. In fact, it dominates, uh, and in fact, maybe even almost universally dominates, the more reflective, more considered aspects of uh, the cognitive sciences. By that I mean contemporary philosophy of mind, contemporary philosophy of language, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, debates about, uh, you know, the limits of machines, uh, you know, can, can software be think, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what I want to try to argue is that uh, uh, all of this is ultimately, if, if you look at it closely, at each point, it's a departure from a naturalistic approach to humans, meaning it's a form of epistemological dualism, hence irrational dualism, unless you can give an argument for it. There might be an argument for treating humans non-naturalistically, but the burden of proof is on anyone who suggests that. And you await an argument, in other words. If you don't get one, you forget about it. That's what I'd like to argue, and to the extent that that's plausible, uh, uh, the, next, the last question, which I'll come back to at the end, is what, why, if I have to show that it's plausible, uh, but assuming that it's plausible, why would it be true? Well, there would be a natural explanation, namely that intuitively we are just dualists. We can't help being dualists any more than we can help see, seeing the sunset. We see the sunset no matter how much we know, and probably our approach to the world, humans is just, you know, is just ineradicably dualist. We see humans as having ghostly minds in a physical body. And even if the notion of physical body disappears, we can't help seeing people that way. Just as once contact mechanics has disappeared, and once the Ptolemaic universe has disappeared, we can't help seeing the sunset. Now, with metaphysical dualism, if this is true as an aspect of human cognitive character, if metaphysical dualism is on a par with the setting of the sun, just a way we can't help looking at things, with metaphysical dualism gone, we're forced to irrational dualism, but it's, mis it's a path we should resist. Uh, that's the diagnosis I'd like to give at the end, but first we have to traverse the path. Thank you. 
No, I completely agree with that, and I think it's worth stressing. So in the actual inquiries, say into vision or uh, <coughs> sensory perception or language, I mean, the stuff we work on, uh, there have been real breakthroughs. I mean, I think really revolutionary breakthroughs. They're considered in, uh, it's this second level cognitive science, the kind we could call philosophy of mind. In fact, they're pretty much the same field. That's the one I'm talking about. Uh, and strikingly, Actual working cognitive sciences, scientists tend to be sort of schizophrenic about this issue. I mean, some of them don't think about the general topics at all. But those who do think about the general topic, which is normal you know, and re reasonable, I'm not suggesting everybody think about reflectively about what they're doing. Like, you know, not many chemists think about what chemistry is about. They just do it. Uh, but uh, in those among the cognitive scientists who think about the topic, they generally, in my opinion, move to the irrational side when they're thinking about it. So somebody may do work uh, in which they, uh, you know, use computational representational models of, say, vision, and then they may argue that this doesn't make any sense. In some way, that's not something unknown in the history of the more advanced sciences. Um, may maybe some of you can, I'm sure some of you know way more about this than I do, so add things that I'll know, but... Uh, well, as, as you may know, one of my colleagues at MIT up until recently was Tom Kuhn down the hall. I was a well-known historian of science. And I have been interested, we, we've been friends for years, and I've been interested in exploring with him similar things in the natural sciences. And interestingly, it hasn't been studied much. He couldn't refer me to any literature on it. So, like, you know, if you ask it, the question, how did this transition go from say, Poincaré regarding the molecular theory of gases as just a computational device to people assuming it, there really are molecules. Uh, and, uh, you know, the whole bunch of things like that. Uh, he, he couldn't refer me to any liter literature, actually only to one study, an unpublished study, uh, <coughs> or, or how it, uh, in Newton's period, was, which has been heavily studied, how did people get from regarding universal gravitation as an occult property which no sane person could even dream of, which was Newton's point of view, to recognizing it as just obvious, you know, in, by the time you get to, you know, Laplace or somebody. Uh, how did that transition take place? There doesn't seem to be much work on that. And I think that's right at the heart, exactly where we're in, you know. Uh, the one study that Kuhn referred me to is a book, actually a dissertation, by a guy named John Heilbrunn, who was actually a, a student of his, who did a doctoral dissertation on the <coughs> uh, on on the things like the molecular theory of gases, on the uh, transition around the turn of the century from a period in which uh, molecules and atoms and so on were regarded as just computing devices. You know, we, like Poincaré said, uh, we use them because we're familiar with billiards. We just want to get the answers. Uh, up to the point where uh, people really uh, just assume they're there, you know, there really are molecules. And according to this guy, uh, if you go back to, say, 1880, scientists were completely schizophrenic, just like cognitive scientists are today. I mean, when they were doing their work, you know, they treated molecules as being as concrete as Bunsen burners, you know, no distinction. On the other hand, when they were thinking about it, they said it's total nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. There can't be such things. Uh, field, you know, molecule, any of this kind of business. These are just ways of coming up with the right answer. You know, kind of very operationalist. And uh, then he says that you, you go about, there's about a 10, 20 year period from about 1890 to 1910 when attitudes just shift totally. And, he, and by, say, 1910, people just talk about them as being like Bunsen burners. I mean, later, you know, it comes quantum theory and new problems arise. But in that period, you know, like the, uh, this period, people just thought of them very, 
you know, substantively. And uh, his argument, his reconstruction is that what happened basically is that, for example, lots of different ways of calculating the number of molecules in a certain volume of gas, lots of different ways of doing that converged, giving you very close to the same number. And there were all kinds of convergence of this kind. And the convergences were just so powerful, along with the elegance of the theories that were coming out, that at some point it just became unreasonable to question it, no matter how much of a wrench it was with common sense. Uh, well, in my opinion, we're in, it'd be nice to understand this better in the natural sciences, because it might give some hints you know, as to where we're being caught in traps and things, if you look at what happened in places where they already been through this a long time ago. My impression is that in the cognitive sciences today, there's something similar going on. So that in the actual work, the sort of first level cognitive science, uh, people are doing perfectly sensible work and making advances and so on and so forth. When people are thinking about that work, including often the very same people who are doing it, it becomes, it sort of flies off to outer space. It's based on illusions. Uh, and it's that second level of cognitive science, the philosophy of mind part that I really am talking about now. that time. Well, of course, <coughs> Descartes is famous for analytic geometry, basically, giving a numerical interpretation of geometry. I, I don't know if at that time there was anything like a real conception of mathematics as a formal system in our sense. That didn't really come till Hilbert, you know, way later. I mean, right through the 19th century. Uh, you know, a, a classical analysis was just some kind of hand waving. So, like, you know, Gauss couldn't have explained intelligibly what he was doing. Uh, it, it didn't really get what we call formalized until mid 19th century, and uh, so I, I don't, I don't know. But I, my impression is that those ideas were not influential in the first cognitive revolution. I mean, what formalized mathematics meant at that time was Euclid, which was pretty close to formalized, though as Hilbert pointed out, when he redid it properly, there were lots of gaps. You know. uh, but you know, that was the model of formalization, and that model didn't really give you a notion of formal language or anything like that. In the mid-20th century, it's been very influential and extremely harmful in my point of view, I, I believe. Now, actually, it, it's double, it, again, double-edged. Like the, the concept of uh, the concepts of formalization that led to the notion of recursive procedure like, say, Turing machine and so on, that was very productive. I mean, it made it possible to face classical problems in a clear way for the first time. On the other hand, the idea of formal language, I think that's been extremely misleading. Virtually all of Quine's work, for example, on natural language, seems to me to be derived, I'll come back to this, from a model of formal arithmetic, which just has no resemblance whatsoever to natural language. It doesn't have any of the same properties. And the uh, conclusions that are drawn from the study of formal arithmetic are totally irrelevant. I mean, formal arithmetic begins by stipulating a class of well-formed formulas. I, I'll come back to this in more detail, but just think of, say, I mean, I, I'll, I'll talk about Quine particularly because he's absolutely, by, you know, beyond any measure, the most influential modern philosopher in this area. Tremendous impact. And if, if you look back at the thinking about natural language and about psychology, it comes from a model which starts like this. It says, let's take formal arithmetic. Okay, <clears throat> how does it work? Uh, we take a, we designate, we stipulate a class of symbols. We construct certain mathematical objects, which are s strings of these things. Uh, we then select a certain infinite set of those mathematical objects. We call them the well-formed formulas. We then pick any recursive procedure we like to generate that set. We call it an axiom system. 
the action system is completely free. We can pick anyone we like. We do it for convenience or something. The only thing that has any reality is the class of well-formed formulas. And that has reality because we stipulate it. Like we could stipulate the class of even numbers or something and then pick any method of generating them we like. The method of generating them is irrelevant. You know, you just use whatever one you feel like. Uh, the thing that's real is the set extensionally. Now, he approaches natural language the same way. He says what's uncontroversial is the class of well-formed formulas. What's problematic is what's called the grammar, the generative procedure that characterizes them. And in fact, he, he argues crucially that to say that one grammar rather than another is the true grammar is like saying that one axiom system rather than another is the right axiom system for arithmetic. Well, that would obviously be ridiculous in the case of arithmetic. So therefore, by analogy, it's ridiculous in the case of natural language. And that, as soon as you make that move, you're off into some totally non-naturalistic direction. And your trouble is you can't make the first step. There's nothing in natural language analogous to the class of wealth and formulas. It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is the generative procedure. The, the thing that doesn't exist in formal arithmetic does exist in natural language and conversely. So it seems to me that the analogy has been extremely misleading from the first moment on. You know. uh, although the concept of generative procedure itself has been very, I mean, has been wave their hands at before. Uh, this has had, an, for the linguists among you, it's had a terrible effect in linguistics. Uh, through, through the 19, from about 1970 up till today, as the linguists will know, there's been a huge debate about the, or, uh, about the uh, generative capacity of different kinds of grammatical theories. You know, like, do they generate all recursively enumerable sets? Or can we cut them down so that they generate only recursive sets? Or can we cut them down so they have only the capacity of context-free grammars, which is supposed to be a big ideal that you're supposed to try to reach? Uh, and in fact, a lot of the argument against so-called transformational grammar, uh, since work by Stan Peters or even earlier, Hilary Putnam, uh, has been that it's too broad and weak generative capacity. It generates too, too many sets. Too wi it generates wild sets. You know? And we don't want that. We want it to generate only non-wild sets. Now, this, I, I call this a debate, but it's really one-sided because only one part of, one, only one position is being represented in the, the debate, those who think it's a problem. The other side, which is basically me, isn't participating because there's no problem, because there's no question. There's no question. You can't talk about generative capacity unless you have a class of wealth and formula. And there is no such thing. Nobody's ever told us what it is. You know. Nor is there any gap in linguistic theory that would be filled if you had such a concept. I mean, it's not that there's a kind of a theory out here and, you know, there's some things we'd like to explain and if we could only figure out this concept, we could explain them. That's not true. I mean, there's nothing around which we would understand any better if somebody specified the class of well formed formulas and furthermore, nobody knows how to do it. Furthermore, every working linguist, here to get back to Luigi's point, every working linguist knows at least on one side of his brain that it doesn't make any sense because working linguists are typically working in areas of relative judgment. Like the most productive work has to do with things like the differences between subjacency deviations and ECP deviations, you know, two kinds of deviation. That's you know, what's going to be useful evidence. You never know in advance. It's usually something very exotic, not what's in front of you. And that evidence turns out, for all kind of theoretical reasons, to be extremely illuminating or takes the study of parasitic gaps, certain kind of construction, which are very odd. You know, when you tell them to people, they kind of cringe. Although they interpret them in very special ways. Now, you know, the ways they interpret them are extremely illuminating. In fact, precisely because they're very odd. They're very odd because nobody ever hears them. So any way they're interpreting is something that's coming out of their minds. You know? So they happen to be very interesting, but they're all deviant. Well, are they well-formed or aren't they well-formed? Well, it's a stupid question, you know. They're exact, they have exactly the status they have. You know. The status they have is deviant in this respect. Uh, there is no notion of well-formedness. Now, every working linguist knows that in, in their bones. You know. uh, uh, no one has ever proposed 
his main a vague idea what the classic well-formed formulas might be. There's no gap in linguistic theory that is asking to be filled by this concept. In other words, the concept has all the earmarks of being totally absurd, yet there's a huge literature based on it and claiming that there are all sorts of problems because weak generative capacity is too large or you know, quantity type indeterminacy problems and so on. That seems to be a really paradigm example of irrationality coming from misunderstood mathematical analogies, which aren't analogies. I mean, uh, actually, I think there's similar things back to Frege. But the model of formal arithmetic is just irrelevant. You know, isn't, it's not at all like natural language. Uh, formal mathematical languages are languages only by metaphor. You know, like uh, the B language is a language. You can use the metaphor if you like. They don't have any of the properties of natural language. It is. Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'd, li I'd like to come back to that, actually, after giving some examples. I mean, it seems to me that from the very start, there were some very funny moves made uh, with regard to, I mean, people tried to, you know, they, they were trying to get out of behaviorism, but I think they fell right back into it. Uh, they fell right back into it in another direction by setting up operational criteria that defined categories of intelligence. So take, take, say, Herbert Simon, who's, you know, really one of the great figures of the field. I mean, uh, actually won the Nobel Prize for this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, he pointed out once in his autobiography, he points out, and he's quite right, that uh, chess playing, the problem of chess playing, is the, he called it the drosophila of cognitive science, meaning it's played the same role in cognitive science that drosophila played in genetics. It's the core problem around which, uh, which everything revolved. You, know, you wanted to solve the problem of Drosophila, that led to genetics. You wanted to solve the problem of chess playing, that led to cognitive science. And he's kind of right about that. I mean, people take it very seriously. And there's a lot of work on it, a lot of money goes into it, and so on. Back in the, 40, in the 50s, when this stuff got started, my view was, and I still hold this view, that this is total nonsense. Total and absolute nonsense. It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference whether you can get an algorithm that'll defeat Kasparov or whoever it was in those days. Uh, the only purpose in working on this topic is if you want to take the fun out of playing chess. I mean, it's, it's about as interesting as trying to show that you can build a bulldozer that'll dig a hole faster than a person. Yeah, probably you can. Uh, but it's not going to tell you anything. It's not going to tell you anything about human beings. And for reasons that every natural scientist knows, I mean, it has to do with the nature of simulation, you know. You don't do simulation in order to try to beat the original. You do simulation in order to try to learn something about the original, okay? So, like, if somebody came along and said, the way to study human physical capacity is to build bulldozers, because they can dig holes faster than people can, that would be a joke. I mean, there would be a point in studying, you know, some digging machine, for a scientist at least, if it was going to teach you something about how humans dig. Uh, you just want to dig faster, you know, it's an engineering problem. It has nothing to do with the sciences. Uh, a chess playing program would be interesting if it would tell you something about how people play chess. Actually, in my opinion, even that wouldn't be interesting. And the reason is that how people play chess is not an interesting problem. Now, inter interesting is a funny notion. You know, what is it of interest for the sciences is something which is which uh, uh, something's interesting for the sciences if it's on the borders of current understanding. If it's way out away from the borders of current understanding, it's not interesting. Doesn't matter what's going on. Now, chess playing is not on the borders of current understanding. I mean, you know, it's some very. In fact, the reason chess is a game is because people are no good at it. If everybody was good at it, it wouldn't be a game. Uh, the things that we're good at are things like talking. You can't have, uh, uh, you know, a uh, a thing like they just had in Yugoslavia where people 
speak sentences to each other and understand each other. The trouble is every three-year-old can do that. You know. uh, so you make up this, in fact, games and sports altogether are designed to be things that people are no good at at all. You know. So therefore, abilities separate and scatter. And only freaks can do it, like say, pole vaulting. I mean, they don't have a walking, you know, you don't have a walking, you see, you see if people can walk from here to there in the Olympics, but you do see if they can pole vault because it's some totally insane activity that nobody is any good at and therefore abilities scatter uh, and only certain people can do it. And in fact, only pretty freaky people can do it. So you can have sports and competitions and so on. Well, chess is like that. It's a game because we're absolutely no good at it. It's probably around the outer edges of the problem space. Now, it's not a mystery or we'd be in real trouble. But it's not central to the problem space, because, and therefore it's a game. So therefore, yeah, and it doesn't make sense. Like if you were studying human physiology, and somebody said, "Look, I want to study pole vaulting." You know, I mean, what people actually study is how I can reach over here and pick up that glass. That's uns unsolved. You know, like how can I build a robot arm that'll duplicate what I do with it? You know, tied to a visual system that'll do what I do when I pick up that glass. That's an interesting problem because it's around the borders of understanding. But if someone were to come along and say, I want to study pole vaulting, people would laugh. You know? It's not worth studying. We don't even know how you can reach and pick up a glass. So who, who cares about pole vaulting? Uh, and the same is true of chess. I mean, it's so far from what we understand that it's not even worth studying. But if for some crazy reason, I think it's crazy, somebody wanted to study it, then they would only be interested in a chess playing algorithm if, in fact, it taught you something about how people play chess. But it was obvious in the 1950s that that's not where it was going to go. The chess-playing algorithms that were going to win the prizes were those that used the capacities of computers, which are completely different than humans. I mean, they use rapid search, for example. So the guys who win the prizes now are people who explore some search space, you know, at very super speeds down to 10 moves, you know. Well, a human being can't begin to do that. I mean, not even begin. Humans do it in a totally different way, however it is. Uh, so, you know, winning the chess championship, like what gets the money in the articles in the science magazines, is like building a bigger bulldozer. And if that's the Drosophila for cognitive science, it really tells you that cognitive science is way off on the wrong track. Uh, and it starts from the very beginning. And I think it's because of the kind of behavior, lingering behaviorism, which showed up as the idea that uh, intelligence is whatever satisfies a certain operational criterion. And if the operational criterion is playing a decent game against a grand master, we study that. But the natural sciences have nothing like that. In the natural sciences, there are no operational criteria. Like nobody sets up an operational criterion for something being a liquid. You know, it feels wet or something like that. I mean, that's, you can set up any, of, uh, any operational criterion you like. There are a dime a dozen. They don't mean anything. You're interested in looking at, you know, trying to dis discover those phenomena that lead you to understanding. Now, it's, it's interesting that when you go back to the 17th and 18th century, people, the, the simulation that was done then was scientific. So when Vaucanson constructed a duck that was digesting, he wasn't trying to fool people into thinking it was a duck. He was trying to learn something about digestion. In fact, he purposely made it transparent for that reason. That's quite different than modern cognitive science and the modern concept of simulation, which is basically an effort to fool people, see if the machine can fool people. I think it's going back way before that. I mean, it's going back to some primitive period that the Cartesian revolution escaped, because already in the 17th and 18th century, uh, the concept of simulation was understood the way it's understood in the modern sciences. Y you can, the guys who were constructing these automata were not trying to fool people into thinking it was a person or a duck or something. They were trying to say, what can I learn about a duck from this automaton? That's the way people construct a model of you know, the heavens or something. It's not the way people do cognitive science. I think this is a regression to the pre-scientific era. And as for the reasons... I think it's a link. I don't think I said that there was a move away from behaviorism, but I don't really believe it. There was an effort to move away from behaviorism, but it fell right back into it in, a, in an even worse sense than behaviorism, namely the attempt to satisfy operational criteria. That's the role that the Turing test plays in the 
contemporary cognitive science. I'll come back to this in more detail, but that's what I think. I don't know. I have, I have no theory about it. My only theory about it is it's probably a mystery. I mean, phenomenally, it looks like a mystery. The, the phenomenon of confronting free will looks to me like the way a rat would probably feel if it was facing a right, right, left, left maze. Something's going on out there, but it can't figure out what it is. You know, uh, The phenomena look so obvious that it's hard to deny them. I don't think it's got anything to do with indeterminacy. I mean, well, like take, say, Roger Penrose, you know, sort of leading quantum physicist. He argues that quantum physics is wrong, is, you know, hasn't really, is, is a ten tentative, it's temporary theory, hasn't quite reached the truth. And when it reaches the truth, it'll explain the mind. Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not enough of a scientist to judge what he's saying, but. Uh, I don't see any reason to believe that. It doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere near the question. Quantum indeterminacy seems to have totally different properties. It's no more relevant than classical determinacy. Uh, as for Priestley, he was just making a common sense, I think he was making a common sense observation. He was saying, look, since there's no matter around anymore, because Newton got rid of it, uh, things like the power of attraction and repulsion, which we don't understand in his day, uh, and electricity and magnetism, which we don't understand, and human thought, which we don't understand, are just properties of what it, of organized matter. And we've got to try to understand them in parallel ways. As to how to understand them, you never it's the kind of thing that you never know until you've done it. You know. It doesn't make much sense speculating about how it'll work out. The only thing that's worth speculating about, I think, is whether some of these questions are in the mystery space for humans, which they might be. And about that, we could conceivably learn something. They do have that feel. And in fact, I think Colin McGinn is basically correct in saying that most philosophical problems have that feel. The problem of consciousness, for example, is one, you know, you can't deny, I mean, there are people who deny that people are conscious or who claim that thermostats are conscious. But, you know, that just seems ridiculous. I mean, uh, and uh, it just seems an obvious truth but nobody has the foggiest idea about how organized matter could have this property. There, there are lots of bad books about the subject which claim to have solved it, but if you look at them, they haven't done anything that has restated the problem. When you're using those terms in a kind of a Foucault-like sense, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can't really comment on that stuff because I don't understand a word of it, to tell you the truth. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh -huh.
Yeah. Let me start with a personal confession of inadequacy. When I read anything that starts with post, you know, post-structuralism, post-modernism, post-anything else, my eyes glaze over. I don't understand it, you know. Uh, I mean, I, when I say I don't understand it, I, I mean, not that I don't get some kind of a feeling from it, you know. I sort of get a kind of a feel of what Foucault is talking about, and often not even that. But I have no cognitive understanding of it. Uh, furthermore, it's, a, it's it, so therefore I really, I'm, I'm just evading the question for that reason. Uh, and just to continue with personal inadequacy, it's lack of understanding of a very special kind. I mean, there's lots of things I don't understand. Like, you know, I take the last issue of Physical Review, let's say, and I open it. I'm not going to understand one word of any article there. However, that's different. It's different in two respects. One respect is I know I can go over to my friend in the physics department and say, look, can you tell me what this is about at my level of you know, foolishness and, mis and lack of knowledge? And they can do it. You know, uh, a good physicist can tell you, yeah, it's, it's sort of about this. You know, and skip this step. And here, here's the problem. And you can get to understand it. So like, say, take Roger Pen Penrose. When he writes about quantum physics, He's skipping all kinds of steps. He's not telling you what a tensor is and you know, all sorts of things, but you can kind of understand it. You know. uh, now, in the case of post X, nobody can explain it to me. I mean, you know, when somebody explains it to me, I'm just as confused as before. Uh, the other thing is that uh, in the case of other hard things, I know there's a path that I can follow to get to understand it. And in some cases where I've been particularly interested, like, say, Foundation of Mathematics, I've done it. You know, I'm not really good at it, but I can sort of follow it. And in this case, I wouldn't even know how to start, you know. I look at these pages, and it's just, I'm, I could look at it forever, and I'd never make any progress. And nobody can help me. So it's a different kind of lack of understanding. And therefore, I'm just sort of off in outer space as far as this stuff is concerned. I, I don't, and hence, that's why I'm evading the question. I mean, I, not only do I not comprehend it, I don't know how to go about comprehending it. Some, some people seem to, but maybe there's a genetic difference or something. <laughs> maybe it's like being tone, could be, it's kind of like being tone deaf. You know, if you're tone deaf, there's certain things you just can't hear. I can't hear this stuff. Well, uh, I mentioned before that Tom Kuhn is an old friend of mine, and one thing we've disagreed about over the years is about paradigm shifts. I mean, in my opinion, there's been about two of them in the whole, all of human intellectual history. I mean, there was, you know, the Galilean Newtonian revolution, there was quantum theory, and I don't know, maybe, if, I don't even think evolutionary theory counts. It's too simple. No. Uh, Maybe there are others, but if so, I don't see them. I mean, people talk about paradigm shifts all the time. I remember not long ago reading an article about this by a, a linguist. A guy was in Berlin, I forget. He was writing kind of a history of modern linguistics, and there was a paradigm shift about every three weeks. You know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I don't see any. I mean, uh, it, I mean the, the shifts are so small, you know, that it's really kind of reconstructing old ideas and understanding them a little better maybe with new technical understanding or something or other. So it seems to me the terms like paradigm shift are kind of too inflated for the sort of thing that most of us do. Uh, it's all what Kuhn would call normal science. He doesn't, he doesn't agree with this, I should say. And, you know, you've got to take him seriously. He invented the story. But uh, it's, just, it's a question of where you, you know, uh, what orders of magnitude seem to you to be important. And people just have different judgments about this. Well, let me mention Penrose again, who's interesting. He divides theories into three types, what he calls superb, useful, and tentative. And his level is so inflated that thermodynamics doesn't make it beyond useful. And contemporary uh, um, part particle theory doesn't even make it to useful. Okay, well, you know, if those are your standards, then we're, we're, we're somewhere else, you know, in some other world. You know. But uh, 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 all the talk about uh, 
I mean, the fact of the matter is there have been only, I think, a few real changes in the way people have looked at things. And those really are paradigm shifts. Um, and they're hard, they're difficult. You know? They're difficult to comprehend. They, uh, they require a complete revising of the way you think about everything. It just doesn't seem to happen in other fields. The changes are small. Small. We don't understand enough. Hey, should we make, try the experiment again? <clears throat> See if there's any improvement this time. Thanks. Well, I <clears throat> uh, suggested this morning that in a uh, post-Newtonian world, we are left with no, no notion of matter or body or physical, hence no notion of physicalism, no notion of physicalist reductionism, uh, no notion of eliminative materialism in the sense of many cognitive scientists. Uh, these, uh, and of course, no notion of metaphysical dualism. Uh, these notions simply seem to have no definition, no specific, they don't have any meaning since the notion physical has disappeared. And again, the notion physical disappeared because Newton dem demonstrated that the physical has ghostly qualities, if you like, uh, all the way down, down to the simplest phenomena. Uh, in, in my opinion, that uh, well, either, this is a f either this is true or it's not true. If it's not true, I'd like to see a reason why. If it is true, I think it is. It's taken much less seriously than it should be uh, because if it is true, it's extremely hard to uh, translate uh, an enormous amount of the discussion in philosophy of mind in a way which makes it into something that makes any sense. It just doesn't seem to mean anything uh, because there doesn't seem to be any topic. Uh, there would be a topic only if the notion physical were in some manner characterized and that no one has tried to do. And they haven't tried to do it mainly because you know, it can't be done. Uh, the physical is just whatever we come to understand more or less. That's the physical. There is no other... Uh, uh, there is, or else, what is actually there? There, if you want to take a realist position, it's whatever's there, uh, and there's no question of reducing anything to that. Everything's just part of that. <clears throat> well, I'll uh, with uh, metaphysical dualism now unstatable, uh, and recall that metaphysical dualism could be, and I think in the Cartesian version was a naturalistic position, something that comes out of. Uh, it's inquiry in the scientific style. Uh, with metaphysical dualism now unstatable, uh, is there any alternative to naturalism? Is there any, uh, is there any kind of dualism that one can uh, put forth? And in fact, there is only one kind. It's a kind of a methodological or epistemological dualism that says we're not allowed to understand, to study human beings uh, in the way in which we study everything else, or at least we're not allowed to study uh, keeping to the same metaphor, human beings above the neck, the man, uh, in the manner in which we study anything else. Now, as distinct from metaphysical dualism, that appears to be a totally irrational position. It doesn't have any saving graces. Uh, unless somebody gives a reason for it, it seems that it should just be dismissed. Uh, nevertheless, as I mentioned, uh, I think it's a very pervasive position, and I'll try to illustrate in the next day or so how pervasive it is. In my own opinion, it's not only pervasive, it's all-inclusive. That is just about everything in the field, referring now to the considered parts of the field, not the actual research, but the th thinking about them, uh, falls under irrational um, methodological or epistemological dualism in this sense. Well, I'll give some examples in a moment, but uh, <clears throat> first let me just, as a 
for concreteness, more or less, uh, spell out what I think a naturalistic program would lead to. I could, could use any area, but there's only one area of the mental where there's real progress, namely language. And let me sketch out what it would lead to, I think, in the case of language. I'm not going to try to give any evidence or any reasons to back that later, but just to give an indication of what I think one finds. Well, it seems to me that what, <clears throat> in the case of language, what one finds is that what's involved in human language is the human brain, not the foot. Let's say. You cut off a person's foot, they have no trouble speaking, or if you cut out the brain, they have trouble speaking. So to start with, it seems to be localized to the brain. Uh, furthermore, uh, it seems to be in certain parts of the brain. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a, an area that you can cut out, but the, although even that's partially true. But certain subsystems of the brain seem to be specifically dedicated to language. Uh, so let's just give them a name and call them the language faculty. So that's whatever subsystem of the brain is uh, dedicated to the storing and the use of language. Uh, <clears throat> when we look more closely at the language faculty, we find two kinds of systems. There's one which we can call cognitive system. And there's another actual class which we can call performance systems. I'll come back to the spelling out more later. Uh, the cognitive system, uh, the world doesn't have to be like this. If it's true, it's an empirical statement about human language, about the architecture of the brain. Uh, um, uh, the uh, cognitive system is a, is a computational representational system uh, which stores information. It stores, in fact, the infinite information we all have uh, about the properties of the expressions of our language, about their sound properties, their meaning properties, their structural properties, and so on. And that is to say that the uh, cognitive system is some, it's obviously a finite object, it's pain. Uh, so it's some kind of finite object that stores an infinite amount of information. And that, con that notion was a big problem throughout much of modern history when people were thinking about this, uh, this topic. It was recognized long ago that we have unbounded knowledge, but that we have finite minds, as they would have been called. Uh, and that was an insoluble problem until the 20th century, uh, when it finally became very clearly understood what that means. Uh, what that means is there's a certain kind of property of the brain, namely the property of being what's called a generative procedure or a recursive procedure, which characterizes an infinite amount of, in of information in a finite way. Now, that happens to be a particularly well understood property by now. So saying that the brain has this property is not a particularly, it could be false, but it's not, it's, there's nothing mysterious about it. Uh, surely the brain has properties. And this particular property, the property of being a generative procedure, is a property which is particularly well understood. In fact, there's a whole field of mathematics about it that has made it very well understood. Uh, with that technical insight, you know, the insight into and technical kind of underplays it with the insight into what it means for a finite procedure to capture infinite amounts of information. With that formal insight, it becomes possible to address the traditional concerns about how you could have infinite unbounded knowledge uh, with only a finite brain. Address them. And in many ways, modern linguistics comes out of that confluence, the confluence of a formal insight and a traditional problem. Now, unfortunately, it didn't work like this. In a rational world, that's the way it would have worked. The reason it didn't work like this is that the traditional concerns had all been forgotten by the time uh, modern linguistics came along. And we were in a behaviorist world, an externalist behaviorist world, where these traditional concerns had disappeared. So you had to reinvent the traditional concerns as well because of the remarkable par parochialism of the professional disciplines. And that includes all of them linguistics, philosophy, uh, and psychology, none of which were aware of the traditional concerns. I should say that these traditional concerns were not very far back. Uh, so for example, as recently as, uh, say, the 1920s, and this is mostly work in the 1950s, as recently as the 1920s, uh, Otto Jespersen, well-known Danish linguist, uh, coming now at the tail end of a several century old tradition, 
uh, wrote that the goal of linguistics, the goal of the study of language, is to characterize what he called the notion, the notion of structure that people have in their minds that enables, that guides them to form and understand arbitrary expressions, including what he called free expressions, meaning ones that they'd never heard before and that had never been produced before and so on. So that's the right idea, and it goes back a couple hundred years. But let's, when I was a student back in the 1940s, no, nobody would read Jesperson. In fact, I just learned about him out of curiosity, looking up books in the library. Uh, and uh, everything else in, in the history had disappeared as well. In fact, uh, we were talking a little bit this morning about the schizophrenia of uh, scientists in the, around the turn of the century. The schizophrenia of serious scholars around this period, say 1940s, is quite remarkable when you look back at it in retrospect. A uh, very striking example of it. Uh, there, there are kind of lessons in this for the future, which is why I'm going off into this anecdote. But uh, <coughs> the, the leading American linguist in, the 19, in that period, say the 1930s, was Leonard, uh, Leonard Bloomfield, who happened to be both a uh, Sanskrit scholar, a scholar of Indic and Germanic studies. You know, he really knew Indo-European linguistics and Sanskrit and so on and so forth. So that was one half of his brain. The other half of his brain, he was trying to be a hard-headed scientist you know, reading stuff from the Vienna Circle on logical positivism and uh, contributing to the meetings of the Vienna Circle and laying the foundations for modern hard-headed structuralism. He was a very committed behaviorist and, you know, what was considered at the time a tough-minded scientist. And actually, if you look back at his work, he was doing two kinds of work, which he kept totally separate. Uh, how he managed it internally, I have no idea. But uh, in the Germanic Indic Sanskrit side of his brain, he was writing generative grammars. He wrote uh, uh, a grammar of, he was working American Indian languages, but he wrote a uh, detailed grammar of an Indian, American, an Algonquin language, Menominee, in the 1930s, which is a, a gen generative grammar in more or less the modern sense, with rules and rule ordering and so on. It didn't go into sy syntax because no one knew how to bridge that gap to infinite information with finite rules. But it did deal with uh, phonology, morphology, I mean, the parts of language that could be, that people knew how to finitely characterize. And it dealt with them by ordered rules and uh, rules of considerable depth and all sorts of things that are by now familiar. Uh, in his, on the other half of his brain, where he was being a hard-headed scientist, the reason he did it is because he knew traditional Indian linguistics from 2,500 years earlier, where that's exactly the way it was done. So if you read Panani, let's say, you know, five centuries BC, it's a generative grammar in the modern sense. Uh, and that's what he knew, so that's what he did when he was doing, doing serious linguistics. On the other hand, as a theoretician uh, and uh, a hard-headed scientist, he was writing derisive critiques of people who talk about ordered rules and all these crazy mentalists when everybody knows that all there is is behavior and the structure of discourse and, uh, you know, all this kind of hard-headed type stuff. Uh, I got to, uh, and th these are in the same years. You know. In fact, it's interesting I said, that his Menominee Morphonemics he published in a very a place which was quite remote in those days, in the French, in the Czech, Czech Linguistics Journal, uh, the uh, Travaux for Czechoslovakia, something which nobody in the, in the United States would ever read. Actually, I was a student about 10 years later, and my professors were students and associates of Bloomfield's. Uh, one of them, in particular, had, uh, had the same mixture of interests. He was an Indo-Germanic scholar who knew San Sanskrit and also a modern linguist. And at that time, I, I also did a generative grammar uh, uh, as an undergraduate thesis. But it, nobody ever pointed out to me that Bloomfield had done it 10 years ago. Now, they had to have known it. I never asked anybody. It never occurred to me to ask them. And I only found out about this years later when all this stuff was rediscovered. Uh, but the point is it was so deeply hidden that even people who had to be aware of it never suggested to an undergraduate that he should look at it because it was considered so outrageous. You know. well, why did Bloomfield do it? Because in the sensible half of his brain, he knew how else could you do it. You know, it's the only sensible way to do anything. But what was sensible was totally repressed. Uh, well, you know, it took a while to 
th this is maybe a much more extreme case than the case of uh, uh, molecules that we talked about earlier, but it's a, it's a warning. I mean, it's a warning about excessive parochialism and taking seriously things that ought to be, ought to be questioned, which in an area like this means almost anything. Uh, well, <clears throat> coming back to, uh, uh, to this picture, uh, we have a cognitive system which is a re some kind of generative procedure, a recursive procedure, that stores an infinite amount of information, and in particular information about the sound meaning relations. Uh, and as to its nature, we have a huge amount of data from a lot of different languages, fairly reliable data, and some theories which are not inconsiderable, some theories which have gone, gone somewhere towards explaining a fair amount of that evidence. So though there's a lot not known about the, cogn the cognitive system of the language faculty, uh, there's been substantial progress in understanding it, and one sort of knows how to proceed. I mean, there's plenty to do. It's a normal science problem in, in that sense. Uh, with regard to the uh, performance systems, much less is known. Uh, it's generally assumed that the performance systems are fixed and invariant, that they don't change through childhood, let's say. You don't, you don't learn them. It's usually assumed that you don't learn a parsing theory, for example. You just have it. And the same for every other performance system. The reason for that assumption is not that anybody knows anything about it. In fact, it's precisely because nobody knows anything about it. Since you don't know anything about it, you might as well make the simplest assumption, which is that it's invariant. Uh, and until you have some other evidence, just go on from there. So the t usually tacit assumption that performance systems are fixed and unlearned is basically due to ignorance. Uh, could be true, could not be true. Uh, but until more is learned about them, it'll be hard to answer. Uh, with regard to the cognitive system, which is much better understood, it's known that it is not fixed, at least not entirely fixed. So Catalan is English, as I find out if I walk outside. Although that could very well be a misleading impression. From the point of view of a rational Martian scientist looking at this universe, he probably would say Catalan just is English. Uh, with some trivial changes you know, that aren't worth looking at. Uh, and that seems to be a sort of, in advance, it's reasonable to suppose that that's what will ultimately be discovered. Uh, the reason why it's reasonable to suppose that that's what ultimately will be discovered is that if that isn't true, it's extremely hard to explain the fact that anybody knows Catalan or that anybody knows English. That is, if you compare the what is known with the database for it, qualitative difference, the gap is so extraordinary that short of miracles, you can only conclude that it all came from the inside. But if it all came from the inside, and since obviously we're not genetically designed to speak English or Catalan, uh, then it's just got to be the same language with minor variations. And in fact, one of the intellectual challenges of the field is to demonstrate what you sort of know in advance has to be true, that there really is only one language, and that the differences between them must be very peripheral and must be located in those parts of the system that are very, uh, s that are subject, that are, for which there is direct uh, data. So about, like about the phonetics, there's a fair amount of data, you hear it. Uh, so those, that can vary a little bit. Uh, but most of the computational part of the system, you have no evidence about, and therefore it almost has to be unique. Current theories, which I'll hope to be able to get to later, uh, do in fact propose that there really is only one computational system for language, and that the differences are located completely outside the computational system. Now, that's far from having been proven, but it's, an, it, it's what ought to be true. And you can now kind of uh, postulate it without absurdity, not proving it, but postulate it without absurdity, and that you know enough so you can see how it could be true. And assuming that it's true helps explain a lot of things. Well, <clears throat> that's getting ahead of the game. Uh, in any event, the, co the cognitive system does undergo some changes, but probably limited changes. Uh, it starts in some kind of initial state, and it goes through a series of states, and it ultimately stabilizes. Uh, it, apparently, there's what's called a critical period for this. It's not certain, but there seems to be a critical period. There's mounting evidence, meaning that it has to take place during some period of uh, uh, physical development, probably pre-puberty. Uh, it, it seems that if it takes changes that take place later seem much more peripheral to the system. But the major fi fixing of the uh, 
of the system seems to be extremely early. In fact, the better the experimental techniques are, the earlier it gets. Uh, by now, some of the results are pretty astonishing. So, for example, it's been there's some evidence recently that uh, four-day-old infants can distinguish uh, the native language of their mother from another language when spoken by another person. So, for example, uh, that's a four-day-old happened to be done in France. A uh, four-day-old French infant listening to a bilingual woman, not, not his mother, say, who speaks a true bilingual who speaks French and Russian, the four-day-old will respond differently to that woman speaking French and that woman speaking Russian. So that means within four days or even pre, you know, even before birth, something got fixed. You know, some differences got fixed. Uh, things like uh, the basic intonational structure of languages uh, seems to be at least in part fixed before six months of age meaning before the kid has said one sound. You know. uh, <clears throat> the same seems to be true of uh, things like um, finding the, the regions within which for certain phonological units appear, like the regions, for, say, a vowel might differ somewhat from Polish to Chinese or something. And those things also seem to be fixed pretty well by six months, say. And if we get better experimental techniques to make it down earlier, uh, one of the uh, interesting and kind of exciting things about work in developmental psychology in the last couple of years is that with the improvement of experimental technique, you just keep pushing down the, the stage of innate knowledge earlier and earlier. By now, it's in most areas way before any overt behavior. So, for example, to go up, up a little bit, it's by now well established that two-year, uh, let's say, 20-month-old children or two-year-old children uh, say 20 months, who are, their behavior is maybe two, what are called two-word sentences, you know, like, you know, something that means give me that or something, which comes out as two words, that those children are able to not only fully comprehend seven or eight-word sentences, but even figure out the meanings of words from the structural properties of seven or eight-word sentences that they're given, all way in advance of any performance. Uh, well, again, this shouldn't surprise anyone who takes a naturalistic point of view to humans. After all, we assume that automatically for every other aspect of development. I mean, nobody assumes that other aspects of development are taught, uh, and there's no reason why this should be. But for the, for, for the study of uh, cognitive processes, it's, uh, uh, it's an important discovery because it tends to overcome that irrational dualism that I've been talking about. Well, in any, I'll come back to that. Uh, in any event, the cognitive system does change to a certain degree. It doesn't seem to change very much. Uh, it gets fixed at some stage, apparently pre-puberty and maybe well earlier than that, and within pretty narrow limits. The attained state, in fact all the states, uh, are, is a generative procedure uh, of the kind that I mentioned, a uh, computational representational system. A generative procedure generates something, forms things. And in this case, uh, the generative procedure, this is what's sometimes called, called a grammar, but that's probably a bad term, so I'll keep away from it. The generative procedure generates linguistic expressions, a certain set of objects, call them linguistic expressions. Each one of these guys is itself a collection of properties. So one of them is, you know, say the word, uh, I don't know, some sentence or other. That sentence, rather, is some collection of properties namely a co collection of phonetic and what are called semantic and others, it's just a structural got too many braces here these two go together uh, so a, uh, each linguistic expression is a collection of a variety of properties, say, the, the linguistic expression, say, table in my language has certain sounds and, you know, certain uh, instructions as to how to use it to refer and so on. So you refer to this, but not the house and so on. Uh, those are the properties of the word table, what's called the word table. And the, uh, uh, the, the generative procedure assigns those sets of properties uh, for every expression. Um, uh, 
uh, what's, what's generated, in other words, it's a set of expressions, what are called technically structural descriptions. Uh, we can pull out some piece of these things. So for example, if we look only say, at this part, if we look only at this part of the linguistic expression, we have something which we could give a name to. We could call it a signal, let's say. Uh, and similarly, we could just pull out these parts, and then we would have something that we might call a concept or something like that. Uh, but the linguistic expression itself is just a collection of all of these things. Okay. The signal could be phonetic, but that's a little misleading because we now know that it could be other things. So it could be sign, for example. Sign seems to be learned pretty much the same way spoken language is. And surprisingly, it even seems to be localized in the same parts of the brain, which is quite surprising because the modality is completely different. It's coming in through a visual rather than an auditory modality but it seems to be ending up being processed in the same part of the brain, actually on the left side, the side that's not used for visual processing, which is a particularly remarkable fact in the case of sign language. And there's a lot of interesting discoveries about that, which tell you a lot about the, stru the structure of the language, the, the structure of the language faculty of the brain, uh, and, and how its parts are parceled out for different kinds of activities. In any event, the, the cognitive part seems to be sort of modality independent. It doesn't seem to matter whether the input to it, the signal that's coming in, is coming through the eye or through the ear, uh, as long as it's of the right type. And that means that the notion's phonetic representation, phonetic part of the linguistic expression has to be understood somewhat more abstractly as whatever part gives instructions to the uh, uh, articulate, the production and perceptive systems. Okay, the normal case is articulatory, but it's now known that that's not the only case. How many others there are, nobody knows. Uh, you don't do experiments on these things. You look at what's around. Uh, <clears throat> that Martian I was talking about might do experiments and could learn a lot, but for ethical reasons, we don't do them. Uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the linguistic expression, then, is a collection of those things. Uh, it has manifestations, signals or manifestations. In a much more general sense, you could say speech acts, you know, like the act, act of referring to something or uh, asking about something or whatever. Uh, speech acts are also manifestations of linguistic expressions, uh, where uh, uh, if you think of a linguistic expression as a set of instructions to performance systems, uh, if you look just at the instructions, say, for the articulatory system, you'll end up with what the signal will be. If you look at a broader set of instructions, uh, to other performance systems, you will get an, an act, you know, an act that a person performs, like the act of referring to this object, with the word table, which is something I could do. That act is another manifestation of the linguistic expression uh, uh, where the instructions have been used by other performance systems. That's, that's, that's the basic picture. Um, now, here we have to begin being a bit careful. It's common in just ordinary discourse or sort of unreflective talk about language to say things like, uh, this word has changed its meaning in the last hundred years, or it's changed its sound in the last hundred years. It used to be pronounced this way, now it's pronounced that way, uh, and it used to mean this, and now it means that. Strictly speaking, that's meaningless. Uh, the word is just the collection of its properties. And if the properties change, it's a different word. I mean, it's, like, it's as if you sort of pick some mountain, you know, say uh, Mount Taniku, that's around here somewhere, and you said, is it the same mountain after an avalanche? Well, that's a matter of decision, not fact. You know, the same mountain, if you want to call it the same mountain. Is it the same mountain after one grain of dust has moved? Well, again, that's a matter of decision. There's no answer to that question. Uh, it's a question of... If, if you want, if you want it within a certain range of human interest, yes. Within another range of interest, no. Similarly, if I say that, uh, but there's no absolute answer to the question. That means that there's no real meaning. There's no absolute meaning to the notion. The word changed sound, or the word changed meaning. Uh, there isn't much confusion about this in connection with words changing sound, but the question of words changing meaning is a big topic. An awful lot of modern philosophy is concerned with how words get their meanings fixed. That's no more significant than the question of how words get their sound fixed. 
which is not considered a big problem uh, because we're less confused about sound than we are about meaning for some reason. But it's basically the same question. The only question is how the collection of features gets combined. And that's neutral as between sound and meaning. Uh, and to say that the words changed meaning or they, it's this way of fixing their meaning or something is really not to ask a very serious question. Similarly, when you ask whether a word means the same thing for me as it does for you, or whether it sounds the same for me as it sounds to you, that doesn't, strictly speaking, mean anything because it's not the same word for you and for me. It's like asking, do you look like me? Do we look like? Well, there's no, again, there's no absolute answer to that. Relative to a certain set of interests, you might say that Luigi and I look alike, you know, as compared with maybe somebody in Africa or something. But relative to another set of interests, we don't look alike. But there's no, there's no true answer to that question. You take two people and you say, do they look alike? There's no true answer. It's an answer that's relative to all kinds of human interests and concerns. And the same is the case when you ask whether two people have the same word or the same expression or speak the same language or whatever. It's all a question of whether it's like asking, do they look alike? There's nothing very profound about this, but it's worth keeping in mind because I think it's constantly forgotten. And again, I'll come back to cases where it's forgotten. I think a lot of the, uh, for those of you who know the philosophical literature, uh, a lot of the contemporary theory of reference, which is called externalist theory of reference, idea being that the reference of words is determined by things in the world and communities, crucially. That's the, you know, the ruling theory of reference. I think an awful lot of that is based on this confusion uh, and disappears as soon as this confusion is eliminated. I'll come back to that, but that's the reason I'm bringing it up now. Before bringing it up, let me just, you know, before going to the applications, let me just repeat what should be obvious, that a word or a phrase or a sentence or a text or whatever is a collection of properties. It's a collection of properties, which some of which are instructions to the articulatory system, some of them are instructions to the referring system, some are instructions to some other thing. Uh, that collection of properties is the linguistic expression. Uh, and uh, it, there's no substantive meaning to the question whether one person has the same linguistic expression as another. Uh, it's like the question, do they have the same shape? Yes or no, depending on what you happen to be interested in. Uh, <coughs> well, um, Uh, suppose, suppose that the cognitive system, as I mentioned, does pass through a sequence of states and hits, hits a sort of stable state. Uh, we'll assume, let's assume that the performance systems don't, though mainly out of ignorance. Uh, suppose the <coughs> cognitive system reaches the state, let's call it L. That's the state that the cognitive system reaches, and that's where it sort of stabilizes at some usually early stage of life, maybe necessarily early stage of life. And after that, it undergoes only peripheral changes, like maybe learning new vocabulary items, which we can forget about. Uh, in that case, if the, if the cognitive system has stabilized in the state L, we'll say that, let's say it's Peter's cognitive system. So we have somebody over here named Peter. Uh, we'll say if Peter's cognitive system stabilizes in the state L, we'll say that Peter knows or speaks or has the language L. Okay, that's what it means to say that somebody speaks a language or knows a language or has a language, to put it in more neutral terminology. So to say that I have some special variety of that crazy mass of things that are called English is to say that my cognitive state stabilized in that particular system when I was, you know, 10 years old or something. Uh, I'll come back to sharpening that up for a moment. But as a first approximation, that's what it means to say that somebody has a language. Uh, uh, the language, then, is just the state that the cognitive system reaches. That's all it is. Now, to avoid pointless terminological controversy as to whether this is really lang language or not, that which, you know, n notice so in advance, we know before we even start, that the terms of common discourse are not going to survive into theoretical discussion. I mean, everybody knows that in the case of, say, the natural sciences. Like, nobody cares whether the word energy, liquid, uh, or momentum, say, as it's used in physics, is, has the same meaning as the same word in natural language. And, of course, it never does. It would be a miracle if a, world, a word of natural language could survive the transition into the natural sciences. 
uh, it would be uh, an astonishing miracle. There's no reason why that should happen. The words of natural language develop the way they develop. They're part of the natural world. Uh, the constructions of the natural science sciences are created by our science-forming faculties, whatever they are, in, in an effort to come to terms with the world. And it would be astonishing if the same concepts carried over, and they almost never do. In fact, never, never as far as I know. Uh, nobody expects to find a counterpart in the natural sciences to notions like the heavens or the earth or uh, water or uh, uh, work or anything. And there was a time when it was believed that there would be counterparts, but that's long in the past or should be. Uh, again, this, has to, this is something that comes up in the discussion of contemporary theories of reference. So I'll come back to it again. Connection, Kripke, Putnam, and so on, but let's put it aside. Certainly, the words of normal mentalistic discourse, like language, are not going to survive the transition to uh, theoretical construction, the development of a theory that, in which we try to understand the way language is used and understood. Very unlikely that they'll survive, and of course they don't. So when I say that that's what I mean by language, all I mean is that that's about the closest counterpart that we seem to be able to get to something like the intuitive notion within a considered theory of language. To avoid terminal, it's, it's interesting that in the natural sciences, you don't make a big fuss about this. Like everybody just takes it for granted. But part of the irrational dualism of the mental sciences, if you like, is that this is considered a big problem. So people want to know, have you really captured the notion of language or knowing a language when you characterize it that way? Nobody asks whether physics has really captured the notion of liquid, let's say, because nobody cares. I mean, there was an article in uh, Science, the Journal of the American Association for Advanced Science Physicists, was trying to decide whether a uh, pile of sand is a solid, a liquid, a gas, or some other form of matter. Uh, had some other story. Uh, but the point is, it, it didn't occur to him, nor would it occur to anybody else, to go around asking people what liquid means. It doesn't matter what liquid means. What matters is the concept of liquid, of, of state of matter that developed within the natural sciences. And then you can ask whether a pile of sand is one or another of those states of matter. And it doesn't seem to be any of them for various reasons that I didn't understand. But uh, uh, <clears throat> in, in the human sciences, these are considered problems. And we should overcome that. It's just of no interest. Well, in order, since they are considered problems, let me make up a technical term so we can avoid pointless debate. And I'll call this thing I language. Uh, the letter I is used. I'll, I use the letter I because of the fortunate accident of English. Uh, the concept that's developed happens to be uh, a concept which is, <coughs> these are technical terms now, it's internalist in a common sense, which I'll explain in a moment, individual, and it's intentional for logicians and philosophers among you. That's intentional with an S, not a T. Uh, the, uh, to say that it's internalist, that uh, means that it has to do with what's inside our heads, not what's outside in the outer in the outside world. So it's in, the concept I language is internalist in that sense. It's individual in the sense that it has to do with Peter, not some community to which Peter belongs. In fact, there are no meaningful communities. There's any community you want to set up. Uh, so it's internalist and individual in the obvious sense. It's intentional in a technical sense. This has to do with generative procedures. When you have a generative procedure, so a procedure, let's say an algorithm, a computer algorithm or something that spins out an infinite number of things, uh, you can look at that procedure or function in extension or in intention. If you look at it in extension, you're looking at the set of things it generates. If you look at it in intention, you're looking at exactly how it works. Okay. So suppose you have some program for, say, getting square roots. Okay, you put in four, it gives you two, and so on. Uh, if you look at the extension, the extension is the pair, is the set of pairs, four, two, nine, three, you know, twenty-five, five, and so on. That's the extension. Uh, if you look at the 
uh, intention is whatever specific procedure that's been has used to get that result. And you could have used a lot of different procedures to get that result. Okay. Uh, so in the case of, say, formal arithmetic, the x, the if you think of the axiom system as being the function that enumerates it, uh, if you look at the function in intention, you care exactly which axioms it has, maybe pianos or something. If you look at an extension, you just look at the set of theorems it generates. Could have any set of axioms. All right. This approach is intentional. You're interested in the exact character of the generative procedure, not in the set of things that. It, I mean, you're also interested in the set of things that it generates, but that's on the side. The ex, let's be clear about what the extension of the generative procedure is. The extension is the set of linguistic expressions, not the set of signals. Right? It's the set of linguistic expressions. That's the extension. Uh, and that's interesting, but it's derivative. Uh, what's uh, important, at least from, from, from a natural science point of view, is how it's done. You want to know what the mechanisms are. Ultimately, you'd like to know what the brain mechanisms are. And that means you're interested in the function and intention. Now, this is, I stress this because it's completely opposite to the point of view that's taken in the cognitive sciences, the reflective parts again, and philosophy of mind. There, what people are concerned with is the extension, not the intention. And as the extension, they don't pick the class of expressions. They pick something different. I mentioned this this morning. Uh, they, pick, uh, yeah. they pick another set which maybe you can derive from the set of linguistic expressions, or maybe not. Uh, it's a set which is sometimes called a formal language, or a set of well-formed expressions, or something like that. So that's something like a set of well-formed expressions of arithmetic, or an equivalent would be the set of theorems of arithmetic, if you're looking at the generation of theorems rather than of expressions. Uh, that's the formal language. Now, as I mentioned this morning, there's no reason to believe that formal languages even exist. But if they do exist, they would be some kind of reflection of the actual extension by some further procedure. And the actual extension itself is uh, what the thing in, the, in your head, which has one or another form, uh, grinds away. Uh, so, for example, suppose I'm interested in how in the, the – I'm a cognitive scientist, let's say, interested in how people – do multiplication or you know long division or something like that. What I'm interested in is the actual function that they that's going on in their heads. I'm not interested in the in the triples, you know x y z where x is the product of y and z that I knew already. Uh, I'm interested in, in what procedure they use to get at it. I'm interested in the function and intention. And the reason is because it's the function, the generative procedure viewed in intention, which is close to the mechanisms. In fact, it's an expression of the mechanisms. It's an abstract expression of the mechanisms. The function in extension is very remote from the mechanisms. Uh, uh, notice that the function in intention is also close to the data, the data of experience. If you've, learnt, if you've learned a language, you've been presented with some kind of data, and that data you know, entered your mind. Uh, your language faculty in its initial state, let's call it as zero, and various things happened, and out of that came your stable state. But out what, I mean, you reached a stable state by data. The stable state will be, will include a generative procedure viewed in intention, a particular generative procedure. The stable state is not an infinite set of linguistic expressions. You are not, your mind is not an infinite set of linguistic expressions. It's not an infinite set of anything. It's a finite object, and the finite object that it is, is the generative procedure, that is what I call the I language, viewed intentional. Uh, if there is a set, there is a, an extension, namely the class of linguistic expressions, but that's more remote from the data. Again, this is the opposite of the way people look at it. The way people usually look at it, they say you have the data, you know, like behavior that you observe. And then you somehow make an induction from the data to the set of linguistic expressions. And then you somehow find the characterization of them, which is the generative procedure. And then all kind of debates and arguments go about how you do it. So the first step, uh, the, the step that says you go from the data, uh, usually what's said is you go from the data to the formal, formal language. 
But that doesn't make any sense at all because there may not even be such a thing. So let's fix it up so it at least makes some sense. Uh, you say you go from the data to the set of expressions, each of them some collection of properties, and then comes the problem of what's called finding a grammar. A grammar is just an I language. Okay? So that means finding the I language, which enumerates and characterizes that set of expressions. And this step is the one that's considered the controversial one. This step is the one that's considered the straightforward one, you know, some kind of induction, whatever that means. So if you look, say, at the philosophical literature, uh, say David Lewis or uh, Klein or anybody who's talked about this, they'll say, look, the problem of going from data to, they usually say formal language, but let's beef it up to classical linguistic expressions, that problem is sort of understandable. But how you go from a set of linguistic expressions to a particular characterization of them rather than some other characterization. That's the part that's incomprehensible or mystical or whatever. And the truth of the matter must be the opposite, just has to be the opposite. Uh, from the data, there's no way of going from the data to the set of expressions. You can't go from finite data to an infinite formal language or to, to, to an infinite anything. There's no way to go from a finite amount of data to any infinite set without going by way of some finite characterization of that infinite set. It doesn't mean anything. You can't grasp an infinite set. You can only grasp a way of characterizing it. Okay. Uh, so that means if you've gone from data to an infinite set, you've done it via a particular form finite procedure that characterized the set. So the first thing you must have hit the child uh, in acquiring the language must have been an I language. And then, of course, automatically he has the extension, the uh, set of expressions. Going from the data to the set of expressions is an impo it's an impossible act. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, induction, in fact, if such a thing exists, which I doubt, but if induction exists, it's a matter of going from finite data to a finite characterization of an infinite amount of data. It has to be that. It can't be going from finite data to infinite data because infinite data doesn't mean anything to a person. I mean, it means something in set theory, but when we're talking about the natural world, there are no infinite sets in your head. Right? There can't be an infinite set in your head. That's impossible. There can only be a finite characterization of it. So the usual debate that goes on has everything on its head, has it completely backwards. Uh, this, this problem, the problem of going from here to here is a straightforward one. In fact, it's the normal problem of uh, biological development. It's just biological development in this special case. It's no different from the problem of going from, say, nutrition to a chicken, a chicken where this is uh, the genetic endowment of the ger germ cell. You got a germ cell, it's got some genetic endowment. It has a nutritional environment, meaning including oxygen or you know, whatever gets to the cell. If things happen, you end up with a chicken. Okay. That's this problem. Uh, if, if you tried to say you don't end up with a chicken, you end up with the infinite set of actions of a chicken, and you go from the nutritional input to the infinite set of actions of a chicken, that would be stupid. You know, you got to get to the chicken first, then you can talk about its infinite set of actions. And similarly here, uh, you have to get to the I language first before you get to anything that's done, done with it the expressions that are formed, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> certainly the, the performances, the manifestations, like the, the speech acts or the signals or whatever. Okay, that, that much is uncontroversial within a naturalistic framework. It's just as uncontroversial here as it is in embryology. Strikingly, in embryology, nobody ever debates it. There's no field of embryology or, you know, the philosophy of biology or something where people debate this and ask, well, how can you go from a nutrition to a chicken, you know, without first going through all the actions of a chicken? I'm almost certain that looking that there's no field of philosophy that deals with, that makes that proposal. But it's, one might ask why not, because it's the same as the standard view in the study of language. Standard view in the study of language is you go from data that you, the child goes from data that it observes to an infinite set of behavior. And then comes this big problem of characterizing them. Maybe that's meaningless and people get into debates about it, maybe subject to a fatal indeterminacy or something. And that would be like going as if somebody said, 
go from the chicken embryo's nutrition to the infinite set of chicken acts and then raise the deep philosophical question of how you can get to a chicken uh, from the set of acts. You know, that, that would be the counterpart. As I say, it's com completely stupid. It's so stupid that nobody thinks about it. Uh, even without knowing anything about embryology. I mean, it's not that people know how you get from an embryo to a chicken. They know virtually nothing about that. But it would never occur to anyone to ask that kind of question. It's only in the study of the mind that people ask such questions and come up with very crazy answers. Uh, those are examples of the kind of uh, methodological dualism that I had in mind. Again, I'll come back to them with some specific uh, references and quotes. In any event, the, the naturalistic way is to say you go from data to an I language to a language understood individually, internally, and intentionally. Specific characterization of the function, not some set of things it enumerates. Uh, uh, given, uh, having done this, uh, the, the set of expressions that are, is, an, is determined by the I language is a collection of instructions for the performance systems. The performance systems use those ins instructions to do things, like to articulate, or to interpret what you hear, or to talk about the weather, you know, or to uh, express your thoughts, or to ask a question, or whatever you do. The performance systems use those instructions to carry out those actions. Okay, uh, But the, gen the I language itself, and the set of expressions that it generates, uh, that contains all the information that is used by the performance systems to do these things. And it, it, uh, uh, it, it accounts for all kinds of relationships. Uh, uh, notice that, uh, before going into that, notice that it's quite possible in principle for two people, say Peter and Mary, to have the same set of linguistic expressions but different I languages, right? Just as they could have a, a different way of computing square roots and come out with the same set of square roots. Similarly, they could have different I languages which compute the same set of linguistic expressions. It's a possible principle. Now, it may be that the nature of the language faculty rules that out. In fact, it's probably true from what, the, what we now understand that the nature of the language faculty is so restrictive that it doesn't allow this possibility to be, in fact, realized. But if so, that's just an interesting empirical discovery about what's called universal grammar, about the initial state of the language faculty. They would say it's so restrictive that this possibility can't arise, although it certainly can arise for a long division or a multiplication or a taking square roots and so on. In fact, it arises all the time. People use different algorithms uh, to carry out arithmetical computations. And we can't rule that out. If it's not the case, it's a discovery. And in fact, an interesting discovery about the near uniqueness of language, that not many options are open. There aren't many I languages around. Uh, <clears throat> well, in these terms, one can account for many properties of sound and meaning. But let's be careful and uh, let's be clear about how we're counting them. So let's take, say, we're talking about Peter again. And suppose Peter has the I language L, let's call it, which is some particular generative procedure which forms an infinite set of linguistic expressions. Uh, and suppose I want to say for Peter, Peter's like me, that say the word pin, right on the line, rhymes with bin, 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 <coughs> bin. Okay, so there's two words and they rhyme. They have a formal relationship, rhyme. Or suppose I want to say that for Peter, uh, let's say John killed Bill entails, let's say, some, someone is dead. So if that's true, that's got to be true. Uh, in fact, it's reasonable to suggest that to say that Peter's eye language ex expresses those relationships. But bear in mind what they are. These, these relationships, for one thing, are on a par. They're relationships between linguistic expressions. Pin is a certain class of properties. Bin is a certain class of properties. And to say that those two classes of properties rhyme is to say that a certain formal relationship holds between them. Not a trivial relationship to describe, incidentally, although we pick out a lot of cases. But some interesting relation holds between them, and it happens to involve 
only uh, wherever it is, this aspect of the uh, set of properties. To say that, a, that John killed Bill entails someone is dead is to say that a formal relationship holds between these two classes of expressions. It's kind of as if it were I. You know. uh, it, it's just some formal relationship. Uh, and again, now this formal relationship is also intricate to describe, and it seems that in order to describe it, you have to look at this part of the class of properties. That you have to look into the decomp decomposition of concepts and so on and so forth. Okay, but having done so, you can express the relationship of entailment. Now, what these are formal relationships. In both cases, it's pure syntax. It's just stating formal relationships between symbolic objects. What entitles us to call it rhyme and entailment? Well, what entitles us to call it rhyme and entailment is the way the I language is embedded in the embedded in the performance systems. The I language is embedded in the performance systems in such a way that the formal relationship of rhyme comes out as something we perceive as rhyme in, uh, in a phenomenal sense. And that's something that people do perceive. I mean, very young children will pick out rhymes. That's why you read them, nursery rhymes, because they know what rhymes without any instruction. So it's something very easily perceived, you know, as easy as shape. Uh, and we want to explain that. Uh, and the way we will explain it, since this is science, is by attributing some structure to the organism. And the right structure, as far as we know, is this. There's an I language which establishes formal relations between pin and bin. It's embedded in performance systems which operate in such a way that this set of linguistic expressions is understood by, a, say, my two-year-old granddaughter as a rhyme. Okay. You can carry out as many experiments as you like to determine that that's the way she's understanding it. Exactly the same is true about entailment. Uh, the relationship between John killed Bill and someone is dead is a relationship of entailment rather than something else. If, in fact, the performance systems work in such a way that they interpret the formal relations that exist as a relation of truth, of truth preservation. Okay. Now, on the entailment side, the problem is harder to deal with. We have a lot more evidence about rhyme, and we can make up easier experiments about rhyme than we do about Basically, it's the same thing. And in fact, if you really tried to work out the rhyme business, it wouldn't be so trivial either. In fact, I don't think anybody's ever done it. You know, uh, I'm not aware of any real theory of rhyme. We just sort of know, know it could be done. Uh, and if you did it, you'd naturally run into plenty of problems. Uh, nobody's paid a lot of attention to the problem because, again, things on the sound side of language are not subject to this irrational dualism. Somehow on the sound side of language, we are able to be more or less sane and treat questions the way you treat things that happen below the neck. It's when you get to the meaning side that all kind of ideological issues start to arise and irrational dualism starts to enter. And you get into big debates about the notion of entailment. Well, there are interesting problems about entailment. But fundamentally, they don't seem any different than the problems about rhyme, which doesn't bother anybody. I mean, not entirely understood, but you'd know how to understand it better. And the same seems to be true about entailment. We have plenty of evidence, reliable evidence, about semantic properties of expressions and semantic relations between them. Uh, like any evidence, it could be wrong. You know, you never know that evidence is true, kind of, even in, in physics, and certainly here. But we have fairly reliable evidence. You can replicate it. You could sharpen it up if you like. You could, you know, do statistical tests and dress it up as much as you please. Uh, and there are even some theories about it. Uh, and the problems that remain, at least from a naturalistic point of view, are not different in principle than the problems that arise about rhyme. That's the point I want to stress. Now, notice that an I language itself, the I language itself doesn't tell you whether these formal relationships are rhyme or entailment or something else or nothing. There are all kind of formal relationships between sets of properties. In fact, you could imagine another creature 
which has an I language, just like mine, but it's linked up to performance systems that guide locomotion. Okay, so that if the performance system, you know, produces a, a seven-word sentence, uh, the person walks off in that direction, and if it produces a twelve-word sentence, it walks off in that direction, and if it produces, uh, you know, uh, a WH phrase, it, uh, you know, it walks faster or something like that. I mean, you could. Uh, <clears throat> It's perfectly possible to imagine an I language, which is a set of instructions for locomotion. Well, in that case, these formal relations will still exist, uh, but they won't be Riemann and Tailman. There'll be some other thing. The relations are Riemann and Tailman because of the way the whole language faculty is constructed. The whole, the, we're talking about a physical object, remember. A physical object, there, there being no other kind of object. It's an object, in short. Uh, and it, as an object, it has its own structure and properties. It appears to be the case, best we know, that its properties are, it's a uh, cognitive system embedded in performance systems where the co cognitive system yields infinite sets of instructions which have formal relations between them uh, that are uh, interpreted or acted upon, manifested by the performance systems in ways that yield the phenomena of rhyme, entailment, and so on. Okay, that just seems a descriptive, as best we know at least, that looks like a true description of, of the language faculty and language use. Okay. A uh, point to stress, no philosophical question, for a naturalist at least, no philosophical questions arise in the case of entailment that don't arise in the case of rhyme. Okay. All that arise are empirical questions, empirical questions of various varying difficulty. Uh, well, uh, there are many. Th this is roughly what a, at a very rough way, what a naturalistic picture yields. I would like to look in more detail at it later, but let's stop there, and ask about, uh, ask general questions. Start looking at the general questions. And the most general question is: Is this the right way to proceed at all in the study of humans above the neck? Should we proceed in this fashion? And that breaks down into a number of sub questions. Uh, first sub, all of which. Raised. I'm not raising them. This is considered highly controversial, I should say, if not totally absurd you know, by people who think, think about these questions, not by the people who do it, but by people who think about it. In fact, it's almost universally thought of as either highly controversial or even absurd in the domains of thought, mostly philosophy of mind, that, uh, that are concerned with these issues. Uh, so we can ask various questions about it. Maybe they're right. Uh, what kind of question can be asked? Well, one question is whether it's uh, improper or in controversial uh, to describe the brain in this fashion, apart from questions of truth or falsity. Is there something improper about using such terms to describe the brain? That is, is it controversial to describe the brain as a system that has states, say? Prob apparently. I mean, any, we describe every other system as something that has states, so that doesn't seem controversial. Well, is it controversial to say that these states have properties? Well, again, we do it all over the place, so that wouldn't seem controversial here. Is it controversial to say that one of these properties is being a generative procedure? Well, that can't be. This is one of the best understood properties there is. There are very few properties that are as well understood as that one, so that can't be controversial. Uh, and proceeding step by step, there doesn't seem to be anything controversial in the moves that have been made. We're saying the language faculty, the, the brain is implicated in the language faculty. Apparently, a part of the brain is. That part of the brain has various states and subsystems. There's a proposal about them. Those subsystems have various states that they go through. Uh, the states have certain properties, like the property of being a generative procedure. Uh, we're all within really quite well understood notions. Nothing, in fact, as well understood as natural sciences, so far at least. Uh, so that part can't be, can't be controversial if there's some problem that's lying somewhere else. Uh, the second kind of question that can arise is whether the, approach, whether the results are correct. Is the story true? Does the brain have this architecture? Does it have these states and these subsystems and these properties? Well, that's where the substantive issues arise. But we can put that aside for the moment. That's not the kind of objection that's being raised. The kind of objection that's being raised is not, look, it, you made a mistake. It's a different, it's a different kind of generative procedure. Uh, that's the kind of 
debate that goes on internal to the assumption that it all makes sense. Okay, so somebody writes a paper and it says, no, your Jenner procedure is wrong. It should be that one or some other thing. Uh, that's, these are where the questions of truth and falsity arise, but they're not relevant here. Uh, a third kind of, and they will be as we proceed into it, but not at the general level. A third kind of question that arises is, is whether there's some alternative. Is there another way to look at, the, at, at language and the use of language which would, <clears throat> say, have, a, have better results or a broader reach or lead into other areas that are not reached this way and so on? Well, uh, a, na a natural, anybody with a naturalistic temperament will keep an open mind about that, obviously. And in fact, we'll expect that it's probably true. I mean, it's always been true in the past in all the sciences that everything has been wrong. So therefore, it's probably true today that everything's wrong, and we await being shown some better way to do it. But uh, that's, that itself is not terribly interesting, because that's the normal state of inquiry. Uh, the question is, is there some alternative around that we can evaluate? Well, as far as I'm aware, there isn't. I don't know of any alternative to evaluate. Uh, so therefore, it doesn't seem that there's anything to look at. In fact, if we look at other approaches, like, say, sociolinguistics or whatever, if we look at them carefully, it always seems that they presuppose all of this. I mean, they may not talk about it much, but if you sort of, you know, you kind of lay out carefully what they're doing, they always seem to be presupposing exactly this. And if you try to reconstruct them without presupposing this, you really reach absolute nonsense. That's true even of people who deny it. People often deny, deny what they're doing. That's not unusual. And it seems to me if you look at the actual work in sociolinguistics or any of the other you know, field, anthropological linguistics, you invariably find that all of this is being tacitly presupposed. Uh, we could talk about that if you'd like. But I'm really not aware of an alternative way of proceeding that's been proposed. So the third subquery doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, there is a class of questions about whether the notion of I language comes close to the common sense notion of language and whether having an I language, meaning having a cognitive state in the state L, where L is the I language, whether that comes close to knowing a language, having knowledge, and so on. Uh, in my opinion, it comes pretty close. That is, I language is pretty close to at least one common sense notion of language, one, one standard common sense notion of language, which appears in the traditional literature commonly, is that a language is a way of expressing your thoughts. To have a language is to have a particular way to express your thoughts. Well, that's pretty close to I language. Uh, as for having an I language, that to me seems to come very close to having knowledge. Now, it's very remote from philosophical theories of knowledge, but I think in term, which are usually phrased in terms of uh, abilities, uh, dispositions, relations between people and propositions, and so on. But in my opinion, those theories are just all flat wrong. They, don't have, they have almost nothing to do with what we call having knowledge. Uh, so not being remote from them isn't a problem. It is very remote from standard theories of knowledge. I don't think it's very remote from the notion of knowledge as it's actually used. Like when we say that somebody knows the construction business or knows his way around Girona or something like that, that seems to be very similar to this notion of knowledge, though very remote from philosophical theories of knowledge. Uh, and certainly not expressible in terms of dispositions or propositions or anything of the kind. Uh, <clears throat> however, whether that's right or wrong is not very important because it just doesn't matter a lot whether the concepts we come up with closely match those of common sense discourse any more than it matters in the case of energy or uh, you know, undecidability or uh, uh, angular velocity or whatever you pick. I mean, you pick the concepts that you need to make sense of things. If they're not close to those of ordinary discourse, so much the worse for ordinary discourse, which is fine for its own purposes, but is not available for the purposes of reflective, rational inquiry. So that's not a real issue. Well, uh, let me now, um, I kind of lost track of time. What time am I supposed to stop? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, five, half past five. Okay, well, uh, let me just say what I'd like to do next, and then I'll stop and open it up for discussion. Uh, what I would like to do next is to turn to various approaches that reject the entire enterprise. Okay, they say the whole thing is wrong. 
from beginning to end and insist on uh, what I would call a dualist approach. This meaning now methodological or uh, 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 epistemological dualism, some kind of non-naturalist dualism. Now, I want to stress in advance that the advocates of the approaches I'm going to be discussing would never accept this characterization of their position. In fact, almost invariably, they regard themselves as hard-headed scientists. So they would completely reject what I'm saying about them. I'm going to try to argue that they're anti-naturalist. Quine, for example, that it's radical, that everything that comes out of that tradition is a radical departure from naturalism. And obviously, Quine wouldn't say that. He regards himself as the prototype of naturalism and regards this as mysticism. And I want to suggest that it's the opposite and that it goes across the board, covering virtually all philosophy of mind and uh, cognitive science in the reflective sense, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, okay, that's the topic I want to turn to next. Let me stop. Not, not, not what it is. Unification, but not production, which are two totally different things. You started by saying that uh, 
uh, uh, the history of science is one of, of unification, efforts at unification, and that's certainly correct. But you then said that, it's, that everybody sensible regards uh, the, pro the project as reduction. That's just false. In, in fact, the history of science is not one of reduction. I gave one example this morning. Uh, if you take uh, the, the classical original moment of modern science, namely Newton, uh, you had a discrete, you had say, Kepler's laws, which describe planetary motion. You had the mechanical philosophy, which was the lower level theory. And it was not the case that Kepler's laws were reduced to the mechanical philosophy. In fact, what happened is they threw out the mechanical philosophy. Okay. Now, there was a unification, but the unification came by throwing out the lower level and recasting it totally in terms of universal gravitation. That's not the only time that that's happened. I mean, if you look at, uh, say, chemistry and physics, see, it, it's true of biology and biochemistry. That was a case of reduction. But if you look at chemistry and physics, it wasn't. The physics of the 19th century was, in fact, incapable of accounting for the chemistry of the 19th century. And the physics of the 19th century had to be radically recast, namely turned into quantum theory, before it could begin to deal with the chemistry of the 19th century. So the end result, looking back, was not reduction, if you like, it was expansion. I mean, the, the more basic subject, if you want to use that metaphor, was, ex was in fact, radically modified and, if you like, expanded to incorporate quite well-established phenomena of chemistry. I mean, the periodic table, for example, was well-established. It just wasn't understandable. The differences between states of matter were well-established but unintelligible. Uh, physics had to completely recast itself in order to solve the unification problem. Now, you never know in advance how the unification problem is going to be solved or if it is going to be solved. After all, it's just kind of a faith in unity of nature that leads us to believe it is going to be solved. I mean, that's not a, uh, a doctrinal principle. It could be that the world is fundamentally dualistic. It, I mean, like about 90% of the matter in the universe is supposed to be dark matter, about which hotshot physicists tell me they don't know anything. Okay. So 90, if this is, if Vicky Weisskopf is correct, 90% of the matter in the universe we don't know anything about. Well, suppose it turns out it follows different laws. Okay. Surely crazier things like that have happened in modern physics. And I don't think any serious physicist would rule that out a priori. Well, if it follows different laws, there isn't going to be unification. Uh, there, there, there may be unification, but not reduction. Uh, now, we don't know in advance, unless we're dogmatists, we don't know in advance whether there will be unification or whether if there is, it will be reduction or change in the so-called more basic science, as has often been true in the past. So I don't agree with your first statement that the history of science is one of repeat steps towards reductionism. Now, going to the three points, take the Cartesians. They had a concept of unification. It was not a concept of reduction, but that doesn't make it non-naturalist. They claimed that the world was a certain way, that the world was consisted of two substances a extended subject substance and a thinking substance. And they were very much concerned with the problem of unification. In fact, there's a whole debate that goes on for a century about this, you know, about how the, how the it's called the problem of mind-body mind interaction. You know, is it pre-established harmony? I mean, did God set it up going that way? I mean, all of those are efforts to deal with the unification problem. And there are all sorts of theories, not by stupid people. I mean, Leibniz was not a stupid person nor was Malbranche, and, and not an inconsiderable scientist either, Leibniz. Uh, they were dealing with a hard problem of unification. It turned out they were dealing with a wrong problem because at least one of those substances didn't exist, namely body. Newton showed that body doesn't exist, so therefore there was no problem of interaction. As to whether the second substance exists, we really don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but so far we have no evidence for it because the only evidence for it was that it didn't appear to fall within body. But since body doesn't exist, that's not an argument any longer. So post-Newton, so it's just, I don't think it's true to say that the Cartesians were 
opposed to unification. It's true that they were opposed to reduction, but that's because of their conception of the nature of the universe, which could have turned out right, consistent with naturalism. Though once Newton came along and destroyed body, it was gone. Uh, at the second po your second point was that our goal is reduction, and I just don't agree. It's never been that. The goal is unification, if it's possible. Unification may require radical changes in the more fundamental subject, as has often been the case in the past. It was the case at the classic moment of the origin of modern physics, namely Newton. It was the case in the most recent revolution, namely quantum theory. And there are many other examples. Uh, you take a look through history. There have been plenty of cases where unification was achieved by radically, often radically modifying more fundamental subjects. As to rejecting the physical, I'm not rejecting the physical. I'm saying there is no such thing. I mean, the problem is not that the ideas they ha are talking about in the physics department are unstable. That's not the problem. The problem is that the guys in the physics department are not suggesting uh, any notion of physical. I, don't, I can't go to the physics department and say, ask Vicky Weisskopf, tell me what the physical world is. All he can say, look, my best guess about the physical world is these are some of its properties. Well, it happens, and the physical, he, the physical world is just the world. You know, it's not that there's a world and then a physical world. There's just the world, because we don't have any way of talking about the physical world any longer uh, after Newton pulled the rug out from under that by eliminating the notion of the physical. So all we have is the world, and the world has its properties, and the physicists say the 19th century physicists understood some of them, and the 19th century chemists understood others, and the 19th century biologists understood others, and in fact, the 19th century psychologists and linguists understood others. Uh, some degree of unification has taken place in all sorts of directions, uh, but, there has been, but there never was a notion of the physical world. It's not that, I mean, if a chemist drew an a picture of an organic molecule and made some predictions about what was going to happen on the basis of its structure, it is just untrue, it would just be, be absurd to say that the chemist wasn't describing the physical world. Of course he was describing the physical world. No physicist could tell him what he was talking about. And in fact, it wasn't until Pauling that they even knew what a chemical bond was in terms of existing physics, because physics had changed. So it took, you know, like almost a century before a physicist could say, oh, that's, that's what you're talking about in my terms. Reason being, physics was just inadequate. But from that, we would not conclude that the chemist wasn't talking about the physical world. That would have been absurd. Of course, organic chemistry was about the physical world and the periodic table was about the physical world. Even if the concepts of physics at the time were incapable of capturing these properties of the physical world. And in fact, as we know in retrospect, they, they were literally incapable of it. They were wrong. They had to be radically changed to capture it. And it seems to me that today we're in the same situation with regard to, uh, say, what are called mental properties. Exactly as Priestley said, these are like uh, electricity, magnetism, and the property of uh, the properties of attraction and repulsion, which at his time nobody understood at all, but they were all properties of the world, that is the physical world, there being no other, and we have to try to find out what properties of matter yield these effects, and, the, and that's the, uh, the psychologist is in the same situation as the chemist in this respect. There is no notion of physicalism, I'm not rejecting it, I'm saying I, I don't see anything to reject Unless someone can come forth with an account of what the physical is, there's nothing to reject, so I'm not rejecting it. Uh, as to reductionism, it's just a false goal. It has not been the right goal in the past, and there's no reason to think that history has changed. If it wasn't the right goal in the past, there's no reason to believe that it is today. And as for the historical point, it's correct that the Cartesians didn't seek reduction, but they did seek unification, and that's a naturalistic goal. It's just false of history. It's false of history, and therefore, it would just be dogmatic to maintain it today since it's never been true in the past. I mean, I'm not never. There are cases of reduction. Uh, Crick and Watson is a case of reduction. But quantum theory is not a case of reduction.
you're absolutely right. I mean, except I haven't even given arguments against behaviorism. In fact, I haven't given arguments against anything. I haven't talked yet about the notion of public language. I'll come back to that. But I, I will suggest, looking ahead, that there is no notion of public language. There's no intelligible notion of public language. I will, you're right, I haven't given any argument against that. Uh, but, I, but I will try to do so as we proceed, because my feeling is that the notion of public language makes about as much sense as geographical region. Uh, that is, uh, to ask whether, say, you and I and you know some North American up in the back row speak the same language, English, is about like asking whether Boston and New York and London are near each other as compared to Tibet. There's no answer to that question. It's any answer you like. You know. And I think that's what turns out about public language. I think it's just a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding of the notion of similarity. But, uh, but you're, you're right. I haven't given any argument. I'll come back to it. Well, I haven't discussed it. Well, Lewis has a funny position. I was, I was thinking of Lewis's article, uh, Language and Languages, in which he takes a very strange view. Uh, he takes the view there that uh, there are two notions we understand. One is the notion formal language, class of expressions. The other is the notion community language. Okay, That's the language people use. And then he says he finds extremely mysterious the notion that I've called I language. Okay, that he feels really is perplexing and raises philosophical issues and so on. And in my opinion, he's got it exactly backwards. The only notion that isn't perplexing is I language. That's like being a chicken. It's no more perplexing than being a chicken. The notion that is completely per perplexing is formal language, because no one's even given a hint as to what it might be. And as to the notion of community language, I mean, you know, it's not perplexing, like being near, near London isn't perplexing. If somebody says, I was near London yesterday, I'm not perplexed. I understand, you know. But it's not a notion of the sciences. Being, whether you're near London or not is a matter of your interests. And whether you're speaking a community language is a matter of your interests. As the interests shift, the community language will shift, and in any arbitrary way. I mean, whether my brother and I speak the same language has no definite answer. We're different in some respects. We're the same in others. And every linguist knows that this just spreads out all over the place. I mean, it's like, it's like geography. It's as continuous as geography. You know, and to try to look at geography and say, look, there are real areas on, on, in the world. You know, there's a real area near London, such that everything's either near London or far from London. Well, everybody knows that doesn't make any sense. But to try to draw an area around Catalan doesn't make more sense except by accident, you know, accidents of conquests or rivers or, you know, television stations or something like that. But apart from historical accidents, you just kind of have a, you know, you just have things spreading all over the place, as far as we know. You know I, I will come back. I've given an argument. But with regard to Lewis, the conclusion that I'd like to come to is that the two notions that he thinks are intelligible, one of them is just un uncharacterized formal language, so we can't say whether it's intelligible or not. The other community, language used by a community, he doesn't, he, he explains it in terms of what he calls shared norms, but that just raises more problems. I mean, he's thinking of a language as something that's, you know, defined by a dictionary and the grammar that somebody wrote, and that's not what languages are. Uh, this is a funny idea that a lot of philosophers have. I was just in Oxford, where I was talking at the philosophy department, and the philosophy lectures about similar topics, and after one of the lectures, I you know, talked for a while to a very distinguished Oxford philosopher of language, I won't mention his name, who told me what I know they all think, you know, but I've rarely heard anyone say it, that the only real language around is Attic, Attic Greek. And the reason is it has a closed corpus, and somebody wrote down the rules. I mean, the only reason he didn't mention Gothic is because they don't study that at Oxford when you're a student. But that would have been another real language, because that's what they mean by language. They mean something which is a closed corpus and has fixed rules that somebody laid down uh, and or maybe what you do in the Oxford Senior Common Room. Well, you can, you can have that in mind if you like, but then don't pretend you're talking about language. Language has nothing to do with that. Attic Greek isn't a language at all. You know? I mean, it doesn't even have the properties of a language. 
uh, I mean, it's true that somebody wrote down a set of rules for it, but those rules are, are just things you teach students under a certain authoritarian system where you're trying to drill something into their heads. I mean, it's a system of authority. It's not a language. If you want to study certain systems of authority, fine, study those. But don't confuse other people into thinking you're talking about language. You're not. Uh, now, when Lewis says that a language is something shared by a community who observe common norms, I think what he means is the norms that are given in, you know, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary and Fowler's English Usage. But that's just an authority system. It has nothing to do with communities. Again, my, my understanding is that since, since Newton's revolution, all the questions have disappeared. I mean, it's monism, if you like, but in a non-interesting sense, there's just the world. So it's monistic, if you like. But there's nothing else that we can say. I mean, Newton, I think it's insufficiently appreciated that Newton pulled the rug out, out, of all, under, out from under all of our intuitions. He said that our basic understanding is wrong. The mechanical philosophy which is our basic understanding, and was also his basic understanding, just seems to be wrong. Well, as I mentioned, Newton had a lot of problems with that. He regarded it as highly paradoxical. Tom Kuhn, for example, suggested in his work on Newton that one of the reasons uh, he called his uh, work, work mathematical principles, not principles of philosophy, which is what science would have been in those days, is because he didn't really believe it. You know, he was willing to call it mathematical principles because, well, okay, it was mathematical principles that work. But uh, it, wasn't, it didn't reach the level of natural philosophy, meaning truth about the world. That's Kuhn's interpretation of the somewhat unusual choice of title. Uh, but whether that's true or not, we know from Newton's correspondence and other things that he was extremely disturbed by the uh, apparent conclusion that he was led to a uh, to, to postulate something, universal gravitation, which, as he put it, no rational person could possibly believe, or, you know, in his words, no person trained in philosophy, being rational, could possibly believe any of this nonsense. He was led to it. And ever since then, we just have, our intuitions about these matters are gone. All we have is the notion, best, best theory. Try to find the best theoretical explanation. Uh, try to unify as much as you can because we'd like to have unity rather than disparity. And that's it. There's no longer any, any intelligible question of physicalism or dualism or monism or anything else as far as I can see. I admit that people talk about it all of the time, but I don't think it's intelligible. I think it's an insufficient appreciation of the collapse of our intellectual universe at that period. example, you could say that the natural sciences in the 19th century were highly pluralistic. I mean, you had chemistry over here, and you had physics over here, and they didn't have a lot to say to each other, you know. Uh, and you had biology over there, and you had even less to say. So it was highly pluralistic. But of course, you know, not metaphysically so. Uh, it's just that they hadn't, you know, they were all so wrong that they hadn't yet figured out how to merge. In fact, the one that had to change most was physics. Learner of the So it seems to have not only are two value systems, 
Well, we certainly have it for normal life. In normal life, <clears throat> we would all agree that I speak English, I don't speak Catalan, Luigi speaks Italian. When he speaks English, it's not quite English the way we speak it where I come from. We all say that. The trouble is we all know that it has no absolute meaning. I mean, I don't speak exactly like my brother. My children don't speak exactly like me. If we travel around the thing called Italy, especially, say, 100 years ago, you know, you're going to get all sorts of things. You don't know whether they're Italian or not Italian or whatever. Uh, 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 English is a misleading case, which I think is one of the reasons why philosophy is misled. Most of it's in English. Uh, but English is misleading because it, it happens to be artificially isolated, you know, for all kind of historical reasons. I mean, it doesn't have the quite the range that you have across, you know, the Germanic-speaking area or the Romance-speaking area. I mean, because of the English Channel and because of, you know, powerful armies and genocidal settlers and things like that. But uh, those are historical accidents. I mean, if you, if you took, say, the, what's now the United States, uh, you know, 500 years ago, I mean, there were thousands of languages. Or you can, I mean, whatever language means. Uh, there was just a huge linguistic diversity. Now there's one sort of one language, but that's just because a bunch of genocidal maniacs conquered the, co the continent. There's no, there's nothing about linguistics in that. Yeah, you kill everybody off, you got one language left. Okay, big excitement. Uh, but uh, th there's nothing else that can be said. You know, I mean, uh, for normal life, sure we can do it, but we can do it in all kind of ways, uh, and. Uh, when you try to make, I mean, I'm, you know, you can tell me better than I can tell you, but uh, if, if you take, say, the Romance area, to decide to call this a language and these different languages isn't going to mean anything. In fact, you know, first day of any elementary linguistics course, the students are told, uh, they're usually told a, a, jo a joke that goes back to Max Weinreich, who said that a dialect is a language with an army and a navy. Okay, and then the next lecture, they're told dialect doesn't mean anything either. And in fact, if linguists thought about it, the third lecture, they tell them idiolect doesn't mean anything either. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not to say that we can't use these notions to get around, but we can use the notion near Barcelona to get around too. Like if I ask one of you, do you live near Barcelona? And, you, and it turns out you live in Tibet, and you say yes. And you were thinking of distance to, you know, uh, uh, Alpha Centauri or something. Well, you were misleading me. You really do live near Barcelona if you live in Girona. Uh, but, but we know that there's no absolute answer to that. In some other framework where we really were talking about Alpha Centauri, then if you lived in Tibet, you would live near Barcelona. And there's no right answer to that. You know, it's a matter of uh, picking, picking the frame. And you can pick the frame any way. I mean, it's not a matter of vague concepts like baldness. You know, you can't decide exactly when somebody's bald. I mean, is it, you know, 93 hairs? Or, that's not like that. This is a matter of hopeless underdetermination. Everything is totally underdetermined by interest and concerns and intentions. And you can set them up any way you like. And any way you set them up, you're going to get a notion of near Barcelona. And you're going to get a notion of near me, meaning speaking something more or less like me.
Well, I didn't. I didn't talk about any of that, <clears throat> but I will. Uh, as far as connectionism goes, there's nothing to discuss. There are no connectionist proposals. Uh, so therefore, we. I mean, I'll. In fact, there have been efforts to construct connectionist models for extremely simple animals, and they, they abstract much too far away from uh, the facts of neural connection. Now, it's true that there are some areas, usually peripheral processing, where parallel pro connectionist models seem to be useful. But in these areas, there's just nothing to discuss. It's just hand waving. Uh, the uh, as for algorithms, uh, there's nothing. I, I don't object to cognitive science when it says that some states of the brain have properties which are algorithmic. I think that's true. In fact, I think language is a paradigm example. But the cognitive sciences have gone on in quite a different direction. The computer model of the mind that's used in the cognitive sciences abstracts away from realization in principle. And that's a mistake. I'll come back to that. That's where I think it's going off track. And I think that's another form of dualism. But if somebody says, look, there are, pro you know, there are certain properties of the world that account for repulsion and attraction, and there's other properties of the world that account for uh, entailment and rhyme, and the latter properties of the world happen to be the property, involve the property of being a generative procedure, well, that's intelligible, and it seems to be true. It's perfectly... When you talked about things known about the brain, a warning flag goes up in my mind. I don't think any... I think almost nothing relevant is known about the brain. I mean, there, there are lots of things known about the brain. Like, there's, a ton of, there's an awful lot of blood flowing through it, huge amounts of blood flowing through it. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, it has plenty of neurons, uh, and it has glial cells, and, and a lot of things seem to be happening all the time. But uh, when, when you get down below that, it's not true that a lot is known about the brain. I mean, there's some specific areas where things really are known. Like if you look at the structure of the visual cortex, the striate cortex, there there's things known, and they're interesting. And some of them see, seem to be algorithmic and some not. Okay, fine. You know. uh, but uh, about the parts of the brain that are implicated in the things we're talking about, basically nothing is known. It, is, it isn't even known that neurons are the relevant thing to look at.
Вот с тоски. Well, well certain, certainly scientists don't. Certainly no scientists have accepted that. Because in fact, it often turned out that the path to unification was to radically reconstruct the, the so-called lower levels. About a bet. Yeah, well, you know, if science, most, well then, you know, you're just talking about different scientists. I mean, some of them bet that it's wrong. I mentioned this morning Roger Penrose, who's again a not inconsiderable scientist. And his bet is that quantum theory is wrong enough so that it probably doesn't have the right answers. Well, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. It makes sense, but it's just completely, yeah. Okay, then they're totally irrational. Because what they're, see, if the view is that everything that's happened in the past is finished, and it'll never happen again, from now on, uh, we're only going to have reduction. If all the, see, if they, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not controversial that up till now, until very recently, as recently as quantum theory, we have often not had reduction. Uh, we have had expansion or change or whatever you want to call it. It's not controversial that through the whole history of science, up until, say, the 1940s, uh, it off unification often involved radical change in the more basic fields. Now, if, somebody come, if a philosopher comes along today and says, well, I think that that's all over. From now on, it's going to be reduction. Then, yeah, that's extreme form of irrationality. I don't see any point. I understand it, but I don't see any point discussing it any more than if somebody had come along and said that in 1900. And if somebody had said it in 1900, it would have been equally irrational and, like most forms of irrationality, quickly proven wrong. Uh, if somebody believes it now, yeah, they're being irrational. Uh, now, it might not be irrational if people really could get, you know, what some people call a theory of everything uh, that, that, you, that was convincing. But even there, you know, the belief that, from, that so much is understood in the basic sciences that nothing will ever change, that goes well beyond any physicist I know. You know. Unification, that's just a general faith in unity of science. In fact, it's not even a faith. It's, it's a desire to understand. One of the ways you try to understand is to connect things. It's like a point that Nelson Goodman made about simplicity 40 years ago. Why try to make simple systems? Why? Because you're trying to explain. And uh, explanation involves reduction of the conceptual base from which uh, uh, conclusions are drawn. That's simpl simplicity. So if you're trying to understand, if that's your enterprise, you'll seek unification. You don't have any dogmas about it. Maybe the world, maybe dark matter follows different laws. Okay, so that's the way it is. You know, uh, there's no point being dogmatic about it. That would be absurd. Uh, but you're going to seek unification for the same reason that you seek understanding. You know, you have genetics over here and you have chemistry over here, and you, you know you would like to know whether the properties of one can be accounted for in terms of the properties of the other, just as you seek unification internal to particular branches of uh, a subject. So let's take, say, linguistics. I mean, this, somebody has a theory of, you know, metrical phonology, something about sound structure, and somebody else has a theory about the way phrases work. Well, you know, maybe there's a principle that underlies both of them. Great. If there is, you'd like to know it, because that would help you understand things. That's why you seek unification. Oh, I don't know. That's, what's the point of trying to understand anything? If you don't know what the point of understanding anything is, get a different field. I mean... People are, you know, humans happen to be curious. Some are more curious than others. Uh, those who aren't curious, there's nothing you can tell them. If they're not curious, fine. You know, then don't try to understand. Uh, there's no law that says you have to try to understand. Uh, those who lack curiosity won't try to understand. Okay? Uh, it's not that they're bad people or anything. Uh, it's like people who don't like to listen to music. Fine. You don't like to listen to music, don't. You don't like to try to understand the world, don't. If you do like to understand the world, well, this is the path you have to follow.
Um, the I language is an idealization. It's, it's pretending that the state of your brain has one instantiation. See, the, the language faculty tells you what a possible I language is. Okay, it's, this is what's sometimes called universal grammar. It's a characterization of possible I languages. Oddly, it sounds as if, it looks as if there's only finitely many of them in any deep sense. Uh, but even if there's more, uh, the language faculty tells you what the possible I languages are. Now, the thing that's out here is never going to be one of them. The reason it's never going to be one of them is that the data are too heterogeneous. In fact, what is it? I, I said before that uh, if linguists are more serious, they would not only say that languages are out the window and dialects are out the window, but so are idiolects. An idiolect is supposed to be the, uh, the speech of a single person in a single style. And that's always going to be some crazy historical accident. Like what's called my language, you know, it's some crazy mixture of the fact that my father came from the Ukraine and my mother came from Lithuania and we grew up in northeast Philadelphia. And when I was 20 years old, I went to Boston and, uh, and the Normans conquered England. Now, all sorts of crazy things have led to this funny thing that's in my head. I mean, that's the chances that that would be an instantiation of the language faculty are zero. Uh, in fact, what's actually in my head is about as interesting for science as the course of a feather on a windy day. You know, it's just some crazy thing. I mean, uh, that's why f physicists don't care about the phenomena of the world. You know, they don't try to describe the phenomena of the world. They describe what they would be under highly idealized conditions in which you've thrown away millions of interfering factors. And if we want to understand uh, the language faculty, we'll, we'll do the same thing. Well, you know, at the moment, it turns out our level of understanding is not so refined that it matters a lot. But we ought to recognize that as the level of understanding increases, uh, <clears throat> it will matter. I mean, it's like saying that, you know, relativistic mechanics didn't matter for a long time because the scale of things and so on was such that you didn't get those measurements anyway. Uh, and the scale of things we can look at now are so crude that the fact that what I have in my head is an unholy mess doesn't matter. But in fact, it's, not, it's certainly not an I language. Now, as to somebody being multilingual, every one of us is multiply multilingual. It would be inconceivable to be otherwise. I mean, the only way not to be multilingual would have been to have grown up in a completely homogeneous speech community which is itself an instantiation of, I language, of, the, of universal grammar. And that's inconceivable. I mean, every one of us has grown up in very heterogeneous communities with all kinds of different things going on. I mean, maybe they're all called English or all called Catalan. That doesn't matter. They're all different. All of us are attuned to interpreting people in different ways. I mean, you listen to your grandmother, you interpret her one way. You listen to your brother, you interpret him a different way. A kid on the street, you interpret them a third way. Sometimes those way ways are different enough so that people call them different languages. Sometimes they're not different enough so they don't call them different languages. But the fact is, every everyone, by the time your state has settled, is a, is a you know, is hopelessly multilingual. The only question is how varied the multilingualness is. And all of this is too close to the phenomena of the world to bother studying. Because if you're serious, you don't care about the phenomena of the world. That's why scientists do experiments. And, and don't just take moving pictures about what's going on outside the window. Because you don't care about the phenomena of the world. You want to understand them. You don't want to describe them. You want to understand them. And the way to understand them is to get highly refined examples, which throw away all sorts of interfering factors. I mean, it's called idealization, but that's a little misleading, because it's getting to reality. The way to get to reality is through a lot of idealization. You know, uh, because you're throwing away interfering factors. You can get down to what's actually happening. Uh, and uh, you do as much as you need. It's like when you're doing experiments. You don't do an experiment that you know, is accurate out to the 23rd decimal place if you don't understand the second decimal place. I mean, unless you need a PhD and you can't think of anything else to do. But if you're, if you're carrying out reasonable inquiry, you do your experiments as carefully as you need, fully 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 as you
to mine or not. Well, we'll <clears throat> continue the experiment. I think a little improvement, but not a lot. <laughs> uh, yesterday, I uh, outlined a na uh, what seems to me the natural course, the proper course for a naturalistic theory of language. Uh, I didn't sketch in any details. I hope we can come back to that later. Uh, it seems to me a model of what naturalistic inquiry should be uh, with regard to any aspect of uh, what is tra what the phenomena that fall into the traditional domain of the mental. And again, I stress that these are not, this is no metaphysical distinction between these and others, although there may well be uh, an epistemological distinction in that these phenomena may, to a certain extent, maybe a crucial extent, be uh, beyond the cognitive reach of a particular creature, namely us, uh, they might be mysteries for us, uh, a conclusion which would not be terribly surprising. <clears throat> I also uh, described uh, a bit how uh, the, uh, uh, the, the collapse of any naturalistic variety of dualism, for example, the Cartesian variety, uh, these collapsed with Newton's demonstration that uh, the ghostly properties of mind pervade the entire world. Uh, that is, that these are th that matter as well, down to the level of elementary mechanics, uh, also has what are ghostly properties from the point of view of the traditional mechanical philosophy, which is a rather good uh, expression of our common sense view of nature. With that discovery, we abandon the common sense view, uh, at least for the purposes of theoretical inquiry, and we move to a uh, 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 an intellectual stage where we search for uh, the best theoretical explanation without any expectation any longer uh, that it will conform to our intuitions or to our intuitive requirements, uh, which simply are another phenomenon of nature that have to be explained. Well, I'll come back to uh, further spelling out of the naturalistic point of view, that's the sub substantive part, uh, but what I want to do now is to, uh, uh, I, I ended yesterday by saying <clears throat> that I would like to turn to approaches to the mental that reject the, uh, entirely the naturalistic approach that I sketched uh, yesterday uh, and insist on a kind of a radical dualism. Now, since this isn't any longer metaphysical dualism, it's a kind of methodological or epistemological dualism. Now, I stress that advocates of the positions that I'm describing would never accept this characterization of what they're doing. On the contrary, they consider themselves hard-headed scientists uh, pursuing naturalistic uh, uh, inquiry uh, in its most uh, uh, perfect and uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, character. <clears throat> but I think, when I will try to show, in fact, that what they are, do what they are adopting is a form of ra radical dualism uh, and a form that is completely irrational 
and untenable. And furthermore, I'll try to show that <clears throat> this is extremely pervasive. In fact, it includes virtually all of the more considered, reflective, thoughtful work on the cognitive sciences, uh, on uh, <clears throat> philosophy of mind, again, excluding the actual experimental work, which goes on you know, with such successes as it has. Well, <clears throat> I mentioned yesterday that, in principle, we could have two people, uh, call them Peter and Mary. And Peter and Mary might have arrived at two different I languages, let's say L1 and L2. Uh, and it might turn out that L1 and L2 have the same extension. That is, they generate the same set of linguistic expressions. That's a possibility, a theoretical possibility. <clears throat> it would arise from the, uh, f from the fact that they had received a somewhat different arrangement of data, and that data had led their common language faculty to slightly different conclusions, uh, which just happened to coincide in the linguistic expressions that they form. Now, it may be, and in fact very likely is true, true that in the real world that can't happen because the language faculty is so restrictive that it excludes this possibility. But that's an empirical issue. Uh, it has to do with the, narrow, <clears throat> the narrowness of the language faculty and the limits of the kinds of languages that it makes possible. Uh, conceptually, there's nothing surprising about this. It very well turned out to be the case. Now, what I've just said is commonly uh, regarded to be completely uh, meaningless uh, uh, and absurd. Uh, there's a major current of modern philosophy which uh, considers this comment simply an absurdity. Uh, the reason is that having the same linguistic expressions means having essentially the same behavior. Uh, the way you speak, the way you understand, depends on the linguistic expressions, the collections of phonetic and semantic properties. And if two people have the same collection of expressions, they're going to react the same way to what they hear, and they're going to express themselves the same way. And over some large range of behavior, they'll be indistinguishable. And since they'll be indistinguishable over a large range of behavior, the, the uh, theory has it that it is unintelligible to attribute to them different states of mind, because the states of mind that we attribute to them are just a characterization of the range of behavior that, <clears throat> that they uh, undergo that they uh, exhibit. Similarly, suppose that in the case of Mary, I have a choice, be, give, given a fixed set of linguistic expressions, I have a choice between assigning to her uh, language L2 or language L3, uh, let's say, which differ in the set of linguistic expressions, <clears throat> or are the same. It doesn't really matter. In fact, I can put this aside. Uh, <clears throat> I might have it as a scientist, <clears throat> I might not be certain from the data available to me whether to assign to Mary L2 or L3, let's say for concreteness that they still generate the same set of linguistic expressions. And that would remain the case <clears throat> even if I had a theory of what's called universal grammar, that is a theory of the language faculty, which is the same thing. Recall that the language faculty is the fixed species-specific system that permits Peter and Mary and everyone else to take certain <clears throat> data and to form in the mind an I language. <clears throat> Suppose that I have <clears throat> two different theories of the linguistic faculty. One of them would lead me to conclude that Mary has L2. The other one would lead me to conclude that Mary has L3. Okay, so I have theory, let's call it theory two, which would lead me to conclude that Mary has L2, and I have theory three uh, of the language faculty, which would lead me to conclude that Mary has L3. And we're assuming that they happen to converge on the set of linguistic expressions. Suppose I discover that there's somebody else, uh, call him Wang, who spe speaks Chinese, uh, and he, he, Wang gets certain data. He, Wang has the same brain that we have. We know, we know that. There's no genetic adaptation to learning Chinese. Uh, so uh, in the case of 
wrong. Suppose the theory T2 uh, allows me to explain how Wang gets his knowledge from the data, but theory T3 doesn't, doesn't allow me to explain that. If I assume that the language faculty is described by T3, and then I look at Wang, and I look at his data, and I assume that this is T3, then I come out with some I language, whatever it is, let's call it L4, which just happens to be the wrong one. I can tell by looking at Wang's behavior that it's the wrong one. It generates the wrong expressions. On the other hand, if I pick T2, then and I apply it to Wang, I get uh, you know, some other language, which in fact is actually Chinese, and it comes out right. Okay. Now, for any scientist, any natural scientist, that would tell us that for Mary, we have to pick L2, not L3. The reason is that L2 is consistent with a more general theory of the language faculty that explains Wang as well, whereas L3 is inconsistent with that theory and is only consistent with the theory of the language faculty, which makes wrong predictions for Wang. Okay, the, lo the logic is quite straightforward, and in the natural sciences would be totally uncontroversial. Uh, however, we are instructed by philosophers that this is impermissible in the, case, in the special case of language. We are not allowed uh, to assign, to choose L2 for Mary in preference to L3 on the basis of the fact that if we choose L2, we can also explain Wang. And the language that we assign to Mary has to be based solely on Mary's behavior, not on Wang's behavior. Okay. Wang's behavior is irrelevant in principle uh, to attributing a language, often called a grammar in the literature, uh, attributing a, an I language, a grammar, to, to Mary. That's the instruction that is handed down by the contemporary philosophical tradition. Uh, now, this is very curious. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's proceed. Uh, the most prominent advocate of this position, the person who more or less established contemporary analytic philosophy, for which this is a crucial principle, is uh, Van Quine, who spoke here a couple of years ago. And uh, Quine actually takes a uh, still stronger position. Uh, he says that if Peter and Mary, if L1 and L2 generate the same formal language, remember that there's another notion here, formal language, <clears throat> which is class of well-formed expressions. And uh, th there's some problems about this. Nobody knows what it is. But let's put those aside. Let's, let's pretend that we know what the formal language is. Uh, well, clearly you can have different classes of expressions that co coincide in their signals. They differ in all sorts of other respects. Okay? Like they differ in how they associate signals with semantic properties and so on. But you could have many, many different uh, se uh, sets of expressions which coincide with the same set of well-formed expressions with signals, in other words, if we knew what the set was. We don't, but pretending we do. Uh, according to Quine's perversion, if Mary and Peter uh, 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 correspond in their formal languages, in the well-formed expressions, the signals that they accept, then we are not permitted to assign a different, uh, 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 it makes no sense to, us to say that one rather than another I language is tr true of Mary and Peter, and we're certainly not allowed to assign different ones to Mary and Peter. Uh, similarly, a fortiori, uh, we're not allowed to consider anything about Wang. That's uh, Quine's version of this. Uh, as he puts it, if two grammars Grammar is just a term for I language. If two grammars are extensionally equivalent, meaning they're the same with regard to formal language, then it is meaningless to claim that one rather than another grammar is in the mind of the speaker. And a fortiori, it's, it's methodologically wrong to appeal to the fact that one decision will allow us to explain Wang whereas the other decision will leave Wang unexplained. We're not allowed to do that either, <clears throat> because only the class of, I lang of formal expressions is allowed to, uh, is the that's the database for the linguist in assigning uh, a grammar. That's the theory. Uh, uh, it, 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 it has a kind of a motivation. 
the motivation is that the child learning the language only hears signals. And the child learning the language is picking up the eye language from the signals. And from that, Quine concludes that it is meaningless for the, to, for the linguist who he identifies with the child. It's obviously a mistake, but he identifies the linguist with the child. Uh, it is meaningless for the linguist to uh, assign different eye languages on the basis of the same set of signals when the child just does it whatever way he does. That's the, that's the underlying motivation. I'll spell it out as we proceed. Uh, other f followers, of course, this, this is what's called the radical translation uh, model or has various other, uh, uh, various other characterizations. Uh, other followers of Quine, like say Donald Davidson, uh, go even further than this while accepting this much. Uh, Donald Davidson argues that it's a mistake to try to attribute mechanisms to the speaker. The claim that what underlies the behavior is some specific set of me uh, mechanisms. As he puts it, it adds nothing to the theory of meaning. That's just the philosopher's way of talking about the theory of language. It adds nothing to the theory of meaning uh, to assume that some mechanisms correspond to the theory. So, for example, if one could find certain cellular mechanisms that are consistent with theory T1 but are not consistent with theory T2, that would be irrelevant in principle to the linguist. So the linguist is not permitted to look at uh, other language. When you're, when, if, if I say I'm trying to determine Peter's eye language, all I'm allowed to look at is the set of signals that Peter accepts. Uh, may, maybe, you know, if you can convince them that that's too narrow, the set of linguistic expressions that Peter has. I'm not allowed to go on to do what any scientist would do and ask whether one theory of the initial state is consistent with the biological mechanisms and another one is. I'm not allowed to ask whether one theory of the initial state is consistent with, say, Wang or Ahmed or, you know, Luigi or somebody speaking a different language. Those moves are excluded. They're barred to the linguist. You're, the linguist is not permitted to study these aspects of the brain by the methods of the natural sciences. That's the theory. Well, presumably, somebody is allowed to study these aspects of the brain. That is, it doesn't, the injunction doesn't seem to be that no one is allowed to study them. I mean, presumably, somebody is allowed to study the mechanisms. Somebody is allowed to study the initial state uh, and to make use of the fact that uh, one theory of it accounts for Wang and another one doesn't. Somebody's allowed to study that, but not the linguist, by the philosopher's st stipulation. Well, this is a pure terminological stipulation, obviously. So let's accept it. Um, who cares? We'll accept the terminology. Linguists are people who, by stipulation, are committed to total irrationality. They're not allowed to study any of the topics that anybody would investigate if they wanted to understand the nature of language. Now, having accepted that terminological stipulation, the rational move is to abandon completely the ridiculous pursuit that is now called linguistics and to turn to this other subject, whatever it is, in which we're allowed to look at Wang when we try to decide what's the right eye language for Peter, and we're allowed to look at biological phenomena if we can find any. In fact, we're allowed to do anything that any normal scientist would do. In fact, that happens to be the actual practice of linguists, which is condemned in this tradition of philosophy, which in a final irony uh, prides itself on its naturalism and its adherence to the methods of the sciences. Now, this seems to me a case of uh, quite radical dualism. Uh, and I stress, for those of you who are philosophers will know, this is a highly influential tradition. In fact, it dominates a large part of contemporary philosophy of language and mind and feeds over into the cognitive sciences. Uh, it seems to be totally irrational. You know, it seems to be a pure irrational stipulation that a certain category in one building in the university, they're not allowed to study the brain for some reason. Uh, you gotta go to some other place and there they can study it. And in that other department, they're allowed to do exactly what linguists are now doing, but they're not allowed to call themselves linguists. That's what it comes down to. So we can accept all that, uh, recognizing that we haven't done anything except, you know, moved around, uh, made some moves. In fact, it's rather <coughs> reminiscent of a 
comment that Voltaire once made about metaphysics. Uh, he said, it's a game with extremely elegant moves where you always end up where you started. You know, it's uh, more or less accurate in this case. Now, Quine himself has a further extension of this curious theory. Uh, he is willing to accept the linguist, remember, is restricted to looking at signals. Okay, just which, which are the well-formed expressions. And maybe, oh, I don't know why he wouldn't, he should go on at least to say the linguist is permitted to look at uh, uh, the way signals are associated with interpretations in a particular community, but he's not allowed to go any further than that. However, Quine, in more recent work, has been willing to ac accept certain other evidence that would be relevant, and it works like this. Uh, one problem that he discusses uh, is the problem of how to assign phrase structure. So if you have a sentence like, say, John saw Bill, uh, there's a question whether it's, say, three different phrases, and that's all there is, or whether it's two different phrases, uh, too many Bs, uh, or whether it has some other arrangement. But those are empirical questions that one might ask. Uh, Klein has argued that there's no choice, there's no truth of the matter with regard to this distinction. It's anything you decide. Uh, the reason is you get the same set of signals no matter which way you do it. Okay, and that's consistent with his terminological stipulation. Uh, however, more recently, he's been willing to accept the idea that uh, some other kinds of evidence might lead you one way or the other. The other kind of evidence is what's called psychological evidence. Psychological evidence is distinguished throughout the tradition, including the, including the cognitive sciences. It's distinguished from linguistic evidence. So linguistic evidence, for example, would be evidence about how people understand uh, referential relations. Okay, it turns out, for example, that if you say uh, he, he uh, thinks John is intelligent, then in English, in fact, in every other language, we know that the person who says this sentence intends he to refer to someone other than John. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you say his mother thinks John is intelligent. And we don't know whether the speaker uh, is referring to John when he uses he or whether he's referring to somebody else. So there's a difference between these two expressions. Well, evidence of this kind is called linguistic evidence. And there's a whole millions of, you know, huge amount of data of this kind. And it turns out if you use evidence of this kind uh, across many different languages, you get quite strong arguments in favor of this analysis. Uh, it tells you this is the way it is, not that way. Uh, then there's another class of evidence, which is called psychological evidence. Uh, an example of psychological evidence bearing on this is uh, <clears throat> a set of experiments that were started by Tom Bever uh, about 20 years ago, uh, which refer to displacement, perceptual displacement of noises. So if you give a person a sentence, like say John saw Bill, some signal, and a person's listening to it, and you put in a noise, a, a click, it's called. In the course of the signal, you introduce a click somewhere. And then you ask the person afterwards where they heard the click. Okay. You tell them, we ask them, where did you hear the click? Uh, what they will tend to do is to displace it to the phrase boundary. That is, they'll think they heard the click over here, even if, in fact, it appeared in the middle. Okay. So you tend to perceptually displace the click to the boundary of the phrases. Well, the click experiments indicate, support the idea that the big split is here, that the structure is AB, not ABC, or maybe a third possibility, you know, DE, the split over here. You, you displace the click over here, not over here. Well, Quine has agreed that that kind of evidence uh, the linguist is allowed to use. He's allowed to use psychological evidence uh, to determine where the phrase boundary is, but he's not permitted to use linguistic evidence, evidence, say, about referential relations and tons of other evidence of that kind. 
Now that, too, is a very curious move. Uh, for one thing, because from a scientific point, first of all, evidence doesn't come divided into categories. There's no such thing as linguistic evidence and psychological evidence. I mean, evidence doesn't come with a, you know, a little tag on it which says, I'm linguistic evidence or I'm psychological evidence. Evidence is just evidence. In fact, it's just data. It becomes evidence, but you can interpret it within some sort of a theory. Uh, otherwise, it's just, you know, random data. Uh, so the distinction doesn't make any sense in the first place. But even granting the distinction, uh, the story is backwards. The only significance to the click studies is that they correlate with the uh, conclusions of linguists. The linguist, so-called linguistic evidence about the phrase boundary is vastly more convincing and persuasive on scientific grounds than the perceptual evidence. In fact, the perceptual evidence tells you nothing from the fact that people displace the click to this boundary, you don't know whether that means the boundary's here or whether it means the boundary's here. I mean, maybe what people are doing is displacing the click to the middle of a phrase. Okay. Suppose people are displacing the click to the middle of a phrase. Well, then, uh, the same data would tell you that the phrase boundary's got to be over here because they displace the click or they perceptually displace the click over here. Okay. So the data tells you nothing. I mean, the only reason why people like, say, Bever and Fodor and others have interpreted the data as, as, as supporting the phrase boundary between, say, subject and predicate uh, is because that's what the linguistic evidence shows. And the linguistic evidence is really quite persuasive. Uh, furthermore, there's a theory about it. It fits into a theory. So it has theoretical consequences, which means there's a whole mass of indirect evidence that supports it, including evidence from Chinese let's say, and evidence from historical change and from child language and so on and so forth. The click evidence has nothing supporting it at all. It's just an observation, just kind of like an interesting piece of data, which becomes evidence because you can interpret it in terms of the much more firmly grounded uh, linguistic theories. Now, this is from a naturalistic point of view, but Quine takes the opposite view. His view is that the psychological evidence Deter is al you're allowed to appeal to it in determining the phrase boundary, although it in fact tells you absolutely nothing. It, it puts the phrase boundary here if you believe that people displace clicks to the boundary. It puts the phrase boundary here if you believe that people displace clicks to the middle of the phrase. And you can just as well believe one as the other since there's no reason to believe either. And there's no theory about it, in other words. <clears throat> well, again, these, are, these moves are completely baffling. From a, from a naturalistic point of view. Uh, they, uh, they make all kinds of distinctions that don't exist. Uh, they put matters on their head. They interpret the powerful evidence as weak evidence and the weak evidence as powerful evidence. In fact, they make no sense at all. Now, we can work out as a kind of psychoanalysis, you can figure out where it comes from. I mean, it comes from a picture of science as something that's done by people who wear white coats and have equipment and do statistics and that sort of thing. Science isn't what people do when they sit around and think about the structure of sentences and you know ask their friends what this means and so on. But that's of course just nonsense. I mean the linguistic experiments on say uh, referential dependence, if you wanted to, you could dress them up too with white coats and statistics and tachistoscopes and pushing buttons and equipment and so on and so forth. Uh, nobody bothers to do it for a reason that's well understood in the natural sciences, which I mentioned yesterday, you never do experiments beyond the level of precision that's relevant to the questions you're asking. And the questions about phrase structure are well enough answered by the very reliable judgments about sentences like this, which indeed are extremely reliable. You can get those judgments from children, uh, or, uh, and you can get them with, they're, they're repeatable. Uh, if you want, you could dress them up as more complicated experiments. But that would be as if a physicist were to carry out experiments, you know, to the tenth decimal place when you don't understand the second decimal place. That would be pointless. Uh, you don't use more experimental precision than bears on the topic at hand. Now, there may come a time, and maybe it's already come, uh, when linguists ought to go beyond this level of precision. I think there's some reason to believe that and should think about 
more sharper experiments that separate out things that we may be mixing up and so on. If so, fine, you do better experiments. Uh, but there's no, you know, there's no break between the psychologist who's doing it with a tachistoscope and statistics and uh, a white coat and, you know, a collection of subjects and, uh, uh, and so on, and the linguist who's just uh, asking, asking the friends. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all ways of getting data that you can use as evidence. And uh, I presume that's the origin of the distinction, maybe something else. But whatever it is, it's a, it's a kind of very radical dualism, and an extremely sharp departure from uh, the natural sciences. Uh, at, at, uh, it, it's hard to imagine, in fact, a sharper departure. And again, this is quite common. You know, this is accepted uh, across a broad range as meaningful. Throughout the cognitive sciences, for example, uh, there's lots and lots of material that claims that if linguists want to really establish their theories, they're going to have to get psychological evidence. The linguistic evidence won't do. Uh, so they'll have to get evidence from, say, click studies, which are completely meaningless. Uh, and in fact, uh, their only significance is that they is a way of interpreting them so that they correlate with the linguistic evidence. Apart from that, they have no significance at all. But that's what people are going to have to have if they want to uh, uh, make claims about the truth about the brain in terms of its computational properties and so on and so forth. Again, these are very strange moves from a naturalistic point of view. But they are intelligible in terms of a kind of radical methodological dualism, which states that you're just not allowed to study humans. Uh, the way you study every other creature in the world, by stipulation. Uh, well, another uh, issue that arises in this connection, and that's, again, all over the place, uh, is the, uh, <clears throat> the matter of access to consciousness. This plays a, a big role in uh, philosophy of mind and uh, cognitive science. Uh, and so I'll, give, uh, I'll give a number of different uh, examples. One place where this shows up is in a distinction that's supposed to exist between uh, psychological hypotheses and philosophical explanations. Again, the discussion is usually framed in terms of problems of the theory of meaning, but that's only for historical reasons. To the extent that the considerations make any sense, they would apply to the study of sound uh, and the study of syntax and the study of everything else. Okay. It just happens that uh, the tradition out of which they come has largely been concerned with meaning rather than phonetics, but uh, the arguments are the same throughout. Uh, uh, let's take uh, a very, another very influential contemporary philosopher, Michael, Michael Dummett uh, from Oxford, who's one of the major modern uh, philosophers of language and mind. Uh, Dummett has argued repeatedly over the years uh, that we have to make a crucial distinction in epistemology and uh, metaphysics and so on between psychological hypotheses and philosophical explanations. Uh, and here's the way it works. Uh, let's suppose that the naturalistic approach is so successful, we'll now pretend that it's successful way beyond our fondest dreams, and suppose that it's so successful that it's, enabled, it's able to give a complete naturalistic account of what happens when a signal strikes the ear and, and then gets computed through the perceptual system and the brain and feeds into a theory of action and leads to a certain action. Okay, suppose we have a theory that accounts for that whole chain. Suppose further that we've solved the unification problem. That is, we've shown how this theory of what the brain is doing relates to an account of what cel cells are doing, you know, cellular activities and chemical interactions between them and so on. So we've solved the unification problem. We have a complete theory of language uh, going from signals all the way up to actions. Okay, let's, let's say we've gotten that far. Well, in that case, Dummett tells us, we would have a psychological hypothesis. That is, the theory that we had constructed would be a psychological hypothesis about people. 
but it would not be a philosophical explanation. And the reason is, I'm quoting, because it would not tell us the form in which the body of knowledge is delivered. Remember that part of the theory, one part of this theory, which goes from signal hitting the brain, this is Peter over here, to some action, one part of it, you tear it apart, is inside Peter's brain a cognitive system, which is uh, an eye language, in fact, it seems, which stores knowledge. And that's accessed by the performance systems. It's accessed by the perceptual apparatus and by the theory of action and so on. And Dummett's point is that even though you had a perfect theory of this by scientific standards, it would not tell us the form in which the knowledge is delivered. The, the idea is that in Peter's eye language, in the cognitive system, there is knowledge stored. And Peter, Peter's mind accesses that knowledge to hear and to act and so on. But we don't know the form in which the knowledge is delivered to Peter. Okay, that's the idea. It's only if we knew the form in which the knowledge is delivered that we would have a philosophical explanation, not merely a psychological hypothesis. And the argument is phrased, framed particularly in connection with the theory of meaning. So if I, that's what Dummett is naturally interested in, being a philosopher. Uh, so uh, he says, if, I, if, we, if we talk about Peter's knowledge that, say, these sentences here mean what they do, uh, we could have a psychological... I mean, suppose, suppose that my theory gave a complete scientific explanation of this distinction that I described a minute ago, uh, which explains how Peter, Peter understands these sentences. So it's a theory of meaning. Uh, according to Dummett, that complete theory would be a psychological hypothesis about Peter's not knowledge of meaning, but it would not be a philosophical explanation, and it would not permit us, it would not justify us in attributing knowledge to Peter. We would not be able to say that Peter knows the rules that lead to this conclusion. There are certain principles of the brain that lead to that distinction over here, just to give them a name, call them binding theory. <clears throat> There's a part of linguistic theory called binding theory that deals with problems of this kind. And it has various principles in it which predict that things ought to come out like this across all languages. Okay. And uh, in the psychological hypothesis, we're not pretending that everything we believe is true and even that we've gotten way beyond what we now begin to understand. But that's okay. That's permitted in this intellectual exercise. So we're now permitting that, uh, pretending that binding theory is in fact true and part of a comprehensive theory which is true. And it leads to the conclusion that for Peter, these two sentences are interpreted exactly the way Peter interprets them. But we're still not permitted to attribute to Peter knowledge of binding theory. We're not allowed to say Peter knows the principles of binding theory, even though binding theory is part of his cognitive system, which is accessed uh, uh, when he acts. Obviously, when you act, you access your knowledge or your beliefs. But we're not allowed to say that in the case of Peter. The reason we're not allowed to say it is that uh, the reason why, the, why, as Dummett puts it, uh, we don't know the form in which the body of knowledge is delivered is that Peter can't tell us that he is following the principles of binding theory. In other words, if we, we, ha we have this kind of evidence about Peter. But if I ask Peter, are you following condition C of the binding theory, he can't say. I mean, in fact, even if Peter is a, is a linguist and knows what it is, you can't introspect and say, oh yeah, that's the computation that's going on in my head. Uh, you can't do that any more than if somebody asked you how you digest your food. You know, you couldn't introspect and say, okay, I do it the way the biologists say. You know. Or if uh, somebody asks you, how do you perceive a triangle? You can't introspect and say, I do it the way the visual psychologists claim I do it. Well, the binding theory is just like that. It's not, it's not available to introspection. Therefore, we don't have knowledge of the form in which uh, the, we, uh, the form, we don't know the form in which the knowledge, the body of knowledge is delivered, uh, and therefore we don't have a philosophical explanation. Notice that for science, the account that we're talking about 
tells us everything that can be asked, we've, by assumption, it tells us everything that can possibly be asked about the form in which the knowledge is delivered. It's answered every question. We've assumed that it's answered every question that science can raise, but it hasn't crossed some bridge to philosophical explanation. Well, it's, this, this seems, again, like a paradigm example of some kind of philosophical dualism. In the case of digestion or visual perception, we don't insist, or say, the motion of the planets, uh, we don't insist on a philosophical explanation that goes beyond what science can deliver. That would be a joke. I mean, there was a time when people used to insist on that, but that's long gone. Uh, we now say, look, what science can deliver ends the story. Uh, but in the case of uh, human beings above the neck, so language, uh, we're not allowed to do that. Now, presumably, though Dummett doesn't say so, the same would hold for sound. The same, same argument applies. So if I <coughs> conclude that Peter judges that pin rhymes with bin, and I make up a perfect theory that explains this, that would not tell me the form in which the knowledge is delivered, and I wouldn't be able to attribute to Peter knowledge of the principles of phonology, which led to that consequence, no matter how well confirmed the theory was, and no matter how well it was unified with cellular theories. I still would have only a, a psychological explanation. Well, that's a very curious position. Uh, and to see how to, to extend the oddity of it, let's consider, let's push it a little further. Suppose that there's a Martian who happens to be exactly like us. He works exactly the way we do, understands everything the way we do, has the same brain, uh, the same theory of our brain applies to his brain. In fact, he does everything exactly the way we do. There's only one difference. Uh, the Martian has access to, he, to, uh, to the Martian, the rules of binding theory are accessible to consciousness. And in fact, all the rules of the I language are accessible to consciousness. Okay, he's exactly like us, but he has a kind of an inner eye that inspects his internal computations and uh, uh, sees what they're doing. So if I ask the Mar Martian, I give the Martian these sentences, and he makes the same judgments that we do by assumption. And then I ask the Martian, look, think about it. Have you applied condition C of the binding theory? And the Martian sort of thinks for a while and says, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I did. You know, just as if somebody asked you how you multiplied two numbers. You, know, you might introspect for a while and say, yeah, I did it this way. Okay, the Martian can do that for condition B, C of the binding theory. And similarly, uh, if the Martian says this rhymes with that, and I say, look, did you follow the rules of you know, metrical phonology? He can introspect and think about it and say, yeah, those are the rules that I follow. And let's say he's even telling the truth. Uh, so he then can see the computations, just as we can introspect about the computations when we carry out a particular algorithm to solve an arithmetical problem rather than some different one. That's the only difference between the Martian and us. Now, notice for the Martian, we have a philosophical explanation of the form in which the knowledge is delivered. We've crossed this mysterious bridge because the Martian has access to consciousness. Now, in fact, we know nothing of any relevance about the Martian beyond what we know about the human, except that the Martian has this inner eye that we don't have uh, that enables him to inspect the computations. Uh, but we're allowed to attribute knowledge to the Martian, and we're not allowed to attribute knowledge to the humans. Well, again, this simply departs radically from any approach in terms of the sciences, at least. As far as the sciences are concerned, the Martian and the human behave exactly the same way. The Martian happens to have access to computations that the human doesn't. That's an interesting question. You know, what is, con what is consciousness? What does it mean to have consciousness? Fine question. But it has nothing to do with the problem of whether uh, Peter and the Martian uh, are following the same rules or uh, <clears throat> have the same knowledge or whatever, just irrelevant. Uh, nevertheless, that's considered critical. Uh, the same distinction shows up in another uh, area, <coughs> what's called um, uh, first-person first authority. That's the technical term for it. Uh, the idea is that uh, when I 
say that his mother in his mother thinks that John is intelligent he could be referring to John I say that with what's called first person authority I have supreme authority over that judgment nobody can question it okay uh, I just uh, I have special privilege knowledge of that fact as I have first person authority when I look at the room and see a bunch of people I mean, that's first person authority similarly the Martian has first person authority when he makes the same judgments but according to the theory uh, we have an account for, for we have an explanation for first person authority in the case of the Martian okay, namely he can tell us he follows the laws but in the case of the human the theory that I've given this say perfect theory I'm quoting now uh, uh, leaves uh, leaves the question of Peter's first person authority a total mystery okay it's left a total mystery because Peter has no access to a consciousness that's quoting in this case uh, an interesting article by uh, Chris Crispin Wright another uh, Oxford philosopher uh, well as far as I can see from a naturalistic point of view that's the wrong formulation uh, the theory of Peter doesn't leave, leave first person it doesn't make first person authority a total mystery it leaves a mystery exactly where it was before namely it leaves the mystery of consciousness doesn't say anything about that that's as much mystery after this theory is completed as it was before but as far as first person authority is concerned there's no mystery whatsoever Peter understands the sentence this way because that's the way Peter's constructed period there's nothing more to say you're constructed so that you get that interpretation that's the full account full total account of first person authority there's no further question that can be asked at least within a naturalistic framework if something's missing it must be because of some non-naturalistic requirement and it would be important to bring out what that requirement is uh, this uh, discussion is usually framed in slightly different terminology uh, in this case the terminology again goes back to Quine uh, actually to, Wit to Wittgenstein as well and others it's uh, the problem of following rules so uh, if Peter is uh, uh, using condition C of the binding theory in drawing that conclusion the linguist would like to say Peter is following the rule condition C that's how Peter make, draws the conclusion that these sentences have the interpretation that they have okay uh, now that's that's supposed to be a big problem uh, the uh, there's supposed to be a big mystery about the notion of following rules uh, Quine has suggested again that we resolve the mystery by making a distinction between two notions of, of following rules one is the notion of fitting rules rule here is a very broad notion it includes for example law of nature you know includes law of nature uh, principle of grammar uh, uh, rule, rule of chess you know. it's a very broad notion okay uh, so Klein suggests that we distinguish between fitting rules or laws and so on and being guided by rules that we clarify the this mystery by making that distinction okay now how, how does that work well according to Quine uh, let's take say Kepler's laws Kepler's laws of planetary motion you know planets move in ellipses and so on uh, Quine says we should in that case we should say that the planets fit the rules they fit Kepler's laws but they aren't guided by Kepler's laws so the planet doesn't think you know I'd like to follow Kepler's laws so therefore I'll move over here okay rather the planet just acts in such a way that it fits the laws okay. on the other hand a person is guided by rules and this is only people if the person consciously explains that that's what I'm doing so for example if I am driving a car and there's a red light and I stop and somebody says what did you do I think about it and I say well there's a law there's a rule that says you're supposed to stop 
when there's a red light, and that's what I did. I followed that rule. If that description is in fact true, then we can say that the person's guided by the rule. So those are the two categories. You're guided by rules when you can say truly that those are the rules you're following, and otherwise you just fit rules, nothing else. Notice that this excludes Peter. Uh, Peter, who is the linguist would like to say, the scientist would like to say, is following the rules of binding theory, certainly isn't guided by them. He can't tell you that that's what he's doing. The Martian is guided by them because he can say so, but Peter isn't. So all we're allowed to say in this case is that Peter fits the rules the way the planets fit Kepler's laws. We're not allowed to say that these rules are part of Peter's cognitive system and that he accesses them and so on. In other words, this perfect theory that we had, we pretended that we had a perfect theory of this, we got to throw it out, okay? Because that theory goes beyond fitting. It actually attributes the rules to Peter. But according to Quine's notion, no matter how successful that theory is, you know, it can achieve perfect success from a scientific point of view, but we have to throw it out anyway. And all we're allowed to say of Peter is that he follows the rules of binding theory, but they're not part of his constitution. Okay, that's the stipulation. Now, here too, there are some very curious moves. In fact, there are even some curious moves about fitting rules. So take the example of Kepler's laws. Uh, actually, the, physicist, the astronomer, the physicist, doesn't just say the planets fit Kepler's laws. What the physicist does is attribute to the planets a certain property, the, namely mass. Uh, the physicist attributes mass to the planets. That's a property. The physicist states certain laws, say Newton's laws. And then it follows that because the planets have the property mass, uh, uh, given Newton's laws, it's going to behave in accordance with Kepler's laws. I mean, that's the actual step that's made. So the analog over here, <clears throat> in the case of Peter, if we want to say that Peter just fits the laws of binding theory, we have to do what the physicist does. We have to attribute to Peter some property from which it will follow by the laws of nature that Peter make, draws those conclusions. That would be treating Peter like the planets. Well, what property do we attribute to Peter? Uh, we could attribute to him mass, but nothing's going to follow from that. I mean, from attributing to Peter mass, it's not going to follow that he interprets these sentences this way. So that's not enough. We have to attribute to prop Peter richer properties than that. Well, in fact, for a scientist, the properties that you would attribute to Peter are the properties stated by the structure of this theory. You would say that I'm attributing to Peter a property of having a brain with language faculty and a cognitive system uh, uh, which includes binding theory and a performance system which accesses it and so on. That whole com complex of, of material is the property that I'm attributing to Peter, just as I attribute mass to the planets. If a, if a plan if some thing up there in the sky didn't have mass, it wouldn't follow Kepler's laws. And if Peter didn't have this structure, it wouldn't follow uh, the laws of nature and yield these conclusions. However, we're not allowed to make that move in the case of Peter, again, by stipulation, another form of radical dualism. Uh, in fact, when people talk about following rules, it's within the category of fitting rules, but where you're allowed to attribute to the person the properties which would account for why they fit the rules. And by stipulation, the linguist and the psychologist are not allowed to do this. I mean, maybe the psychologist, but not the linguist. And again, that's a pure dualist stipulation. Uh, the, uh, there's a whole huge literature following this distinction. Uh, the person who's developed it furthest uh, is John Searle in a series of <clears throat> uh, articles, in a, actually a new book, which I haven't seen yet. I think it's just come out. Uh, the uh, Searle was, he, he insists strongly, as most philosophers and cognitive scientists do, that access to consciousness is the crucial criterion for attributing rule following. Uh, the Wittgensteinians more or less do that too, although it's a little more qualified. Uh, the, uh, but Searle explicitly 
demands that. His demand is, it's, not, it's nonsense, it's an absurdity to speak of Peter following rules unless Peter can tell you that that's what he's doing. Uh, so we're not allowed to do what the scientist would do in this case. Okay. Now, Searle, however, has recognized that there are certain, you know, kind of paradoxes that follow from this insistence. Uh, one thing that's bothered him is a phenomenon that in the psychological literature is called blindsight. Uh, it was discovered some years ago that if uh, a person suffers a certain kind of damage to the visual cortex, say maybe some part of the visual cortex is removed, uh, then in some area of the visual field, the person has no awareness of seeing anything, look, looks blank. On the other hand, under some cases, it turns out that you can show experimentally that the person really is seeing something. So if you, if you take the area, suppose the person, this is the area of the visual field for which some person who's had a brain operation has no awareness. And if you draw in there, let's say, a cross uh, or a circle, person, do you see anything? They say, no, I don't see anything. And they say, well, okay, you don't see anything. But just tell me, what do you guess? Is it a cross or a circle? And the person will make the right choice. And they'll say, yeah, it's a cross. If it's a cross, it's a circle. If it's a circle. Uh, if you put over here a picture, let's say, of a house on fire, and you put over here in another portion of the blind visual field, a picture of a house that's not on fire, all of this in the blind area, and you ask the person, what do you see? They'll say, you see nothing. And they'll say, okay, you see nothing, but extend your hand to some place where it won't get burned. Okay. And then the person will extend their hand here, not here. Okay. And there's a whole pile of stuff like this. Uh, so that's the phenomenon called blindsight. Well, here there's obviously a kind of problem arising for this rule, rule following business. Because if you take crime seriously, you'd have to say that the person with blindsight uh, there's every reason to believe that the person is perceiving the cross and the circle and the house on fire just the way he did before. He just doesn't have any awareness of it. And Quine would be forced to say, and Dummett and so on, that the person is no longer following rules, even though he's doing exactly what he did before. And that, Searle recognizes, would be kind of paradoxical, and he doesn't want to draw that conclusion. So he introduces a distinction... Uh, between what he calls blockage and um, inaccessibility in, in principle. Okay, so that's a distinction. In the case of the man who, with blind sight, uh, he he only has something called blockage. That is, he doesn't have inaccessibility in principle to, the, uh, uh, to, to what he's perceiving. It's just some interference, you know, blockage. So now we have that distinction. On the other hand, in the case of Peter, uh, following the rules of the binding theory, it's inaccessibility in principle. Okay. Well, uh, suppose we pursue this uh, argument further, uh, and let's go back to the Martian who talks English and has complete access to all the rules. Remember, for the Martian, there was no problem. The Martian was like, uh, uh, had accessibility to the rules. Uh, suppose the Martian has a brain injury, okay? 
And now he's just like the person with blind sight. He keeps talking exactly the way he talked before, which by assumption is the same way we do. He acts just like before, but he's lost the inner eye. You know. The brain injury has uh, eliminated his ability to access the computations. Okay. Now, according, according to Searle, this has got to be blockage. It can't be, it can't be an accessibility in principle. Right? That's exactly the same case. Uh, the, the, just as the person who's with brain damage lost access to awareness but is acting as before and therefore only has blockage, the Martian, who through a comparable brain injury has lost access, uh, only has blockage, not an accessibility in principle. So the Martian is still following the rules just as uh, the guy with blind sight is still seeing, uh, but without awareness. Okay. Uh, suppose now that uh, notice that the Martian is now indistinguishable from us. In fact, this brain injury might have turned the Martian into a human. In fact, that's exactly what it might have done. In fact, suppose the Martian had some little component up there, uh, which was what was making it possible for the Martian to inspect his computations and uh, um, say, yeah, it's binding theory. I suppose the operation just cut that out. Well, now the Martian's indistinguishable from humans, but the Martian only has blockage and is still following the rules, while the human is not following the rules because of inaccessibility in principle. Uh, now let's carry it a step further. Uh, suppose that among Martians, somebody's born with a certain genetic defect and the genetic defect makes the guy indistinguishable from the person with the brain injury. Okay? In other words, the genetic defect just didn't allow that part of the brain, brain to grow. Well, what about this person? This person is now identical with the Martian with blockage and identical to Peter, but it wasn't caused by a brain injury, it was caused by the genes. Well, presumably, what, what, we have to decide what we're going to say in this case. Uh, unless we want to return to absurdity, we would have to say that the Martian with the genetic defect still just has blockage. He's exactly like the other Martians, but something went wrong with his brain, even though he's now born identical with humans. Suppose now that this genetic defect is perpetuated for you know, thousands of years, and there's a whole race of Martians, all of whom have the same genetic defect, and suppose by now they've come down to Earth and they're all intermingled with us. And since they're identical with us, we can't tell any difference between them. Uh, we would still have to say by this reasoning uh, that these Martians sort of scattered around the audience here have only blockage, whereas the rest of them, you know, humans who have some other evolutionary origin, they have uh, inaccessibility in principle. And the Martians among us are following rules, but the humans are not. In fact, it could be that that's the reality. Maybe there was an invasion, you know, 50,000 years ago of Martians with genetic defects, and now half of, half of you are descended from Martians and half from humans. Uh, but some of you are then following rules, and others aren't, and we have no way of telling. That's what we're forced to if we pursue this line of reason. Uh, and if you want to push it further, you can go further. Uh, it's sort of becomes obvious that something's gone wrong. Uh, in fact, to stop this course of absurdity from proceeding, we would have to cut it off at the first step and say there couldn't be a Martian who is just like Peter, except that he has access to consciousness. If we allow the possibility of such a species, we go off into this absurdity. So therefore, in order to block the absurdity, we have to say there couldn't be such a species. Well, we now have the philosopher making a very curious empirical assumption about the possibility of certain species. The philosopher is now driven to an empirical assumption that goes way beyond any biological knowledge that says certain kinds of species are impossible according to the laws of nature. Now, you know, when philosophy is driven to a crazy empirical assumption, you know that something's very wrong. Uh, and tracing it back to the origins, what's wrong is the whole idea, the whole idea that you're not allowed, that access to consciousness has any relation whatsoever to attributing rule following. 
It has no relation whatsoever to it. Uh, therefore, we just go back to the naturalistic interpretation and access to consciousness is an interesting question, you know, fine question. just has nothing to do with rule following and so on. <clears throat> well, here again is a, in this naturalistic approach, which is post-Newtonian, that's the one form of post-X that I understand. So it's post-Newtonian. Uh, in this, uh, we just look for the best theory. We look for the best theory. Uh, and if the best theory that we can find tells us Peter's following rules, well, and Peter's following rules, we have no higher criterion to which we can appeal uh, in the post-Newtonian era. Uh, there is no privileged category of evidence, like, say, linguistic evidence or psychological evidence. Uh, there's no uh, uh, notion of philosophical explanation that goes beyond psychological hypothesis. And uh, there's no notion of, uh, say, blockage versus uh, ac access or any such mysterious inventions which are introduced in a, an effort which is certain to be a vain effort to keep the whole thing from collapsing into absurdity. It just forces you into absurdity. I should say these questions have been raised uh, to John Searle in particular, and I don't, I don't see any answers to them. It seems to me he kind of skirts the questions. Now, maybe the new book, which I haven't seen yet, uh, says something about it, but I'll be very surprised. Uh, maybe, I don't know, if any of you, I doubt if anybody's seen it yet. It's just appeared. It's about the topic. Uh, but it seems to me he has to answer these questions. And unless he can answer these questions and similar one, other ones like it, the whole project totally collapses. And with it, the whole Klein project, which is based on the distinction between guiding and fitting, both of which are misinterpreted. Fitting is misinterpreted because it fails to notice that uh, the planets fit the rules by virtue of property that they have, and guiding is misinterpreted because it's far too narrow. It's just based on the arbitrary stipulation uh, that access to consciousness is a critical criterion, uh, which makes no sense in the first place, and the fact that it makes no sense quickly shows up as you pursue it on the path, this and other paths, which quickly lead to absurdity. Now, in the case of the Wittgensteinian variant of this, uh, or, say, Saul Kripke, who's developed it further, there's a somewhat different view of the matter. Uh, in the Wittgensteinian version, there's also a discussion about following rules, but the examples are typically rules of arithmetic. So how do we decide? We see somebody multiplying numbers, you know, two times three equals six, and things like that. Uh, and we see that person multiplying lots of numbers, how do we know that the person is following the rule of multiplication? How do we know that when you get to, you know, 5 times 25, it's not all of a sudden going to be, you know, 12,862? After all, that's a rule, too. There's a perfectly good rule of arithmetic that says multiply the normal way up to big numbers, you know, pick some point, and from that point on, uh, make all the products equal to uh, pi, let's say. Okay, That's a perfectly good rule of arithmetic. And how do we know that the person's not following that rule? And as Wittgenstein points out, no matter how much evidence you have, you never know that. I mean, you might decide that, uh, you might have the hypothesis that uh, when you get to 100, all the products go up to pi. And then when you get that far, you'll find you were wrong. But you can say, oh, it's well, when you get to 1,000. After that, they're all equal to pi. And for every mass of evidence that you accumulate, you're always going to have these further hypotheses. So he concludes, you can never say that the person's following the rule. It's kind of like a paradox. And Kripke, in a recent book, uh, I forget what it's called, it's Kripke's recent book on Wittgenstein, but it's got to remember, but whatever. Uh, he, he develops this much further. Uh, well, Whatever the significance of any of this may be, we can put it aside because the rules are not relevant. These rules are rules of a totally different category. The rules of binding theory, the rules that Peter is following, are laws of the natural world. They're like Kepler's laws or Newton's laws. 
this whole law of the natural world is claimed that if you have a brain organized in terms of principles of binding theory embedded in a performance system of a certain type, you'll understand sentences in a certain way. That's just a more complicated variant of Newton's laws, let's say. And questions do arise about the validity of natural laws, but those are just normal questions of inductive uncertainty. And as I said at the beginning, general questions that arise for physics don't have to trouble us when we're doing psychology. You want to find the answers to those questions, go to physics. But there's no point in raising for psychology or linguistics exactly the kinds of questions of, say, inductive uncertainty or accuracy of you know, legitimacy of theoretical postulates that arise for the most advanced sciences and arise necessarily and, in fact, can't be overcome. And we know that they can't be overcome. They're just an inherent property of natural inquiry. It was well understood by the 17th century uh, after the Cartesian crisis of skepticism. It was well understood by people like Gassendi and others that uh, the problems of induction are inherently unsol insoluble. Uh, all we can do is uh, <clears throat> realize that we have some method of gaining better and better understanding while knowing that it can't have any absolute grounding. We realize that. That's the result of the skeptical crisis. And that's basically the position of the natural scientist. And it's a fair position. And we can adopt it too. Uh, so those questions don't arise. As to the specific questions that arise in the case of arithmetical rules, they are irrelevant because the arithmetical rules are stipulated. Those are rules of a totally different type. They're rules which we stipulate. We stipulate that plus is going to mean so and so. Okay? And if you don't follow that, you're just not following my stipulation. That's like turn right on red or something. You know, it's a stipulation. And yeah, we, we, don't, we can't be sure that people are following stipulations, but who cares? It's not, it's not relevant. So that kind of consideration, the wittgenstein Kripke kind, uh, we can uh, put aside. Uh, we're simply concerned with rules that are of the type of natural laws, rules that Peter follows because that's the way Peter's constituted, period. Nothing more to say about it. Now, we have to be careful here uh, to distinguish two, two ways in which people can follow rules. So, for example, uh, I, know, I know that the word chair, let's say, uh, can be used to refer to this kind of thing, but can't be referred, used to refer to this kind of thing. Now, that's following a rule. Okay. Or I know that these sentences, which I've since erased, uh, have the meanings that they do and not other meanings. And when I give them those meanings and use them in those ways, I'm following the rule. Now, I could choose consciously to violate those rules in a certain sense. I could use the word chair to refer to tables. In fact, we might make up a code, let's say, in which we want to confuse spies or something. Uh, and you and I might decide, okay, when we want to refer to a table, we'll say chair. Or I couldn't take these sentences and we could make an agreement that we're going to interpret them you know, so that the first sentence means uh, the planes are leaving the air base and the second sentence means uh, set off the bomb on the battleship or something, uh, as, as in a code. We could certainly do that. And in that case, we wouldn't be following the rules. Of course, we would know, because we can't help knowing it, that chair means chair and that the properties of reference there are the properties of reference there. But we could choose to just overlook that fact and to use these physical objects in some other fashion. Uh, well, that's a distinction in rule following that has to be borne in mind, uh, but it uh, plainly has uh, no bearing on this, uh, on this question. Um, I'm turning to another, maybe, maybe this would be a good point to stop. Uh, <clears throat> I want to turn next to an further examples of this dualism and continue to try to show that it indeed is all pervasive, that virtually nothing in the field is not infected by it. But let me hold that one off till this afternoon.
I know, I, from a naturalistic point of view, that's obviously correct. <clears throat> but what uh, Quine would surely say, if you gave him the, that evidence, is exactly what he said when somebody pointed out to him the uh, click evidence, that this kind of evidence does allow us to establish hypotheses. So if Karamatsa has distinguished, <clears throat> say, in aphasia or whatever, between uh, inflectional and derivational morphology, there's a distinction that we're allowed to attribute it to the brain. But if some linguistic theory makes crucial differences between inflectional and derivational morphology to explain linguistic phenomena, we're not allowed to do it. And I think the relationship between the categories of evidence here re still is the same as in the case of the cliques. Uh, Karamatsa's evidence and the uh, evidence about WH and so on uh, are of significance for the moment, primarily because of their correlation to the linguistic categories. I mean, if, if Karamatsa were just to look at the brain without any idea about lingu language, he'd find millions of different kinds of distinctions. Most of them would be totally irrelevant to anything. He picks these to be relevant because there is a reasonably well-established theory that makes those distinctions. Uh, so it's like, it's kind of like the relation between chemistry and physics a uh, hundred years ago. The chemists had very good reasons for putting things in the periodic table the way they were and for classifying types of matter the way they did. The physicists had no special reason for why things should be that way. The chemistry was a kind of a guide to the revision of physics. Ultimately, it had to be a big revision that said, look, these are the kind of things you got to look for. You have to look for the difference between solid and liquid you know, organized matter and non-organized non matter. Uh, and uh, you have to look for the fact that sodium is yellow, necessarily, and so on. Those are the things you have to explain. And it seems to me in the brain sciences or psychology, the way the fields are now, you know, the way the theories now stand, uh, it's the better grounded computational representational theories, which by and large are providing the guidelines for research. But of course, the more converging evidence you get from different sources, the more irrational it, it becomes to take one major source of evidence and the well-established conclusions that follow from it and say that wasn't allowed. Uh, I have no idea how philosophers in this tradition are going to react to this kind of material as it continues to pile up. It's perfectly true that Wittgenstein has many cases, but all the cases fall into the notion of rule that involves norms. You know, conventional norms, community norms, something like that. As far as I know, every example is like that. That's right. I understand. One of Wittgenstein's examples is that if I point over there, there's no way of telling from the gesture itself whether I'm pointing in that direction or in that direction. I mean, maybe when I stretch my arm that way, I mean you to 
extra extrapolate gaze backwards so that you look at what's over there. Well, uh, Wittgenstein is not, you know, the least obscure writer in history, and it isn't very clear what he concludes from that. What he ought to conclude from it, and I don't know that this is what he does conclude, is that you extrapolate your gaze that way and not that way because that's the way we're constituted. We're built that way. That's the kind of organisms we are. We have no choice about how to interpret this gesture because it's part of our nature. Uh, so the fact that some other creature might interpret it another way is irrelevant. You know, it's like saying that in some other world, planets might not satisfy Clef Kepler's laws. Okay, so it's just a fact about nature. It's a biological fact. Now, I don't see what that has to do with his whole story about rule following. He seems to think it means something different, uh, but I don't know what. Um, it's, I, I don't agree with that. It's true that some of them look at your finger, but that's a matter of development. No child is taught to extrapolate gaze, to extrapolate the arm. There is a stage when, if you raise your finger, an infant will look at your finger. There's another stage when you go like this, and uh, the child will extrapolate the length of your arm, and no instruction has taken place in between. So it's just some developmental process. It just has to be. I mean, any p parents can think back and ask when they've tried to teach their children that they're supposed to look that way. You know? uh, in fact, you couldn't, do it. you couldn't do it if you tried. You wouldn't know how to do it. Interestingly, interestingly young, young infants... It's, not, it's only an infant. An infant will look at your finger. But as soon as the child has matured properly, it's, it, the child starts pointing before people do. One of the earliest actions of children is to point and ask for the name. You know, and at that point, they're already using gestures as pointing gestures. In fact, there's been some study of this. Uh, there's a very interesting study, but mostly by a woman named uh, Laura, Laura where, where are the double T's? I keep forgetting. Two T's? Petito. Two T's? First, first time one. Okay. Now, Laura Petito, who's uh, been studying, uh, she, she was particularly interested in development of sign in children. And she discovered some quite remarkable things about pointing in extremely young children, like children a year, a year old and so on. Uh, it turns out, in sign language, you know, like, say, American Sign Language, uh, pointing gestures are used for reference, like you is that and me is this. Okay, so pointing gestures have referential content. But it turns out that those referential gestures, which are like pronouns, develop quite separately from the normal pointing gesture, you know, pointing at something because you want somebody to look over there. In fact, they develop so separately that they sometimes work in contradiction. There's an early stage of child language, which anybody who's watched children remembers, uh, where a child will use the pronoun you to refer to himself and refer to I to refer to you. And it's sort of obvious why, you know, the child hears himself referred to as you, so he figures that's my name, you know, and he receives that person referred to as I, so he figures that's your name. So there's a, there is a stage that children go through where they invert the pronouns. I is a person over there, and you is me. So a child will say, pick you up, pick you up, meaning pick me up, okay. That's standard, in fact, virtually universal. Well, it turns out that the signing kids use the sign uh, symbols counter-iconically. That is, 
they use this symbol to refer to you and that symbol to refer to me, counter-iconically. At the same time that when they're pointing, they use them iconically. Okay? And these systems develop in parallel, though they mean opposite things at this stage. Now, in both the development of gesture and straight gesture in deaf children and hearing children, the development is exactly the same and completely independent of any parental interaction. It it's nevertheless does remain true that if you take a six-month-old infant and you stick out your finger, the infant will look at your finger. But that's just a developmental fact. I mean, there comes a point where, in fact, infants even extrapolate eye gaze. So an infant will look at, you can be looking at something, and the infant at some level will look at you and look at the thing you're looking at. That's a pretty amazing computation. I think that other primates aren't capable of that, as far as anybody knows. And notice that that's a crucial prerequisite to learning names. You have to know what the person's attending to. So if the mother is looking at that, the child can look at the mother's eye and figure out that the mother's looking that way, and will then look that way. So it's not, and certainly no child has ever taught that. I mean, that's out of the question. But that's just another form of extrapolation of arm. So all of this thing comes along. It all comes very early, very, very early. Uh, it, it sometimes even works contrary to picking up of referential gestures, as in the sign case. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it just looks like normal biological development, like learning to walk. I mean, children aren't taught to walk. They just walk at a certain stage. True, at an earlier stage, they crawl, but they're not taught to walk. Uh, and similarly, at an early stage, they look at your finger. At a later stage, they extrapolate arms, but they're never taught to do it. And in fact, the effort to teach would be impossible. You know, nobody, nobody can even dream up a teaching procedure that would work. This eye gaze business is kind of amazing, in fact. Uh, <clears throat> as you all know, when you, can, you can look at a person and you know when they're looking at you. And some sort of instinctive reaction that we have, which must go way back in evolutionary history, prevents us from looking at people. Because if you're talking to somebody and you look into their eye and you see that they're looking at you, somehow that establishes too much intimacy or something, and you have to look away. So your automatic reaction is to look away. And if you keep looking, it's, fright it's frightening. It frightens the person if you keep looking. I mean, unless there's some special relation of intimacy or something like that. And uh, th these are extremely subtle calculations. I mean, to decide whether a person is looking at you requires a very precise calculation. You know? uh, and the, the whole instinctive background that tells us how to respond to it, you know, like looking a little bit away when you're talking to somebody, uh, it must be very deep in our evolutionary history. And actually, the neurophysiologist should assume the same thing. I mean, it's extremely easy. <clears throat> There's nothing easier than to do irrelevant experiments. In fact, most experiments are just irrelevant. You know, if, if you pick an experiment at random and you do it, you'll get meaningless data. It takes an awful long time to get data that actually means something. So say, take the click experiments. I mean, it's not that Tom Bever and Jerry Fodor decided to study click displacement and found this thing. What happened is 
they had this idea that maybe there would be click displacement. And they did experiments, and they came out with completely crazy results. So they changed the experiments, and then they came out with better results. And they kept refining the experiments until they had found experiments that gave them what they knew had to be true, namely that you get displacement to the phrase boundary. And an awful lot of experimental work is like that. I mean, they don't tell you about that when they write a scientific paper. But anybody who's an experimental scientist knows perfectly well that an enormous part of the effort is trying to find an experiment that's not stupid. Because most experiments are just stupid. You know. uh, and if somebody comes along with a stupid experiment that says, I can't find any relation between this and that, the usual answer is go back and design a better experiment. Uh, one of the things you learn as an experimental scientist uh, is that uh, the process of designing a correct experiment is like the process of designing a good theory. Uh, you know, it's, it's very similar. They don't just come along. You know. You've got to refine them and modify them and see what's going wrong and eliminate interfering factors. And uh, ultimately, if you're lucky, you'll get an experiment which shows something. And usually that means bears on some theoretical assumption. Now, in the case of the inflection and derivation, there is a theoretical assumption, namely that they're different, and there's a lot of evidence for it. So the neurophysiologist will try to find experiments that show something going on in the brain that correlates to that. There are millions of experiments that will show no correlation. In fact, almost anyone you do at random will show no correlation. Well, let's go back to the concrete case. So uh, let's take the example that I gave. Okay, he, th he thinks John is intelligent his mother thinks John is intelligent. Now, if Peter says that, if Peter says this one, I know that Peter is intending to refer to two different people, one of them John and one whoever he, he is in this discourse. Okay. Uh, if Peter says this one, I don't know that. He might be ref intending to refer to two different people or he might be intending that this pronoun refers to John. Okay, he might be. So I know, I know something about the meaning of those two cases. That's just a fact. You know, it's like the fact that sodium is yellow. Okay, it's just a phenomenon. You can make that fact as reliable as you like. You know, do the very tight experiments. You find it in other languages, you know, and so on. Uh, so without knowing Catalan, you know, something similar will be true. You know. uh, the, uh, now, so we have a fact. All right, there is a theory called binding theory, uh, which deals with a wide array of facts of that type. There's a whole mass of them. They have to do with pronominal dependence, the conditions under which a pronoun can be dependent, can pick up its reference from something else. And it's a rich theory with a lot of results. All right, Dominic is willing to agree to that. He says that this theory uh, is a psychological hypothesis. In fact, even if we improved this theory, to the, we expanded it so that it didn't only cover these phenomena, but it covered all phenomena of language, it would still just be a psychological hypothesis. And even if we improved this theory further so that we related it to you know, activities of cells, we said that 
when the when I make this judgment, the cells in my brain are doing so and so, and when I make this judgment, the cells in my brain are doing such and such, and some arrangement of cells expresses this. Even if we did all of that, we'd still only have a psychological hypothesis. We would not yet have a philosophical explanation for meaning. That's his his claim, and his claim is that we cross that bridge from psychological hypothesis to philosophical explanation only when the person is guided in quine sense that is can tell us that these are the rules they're following so if the martian can introspect and say i'm following the rules of binding theory then we have a philosophical explanation we know the form in which the knowledge is presented otherwise we don't and if we've crossed that bridge we're now allowed to attribute knowledge to Pete, to Peter. Uh, we're allowed to say Peter knows the principles of the binding theory. If we haven't crossed that bridge, we're not allowed to do it. Well, as far as I can see, you can look at these, at this theory in two different ways. You can say it's just a bunch of terminological stipulations. Okay, in that case, it's of no interest. I mean, if that's what philosophers want to say, if that's the way they want to use words in the Oxford Senior Common Room, fine you know it has nothing to do with knowledge it has nothing to do with people uh, it has nothing to do with rule following it just has to do with certain odd conventions in oxford senior common rooms like whether you which are on a par with whether you drink drink port before meals or after meals it's something like that on the other hand if they think they're saying something that has some significance either for philosophy or for science or for human life and so on then they have a lot of explaining to do. They have to explain why any of this matters. And they also have to exp get the explain their way out of strange paradoxes that, that result if you pursue it, like the case that I went through in the Searle case. So I think they have a lot of explanation to do. Either it's just terminological stipulation, or else there's some explaining to do. Now, nobody has tried the explanation. It's considered self-evident. So, for example, in Dummett's latest book, which is the one I'm quoting from, uh, <clears throat> he sort of just presents this as a kind of side comment on why he rejects linguistic explanations in the theory of meaning. He says, well, we obviously reject these because they don't tell us the form in which knowledge is presented and therefore don't give us philosophical explanations. But that's not enough. You know, I mean, that's not, it's not enough to reject it that way. There are questions to answer. Now, I think if we sort of think it about the cultural history of philosophy, we can guess what the explanations are. Uh, you know, this is now trying to look at philosophy the way a cultural anthropologist would look at a tribe in Central Australia. You know, we can try to figure out how they're getting to the curious positions that they're getting to. And I think it's easy, it's, it's, if you know the background, you can sort of see it. You can see what might have led somebody to this position. Uh, part of what's leading to that position is a classical education. Almost all of these people have gone through a classical education. Uh, in a classical education, you're taught something about language. I mentioned yesterday, I forget when, I, I, uh, was it here or somebody else? I, I mentioned to someone yesterday that I had just come from Oxford where I was talking about these things. And after a lot of discussion about it uh, in the senior common room, which is where um, everybody's life goes on, uh, a, a, a very distinguished philosopher uh, told me that uh, he thinks all the stuff we're doing is kind of interesting, but it's not about language. Because the only language is Attic Greek. That's the only language. And that's the one he learned when he was a student at Oxford. Now, Attic Greek is an interesting... Why is Attic Greek a language? Well, because there's a fixed, closed text. You know, there's a, it's, it's finished. You, know. you can say, here it is. It's these texts. Furthermore, there's a bunch of guys who wrote some rules. And they say, these are the rules of Attic Greek. Now, in fact, those rules come nowhere near describing the texts. But they don't know that because they didn't think about syntax and semantics and so on. The rules, in fact, describe very peripheral aspects of the text. But you're not taught that when you get a classical education. What you're taught is memorize these texts, memorize the rules, the rules determine the texts, 
rule when you have a composition, like you have to write a composition for your teacher, uh, you're supposed to follow the rules in the sense of putting together the constructions the way it says in that rule book. Okay? And I think that's the model people have in mind. Okay? Well, if you have that model in mind, you could very well be led to this. I mean, the model is you know, completely wild. You know? But if that's the model that you have in mind, you could very well be led to these conceptions of rule following language, uh, knowledge. See, in the case of knowledge of Attic Greek, what it would mean is having memorized those rules. The rules are there in a book, and you've got to study them if you want to you know, get a high degree at Oxford. And you memorize the rules, and you know them all by heart, and then you know Attic Greek. Okay? And I think that's the model that people have in mind. And that carries over to all of these discussions. literature. Real-time ex <clears throat> real experiments. Well, uh, I think that's the kind of thing that Luigi was actually referring to. Uh, real-time linguistic processing you know, has the usual problems. It's easy to do irrelevant experiments. And it's only quite recently that people have started doing experiments which are quite intriguing. So, for example, there's um, experiments on what's called priming, priming effects. Okay, so you, you know, you play, play a signal to somebody, uh, and at some point, you ask them a question about something that happened before. You know, I mean, you can ask the question sort of indirectly, like maybe some word appeared here, and you ask, you give them another word that's in the same semantic category. And you ask how long it takes to remember to, for them to find, think of it or find it or something. Uh, well, what's been done is to take various what are called empty elements, elements that are there in the mental representation but don't have any sound. You don't pronounce them. Uh, so there are, there are uh, empty, like when Catalan, for example, there are empty pronouns. Y you mean he, he, but you don't say it. You, know, you just say nothing. And there's a whole variety of these things that have different types. In linguistic theory, they fall into many different categories. For example, if you say, who did John see? There's good reason to believe that there's an empty category over here and that you're interpreting who as being a kind of an operator binding a variable which is actually here. And there's good reason to believe that in the mental representation, it is actually there. The mind sees it. It's only that the voice doesn't pronounce it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, and, and there's a number of different types. Well, the priming experiments, which are real-time processing, have gotten sophisticated enough, so they're beginning to be able to make distinctions between the kind of priming of earlier things that you, that you could ask about a pronoun and its antecedent, or one of these things, and the quantifier, and there are all these relationships. And they're beginning to find different kinds of relationships for different kinds of elements. Okay, that's real-time processing work that's very intriguing. It's intriguing, again, for the same reason. It's beginning to give evidence about processing, which is meaningful evidence, because it correlates with categories that are pretty firmly established from other points of view. Now, notice that there could well come a time when this evidence gets good enough so that you'll rely on it to change the linguistic theories. Okay, that could well happen. So, for example, if the priming, of, if, if linguists postulate two different kinds of empty elements, and priming studies show that they always work exactly the same way, as distinct from others, well, the linguists are going to have to rethink it. Maybe they made a mistake. You know? So there, there will come a time when, maybe it's there already, when the real-time processing experiments could very well bear on uh, the theory of the computational structure. 
And that's one of the many, many areas of interaction which are very fruitful now. Uh, Luigi mentioned brain studies, child acquisition studies, uh, uh, real-time processing. All of this material is beginning to interact in ways that bear on the same questions from quite different points of view. And of course, that's very important. You know, then you can get confirmation and disconfirmation and new ideas and so on uh, from other areas of evidence. Okay, should we get started? <clears throat> See how things work this time. Uh, let me begin by recalling the general uh, plan. Uh, I'm trying to first uh, defend a naturalistic approach to problems of language and mind. Uh, second, I want to try to show that the most influential cur currents of contemporary thought uh, that deal with these issues primarily philosophy of language and philosophy of mind, but also spilling over to cognitive science, uh, that these approaches are both non-naturalist and radically dualist. And uh, I've tried to show yesterday that those are two different things. You could have naturalist dualism in the, like the Cartesians, but these are dualist and non-naturalist, kind of methodologically dualist. And the third point that I want to make is that all of this is a very serious re regression, step backwards, since the 17th century, uh, and it should be completely abandoned uh, without a trace that left, to put it as uh, strongly as possible. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, this morning I gave some examples uh, of what I think should be called radical methodological dualism uh, with regard to what are, roughly speaking, philosophical issues issues having to do with attribution of knowledge, uh, with uh, the propriety of, attr of uh, attributing rule following, and so on. Uh, the general conclusion, uh, I think the most charitable conclusion that can be drawn, is that in, in the major thinking about these issues, we have a series of arbitrary stipulations about certain invented disciplines, one of them called linguistics, the other called philosophy, uh, linguistics is uh, committed, must is, give, is instructed uh, by these doctrines that if it wants to study Peter's mind, it must consider only Peter's behavior and uh, maybe people in Peter's community. But it's not allowed to study Wang's behavior, and it's not allowed to study, say, cells. Uh, those th those steps are ruled out although any scientist would take them at once uh, along lines that we discussed this morning. Uh, so if we agree that that's what linguistics is, uh, the response is simple, just ab abandon it. It's a ridiculous pursuit, and therefore abandon it, and turn to this other study in which you're allowed to uh, bring in ev evidence of whatever sort is relevant to understanding Peter's mind, maybe Wang's mind, maybe things about cells or aphasia or uh, whatever. So the answer to the first stipulation is simple. Let's abandon this ridiculous uh, vocation and turn to a serious topic, which happens to be the topic everybody's pursuing anyway, so it's not a big change. Uh, and that takes care of the first point, it's just pointless terminology. Uh, with regard to philosophy, <coughs> philosophy seems to be identified as a discipline that is concerned with something called philosophical explanation uh, not, which is different from scientific explanation and is interested in something called attribution of knowledge and rule following in an invented sense, technical invented sense, namely the sense in which these things turn on access to awareness, access to consciousness. Now, 
it's possible to invent such a discipline. You can invent anything. Uh, that discipline uh, has no connection to inquiry into the nature of the world, it's not telling anything about the world. It has no connection with ordinary usage, which doesn't follow those principles. And as far as I can see, it has no connection with anything. It has a historical tradition. One can see where it got, how it got there. But again, it seems to me a pursuit that uh, has no redeeming virtues, uh, should simply be abandoned. Uh, so that's my conclusion about the second one. Well, what I want to do now is turn, is continue the discussion, but begin to turn sort of step by step uh, towards cognitive science, uh, not turning, turning now from what are considered philosophical issues, but just seem to be matters of terminological stipulation, uh, turning to substantive issues, more substantive issues, uh, empirical issues. And here, too, there are lots of uh, theories and requirements and so on, uh, so uh, let's continue. One substantive issue, plainly, has to do with <coughs> the growth of cognitive capacities, the growth and development of cognitive capacities. We know that they change. They're not the same at age you know, zero as they are at age 12. So some change takes place, uh, some kind of growth, or what's called, in my opinion, rather misleadingly learning. So say, we'll talk about language learning, which I think should be regarded as language growth, uh, analogous to other forms of growth. Well, uh, um, <clears throat> here we at once run into a kind of dualism of a curious kind. So let's look at it. Uh, there's a doctrine that is called innateism, okay? And there's a big debate about innateism. Now, as in a couple of cases I mentioned yesterday, this debate is one-sided. Lots of people write articles denouncing innateism, but nobody defend, defends it. Nobody writes an article saying, I believe in it. Now, I'm supposed to be the main cr criminal, you know, the one who is the person who's mainly guilty of the crime of innateism, but I've never really defended, responded to any of the criticisms or defended the doctrine because I have the slightest idea what the doctrine is supposed to be. Since I don't know what the doctrine is, I can't defend it. I mean, if the doctrine is that humans are different than rocks, then I agree. Humans are different than rocks. Rock, rocks don't learn how to talk. Uh, if it's that humans are different than chickens, well, apparently. I mean, chickens don't seem to learn how to talk and humans don't seem to learn how to fly. Uh, well, if that's innateism, I agree with it, uh, but I don't understand what there is to be defended unless somebody really thinks that rocks do learn to talk. Uh, if they don't think that, there doesn't seem to be any doctrine to be discussed, and therefore I don't understand what the arguments are about. Uh, well, interestingly, these arguments are invariably dualistic. That is, they only refer to cognitive growth. They don't refer to uh, embryological development. So to go back to my example of the chicken yesterday, uh, nobody suggests that the transition from an embryo to a chicken uh, is uh, determined by the character of the nutritional environment. It's like if you change the nutritional environment, you might end up with a dog or something like that. Nobody claims that. Uh, uh, and the same is true of everything from sort of conception up to birth. Well, well what about after birth? I mean, organisms change after birth, too. Uh, well, nobody, I think, believes that children learn to get bigger, say, uh, or to take something that happens pretty far after birth, take, say, undergoing puberty, which happens at a certain age, roughly. I've never heard anybody suggest that children are taught to undergo puberty. You know, they get instruction from their parents, it's about time, why don't you do it, or something. Or they notice that other people are doing it, say, other kids around their age, and they're subject to kind of peer pressure. You know, they want to be like everybody else, so they do it. Uh, I, uh, nobody has ever suggested that. Uh, and so on all the way through all development except for cognitive development. So the, the visual cortex assumes whatever structure it does uh, on the basis of internal direction. Now, it's not that anyone knows anything about these topics. Nobody has the slightest idea what makes people undergo puberty at a certain age. And nobody knows, really, what makes a chicken embryo turn into a chicken. Some very strange things happen, and they're hard to explain. I mean, for example, a particular cell, remember all the cells of the body have the same instructions, but they do different things in different positions. So somehow, a 
particular cell knows at a certain point that it's got to become a bone, you know, instead of a piece of an eye. And to try to figure out how the cells know that is extremely hard. So it's not that anybody knows the answers. It's just that everyone assumes that it's, uh, it's all determined by some inner program. And the outer environment can have, at most, very marginal influences. I mean, maybe it can accelerate the development or retard it or something like that. But it can't really change it in any significant fashion. That's just all taken for granted, the absence of any knowledge. And that makes perfect sense, because it's obvious from the qualitative character of the problem. Uh, you see in all of these cases that the, the organism reaches a very complex, highly articulated state of development. And it does it on the basis of extremely limited instructions from the outside. And they all do it about the same way. So if you're even, uh, you even semi-reasonable, you assume it's inner directed. Well, somehow, in the case of cognitive growth, you're not allowed to be reasonable. Uh, the same thing is true there. In fact, in the case of cognitive growth, we even know more about it. So a good deal is known about the innate structure, actually more than in many of these other cases. But we're not, and, and the qualitative situation is quite the same. Uh, you can show quite easily, I mean trivially, uh, that people are capable of interpreting and understanding and freely using without any consciousness of strangeness all kinds of <coughs> complex constructions that they've never heard and they've never heard anything like them and so on and so forth. I mean, that's trivial to demonstrate. A fair amount is known about the initial structure that makes it possible, about the uniformities and so on. Nevertheless, it's considered highly controversial to be reasonable in this domain. And therefore, you have debates about innateism, which means uh, taking the point of view that you take towards a chicken embryo. Well, that's very strange. Uh, it, again, it's comprehensible on traditional grounds. You know, you can trace it back to traditional religion and, you know, the soul and all sorts of things. Uh, but whatever the uh, anthropological explanations uh, or the explanations as a piece of cultural history, it's a view that seems to have uh, no redeeming features. Well, let me... Uh, and nevertheless, it's very strongly maintained. And again, the, the most... Uh, uh, explicit, influential advocate, as in most of these areas because of his enormous influence, uh, is uh, Quine. Uh, he's put the point uh, over and over again over the years. Uh, let me take his most recent version, which appears in a book called Pursuit of, Pursuit, Pursuit of Truth <clears throat> that just appeared a year or two ago. And I'll actually write this out so we can have a look at it. Let me write it and then I'll... Uh, in psychology, one may or may not be a behaviorist. <clears throat> in linguistics, one has no choice. In acquiring language, we depend strictly on observable behavior in observable situations. There is nothing in linguistic meaning. And remember, meaning just means language generally. That just happens to be the aspect of language that the philosophers are interested in. So we could say there is nothing in language beyond what is to be gleaned from overt behavior in observable situations. Accordingly, the behaviorist approach is mandatory. That's the argument. Okay. Now let's uh, try, uh, <clears throat> and that's a, an argument that's been repeated over and over over the years. Uh, this is the most recent formulation of it, and it's been very influential. So let's try it below the neck. Okay, let's go back to the chicken. Uh, and I'm going to give a paraphrase an exact paraphrase in which I'll just change a couple of words. Uh, in the passage from the embryo to the mature state, uh, the embryo depends strictly on nutrition from outside. There is nothing in the structure of the mature organism beyond what is to be gleaned from nutritional inputs. Okay. Uh, 
therefore, accordingly, the nutritionist approach is mandatory. Behave, uh, biologists must be nutritionists. Okay. Notice that's exactly the same argument. All I've done is replace, you know, nutritional observable situations by nutritional inputs. But the argument's the same. And the conclusion, therefore, is that embryologists should abandon all of this complicated inquiry into how a cell decides to become a bone in one place and a, an eye somewhere else, and they should really do something much simpler. Just take a look at the nutritional inputs to the, to the embryo, which is going to be really easy because they're about the same for a chicken and a frog and everything else. Uh, and if you look at them, that's all there is. That's going to tell you everything. Well, there's got to be something wrong with that argument. I mean, if anybody presented that argument in embryology, people wouldn't even bother laughing. Why? I mean, why is it any more sensible in the study of language than it is in the study of embryology? That's the question that ought to be asked. Uh, <clears throat> now, notice that it's not that the argument is wrong. The argument is, in fact, entirely correct. Uh, it's perfectly true that we depend completely on observable uh, 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 observable behavior and observable situations, and it's equally true that the embryo depends on nutritional inputs only. There isn't anything else, so that's what it depends on. But the question, of course, is what does the word depend mean? You know, what does the organism do with the... Uh, how do you spell out dependence? You know, let's spell out the concept dependence. Well, when you spell out the concept, concept dependence in embryology, you get these complex theories about how cells, you know, depending on the gradient of certain chemical concentrations, uh, know that they're supposed to produce this protein and not that protein. And then after all kind of complicated stuff, you end up with a chicken. Spelling that out is the meaning of dependence. But of course, the same problem is going to arise in language. You've got to spell out the notion of dependence. Well, there is a theory that spells it out. That's the theory <coughs> of basically universal grammar. It's the theory I talked about before, which says there's some sort of a device, which is the internal structure of the language faculty, and it has all these internal parts and properties and so on and so forth. And when it gets observable behavior, what I call data, it spins its wheels in the way which linguists try to describe, and it ends up giving you the I language. And this, explain, this is the dependence. That's the spelling out of the notion depend. Now, in embryology, you're allowed to do it. In linguistics, you're not. In this, and in linguistics means... Now, it's interesting that in this case, he distinguishes psychology from linguistics. In earlier writings, psychologists had to be behaviorists, too. And that's connected with the move that I mentioned this morning, which distinguishes psychological evidence from linguistic evidence. And psychological evidence has this miraculous character that it enables you to do what scientists do. But linguistic evidence somehow doesn't. Uh, I think that this is just pushing the dualism deeper. You know, when you're looking at things like vision, say, you're not getting really close to the soul of it. Uh, so therefore, you can allow science to enter. But when you get to language, you know, you're right at the core of things. Here we have to make sure the barriers are very high uh, and nothing rational is going to be allowed. Now, I don't want to suggest that Quine is, a, you know, is religious or anything. In fact, he's a total atheist. He thinks the whole business is nonsense. And he thinks the only thing that exists in the world is elementary particles. Nevertheless, when, he's, when, when he deals with the questions, it sort of spells itself out as something very similar uh, to the traditional church. Uh, and now, that's an interesting phenomenon. Because what it mean, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon about, intell about our intellectual culture. The most naturalistic, hard-headed, scientific people, as they begin to think about things that are close to what traditionally was the seat of the soul, soul you know, they veer away from ration, be, rationality. I mean, it's like a particle being repelled by a particle of the same charge. You can sort of start getting close to it, but as you get closer and closer, you move away. Uh, and that's a very common feature of the intellectual culture. Uh, and it's quite remarkable to see how it shows up uh, even among the most hard-headed, most scientific people. Uh, it's definitely worth thinking about for those who are interested in our <coughs> intellectual culture. Now, the point is, without properties in the internal state, 
nothing is going to happen when you're given the nutritional inputs or the observable behavior. There has to be some structure to the organism. Otherwise, it's not going to do anything to the inputs. You give the nutritional inputs to a rock, it's not going to become a chicken. And you give the nutritional inputs to a rock, and it won't pick up an eye length. The reason is because something about the internal structure of the embryo and the internal structure of the human brain. Now, Quine, of course, doesn't deny this. In fact, he agrees with it, insists on it. And he even tells us what the uh, internal structure uh, must be. So he, he definitely rejects the theory that I described, the, the, the one that's guilty of innatism. But he has his own theory about what's in here. Okay. He, he, he tells you what's, what it is, what capacities the child is allowed to have. And the capacities <coughs> are those that are spelled out in what is called his radical translation paradigm. A kind of thought experiment. And if you look at it, uh, the child is allowed to uh, identify objects. The child is granted all of phonology. It's kind of an interesting fact, because it's not clear why. But somehow the child is granted all of phonology, so it gets words and phonological representations. It's even granted morphology, so it gets sentences broken up into words. Uh, after it gets expressions, like words, which it gets somehow, there's something in here that allows that, uh, the child is allowed to um, ask, a qu do the equivalent of asking a question, to see whether people as assent or dissent when they're shown a certain stimulus and given a certain word. Okay, so you got a stimulus over here, you hear a word, and you're allowed to ask you know, your teacher. Uh, is this stimulus a so-and-so, or isn't it a stimulus, a so-and-so? The case that Quine discusses famously is where you see a rabbit, and uh, the word, you hear the word gaba guy, and the child is allowed to say that, yeah, that stimulus is or is not a gaba guy. Okay, that's all. And you're allowed elementary induction. Elementary induction is sort of if things work most, most of the, some of the time, they probably work all the time, something like that. Uh, if you look more closely, the child is also allowed a quality space. So that's a set of properties, like, say, color, loudness, you know, things like that. It's not really specified, but you're allowed some kind of quality space, and you're allowed a distance measure. So you're allowed to say two things are closer in color, are close. A is closer in color to B than it is to C. Actually, I cheated a little here when I said you see a rabbit, because, of course, all you see is some visual presentation. Okay. And in fact, the core of Quine's theory is there's no way for the child to know whether that visual stimulation is a rabbit or you know, the tail of a rabbit uh, or a rabbit against the background of a bush or a stage in the growth of rabbits or whatever. Anything that's consistent with the stimulation uh, is uh, given by the ascent relation here. Okay, and from that, that's radical translation. That's the whole story, and that's the structure of the organism. So, of course, Quine has a theory of the structure of the organism. He's not saying it's a blank slate. That would be absurd, because <clears throat> he recognizes, in fact, that, that would be absurd. But notice we've just gone from one absurdity to another. This is a theory of the organism, and it's an empirical theory, right? It's got to be treated like any other empirical theory. And the theory is so ridiculous, it isn't even worth looking at. We know for certain that nothing like that is the structure of the organism. Now, there isn't any reason whatsoever to take that theory seriously. Uh, there, there isn't a particle of evidence that that's what people are like, and insofar as we know anything about them, they're not like that. So therefore, the theory is not worth looking at. Uh, the theory is presented purely a priori. No evidence is given for it. There's no indication of how you might proceed to find evidence for it. It's just stipulated. This is the theory. This is what organisms are allowed to have above the net. I mean, even if by some miracle it turned out to be true, it would be a, it would be a totally irrational step. In other fields, you're not allowed to just stipulate a priori 
what the structure of some system is, because that's what it looks like, and that's what you like or something. You're not allowed to do that. If someone came along and stipulated the structure of a chicken embryo, even if by a miracle it turned out to be right, people wouldn't pay any attention to it. Uh, if you propose a theory, you need some arguments. You need some evidence. You have to say, why is it this and why not something else? You know? So, in fact, this is just you know, the purest form of irrationality. It's true that there is a structure to the organism, but there isn't the slightest reason to believe that that structure has anything to do with the organism. And, in fact, when you try to apply that structure, you get into all sorts of crazy conclusions. You find that you cannot possibly explain what people, in fact, know. I mean, what people, in fact, know can't, doesn't, isn't accounted for at all by this. We have overwhelming evidence about what they know. For example, in the case of Gava guy, the over, overwhel you know, say rabbit, rabbit or whatever the equivalent word is in Catalan or anything else, we know perfectly well that children immediately, actually on one presentation, you don't even need a lot of evidence, take the word and they, and they don't ask assent, dissent questions. They just hear somebody use the word in some circumstance and they instantly know, virtually without error or without later correction, that what was meant was a particular animal. You know, not that animal along with a twig that was next to it, and not a stage of the animal, and so on and so forth. Now, we have evidence as strong, we can accumulate evidence as strong as you like that that happened. Furthermore, if that were not what happened, nobody would even understand Quine's discussion. I mean, if half the people in the world had thought that rabbit means rabbit stage, and the other half thought that rabbit means rabbit, how would the first half even understand his example? I mean, the fact is everybody understands his example because we all made the same move. We all picked out rabbit as soon as we heard the, the relevant word applying. And furthermore, a fair amount is known about how this happens, uh, about what kinds of entities are picked out, pre-linguistically even, what kinds of object constancy there are, you know, how children, pre-linguistic children, identify stimuli as three-dimensional and persistent, like remaining after they disappear behind the screen and coming out in the right place. They get this surprise if it comes out in the wrong place and that sort of thing. Um, there's all kinds of not null understanding of how children conceive of the world even before they start uh, learning language. And of course, when they start learning language, it relates to the way they've already conceived of the world. Uh, and as we go on, we find more and more respects in which nothing of this sort even happens. So we have a stipulation <coughs> which is uh, uh, completely false, completely re easily refutable, and not worth looking at in the first place because it's totally arbitrary. So why does anybody pay attention to it? Why is there an influential tradition, including most of serious analytic philosophy uh, until today, which looks at the consequences of the radical translation paradigm. Now, the radical translation paradigm yields a property that Quine calls indeterminacy, uh, indeterminacy of translation. The problem is that if you're only allowed this much structure, then it's true that the child can't tell whether the stimulus was meant to be a rabbit or a stage of a rabbit, or whatever. So therefore, the answer is indeterminate, and Quine therefore concludes there's no truth to the matter. There's no, the question, does Gavagai mean an actual animal, or does it mean an actual animal with a twig behind it? That's not a question that has a truth value. Doesn't have, there's no truth to the question of, of whether it's one or the other. It's indeterminate, no, and indeterminacy is to be distinguished from underdetermination, crucially. Like everybody, Quine recognizes that in the sciences, everything is underdetermined. So if you draw a conclusion in the sciences, say, you know, relativity theory, it's, of course, underdetermined by the evidence. There was plenty of other, there, were, there were, in fact, infinitely many possible theories, alternative to that one, that were consistent with all the evidence around. That's the, that's the state of, of rational inquiry. The state of rational inquiry is it's always underdetermined. That's what it means for something to be empirical inquiry. If it's not underdetermined, it's mathematics, not empirical inquiry. The only place where inquiry is not underdetermined is where you stipulate in advance what the answer is, and then it's mathematics. If it's an effort to find out about the world, everything you do is underdetermined. But this problem here is supposed to be something beyond underdetermination, something really lethal, 
uh, indeterminacy, something which crucially affects language and meaning and reference uh, and so on. And all sorts of conclusions are then drawn about language and thinking and people <clears throat> and so on and so forth. And we're simply told that we're not allowed to take consider an alternative theory of the initial state, namely one that works and has scientific evidence supporting it. We're not allowed to take that one. We have to take this one, which is a priori and instantly refute it. Well, that's extremely strange. And how strange it is, you see, uh, if you look more closely even into the uh, radical translation paradigm. Uh, I mentioned that the, the child, uh, incidentally, the way this is usually described is in terms of a linguist, not a child. And remember, the principle is that the linguist has to follow the path of the child. The child depends only on observable inputs. Therefore, the linguist has to depend only on observable inputs. Well, that's kind of strange to start with. I mean, the embryologist doesn't have to follow the path of the chicken. Okay, like if an embryologist is studying a chicken, it doesn't just take in nutritional inputs and sort of you know, drink the milk or something like that. But the embryologist is allowed to do all sorts of other things. But the linguist isn't. The linguist has to follow the path of the child. A hopelessly irrational idea, if you think about it. But one which is incidentally never questioned in the field. Take a look at the literature. This has been around for 40 years. There's nobody who's questioned it internal. It's questioned sort of from the periphery all the time. But nobody pays any attention to that. Professional disciplines are very well insulated. Uh, that's one of the differences between the sciences and the humanities. Striking difference. Uh, in the sciences, you just can't be irrational. Because if you are, you're refuted at once and nobody cares about you anymore. But in the humanities, you can be as irrational as you like because the disciplines are insulated. They don't really have strong empirical evidence bearing on them. Uh, you can go on for craziness forever, and it happens all the time. Uh, it's sort of typical as another fact about intellectual history, if you like. I mean, it's not that scientists have better genes or anything. It's just that nature is, you know, tough, doesn't let you get away with nonsense. Uh, well, and and, and this, if, if you try you know, faking an experiment or you know making up a priori theory, uh, people will refute it, and then you're finished. You know. Uh, furthermore, in the sciences, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over for the rest of your life. Uh, your students will start asking questions, and they'll say, "Why don't you do this?" And pretty soon they'll be off learning new things, and you'll be out of the business. In the humanities, that's not true. Uh, and uh, these these are really big differences. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in any uh, other kinds of dualism, which are, if you like, part of cultural history. Actually, it's very striking personally to me where I live. I live right, well, a lot of you have been around, and you know what it's like. There are two major universities, maybe the two world's major universities within you know, a mile. One of them is Harvard, which is humanities based. I mean, it has sciences, but you know, the spirit of the place is determined by the humanities. The, the oligarchy that runs it comes from the humanities and so on. The other is MIT, which is a science university. I mean, it has some humanities, but they're kind of you know, around the periphery. Uh, and the difference, the difference of intellectual character between the two places is just astonishing. I mean, I've been there for 40 years, going up and back between them. And it's like two totally different worlds you know, in every area. That's why linguistics is at MIT, not at Harvard. Uh, and it's, in fact, if you look around the world, it's mostly developed in places where there are no strong humanistic traditions. It hasn't developed in the major universities that have humanities programs. That's true in the United States. It's true in Europe. It's true in Japan. And it reflects something very straight, very obvious. Uh, in the humanities, disciplines are insulated. They don't want to change. They don't want to hear. They don't want students to come along with challenging questions. Uh, they want to keep repeating the same thing forever. Uh, there's a lot of personal power involved you can get away with. You're never going to be refuted. Uh, you can tell lies about the French Revolution forever, and you'll never be refuted. Uh, and the effect is that when new things come along, they're welcomed in the sciences. People want them. You know, you want things to be shaken up because you want to learn something new. But in the humanities, it's frightening, uh, and therefore they're sort of pushed aside. I don't want to say this is 100 percent, but there, this, the tendencies are very striking. Uh, well. Uh, let's take a look at, at the radical translation experiment. Uh, we now, we're, let, let's agree to what is completely irrational, namely that the linguist has to follow the path of the child. 
Okay. So we I described it as something that the child does. Now we have the linguist coming in to study the community from the outside. Okay. So here's this ling here's this jungle community as as Klein calls it. <clears throat> it's off somewhere. We, we, uh, the linguist comes from the outside. The linguist is trying to figure out what language they speak. Now, if the linguist was a scientist, what he would do is just what he would do if he was trying to figure out what bird there is in this jungle. The linguist would bring along as part of the baggage everything that he or she knows about language. Then you do all sorts of things about language, you know, from studying other languages, and, you know, psychology, whatever. You have a huge amount of understanding about language. And any linguist who went to study this would bring along that information, just as any you know, ornithologist studying birds would do it. Uh, the linguist would see right off that these things over here are people, just like other people, meaning they're not genetically designed to pick up this language rather than another one. So therefore, they fall within the human species. And therefore, whatever is true of Chinese and Japanese and Catalan and Swahili and so on, it's going to be true of these people. So you bring all that along. But the radical translation linguist is not allowed to do this. And that's part of the question I discussed this morning of using information about Wang to uh, draw conclusions about Peter. Not allowed to do it. You're only allowed to look at Peter's behavior. Uh, and notice that that's true of the child. The child, when the child's trying to pick up its language, it doesn't bring along information about Swahili because it doesn't know anything about Swahili. But remember, the child has all of that built in. It doesn't have to bring it along. The child has all of that information stored in his brain. The linguist is trying to find out what the child has stored in his brain. The child doesn't have to bother finding out. It already knows it. So that's why the, so, so in, in a, it's really wrong to say that the child doesn't bring along information about Swahili. It does, because the child has universal grammar, just as the chicken embryo brings along information about every mature chicken because it's got it stored in its genes. And the same is true of the child. <clears throat> well, let's take a look at the linguist pursuing this curious path, not allowed to use anything that has been learned about language, not allowed to use anything that might be learned about, say, cellular biology or uh, you know, the structure of the brain or whatever, uh, not allowed to have what the child has, crucially, namely universal grammar stored into its head because the linguist doesn't the, the linguist has it as something it can use but it doesn't have it as something it can study like the the embryologist has genetic instructions not unlike those of the chicken in fact but those genetic instructions don't help it in studying a chicken i mean a human arm is like a chicken's arm it has one big bone and two small bones and you know, happens at five instead of three, but that's a trivial difference. And then basically three digits. That's just like a chicken's arm. So the human embryologist has stored in its genes the answer to the question of how the chicken did what it did. But that doesn't help, you know, because the chicken is a, the embryologist is approaching the chicken with its science forming capacities, not with its gene instructions. In fact, it's trying to find out what the instructions are in the gene. And the same is true of the linguist. The linguist has universal grammar in the genes, but that doesn't help study universal grammar, you know, for the same reason. Well, all right, now we have this linguist curiously handicapped, not allowed to know what has been learned about language, not allowed to use information about the initial state that's been discovered or that's stored or whatever, uh, <clears throat> restricted to observable behavior in observable situations, but, of course, lacking what the child had namely the internal structure that made it possible to get something out of that. Well, what, what is the linguist supposed to do? The linguist now sees this stimulus. It's supposed to hear the word kavagai. And then the linguist is allowed to ask the informants, is that thing a gavagai or isn't it? And it gets a yes or no answer. Then the linguist is allowed to do simple induction, and you end up with indeterminacy. Okay, that's the same, same course. But now no, notice what's been presupposed. The linguist was allowed to hear the word Gava guy. What does that mean? I mean, all the linguist heard was some signal, some noise. You know. The linguist heard a noise, saw, saw a visual stimulus. How does the linguist get from the noise to Gava guy? Well, as any phonologist, any linguist knows, that's a tough job. Getting from a noise to Gava guy involves a lot of theoretical assumptions. For example, 
uh, you have to ask, this is some kind of phonological representation, quite abstract representation. I mean, for example, you have to know, is that the same noise as something you might transcribe, I don't know, say, kepeki, say, because that comes along next. Is it the same noise or a different noise? Well, you don't know. I mean, there's, depends on your phonological theory. It could be a repetition of the same word. For example, this could be a language which neutralizes voicing and neutralizes front and back vowels and has uh, what amounts to the English vowel shift as an option. Okay, those are all sort of intelligible phonological processes. Uh, maybe that's in part of the optional phonology of this language, so these are the same words. Well, somehow, Quine's linguist has gotten over that stage. You know, he's allowed all the kinds of scientific inquiry that tell you that these are different words, or maybe the same words. Uh, all of that's presupposed in setting up the radical translation experiment uh, where you're granted that you hear Gavagai. And that's an awful lot. It's not trivial. I mean, there's an awful lot of linguistic theory presupposed and granted to the linguist as more equipment. Now, why, why, now, of course, you get all the same indeterminacy problems there. I mean, hearing the signal, the conclusion that it was Gavagai, no, not some other thing, is exactly as indeterminate as concluding that it was rabbit, not rabbit state. In fact, that's putting it unfairly. Uh, we have a lot more evidence here that the child is going to pick rabbit than we do that it's going to pick gaga guy from a signal. In fact, it might have picked different things here. For example, it might be the case that the child picked out something that doesn't distinguish these two. You know, I picked a pretty wild example, but you can take less wild examples where in existing phonological theory would just say, hearing a signal, you could have picked this range, you could have picked this range. And in fact, that's permitted by phonological theory. However, nothing is permitted by conceptual, by the theory of conceptual development. Here we have very strong evidence that everyone picks out rabbit, not rabbit stage. It's not that there's some communities where they pick out rabbit and there are others that they pick out rabbit stage. In fact, all that was picked out before the child ever heard, heard any language. In fact, it may be built in to start with before any experience for all we know. So the, uh, looking at the question naturalistically, we've granted exactly the wrong talents to the linguist. Uh, we have not granted the linguist the ability to solve this indeterminacy, although it is solved in the world. And we have granted the linguist the ability to solve this indeterminacy, though in fact it really is indeterminate. Not totally indeterminate. There is a theory which will ultimately resolve it, but on presentation of a single signal, you don't know. When you hear the first signal, you don't know whether it's in this range or this range. So that's real underdetermination. Uh, and there's a science that explains it and deals with it and tells how you converge from one answer or another. Here, there's no, there's no underdetermination at all, as far as we know. Uh, so to conclude that here we have a problem of indeterminacy and here we don't is very curious. Very, very curious indeed. Uh, well, why is the linguist allowed to do that? And why is he automatically granted all the theory that lets you get as far as Kava got? Well, I think the, the answer, there's no rational answer. But again, there's, a, there's an answer that comes out of intellectual history. Uh, Gava guy has to do with the sounds, with the perceptual articulatory system. And the perceptual articulatory system is far enough away from the soul so that you're allowed to be rational. But you know, the, the concept rabbit somehow is closer to the soul. So we've got that same problem of the particle being repelled as it gets closer to the question. As you get closer to it, you have to veer off into more and more irrationality. I don't think there's any other explanation for this. Uh, if you think this is wrong, try to work one out. Try to work out another explanation for why everyone's happy by saying there's no underdetermination in the case where there really is underdetermination, namely the phonology, and there is underdetermination in the case where there really isn't underdetermination, namely the concepts. Why is everybody happy with that? And why is it the basis for you know, huge theories about the humans and so on and so forth? Well, as I say, there is a reasonable theory, wherever it was, probably raised it somewhere, you know, that one up there, uh, that tries to deal with all of these questions and both the Gavagai type question and the concept type question. 
and does so with you know, reasonable success uh, with the kinds of problems that arise in empirical inquiry. Uh, we're told by the <clears throat> anti-innatists that that theory has to be abandoned, not, for any, not because it's false. You know, it's not, they don't provide any evidence against it. It's just you're not allowed to do it, period. Philosopher stipulates that you're not allowed to do it. Philosopher stipulates that you have to pick this theory, although we know it to be false, and it was totally arbitrary, uh, and the assumptions that it makes are completely irrational. That's where, that's where that debate lies. Uh, now, perhaps what seems to be the right theory ought to be abandoned. In fact, very likely it ought to be. You know, chances that we take the right theory are very slight. You know? So probably it'll be abandoned. You know, probably 10 years from now, we'll have a better theory. That's what we expect. But uh, to show that it ought to be abandoned in terms of something unknown, it does not suffice uh, to, claim, to require that the linguist abandon naturalistic inquiry. That's not a good enough argument. Uh, it's not enough to say you have to abandon the methods of the sciences and you have to accept arbitrary stipulations that I make up. That's not a strong enough argument. In fact, it's no argument. Uh, and uh, I stress again that nothing comparable would ever be considered for an instant in the study of other aspects of growth, say a chicken embryo, or for that matter, even phonetics. I mean, if somebody were to come along with similar stipulations in uh, say, uh, the sound side of language, uh, even the philosophers would laugh. But when you get to the conceptual side or the structural side, it's taken very seriously. Well, again, that seems to be uh, a uh, radical form of anti-naturalist dualism. Uh, as far as I can see, let me put it in the strongest possible terms, nothing can be resurrected from this highly, influ highly influential picture it's kind of a paradigm example of what ought to be avoided in philosophy or the sciences or anything else. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm trying to put the conclusion as strongly as possible uh, in the hope that it will sound as outrageous as possible and lead you to think about whether what I just said is wrong, and if so, why, and if it's right, what it means. Well, let's turn to another issue, uh, also a... a we're now dealing with substantive issues, namely language growth. And uh, I'm trying to argue that the irrationality pervades the substantive issues just as much as it pervades the so-called philosophical issues about attribution of knowledge and so on. <clears throat> uh, let's take another kind of substantive issue, uh, a question that came up yesterday, in fact, in the discussion, uh, the question of reductionism. So uh, natural inquiry leads to all kinds of hypotheses about the brain of the kind that I roughly sketched out. For example, it leads to phonological theories that tell you what the possible regions are within which that signal could be placed and how you could proceed to decide what's the right region. Uh, it leads to uh, theories that give you, you know, the binding theory facts that I spoke about this morning that deal with referential dependency and so on. And um, it deals with phrase structure, another example that came up, and all kinds of other things. Uh, it does it by attributing to the brain certain states and certain properties, certain architecture, well understood properties, like being a generative procedure, which in fact can be spelled out quite carefully. However, this is regarded as highly controversial and maybe absurd. Uh, the reason is that nobody knows how to relate these states and properties to other kinds of description of the brain, say description of the brain in terms of, of cells. Uh, well, uh, that's largely true. Incidentally, it's not entirely true. A couple of examples have all already come up to indicate where it's not true. So there are some things about localization that are known, uh, which are not, not trivial. For example, as I, I mentioned yesterday, <clears throat> uh, localization of the syntactic and semantic processing for sign language appears to be in the same place as where it is for spoken language, which is a very remarkable fact uh, because it's in the left hemisphere, the language hemisphere, whereas visual processing, as must go on in sign language, is typically in the right hemisphere. So there's something deep about syntactic and semantic processing which is localized in the left hemisphere, no matter what the modality is. Uh, uh, Luigi mentioned this morning some other things. 
some uh, results by Karamatsa on differences between inflectional and derivational morphology associated with particular kinds of localizable brain injury. Uh, there are other examples, some of them kind of striking. Let's have a look at one. Uh, <clears throat> this one has to do with uh, some recent studies just recently published on what are called ERPs, that stands for event-related potentials. Uh, it doesn't matter what they are. It's just some, some measure of electrical activity of the brain. Okay. It turns out that when people are doing different things, you know, thinking different thoughts or saying different things and so on, the brain is always producing tons of electrical activity, and you can measure it now. There's sophisticated techniques for measuring it, for extracting signals from noise and so on. And it turns out kind of remarkably that you can find quite distinctive patterns associated with particular properties of thought and language. So, for example, it's been known for some time that what are called semantically deviant sentences, you know, things like colorless green ideas speak furiously, that kind of or, um, you know, I, I ate the house or something like that. When people hear those sentences, uh, the brain produces a specific characteristic electrical pattern, which is like a mark that some semantic confusion took place. Notice that that fact alone would suffice to tell us, suggest to us that the semantic indeterminacy theories are way off the mark. I mean, our semantic... Our notion of semantic coherence is so tight that deviation from it even sets off uh, identifiable uh, brain, you know, uh, 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 potential uh, the brain, electrical activity of the brain, which is distinctive, a particular pattern that identifies semantic deviance. Well, some more recent work has gone on to uh, find distinctive ERP patterns for, uh, for several categories of linguistic expressions, which are quite intriguing. For example, it turns, uh, <clears throat> turns out that uh, sorry, not, let's, non-deviant sentences, you know, things like John took a walk in the garden or something, uh, sentences that are semantically deviant, so, you know, Chen John took a, uh, you know, I don't know what, a uh, flower, I don't know, uh, some crazy word instead of walk in the garden. Uh, phrase structure deviances, where you break phrase structure rules. <clears throat> um, extraction violations of two types. One, extraction from specific noun phrases. It's well known that if you have a sentence like... Um, who did you see? A picture of. This is English now, but there are comparable things in other languages. Who did you see a picture of is an okay sentence. But if you say, if you try, who did you see that picture of, it's not any good anymore. Something goes wrong. Okay. And the reason has to do with the fact that that picture of him is a is specific in reference, picks out something in particular. A picture of him is nonspecific. And it's it's, it's a very subtle point because, in fact, if you take indefinite noun phrases and you give them a specific interpretation, you get the same violation. Uh, so that's one kind of deviance. There's another kind of deviance that's, uh, well, its technical term is subjacency. And it basically means moving something farther than it ought to move. Uh, so sentences like, uh, who did you wonder whether John met are, are worse than, they sound worse to people than, uh, who did you think that John met, the well-known difference. Uh, now, it turns out that these five categories of expressions, non-deviant, semantically deviant, violation of phrase structure rules, violations of extraction from specific noun phrases, uh, subjacency violations, moving something too far, yield distinctive uh, patterns of electrical activity of the brain. 
Each category yields its own pattern. Okay, so all subjacency violations yield the same pattern. All extraction from specific violations yield the same pattern. Uh, well, that's, that's quite a surprising result in many ways. In fact, it's, it's results that linguists could use to sharpen up their own experiments because a lot of these judgment, judgments are pretty subtle and not terribly reliable. Uh, and, you know, they change under all kind of slight changes of the conditions when you change from a finite clause to an infinitive clause. And there's a lot of work on it. And it's by no means settled what's going on there. Uh, but you do get distinctive brain patterns, distinctive ERP patterns. Well, remember, our question was a question of reductionism. That's really the wrong way to put it. It's a question of unification. We have a characterization of the brain in terms of uh, computational representational systems, which leads to certain results and explanations and understanding. We have another account of the brain in terms of electrical activity, and here we're beginning to find correlations. We're beginning to find relations between the two. Well, that's always exciting, you know. Uh, uh, it, but think through uh, the, what these relations mean. It's very much like the case of click displacement that I discussed this morning. These five categories of expressions are well established within the computational representational theories. They have a theoretical home. The categories are picked out because of properties of the theories. Uh, there's evidence about them from lots of different languages. Uh, they, in other words, they're embedded in theoretical understanding. Therefore, they're significant and there's all kinds of evidence bearing on them. The ERP results are just curiosities. I mean, it happens that uh, the people studying the brain, uh, who are, of course, guided by these cate categories, they didn't pick sentences at random. Uh, the people who were studied it included linguists, like Andy Bars, who a lot of you know, uh, who knew what to look for. Uh, and they found numbers. But apart from the correlation, the numbers are just curiosities. There is no theory of electrical activity of the brain that tells you why these numbers should have any significance. Uh, you get all kinds of numbers. These happen to have significance because they correlate with the better understood computational representational theories. So you have a kind of unification, but it's unification from the weak theory to the strong theory. That is, and now we know something about electrical activity of the brain, namely, seems to correlate with things that really exist, namely these categories. Uh, I, I stress this because the standard dualist reaction to this information is going to be the opposite. The standard dualist reaction is going to be, okay, we've now given some support to the linguist's categories because of the ERP results, just as the click experiments were misinterpreted that way. But that's complete nonsense. The ERP results are totally meaningless, apart from the fact that they correlate with the linguist's results. Suppose, suppose you had two theories. One of them correlated with, neural, with the ERPs, the other didn't. Would that be evidence for choosing between the two computational theories? Uh, that's a matter of scientific judgment that you can, can't give a simple yes or no answer to. But at this stage of the game, the my scientific judgment is that at this stage, no, because the ERP results are too isolated. Uh, you know, they're just funny numbers. I mean, it could very well be that if you take that other theory, it'll have ten different categories to find numbers that correlating with that. I mean, it, until you come along with a substantive theory of electrical activity of the brain in which these numbers are embedded, they are curiosities. So the point you're making is very correct, and I agree with it. The, I, I just doubt that we've gotten to the point where we can use the information that way. It's very much like the click experiments. Were you here this morning? Were you here this morning when we discussed it? Yeah. Well, this morning I discussed the Fodor, Bever, Click experiments and Quine's interpretation of them as providing real evidence for phrase structure. 
as compared with the linguistic evidence, which doesn't provide evidence for phrase structure, it leaves indeterminacy. And what I argued is it's the other way around. The click experiments have no meaning at all, except for their correlation with the uh, linguistic evidence about phrase structure. Uh, Jerry Fodor interpreted the click experiments as meaning that people displace a perceived click to the boundary of a phrase because he knew what the right answer was. He could have, if, if, if the clicks had been heard in the middle of the phrase, he would have developed a psychological theory which said you displace the click to the middle of the phrase. So there was no reason to say you displace to the edge of the phrase, except that if you did that, you got the right result, and you knew the right result from linguistic evidence. So the, now someday the click experiments might be sharp enough to give you some evidence about something. And I, I think that probably they are, in fact. The correlation to the right result in well-established cases is firm enough so that you can begin to trust the cases in non-obvious cases. In fact, there's inquiry into that. Uh, here's a case that's not obvious. If you take sentences like, John uh, expected <coughs> Bill to be intelligent, these are pretty peculiar. There are things like that in other... Well, in uh, a Spanish example would have a causative. Uh, you know, some, something like John made Bill leave, something like that. Uh, there's a real question where the phrase boundaries are. I mean, semantically speaking, the phrase boundaries are around here. Okay. But the point is that this word, Bill acts like it's the object of the upper verb in many respects. So it's as if the phrase boundaries are here. Okay, so you have kind of conflicting evidence. Uh, in uh, you know, I didn't pick exactly the right Spanish example, but you can fix it up so it comes out right. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, there's a real conflict about the evidence there. The evidence is conflicting. All right, that's the kind of case where you might turn to the click experiments to see what they say. Since we have evidence, that they give the right answer in other cases, we might be willing to trust their answer in this case. And in fact, uh, Bever and Fodor went right on to look at that case because it's the obvious outstanding case. Unfortunately, the results weren't good enough to tell you much. But it's the right kind of thing to do. And with the ERPs, the same story will be correct. I mean, where there are, I mean, if these results get solid enough, then any linguist will want to take cases where it's not obvious whether you have a subjacency effect or not, and see whether you're getting the special, the special result. So in that sense, your suggestion would be exactly right. Uh, the only question is one of timing. You know, how are we far enough along so that it's the right thing to do now? <clears throat> well, that's a stage towards unification. We're relating electrical activity of the brain to the, so far, better established uh, 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 theories of... Uh, computational structure. Well, despite a certain degree of a certain degree of progress in unification, the fact of the matter <clears throat> is that uh, there are huge gaps, just huge gaps between the brain sciences uh, and you know the, the ones that look at the soft stuff in, in the brain and subjects like linguistics, which really are brain, brain sciences in my opinion, but are looking at the brain more abstractly kind of looking at matter the way chemists looked at matter in the 19th century from a somewhat more abstract point of view. Uh, there are huge gaps. Uh, for example, nobody has the slightest idea how a messy object like the brain can create something with the highly refined, extremely sharp, very surprisingly elegant computational properties that seem to be discovered in natural language uniformly. It looks like a very strange thing to come out of a messy thing like the brain. Uh, so strange that a, that a lot of brain scientists just conclude that the linguistics has to be wrong. Uh, Jerry Edel Edelman is, is a good example of a well-known and important brain scientist who simply concludes from this disparity that whatever the evidence is, it's got to be wrong. The brain couldn't do anything like that. I don't think that's a scientifically justified move because I think much too little is known about the brain. But there's no doubt that the gap is great. And when you turn to things like the creative aspect of language use, the gap is almost infinite. 
I mean, nobody has any idea how any mechanism that we understand, whether quantum theoretical or, or whatever, could have properties like ordinary human freedom or consciousness. There, the gaps just seem huge. I mean, uh, you don't know how to begin to bridge them. So there are tremendous gaps. Well, <coughs> um, uh, uh, that the existence of those gaps could lead to the conclusion that something's gone wrong, something's amiss, uh, and if so, we ask where. You know, where where is something amiss? Well, we don't know. In naturalistic inquiry, what you do is you assume that the better established fields are probably you, you kind of hold on to the better established ones, and you start looking for changes in the less well established ones. That could be the wrong move. You know, you're just making guesses after all. But it's the rational move. Well, in this case, the better established fields by scientific criteria are the computational representational ones. The neurological ones are very poorly established. And you find a lot of things about neurons, but you have no idea that they have anything to do with this stuff. I mean, you just guess maybe they do because they're there. Uh, and uh, in the case of electrical activity, uh, very, there isn't much of a well-established theory. So to the extent that something is amiss, uh, that you know, there's a gap that has to be overcome, uh, natural inc naturalist inquiry would say, well, let's tentatively hold on to the quite well-established computational representational theories and let's see if there's something radically wrong about the way we're looking at the brain when we look at it through the microscope. That would be the rational move. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, maybe wrong, but of course, rational moves aren't necessarily right, obviously. Well, let's have a look at some analogies. Uh, some of them I mentioned yesterday, just to kind of make this look less strange than it may sound. Analogies are never perfect, but they could be, they can be helpful. I gave a couple of them yesterday. One is the classic moment of the beginning of modern science. You had Kepler's law, well established. You had the mechanical philosophy, which was regarded as self-evident. There was a gap between them, as Newton showed. What was abandoned was the mechanical philosophy. It may have been self-evident, but it was just wrong. Uh, that's the step that science took. Uh, take uh, chemistry and physics 100 years ago. You had quite good and well-established abstract theories of matter in terms of things like valence, uh, um, periodic table, uh, uh, differences between states of matter, and so on. You had physics, which was taken to be kind of self-evident, namely particles and fields. There was a huge gap between them. It turned out that the physics was wrong. It had to be radically revised in order to be able to incorporate uh, things like the difference between solids and liquids, or colors, or uh, the chemical bond, or Know, why valence works the way it does and so on. Uh, take, on the other hand, uh, say still 100 years ago, genetics and uh, biochemistry. Again, genetics was abstract like chemistry uh, and there was a huge gap. In that case, it turned out the other way around. It turned out around 1950, and I'll work through the 40s and by 1950, that you could uh, account for a large part of known biology in terms of known biochemistry. So there you had what's called reduction. The other two cases you didn't. You had inflation or expansion or some other thing. Uh, well, if these examples sound too uh, exotic, let's take one that's very much down to earth, the current one that's interesting, uh, very much down to earth, very mundane. Uh, this is an example. Um, Uh, which, in my opinion, is quite relevant to the cognitive sciences. Uh, th th this has to do with something called nematodes. Nematodes are tiny little worms, very tiny. They have about 800 cells. They have a three-day gestation period. Uh, they, ha they have about 300 neurons. 
the wiring diagram of the neurons is completely known. You know exactly how the neurons are hooked up. The developmental pattern is completely known. You know how a nematode gets from one cell to 800 or maybe 1,000, I've forgotten, whatever the number is. So the developmental pattern is completely known. The wiring diagram for the neurons is completely known. Nobody has the foggiest idea why a new nematode does anything that it does. You know, like why does it turn left? Or, you know, how does it do this? And so on. Uh, so you know everything, you know, but you understand nothing about a nematode. Nematodes are critical for this field of biology because they're the simplest organism. Or to, sorry, that's the other way around. They're the most complex organism for which everything is understood, but nothing is understood. You know, that is, all the wiring is understood, the developmental pattern is understood, but you know nothing about what's going on. So it's an interesting problem. Okay, here's, uh, here's some, uh, I'll read you some excerpts from a current research paper on nematodes. Don't bother trying to understand it. I, don't understand it either. I just want to give you the flavor. Here, here's the flavor. Uh, it says that nematodes, it's the guy's trying to deal with this problem, you know, the gap. He says, well, the way to deal with it is to consider nematodes to be abstract computational devices belonging, I'm quoting, belonging to a special class of asynchronous interacting automata uh, implementing certain algorithms, which he then spills out, with computational and control structures viewed abstractly, organized in terms of abstract constraints and underlying organizing principles, some of them general, meaning universal biology, most of, most of them unknown. Uh, he takes a highly modular approach with separate models for development structure varying various functions. They differ in what he calls levels of resolution from phenomenological models to molecular models. Uh, the investigator dismisses connectionist models uh, as inadequate for this 300 cell organism, 300 cell neural system, uh, because they abstract much too far from uh, physical reality and suggests instead that neurons be treated as cells, I'm quoting, that interact uh, by way of a wide variety of chemical information substances, including neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, neuropeptides, and so on, acting over multiple characteristic distance and time scales, in part not through synaptic junctions at all. Uh, these, all of these crazy systems, he says, are metabolically supported as to have some interpretation in the metabolism and realized in the molecules, but nobody has the foggiest idea how. Uh, putting it differently, this description of the uh, nematodes and explanation of their behavior in these terms is as yet unconnected with other descriptions uh, in terms of, say, cells. And the description may involve uh, the unification, if it takes place, may involve reduction, uh, expansion, uh, modification of the whole business. Uh, the unification problem may take any course. Okay, that's nematodes. Now, notice that in this case, there are some temptations that no one falls into. Uh, I'll quote some temptations from the philosophical literature about language, which is translated into nematodes. So in this case, nobody constructs Platonistic biology you know, to say that we have to have platonic models of ne nematodes to which nematode stands in some relation. Uh, no one demands that the inquiry has to take account of communities of nematodes, say the social life of nematodes. Uh, no one claims that there's no truth to the matter because there will be infinitely many theories consistent with the results of some arbitrarily selected experiment or some stipulation about physical reality. Uh, nobody is tempted to construct a common nematode system to whose principle each worm only partially conforms or to dismiss all of this in terms of dispositions of nematodes to do this or that uh, under particular circumstances. Uh, nobody is tempted to hold that if a, an abstract theory of nematode behavior is given, like say the one I just quoted, it adds nothing, I'm quoting, it adds nothing to insist that some mechanisms must correspond to the theory, and so on. Now, all of these are quotes from Michael Dummett, 
Milton Klein from Donald Davidson uh, in comparable circumstances about languages. And I don't think that these mean, but you know, that's the case of language that philosophers are interested in. I don't see why the arguments have any more force in the case of uh, a language than they do in the case of a nematode. In the case of a nematode, nobody's driven in that like, direction. Why are we driven in that direction in the case of language? Well, I think an answer has to be given to that question. Unless the answer is given, then I don't know what it would be. We seem to be, again, in a kind of a dualist morass. Uh, the fact of the matter is <coughs> that whether we're studying organic molecules or nematodes or the language faculty or whatever, we pursue different levels of explanation. Uh, we uh, uh, try to find understanding as well we can. We hope that we're going to be able to integrate these levels. So we hope that we're going to be able to integrate chemistry and uh, biology, chemistry and physics, uh, asynchronous interacting automata with cellular biology, uh, eye language, with something about brains. Uh, we don't know in advance whether the right move is going to be reduction, expansion, change of everything, or something that maybe nobody's ever thought of up till now. Uh, same with electrical activity of the brain and eye language. Uh, there's no point discussing in advance what course the unification will take. We'll know when we do it. In advance of doing it, you have no idea how it's going to go. And there are plenty of historical examples in all directions. Uh, as unification proceeds, it may lead to empirical assumptions, uh, including ontological posits that look absolutely outlandish today, just as has often been in the case, the case in the past. Uh, ever since Newton. If so, well, so be it. Uh, in the case of uh, language and other cognitive functions, uh, it's common to try to relieve the fear that something's amiss. Everybody feels something's amiss. Uh, and there are several common ways of relieving that fear. Uh, one of them is by saying, there's a slogan around which says, the mental is the neurophysiological higher, at a higher level. That's offered as a kind of a definition of the mental. Okay, so don't worry about the mental. It's just the neurophysiological described abstractly. That's standard slogan. It happens to be a quote from John Searle, but everybody. Uh, another approach is that we should eliminate the mental. Just forget it. There's one well-known version of this called eliminative materialism. I'm going to erase. <coughs> Particularly associated with the church ones. <coughs> Two philosophers, uh, whose uh, suggestion is that people should stop talking about cognitive function altogether or language. They should just study neurophysiology. So Patricia Churchland, one of the two, wrote an interesting book actually on neurophysiology, uh, which you know describes it for the lay, lay person. And the point is to tell philosophers this is what you ought to be studying. Forget all the mental, you know, thinking, uh, language, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we. Eliminative materialism is the doctrine that says we should only look at the material world, not anything else like the mental. A third move, which is quite standard, is to say you should look at connectionist models. Uh, connectionist models have a different organization. Uh, they don't directly do algorithmic processing. They do things in parallel. Uh, the systems sort of take form uh, and assume certain forms as a result of continuing interaction with the environment. And they can often do some pretty complicated things. Uh, but they, to say that they don't do algorithmic calculation, is that, which is what's usually said, is not a very clear statement. Because of, from some interpretation, they are Turing machines, which means under some interpretation, they are doing Turing 
you know, algorithmic calculating. But one sort of has a sense of what it means to say they aren't calculating algorithms. They aren't computational representational in the sense of uh, the kind of uh, machines that are, that are standard computers, let's say, standard computers. I'll, I'll come back and spell this out more closely when, if, for those of you for whom it may not be familiar, uh, when we get to more into the cognitive sciences. But one standard move is to say, look, the problem with mental is you guys have looking, been looking at computer models, and you should look at other kinds of models, like connectionist models. Well, those, uh, and somehow in that way, you know, in one of these ways, maybe we can overcome the feeling that something has gone wrong because of this huge gap between mental, let's say, theories of eye language uh, and uh, the physical you know, theories of cells. Well, from a naturalistic point of view, all of these are extremely strange moves, and it's worth seeing why. Uh, let's take the first. Uh, the neural, the, uh, we have an account of many things in terms of computational representational systems. Like we have an account of the phonology, phonology of Gavagai. We have an account of referential dependencies and all kinds of other things in those terms. And it's a good account with a lot of consequences and results and so on. Uh, we, we basically on faith, purely on faith, we assume that there's an account of those things in terms of atoms, cells. I mean, that's just an act of faith. Of course, nobody thinks that the operative principles are going to be identifiable at the level of atoms and cells. So it's not going to be that kind of account, that's for sure. But people assume that somehow there's some kind of an account of all this in terms of atoms and cells. That's a leap of faith. With a much greater leap of faith, many people assume that there's going to be an account in neurophysiological terms rather than, say, vascular terms although the brain is just flowing with blood all over the place. So much blood is in the brain that many biologists have, who are very skeptical about all of this stuff plausibly, uh, argue that maybe Aristotle was right. Maybe the brain is really a thermoregulator. It's there to cool the blood. Uh, and then it has these side functions of uh, you know, language and so on. Uh, it's not totally outlandish when you look at the amount of blood in the brain. And there's a lot of other junk in the brain glial cells all over the place. Nobody knows what they're for. You know. uh, furthermore, uh, neurons are cells. They have all kinds of interactions besides synaptic interactions, as pointed out in the case of the nematode. And the special approach of neurophysiology might just be the wrong one. Or the brain might just have other properties that nobody's thought of yet. I mean, there are you know, very fancy physicists, some of the best contemporary physicists, who believe that uh, contemporary physics is too misguided to be appropriate for the study of systems like the brain. That new physics will have to be discovered to deal with such things. Maybe, you know, I mean, we, do, we have no idea. But the point is that the, the, this slogan, the mental is the neurophysiological at a higher level, intended as a definition of the mental, has the matter backwards. What it should say is maybe the neurophysiological will turn out to be the mental at a so-called lower level, although maybe not, because it may be the wrong place to look. That would be the naturalistic approach. <clears throat> so the first move is just wildly dualistic. What about the second one, uh, eliminative materialism? Well, that's just meaningless. Until somebody, until the churchlands tell us what the material world is, we don't know what eliminative materialism is. I mean, they seem to understand that cells are in the material world and words aren't. But nobody else, but no scientist can understand that. All we know is that the brain has properties. Some of the properties are it gives rise to electrical activity, like ERPs. Another of its property is that people who use brains can identify rhyme and anaphoric dependence. Uh, there are theories about these properties. Some of them are in terms of computational systems. There's no subpart of all of that that's material, at least as far as anybody knows. So until somebody can tell us what's the material subpart of all of this, there is no doctrine of eliminative materialism. Now, we do understand Patricia Churchland when she said, when she says uh, linguists and cognitive scientists and so on should stop studying reasoning 
and uh, thinking and uh, language and so on, they should start studying neurophysiology. That makes about as much sense as telling embryologists, stop studying all that stuff and start studying string theory. Okay, if you're interested in string theory, study string theory. Uh, maybe ultimately string theory will account for neurophysiology for embryology in some fashion. But to tell embryologists that they should start should drop their inquiries into what makes a cell decide to become a bone rather than an eye, because some physicists have this nice idea about string theory, would be totally absurd. Uh, to tell linguists that they should study neurophysiology is far more absurd, because it's at least possible that string theory might be the foundation for embryology. And so far we have very, there's like some reason to believe that. But there's very little reason to believe that neurophysiology is the foundation for thinking. Could be true, but we have no real evidence for it. So that's just irrational. Intelligible, but irrational. Whereas eliminative materialism isn't even intelligible. Well, what about the idea that we should move to connectionist models and parallel processing systems? The idea is that Granted that these systems don't work for a 300-cell nervous system where everything is, where the wiring diagram is known, but maybe by some miracle they'll work for 10 to the 11th neurons where nobody knows how they're hooked up altogether. Well, maybe, but one would like to hear an argument. Uh, it's often argued, I'll finish with this, that we ought to think about the possibility that maybe connectionist models will someday come along that will do what we do in terms of our rule-based models. And we could, should consider what implications that possibility would have for the existence of rules. And there's a big literature about this. That's very much like saying to the embryologist, look, maybe someday you guys are working out all of these really complicated theories about how cells decide what protein to produce on the basis of uh, chemical gradients in the environment and so on and so forth. Maybe someday somebody will come along with a completely unstructured theory that doesn't have any of those complications and will explain all the things that you're looking at. So why don't you stop looking at it? I mean, that would be so unreasonable that you couldn't even laugh at it. And it's equally unreasonable to raise the question of what it might imply some unknown connectionist model that you can't even dream of uh, would someday replace rule-based models which actually work. Uh, well, uh, let me stop there. Uh, and uh, uh, we're right up to the point of getting to cognitive science and its computer models, which is the other standard way of trying to relieve these uh, feelings that something's wrong and the wrong who, in my opinion. to the uh, postmodernist discussions. Well, I, I wouldn't like to refer to it in those terms. Okay, what, what terms? Uh, the, for example, just debates over changing the nomenclature for English departments. To, to what? I mean, to comparative literature or, or uh, ethics, uh, Western, Western culture, yeah. 
so the, so these questions about cult about uh, 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 the there are interesting discussions going on about the canon. It's called, you know, what should you study? Should you study only, you know, the standard phrase is dead white males, uh, or should you study other things too? Okay, that that's a very live discussion going on in the United States. I don't know if it's going on in Europe. Uh, well, uh, the first question. Um, I, you're, I'm sure you're right that people are deeply concerned about what seems to be the ephemeral quality of the successful theories in the case of language. But they shouldn't be, because everything has been ghostly back to Newton. Uh, ever since Newton, we have known that our intuitive judgments about the way the world ought to be are just wrong. Okay, The world has ghostly properties. The world is ephemeral. It has such strange properties as attraction at a distance, which can't exist as any sane person knows, but does exist. Uh, maybe it's interpreted in terms of curved space-time, which obviously can't exist as any sane person knows, but according to general relativity theory does exist. Uh, any sane person knows that a mathematical object, like a vector field, can't have mass, but it does, and on all the way up through science. I mean, everything is ephemeral, uh, because nothing conforms to our intuitive conceptions of the way, uh, common sense conceptions of the way the world works. Well, by now we're used to that, or we ought to be used to that. So if these subjects are ephemeral, that just means they're like everything else in science. But still, you're right. I'm sure that's exactly what bothers people. I'm just saying it shouldn't. Uh, at least it's one, one of the things that bothers them. Uh, now, the reactions usually within the er traditions that I'm thinking of, I mean philosophy and cognitive science, are to dismiss this as either highly controversial because of this ephemeral character uh, or absurd because of the ephemeral character or for the more tolerant people like Michael Dummett to accept it as what he calls a psychological hypothesis, but not a philosophical explanation, not really getting there. Those are the standard move. Those are the ones I talked about. Uh, on the other issue, that's a very serious question. Uh, there is, I mean, the United States, to an extent that's unusual among the countries of the world, maybe unique, has actually dealt to a certain matter, to a certain extent, with the fact that it's a multi-ethnic society. Most societies are very, uh, very, extremely racist. This is particularly true of Europe, which must be the most racist part of the world there is outside of maybe Japan. Uh, the racism is so deep in Europe that it's very striking for a North American to come over to see how dramatic the racism is, meaning the hatred of everybody else, even, you know, a couple of miles away, you know, and the loyalty to particular, you know, communities and purist communities and so on and so forth. I mean, the U.S. is bad enough on these issues, but it has come to terms with these questions at a level well beyond Europe. Well, at least the parts of Europe I've seen and know about, France, Germany, and so on, uh, England, etc. Uh, and one of the things that has come out, come, come along in the United States in recent years, part of the, there's been a kind of a cultural revival in the last 20 or 30 years in the United States, to some extent everywhere, but strikingly in the United States. Uh, the country is a lot more civilized than it used to be uh, in many respects. Now, this hasn't really infected educated circles very much. They are kind of immune. But the general population has changed a lot in all kinds of ways. And one of the ways it's changed is that there's a lot more respect for other cultures and other people uh, and a recognition that you should accord them some you know, rights. Now, it's not done very nicely, and it's often extremely ugly, but at least the concepts are around and the, feel the feeling is around that you ought to do it. All right, this is reaching the universities. Uh, for the last 20 years, uh, it's reached the universities in connection with the study of what's called the canon, meaning uh, what's the course of study that everybody has to go through, the sort of core readings that everybody has to go through. You know? So traditionally, the canon has been, you know, you read Homer and uh, Plato and Shakespeare and, uh, you know, uh, uh, a couple of other things. I mean, that's the canon. That's which, what people caricature as dead, dead white males. Okay. 
Uh, you don't read contemporary literature. You don't read literature from Africa. Uh, you don't read uh, uh, women's literature. You know, all kinds of other things you just don't read. They're somewhere on the outside. They're not in, not in the canon. Well, that's been challenged. Uh, people have suggested that we ought to have a much more complex canon in which some, you don't stop reading Shakespeare, but you read Shakespeare together with... Uh, uh, so maybe you read uh, The Tempest, you know, Shakespeare's account of the Colombian conquests, together with, say, Las Casas, or even better, with some of the Aztec chronicles that describe it the way it looked from the point of view of the people who were getting slaughtered. You know, maybe you should look at the whole business. You know? uh, and similarly across the board, there are many other many, the ideas, there are a lot of different other forms of human culture besides the canon that, we've been, that has been the ruling aristocracy in the ruling societies. And there's a big fight about this. I mean, it's a huge battle. Uh, and I don't think the answers are always simple. Like, you know, if you ask, should you stop reading Shakespeare? Well, sure, you shouldn't stop reading Shakespeare. On the other hand, a lot of the stuff about the canon is sheer fraud. The fact of the matter is, it's true that everybody went through that canon. Like, everybody read the Iliad, and everybody read Hamlet, and everybody read the Republic. And 99.9% .9 of the people who read all that stuff don't remember one word about it. You know, it went in their eyes, it came out of their hands when they had to write an exam, and then they forgot about it. So for all meaningful purposes, they didn't read it. You know, because it wasn't related in any way to anything in their lives or in any experience and so on and so forth. And part of the uh, argument in favor of enriching the canon by bringing in a broader range of uh, situations and cultures and so on, is that you can make, the, make this newer canon alive. You know, you can make it meaningful to people uh, by relating it to things that matter to them. You can show them that when they read Shakespeare, they're reading about things that really happen to people here and now, not just, you know, in Elizabethan England. Uh, <clears throat> and that's a different approach to the canon itself, of course. And that interrelates. Well, there's an enormous battle about this. Uh, and some of the things that are coming out are really amazing. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the cultural conservatives, as they're called, who oppose any modification of the canon, have argued, well, for example, Saul Bellow, contemporary American novelist, has uh, he said at one point that he didn't see any point in reading literature from Africa because there isn't any African Proust. Okay, well, I don't know if there's an African Proust or not, but there isn't any American Proust either. So therefore, you shouldn't read American literature, according to that. Uh, and you know that kind of stuff is coming along all the time. Uh, there are, there's also extremism at the other end. You know, there are, there's a fringe that says, you know, let's toss off everything and just study rap. I mean, that fringe is so marginal you can't even find it. Uh, most, most of the discussion is in a sort of a sane middle range, and it's dealing with real issues. I mean, as my comments may hint at, I think there's a lot of reason for enriching the canon, enriching it in two directions. For one thing, teaching it so that it's meaningful, not rote learning, and for another, broadening it to include a much broader range of uh, uh, cultural contributions. But exactly how to do that is not so obvious, and there's plenty of ground for discussion about it. Yeah, you're correct. It's a canon. It's a canon in quotes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a collection of alternative paths that you can take through human culture. <clears throat> Of the properties of the, of the organism or the mechanism, I think that Quine has to add uh, a kind of ambiguity of his position for learning how to make associations. Right? What do you. Uh, <coughs> for why, you That's know, true. For certain, you know, why, uh, why I can speak and, and 
He has, he adds what he calls conditioning. Now, Whatever that is. No, nobody else knows either. Uh, there is, there are various precise notions of conditioning. So there's Pavlovian conditioning, but he doesn't mean that. Uh, what he probably means is operant conditioning, Skinnerian conditioning. Uh, this is a, it's an experimental situation in which you, you increase the probability of a particular response by uh, rewarding a certain performance in the presence of a certain stimulus. Okay, so you have a red light. You have a pigeon over here. I don't know how to draw it, so I'll write pigeon. Uh, you have a red light. Uh, you have a... Uh, place where the pigeon can peck. Uh, and uh, if the red light flashes and the pigeon pecks after the red light flashes, it'll get a piece of corn. If it doesn't peck, at, uh, if it pecks at some other time, it won't get a piece of corn. Okay, that's the experiment. And what you observe is that uh, the probability that the pigeon will peck when it sees a red light increases. Okay, that's called operant conditioning. That's all it is. It's reinforcement. It's reinforcement. Yeah. Fancy words, oper operant conditioning. So he does assume that. Actually, there's some interesting things about, there are interesting questions about whether this phenomenon exists. It's not at all obvious that it exists, but at all, even in for animals. In fact, that's been known for about 30, 30 years. But uh, I'll, I'll describe the problems, if you like. It may be a pure, a pure experimental artifact that's contrived under certain experimental designs that isn't really happening. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment, but go ahead. Now, before we continue, I think it's your position to talk about, uh, should we listen from the living organism that it does, it doesn't even, it doesn't even go that far. The ability to peel a banana goes beyond the framework that he described. Well, so somebody could have that theory, but he doesn't. I mean, that would be kind of Humean, Humean theory. But Quine is under the illusion that Skinnerian operant conditioning theory replaced all of that. So he does not accept classical association, classical associationism, except in one partial respect. The quality space and the distance me measure gives you a kind of associationism. Like it says, if you're, you know, if you're trained to react to a certain point in the quality space, there's a certain spread, and you may be partially trained to something that's near it in the quality space. So you're trained to do something for a bright red light. You may do it to a lesser extent for a less bright red light. That kind of association would fall out of it. I mean, nothing changes if you add association. Nothing, you know. We're still at ground zero. Uh, nothing happens, it, no matter how much of this stuff you add. In fact, <clears throat> nothing happens for animals either, contrary to what's commonly believed. You can't account for anything that animals do in these terms. Uh, the classical conditioning experiments <clears throat> don't even work for animals. I mean, they work when you set the experiment up to make them work, but they don't work if you modify the experiment slightly. So, for example, years ago, uh, it was learned that, first of all, we might ask the question, why did this design that I just erased have the pig pigeon pecking as a response? Why not some other response? Well, the answer is that pecking is an innate response for chickens, pigeons. They just peck. You know, they go around pecking all the time. So you pick out an innate response, and that's the one you try to modify. Now, that fact is not so trivial as it sounds. All of this shaping of behavior is shaping of innate behaviors. It's taking certain innate patterns of behavior and introducing slight modifications to them. And those modifications are indeed very slight. And just to illustrate how slight they are, uh, Two of the, the person who worked this stuff out in the most sophisticated way was D.F. Skinner. 
uh, who is, it's his point of view that Quine has essentially taken over. Uh, Skinner was extremely effective in training animals. So most of the animals that you've seen on television, you know, like the dolphins that, you know, on the television shows and that kind of stuff, they weren't trained by Skinner, but they were trained by his students. <laughs> Skinner's students, a lot of them went into animal training because about the only thing the stuff was good for was training animals. It didn't, teach, it didn't teach anything, but it was a good device for training animals. Uh, two of the best animal trainers are the ones who trained most of the famous perform performing animals were two students of Skinner's named Breland and Breland. Well, you know, male and female Breland, I've forgotten their names. Uh, and they set up an, they were, you know, got their PhDs and they set up a training school for animals. And as they pursued the training, they discovered something quite intriguing. Uh, they discovered that, in fact, the experiments worked up to a point. So, like, if you were trying to improve the, you're trying to, I mean, for here, here's one case that they were trying to do. They were basically trying to train circus animals. So one thing that they tried to do was uh, to train a pig. Okay, so you've got a pig over here. And the idea is that the pig is supposed to pick up a coin that's lying on the ground and stick it into a slot over here, which is like a, you know, a mailbox or something. And then it gets, a, you know, whatever pig's like, I don't know. Gets, gets one of those things. Uh, so that's a standard conditioning experiment, a little more intricate than what I described before. The pig kind of moves around randomly and ultimately by accident it picks this up and you know, after a while it sticks it in there and it gets a reward and then maybe that increases slightly the probability and so on. The way the theory is supposed to work, all irrelevant behavior is supposed to be uh, filtered out and after you continue the process, the pig is just supposed to go straight to the coin, put it in the slot, and get the reward. That's what's supposed to happen. And if you measure the progress in the experiment, you do get the predicted progress. So it continues to improve at misperformance up to a certain point. At that point, it starts to fall off and get way down to the point where it starves to death. What the pig starts to do is, after a while, it's, it, instead of just picking up the coin, it starts to, uh, what's called in English, root. I don't know what the word is. It's what pigs do when they go for truffles. They dig in the ground, you know. Uh, that's the pig's instinctive action. It's trying to get a truffle out of the ground, so it sort of digs at it. And that's what they start doing. Instead of picking up the coin, they start rooting. And then, of course, it takes longer for them to get the reward, so they get hungrier. And then they root more, and they get even hungrier. And finally, all they're doing is rooting, and they starve to death. So the performance curve goes up to here to a certain point, and it goes all the way down to death. You know. Well, what's happening, what's happening is perfectly obvious. The reason why they picked in the experiment picking up a coin is because picking up things off the ground is a thing that pigs do. But of course, as the pig began to you know, interpret all of this as having something to do with being fed, as the reinforcements were established, it started invoking its normal feeding behavior. Uh, now, its normal feeding behavior happened to be counterproductive in this experimental design. And so, and ultimately so counterproductive it leads to death. Uh, this is what they called instinctual drift. And uh, they finally decided, it looks right, that the reason the conditioning exper experiments appear to work is they're always stopped right here. That's where the experiment stops, when you've reached the performance level you want. If you were to continue it, what you would get is that the activity of the bird, or you know, the pigeon, or whatever it is, would get absorbed into its own instinctual patterns, which would be highly counterproductive for the experimental situation, and would ultimately lead to disaster. Okay, so that, uh, so the, the possibility that it, there's a strong possibility that conditioning is just an artifact. It's a way of modifying instinctual patterns within a certain narrow frame, but ultimately the instinctual patterns will be taken over. Well, a couple of years after that, uh, some people started studying human conditioning. Oops. <clears throat> there's a guy named uh, Don Delaney, who was a uh, 
behavioral psychologist, committed behavioral psychologist at Illinois, I think. And he started studying human conditioning experiments. So these are the standard kind. Uh, you have a red light. Here, here's the person. There's a red light. Immediately after the red light, there's a puff of air that hits the person's eye. And the person's supposed to learn. He better blink his eye when, they, when the light shines. Okay. So after a while, the person starts blinking his eye as soon as the light shines. The standard conditioning experiment. Well, Delaney made the following modification. He took conditioning experiments and divided the subjects into two categories. Those who were conscious of the relation between the stimulus and the, not a reward in this case, but the reinforcement. Reinforcement can be positive or negative. There were some people who were aware of the relation between the stimulus and the reinforcement. I mean, they knew consciously that when you push the button, you're going to get a lollipop. Or when you see the red light, you're going to get a puff of air in your eye. They knew it. There's another class of people who just never figured it out. Okay. Now, it turns out that the only ones who were reinforced were the ones who were conscious of it, which means that there's no evidence that reinforcement ever took place. It may be just that some people sort of figured out what's going on and decided, you know, I might as well push that button because I want the lollipop, or I better close my eye because there's a puff of air going to come. Well, that's not reinforcement. That's just solving a problem. I mean, it's solving a sort of a stupidly designed problem designed in such a way as to mislead a psychologist into thinking that conditioning is going on. Uh, now, he went through uh, uh, quite a lot of literature after this. He was very surprised because it seems to show that there may not be human conditioning. He went through a, a lot of literature and uh, concluded that there was no evidence for it. I remember once giving a lecture at the University of Illinois about 25 years, 25 years ago and these usual questions came up, and I mentioned his stuff. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I broke the time span. Before these experiments were done, I uh, happened to be at the University of Illinois, and in the discussion, I expressed some skepticism about conditioning, and said, uh, well, actually, I guess it was after Delaney's experiments, and I said, look, it uh, doesn't seem to work for humans, but probably works for animals. You know, uh, another behaviorist psychologist there named <clears throat> Brewer asked me afterwards why I thought it worked for animals. And I said, I don't know. It sounds like you ought to be able to do it for animals. And he started investigating that specifically. And it turned out as you can't ask an, an animal, are you aware? But he did other things, which made it look very strongly as if uh, the animal was acting conditioned only if it had absorbed, internalized certain information. And if it hadn't done that, it wasn't acting conditioned. So he concluded, finally, there may not be any conditioning at all. Well, at the moment, there's no real reason to believe that the thing is anything more than an artifact, apart from the fact that it has no implications anyhow, even if it does exist. But that, you're right, is the one addition to the Quine basis that I didn't mention. I didn't mention it because I don't even know what it is. Yeah, I didn't say that. 
but that's just just my point. Yeah. My point is that Quine, though he, though he's an anti-innatist, he attributes innate structure to the organism. He just does it arbitrarily. What he attributes is the radical translation paradigm. Uh, That's easy to understand. Yeah, for example, here, here's something that could be understood. Uh, it's not Quine's position. <clears throat> but somebody could say, this was Hillary Putnam's position, there are generalized learning mechanisms. So Hillary, Hillary Putnam was one of the early anti-innatists. And his position was there are generalized learning mechanisms which apply to all cognitive domains. They apply to language, to uh, thinking, you know, to everything. And that's all. There's no, nothing special for language. Uh, Putnam is an example. Uh, most psychologists have believed that. For example, Piaget believed that. Um, Skinner certainly believed it. Whether Quine believed it is not so obvious because he attributes specific structure to the language system, namely the radical translation paradigm, which doesn't look as if it's going to carry over to anything else. But if it does carry it over to other things, then he believes it too. So that's certainly a position that we can understand, but instantly reject. I mean, it's as if somebody could instantly, not even for, look at it for a moment. It makes exactly as much sense as if somebody said to the embryologist, you don't have to look at the instructions in the cell because there's a generalized growth pattern. There are generalized growth mechanisms and they work for chickens, and they work for nematodes, and they work for people. So forget all your business about the genetic instructions in the cell. It makes exactly as much sense as that. They would make, you could, you would, a scientist wouldn't bother listening to the second one. And they would only listen to this one if somebody tells them what the general generalized learning mechanisms are. So, okay, tell me what they are. You know, tell me what they are, and then I'll take a look. But, if, but then the, the, all of these people say, well, I can't tell you what they are. I just think they're there. At which point you say, well, I'm sorry, I'm going home. It's just pure irrationality. Now, it's, it's very striking that, uh, and incidentally, in the case of language, we have plenty of evidence that it's false. I mean, language has all kinds of properties that you don't find in other cognitive domains. I mean, you know, it's just radically different from other cognitive domains in all kinds of respects. I mean, even its digital character, you know, or its recursive enumerability, I mean, and on to much more complex properties. And we also have very strong evidence that these properties are universal, that they're just internal, which is why they show up in all languages. But somehow we're told we're not allowed to look at that. We must assume that there are generalized learning mechanisms, although I can't tell you what they are. Now, that's pretty irrational. Uh, when the position was stated by... Nelson Goodman, who's another major philosopher, in fact, my, my own teacher, uh, he, he pointed out something that, in fact, is plausible. He said, look, he doesn't see an alternative to the postulation of innate structure for language, but the fact that you can't find an alternative to a completely offensive and unacceptable view doesn't mean you have to accept that offensive and unacceptable view. Well, that's true enough. I mean, if the view that cognition is like everything else in the biological world is so offensive that you just can't accept it, okay, then don't accept it. I mean, it's like some 18th century physicist saying, I'm just not going to accept universal gravitation. It's too offensive. Uh, well, okay. I mean, this ends the discussion. Uh, the discussion with Hilary Putnam, who... I should say it's, not, it's an old personal friend of mine since high school, so we've argued about it personally as well as in print. Uh, that discussion rests with my question, what are the generalized learning mechanisms? And I don't see any, he has no answer to that. Uh, so that's the end of that discussion. The discussion with Quine can't get off the ground because he simply stipulates mechanisms and says you've got to accept those, namely the radical translation ones. And he also insists that we treat the 
a language learner and the linguist is following the same course, which makes no sense at all. And since that's what he insists on, I'm just, all I can say is, well, if that's a game you want to play, okay. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, any effort to understand the world or to solve philosophical problems. It's a game which is going nowhere. And the same would then be true of Donald Davidson and Richard Rorty and, in fact, anybody who takes that paradigm seriously, which is a very wide, wide swathe. Yeah. I mean, if I get the reasons why the first of these three pieces may is to <clears throat> well the thesis is that we're worried we're worried about the dis there's a gap between the mental and the physiological neurophysiological it's true that we can't relate them okay we've got a theory of the mental like some computational representational theory of the brain we have a theory of the neurophysiological like you go over to the brain science department and they'll tell you in great detail how synaptic connections work and you know sodium ions move from here to the hair and all that kind of business and we don't see any way of relating these two things okay so that's the gap well uh, the slogan says the mental that is what all of this stuff is talking about is just the neurophysiological at a higher level that is the neurophysiological the business about synaptic connections that's the answer the mental is just some way of talking about that. Now, the reason why I think that's irrational is that the, these theories actually work. These theories don't in the relevant domain. I mean, these theories work fine for synaptic connections, but they tell you absolutely nothing about language. Zero. Okay. So with re that's the domain we're talking about. We're talking about the domain of language. So here we have a theory which tells you nothing about that domain. Here we have theories which, say, which tell you a lot about that domain. Now we're, we're, we're instructed that we must consider these theories to be just abstract versions of these theories. Now the rational approach would be to say, maybe instead of defining the mental, these are definitions, instead of defining the mental as some abstract version of the neurophysiological, what we could say is maybe the neurophysiological will turn out to be the relevant uh, cellular structures for for the for the uh, eye language, computational representational systems. So maybe in that sense, the neurophysiological will turn out to be the mental at a lower level, but it's the mental we're, that we're secure about, not the neurophysiological. And maybe it won't, because there's no special reason to think that, uh, say, synaptic connections are the relevant phenomenon. So that's it's dualistic in the sense that it's giving a priority to what people intuitively regard as physical, although I don't give any meaning to that, uh, that it shouldn't have. No, they don't. Not, not in the least. They, they are not, none of them are saying maybe the neurophysiological will turn out to be the right level. In fact, take Searle, whom I'm quoting. This is part of Searle's discussion in which he says you've got to throw these theories out totally because you're not allowed to attribute rule following to people because of lack of access to consciousness. I talked about that this morning. This happens to be Searle's slogan. I'm quoting it. Uh, and it's part of a discussion in which he says forget the computational representational theories of the brain because you're not allowed to have them. And the reason you're not allowed to have them is some other stipulation about access to consciousness. So he certainly doesn't understand it that way. Uh, insofar as the, the churchlands don't exactly say this, they say just forget the mental. Pardon? No, Ned Block, I'll talk about Ned Block tomorrow, and he certainly doesn't say this. Ned Block takes the position, I'll quote it tomorrow, that the computational model of the mind abstracts away from biological realization in principle. So it's not that the mental is neurophysiological at a higher level. The mental is not related to the neurophysiological in principle. That's why he wants to say, that's what he calls, you know, he calls what he calls chauvinism in his account, is the belief that we must restrict our theories to humans. And he says, no, our theories of language ought to as well include, you know, Martians with silicon-based brains. Okay. 
so it's certainly not the mental neurophysiological at a higher level. As to Jerry Fodor, I'm not quite sure what position he takes on this. I don't think he said. Actually, I'm not even sure he'd say that. I'm not sure that Jerry Fodor would say that. Ned, Ned Block would deny it. John Searle says it, but means by it throw away the computational theories. And in fact, Ned Block and John Searle are at opposite ends of the discussion over this. Uh, it's the issue of strong AI. You know, do algorithms understand? <clears throat> Uh, uh, yesterday, I uh, gave a few examples of what uh, seemed to me to be properly described as non-naturalist, dualist, meaning methodologically dualist, uh, approaches to substantive issues, issues of fact, issues about the world. Now, let me stress again what you know, but I want to make clear that the advocates of the positions that I'm presenting regard themselves as being, take, as being paradigm examples of naturalist monism, pure, hard-headed naturalist monism. So when I say that it in fact is non-naturalist uh, epistemological dualism, that is a highly controversial statement, and you therefore ought to take it with a good deal of skepticism, uh, since the prevailing view is exactly the opposite that this is exactly what hard-headed naturalism is. So, for example, if you read uh, any of the expositions of, say, Quine, Roger, Roger Gibson's books or any of the others, uh, it is described as, just as Quine describes it, as uh, <clears throat> the demonstration of what a naturalistic philosophy would be, a philosophy that peels away all confusion and uh, residues of a, uh, a non-scientific path and just pursues questions of language and mind and reality and so on, strictly from a naturalist point of view, which is even called naturalized epistemology and so on. Uh, nevertheless, I'm arguing the opposite, that in fact it's a paradigm example of a new form of dualism, much more irrational than the old form, uh, the old form having been incorrect, but nevertheless naturalistic within the framework of uh, uh, the thinking of the natural sciences. Well, uh, the examples that I gave last time uh, had to do with la what's called language learning, what I prefer, prefer to call language growth, that is the development of language in the mind. Uh, and here, what was the issue <coughs> is the uh, is uh, what Quine calls uh, radical translation. That's a certain paradigm uh, that describes a number of different things. Uh, the core thing that it describes is the way the child acquires language. Uh, the child acquires language by means of the process of radical translation, so Quine assumes. Uh, radical translation, uh, we, we, any, anyone, anyone even sane who thinks about the problem of language acquisition we'll recognize that the child is presented with certain data, and here's the child, and something is formed in the child's constitution, you know, brain or mind or whatever you want to call it. Quine actually isn't very clear about what is formed here, uh, but it seems that what he has in mind is formal language. That is, a set of well-formed formulas. At least, he says that two different theories about what the child has acquired are indistinguishable if they converge in the set of well-formed formulas. So it appears that what he has in mind is that the output of the acquisition process is a set of well-formed formulas. Now that can't really be correct because you can't have an infinite set in your head. The only thing you can have in your head is a finite characterization of an infinite set. That would be uh, and I, uh, what I was calling an I language, meaning a generative procedure intentionally characterized, characterized in terms of the actual form of the algorithm. Okay, and then if you have an I language, the fact of the matter is it does generate a class of expressions. And then it's a further assumption that Quine 
takes for granted. He, d he doesn't even go this far. He assumes that somehow, uh, he doesn't assume the I language either. I mean, I can't really give an exposition of this because it's incoherent in my opinion. But if you want to make the view coherent, you would have to assume that there is some kind of generative procedure formed which characterizes the, the let's call it a generative procedure, which characterizes the well-formed formula. Now, Quine doesn't seem to want to make that move. That is, he, he, he regards the question of a generative procedure, what he calls a grammar, <coughs> as being subject to lethal indeterminacy. That is, there's no question of truth or falsity as to what's the right one. So if there's no question of truth or falsity, obviously, it can't be in the child's head. Because if it's in the child's head, it, it's just as real as his arms and legs, let's say. Uh, <coughs> Therefore, if, in fact, the grammar is subject to lethal indeterminacy, it cannot be in the child's head. Uh, therefore, we somehow are going to the class of well-formed formulas without any finite characterization of them. And then we're making guesses about possible finite characterizations. Now, this is all completely incoherent. You know, I'm repeating the words, but they don't mean anything. Because you can't have an infinite set in your head. Beyond that, there's the question whether the formal language exists. As far as I know, it doesn't exist anyway. Uh, there's no evidence that there is such an object. Uh, there's no gap in linguistic theory that's waiting to be filled by the invention of such an object. No one has ever made a proposal as to what such an object would be. So it's pure mystery. Uh, but that's somehow the picture. Uh, we, w there is a coherent picture, but Klein won't accept it. He th thinks there's something definitely wrong with it. The coherent picture is the naturalistic one that I described before. Uh, the child gets the data. There's an I language, a generative procedure, but a very specific one. And we'll find out since it's, re it's a real object. It's just as real as the structure of the visual cortex. And we'll use any evidence at all to try to find out what it is. Biological evidence, evidence from other languages, uh, quantum physics, if that turns out to be relevant, anything. Just follow the methods of science, which are completely opportunistic. You look anywhere for evidence. But we're not allowed to do that here, not under the paradigm of radical translation. So the picture is you go from the child goes from data to a class of well-formed formulas somehow without going through an, a generative procedure that characterizes them. Now, you can't make any sense out of this. Uh, something is missing. And for years, in my case, for 40 years, I've been asking Quine what's missing. And I never get an answer. And there's nothing in the literature that tells you what the answer is. Uh, so that's where... That's where it stands. I can't give a more clear characterization than this. And this characterization is not clear. In fact, it is incoherent. But I don't know how to get beyond the incoherence. That's something intrinsic to this approach, as far as I can see. If somebody knows how to do it, I'd like to hear it. Uh, but uh, I've never heard it, and I can't find anything in the literature about it. <coughs> well, OK, somehow the child goes from the data to the class of signals or well-formed formulas or something like that. Uh, Quine recognizes, of course, that unless there's some structure to the child, you won't do anything with data, right? Unless there's some structure to the embryo, the, uh, the nutrition won't have any effect. Well, what's the structure of the child? Uh, <clears throat> Quine simply stipulates the structure of the child. He doesn't regard it as a matter that requires evidence, which is a curious move because you're talking about something real, the structure of the child. When you're, if somebody makes a proposal about the visual system, and says, I think it has such and such a property. Like, I think it uh, determines structure from motion, or I think it has line detectors, or whatever. They're expected to give evidence, otherwise nobody pays any attention. Um, you can come up with any crazy idea you like. You know. But in this case, somehow, you don't have to give evidence. You just stipulate it. And the stipulations are uh, <clears throat> the ones I mentioned yesterday. There's a quality space. It's a space, which means it has a kind of a metric in it, meaning there are things like, he doesn't say exactly what they are, but presumably the kind of elementary you know, properties of things like color and size and shape and loudness and so on, and then some measure that tells you how close things are, which allows a degree of gener generalization. You know, so you generalize from one point to a close point. Uh, <clears throat> there is, as Karma pointed out yesterday, uh, conditioning. Um, there's the ascent, descent experiment. The child is allowed one experiment, namely asking, is this a so-and-so? 
that's the experiment that Charles allowed. Uh, <clears throat> there's elementary induction, meaning simple induction. So if some, if a thing has happened a lot of times, it'll probably happen again, that kind of thing. Uh, and tacitly, this is never discussed, but I, meant, I discussed it last time, tacitly there is some linguistics. Now we don't know exactly what, because it's, it's tacit, it's never stated, but it's at least phonology. And apparently also morphology. If you look, at, here you just, here's a question of interpretation of texts. Now we're talking about something like interpreting Gothic texts or something. You know, you see what's written and you try to figure out what the person has in mind, because you know, it's not stated. And what seems, if you look at the texts, you find presuppositions about morphological structure, you know, inflections and uh, plural and things like that. They seem to come from somewhere, and the child has them. So apparently the child has morphology. Uh, the child somehow allowed to pick up words, and I don't know, maybe something about sentences, I'm not sure. <clears throat> But some range of things are given tacitly. We're not told why. <clears throat> you can just see from reading the text that they're assumed. Well, that's the radical translation paradigm. Uh, the next uh, crucial aspect to it is that the linguist is identified with the child. Actually, there's a further point, which I didn't mention yesterday, but I'll talk about now. Uh, the person in communication situation, meaning, let's say, you and I, when we're talking, is also identified with the child, hence the linguist. So all three of these are the same. Uh, all three of them require use of the radical translation paradigm. Uh, with regard to the child, the radical translation paradigm is a theory or would be a theory if, the, if it was filled out and if the incoherences were removed. If you could explain what you mean by going to the set of well-formed formulas and if you could fill in these tacit assumptions and if you would spell out the quality space and so on and so forth, then you would have a theory of the child, right or wrong. I mean, in fact, so obviously wrong that nobody would even bother, no scientist would even look at it, as is, take, as is always going to be the case when you simply stipulate a theory. I mean, if I were off the top of my head to stipulate a theory of the visual system, the chances that it would have anything to do with reality would be zero. Uh, and the chances that this one has anything to do with reality are also zero. And insofar as it's cl clear, it's not completely clear, so you can't really test it, but insofar as it's clear, it's just flat wrong in every respect. Uh, that's why nobody who, say, works on language acquisition, it's a big field of language acquisition, but nobody pays any attention to this model because it's so totally wrong in such obvious ways that there's no point in pursuing it. Uh, but strikingly, it's arbitrary. It's stipulated. Uh, and that itself is a very sharp departure from naturalism. Uh, now, when I say it's arbitrary, I don't mean that it has no historical sources. It does have historical sources. And here we get into a matter of kind of, uh, you know, hermeneutics or something, uh, exegesis, trying to figure out what's in the back of people's minds. And in this case, it's not very obscure. Uh, what's in the back of Quine's mind, I suppose, is formal arithmetic, or you know, formal systems, like, say, arithmetic. If you want to set up a system of arithmetic in the modern period, say, 20th century, if you, if you take a course in metamathematics or foundations of mathematics or something like that, uh, you'll start off by defining something called a language, although it has none of the properties of natural language. This is just a metaphor. In fact, it's radically different from natural language in all of its respects, but it's a metaphor. It's called a language, so okay. Uh, and the language is formed by picking some symbols, you know, like plus and uh, zero and successor and so on. So you pick a bunch of symbols and you list them. You say, here's the symbols of the language. That's the phonology, if you like. Uh, and then <clears throat> you have an operation called concatenation, which allows you to string, string these things together so you can get something like zero you know, times, let's say you're allowed three, which is really zero with a couple of strikes, strokes after it, uh, equals, uh, you know, 15, or, you know, left, right parenthesis. I mean, you can st string together various symbols. That's a, f a mathematical operation, which you can define. 
and then you pick, you give a criterion which picks out a sense a class of well-formed formulas. You say among all these strings, there is a certain infinite class which are well-formed formulas, like two plus three equals seventeen is a well-formed formula, but uh, left parenthesis plus right parenthesis equals three uh, or something isn't a isn't a well-formed formula. And you give a criterion for that. And that's a mathematical operation. It's like defining a set of e even numbers, let's say. And, th and that's your language. This, this is now the language. And then you can pick one or another generative procedure, anyone you feel like, to characterize that infinite set. Like you can pick a particular you know, system that will form the things, or you can pick some other one. And indeed, it is indeterminate. It doesn't make any difference which one you pick. Uh, you do the same thing within the class of well-formed formulas you may want to make a further distinction between those that are theorems and those that are not theorems. So this one isn't a theorem. But if, it, if I had five over here, it would have been a theorem. And you want to make a distinction between those. And then the class of theorems can also be characterized by some procedure. And that procedure is called an axiom system. And again, you can pick it any way you like. As long as it gets the right class of theorems, you can pick it any way you like. And then you can ask very interesting questions. Like, for example, you can, you can, say, you can give a, an interpretation of the system under which some of the well-formed formulas are true, and you can ask whether the truths are the same as the theorems. And when you pursue these questions, you reach some quite spectacular mathematical discoveries, some of the great discoveries of modern mathematics, for example, the unformalizability of the notion truth due to Gödel and others. So it's by no means a trivial subject. It's one of the major subjects of modern mathematics with enormous implications, but it runs sort of like that. Now, if that's the model you have in mind, you can sort of understand what Quine's thinking about, because in that model, it's quite true that you specify the language, so-called, it's in quotes, you know, in metaphoric language, as a class of well-formed formulas, and then you pick the generative procedure, the grammar, any way you feel like. And what are the theorems depends on all sorts of things, you know, beliefs about the world, this and that. Uh, and they'll mod be modified as your beliefs get modified. And there's no, you know, definite set of them. You could pick an axiom system one way, you could pick it another way. Uh, even for systems as simple as arithmetic, it's a remarkable fact that there is no way to give an axiom system that captures our notion of natural number. Any axiom system that you construct is consistent with what are called non-standard models, that is, classes of things which don't have the properties of the natural numbers. So even something as simple as the natural numbers can't really be characterized. You can see why people who know all of this stuff would be led to theories about indeterminacy for something as complicated as language. The trouble is it just has nothing to do with it. You know, I mean, it has no relationship at all. It's just... Uh, from the very first step, it has no relationship. The, the structure of formal arithmetic is radically unlike the structure of natural language. And furthermore, these are creations of the mind. Natural language isn't a creation of the mind any more than your arms are a creation of the mind. It's just a form that the brain takes under certain conditions. It's not, it's not something you create by thinking about it. I mean, this is like a painting, if you like. You, know. uh, you just create it. And it's interesting to know how people create things, and you know, then you can ask all kind of questions about uh, what the nature of mathematical truth is, and you know, all kind of interesting topics. But it's a different field. Linguistic, the study of language is like embryology. It's just the study of how the brain takes a certain form under certain conditions. And any mathematical analogies are just totally irrelevant. You know, it's not at any point pursuing them. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the people think there's a formal language in natural language, I suppose, because there is a formal language in the case of arithmetic, and there is because you stipulated it to be so. You stipulated the class of well-formed formulas, just like, you know, if you're doing number theory, you could stipulate the class of prime numbers. It's the same sort of thing, and therefore it exists because you stipulated it. But you can't stipulate things in the natural world. They're either there or they're not there. You know, you can't say they're there because I say so. That doesn't work in studying the natural world. Uh, so carrying over these analogies and models is very misleading. Now, remember, when I, what I've just been saying is an interpretation of what I think is in the back of the minds of people who create these systems. They don't say so. But I'm just guessing 
as to what's in the back of their minds, which could lead to a picture so totally incoherent and so totally arbitrary and stipulative and anti-naturalist. So I'm kind of trying to make up a story that would make it intelligible and understandable that smart people who know mathematics could be so misled when they're studying the natural world. Maybe that's the right story, maybe it's the wrong story. I mean, that's a matter for uh, the biographers. But uh, <clears throat> those are the questions that ought to be raised in intellectual biography if it was ever done by people who aren't just hagiographers, you know, which is rare. You know. uh, but uh, <clears throat> anyhow, that's the picture, whatever the source may be. Now, we have to somehow try to make sense out of it, since it doesn't make sense itself. Well, it has various problems. One problem is that the output, class of well-formed formulas, is a completely crazy output. There's no such thing, as far as we know, and there couldn't be such a thing as an output unless there was an explicit, fixed, intentional characterization of it, that is, an I language. And since the existence of the I language is denied, we're in total incoherence. So one, the output of the system is crazy. Uh, a second thing that's problematic about the theory of radical translation is that the internal state is crazy. So the output's crazy, the internal state is crazy, not because it couldn't be that way. See, the output couldn't be that way. There couldn't be a possible organism which has that output, namely storing an infinite set without a finite characterization of it. That can't be the case. So the output is just incoherent. The internal structure is not incoherent. You could design an organism which has those properties. That is, it has these, these properties. It's just that there isn't any such organism around. Uh, in fact, none remotely resembling it. Uh, what's crazy about the internal state is the idea of stipulating an internal state. The internal state of a complex organism is a very com hard thing to understand. You want to understand what makes a chicken embryo turn into a chicken, you've got to do a lot of work. You want to understand what causes a human to grow arms and legs and not wings, you have to do a lot of work. And you're not going to have to do less work than that to determine what makes the human brain turn into a human language. Uh, so the idea that you could stipulate any of these things is just outlandish. Uh, the third thing that's crazy is the identification of the linguist with the child because their situations are totally different. The linguist coming to uh, investigate the jungle language, as Quine puts it, uh, is not at all in the epistemic situation of the child. The epistemic situation of the child uh, is uh, the child comes already equipped with the innate knowledge of what a possible language is. That's there in the head, somehow. The child comes to the language acquisition problem knowing tacitly that there's a certain class of possible answers, small class of possible answers, in fact, very small. Uh, and the child picks out one of those answers in one eye language. That's the epistemic problem for the child. The epistemic problem for the linguist is totally different. The linguist is trying to find out what is the epistemic state of the child. That's the linguist's problem. So on the one hand, the, the linguist does want to find out what the child ends up with, like you want to know the, what's the structure of Catalan. But the more interesting question, the one that one's really interested in, is what is the structure of language, which is a question about you know, the question sometimes called universal grammar, which is simply the question, what's the initial state of the child? So the task of the linguist is to, is to discover the epistemic state that the child begins with, to insist that the, that the linguist approach that problem by being in the epistemic state of the child doesn't make any sense. In fact, the linguist, as I say, will use any data at all. The linguist won't be restricted to this data. Why should he be? You know, the linguist will certainly use data from other languages. In fact, every linguist always does that. If somebody's studying Catalan and they have two, two choices as to how to handle causative constructions, they'll ask questions about how causative constructions work in other languages. Re this make perfect sense. Because uh, uh, however they work, it's being determined by the internal state and if you have evidence about it from Japanese, that's going to bear on Catalan, obviously. But that's excluded here. Uh, if anything were discovered, say, about um, you know, an ERP, say, electrical activity of the brain, a linguist would be happy to use that as evidence. Uh, if anything's discovered about uh, the theory of cells, fine, use that. 
use anything. You're certainly not restricted to this database. And you can't be in the epistemic, and you're not in the epistemic situation of the child. A person inquiring into the nature of the epistemic state isn't in that epistemic state. You're using some other capacities of the mind, the capacities that you use when you try to understand quantum physics. Those are the capacities that you're using when you try to understand this. Right? Like when you're trying to figure out quantum physics, you don't use these capacities, even if they existed. In fact, you also don't use the actual capacities of the child. When you're trying to understand quantum physics, you don't use universal grammar or whatever it is. That's just irrelevant. You, know? you use whatever the relevant aspects of our science-forming abilities are. And those are the very same aspects that you'll use in trying to answer the question, what's this epistemic state? So <clears throat> the picture has three forms of craziness, if you like. One, the output, which is incoherent. Two, the input, which is stipulative and wrong. And three, the assumption that the linguist is in the epistemic state of the child, which doesn't make any sense at all. You know. uh, so, so it seems to me that this entire picture uh, has just nothing in it that can be resurrected. And any conclusions that follow from it are valueless because it can't get off the ground. Now, very far-reaching conclusions are drawn from this about the theory of meaning and you know, people and so on and so forth, and it's a highly influential paradigm, but as far as I can see, it's about as remote from naturalism as anything you can imagine in every respect, completely off base. Uh, let me just finally add the thing that I forgot to mention last time, the uh, identification of the person in the communication situation with the child. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is we have two people talking, let's say Peter and Mary, and the question is, how do they proceed to communicate? Well, according to Quinean view, they essentially proceed by radical translation. Okay, that's the only thing they can do. So Peter has that set of qualities, and Mary has that set of qualities, and maybe they're allowed some guess, guess maybe they've already achieved some kind of language. That's not clear, you know, it's not stated, so I don't know what to say about that. And then they try to communicate. Peter hears Mary say, Gava guy, and tries to figure out whether that's rabbit or rabbit stage. That's the story. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the person in the communication situation is like the child. Notice again that this is radically different from the way we study any other kind of communication. There are a lot of other communication problems that people study all the time. So there's questions about how cells communicate. They do. You, know, you have two cells over here and you want to know how they interact. They do, they interact in all kinds of ways. Uh, well, you, don't, you never study cellular interaction by stipulating something like a radical translation paradigm and saying, that's how it works, because I say so. You know, it, I mean, it would be too idiotic to consider. Or suppose you're, you're studying, say, ants, which also communicate chemically, or say, uh, bees, which have something which is sometimes called a language, but that's, again, just a metaphor. You know, just some, every, Everything from cells on up has some kind of communication system. In the case of bees, it's called a language, but that's, you could just as well call it that for cells uh, or ants or anything else. Or let's say, you know, chimpanzees or birds or whatever. I mean, there's all kind of work, interesting work in biology that studies communication between systems. And the way it works is always the same. You try to discover what's the internal state of this system. And what is its internal state? And you ask two questions about it. First of all, what is it? And then how did it get, how did it get there? Okay. So those are the basic questions. You want, if you're studying a communication situation, you want to know what's the internal state of the entity in it, and how did that internal state arise? I mean, that's standard science. And in fact, that's the way you do it for cells, ants, bees, chimps, birds, and so on and so forth. Uh, but when we get to humans, we're not allowed to do it anymore. That's the same, same dualism suddenly arises. When we get to humans, we're not allowed to ask, what's the internal state of Peter? What's the internal state of Mary? How do those internal states affect their interaction? Uh, and how do those internal states develop? Right? The questions we would ask about everything else from the level of cells up to humans, we're not allowed to ask here. Rather, we have to assume that the epistemic state of Susan and of uh, Peter and Mary is uh, what is stipulated by the philosopher. 
uh, there's nothing in the history of philosophy as irrational as this. I mean, there are a lot of irrational things in the history of philosophy back for thousands of years. Uh, you know, people have made stipulations about the natural world. But I can't think of anything as irrational as this. You go back to the earliest period, the stipulations about the natural world were sort of speculations based on current understanding. So, you know, Democritus and Adams was a speculation based on current understanding. I mean, you saw that if you poured oil on water, it didn't extend forever. Okay, so you think, okay, there must be discrete particles or something, which is quite, quite good reasoning, in fact. Uh, and, in fact, quite generally, concepts, speculations about the world, or say Hume, Hume speculated that uh, uh, the springs and origins of human understanding, as he called it, involved certain principles of association and so on. Okay, it's a theory, you know, not unreasonable, wrong, but not unreasonable. But uh, anything, I think you, you have to go, you have to look very far to find anything as irrational as this. Uh, you might try, but I don't, I think it's unique in the history of thought, in fact in the level of irrationality that it's reached. Uh, and strikingly, it's, you know, it's, there is no internal critique of it. People just, very smart people, you know, really smart, sophisticated people, pursue it as if it makes sense without any serious questions being raised about it. it maybe, I'm to maybe what I'm saying is completely wrong. That's, you ought to certainly take that possibility very seriously because it's a very strange thing if it's correct. Uh, but if it's... Cor uh, if it's correct, you know, it does require explanation. Uh, there's another aspect of this, which I, I mentioned a little bit yesterday, and that is the willingness to, in the case of Gavagai, the willingness to allow, which is the standard example, you know, the one, actually the one example, uh, the willingness to allow the child, the linguist, and, the, and Peter in the communication situation, to allow them to pick out the phonology of the word. They're allowed to pick out the phonology of the word gavagai. They're not allowed to pick out the meaning of the word rabbit. Rather, there's indeterminacy about the meaning. Well, that's an asymmetry which requires explanation because, as we know, picking out the phonology is no trivial matter. In fact, there, it's a sophisticated matter. And, in fact, there really is underdetermination, uh, really is. The child's or the linguist's first hearing of the signal, you know, you, even just writing the phonetic transcription of the signal already brings to bear a rich theoretical apparatus based on universal phonetics. But even, even when we get beyond that, we know perfectly well that what, what uh, range of variation uh, falls within what we will ultimately call the word gavagai for a particular language is, in, is underdetermined by the first signal, certainly. Uh, in fact, it requires building up a pattern and a system and meeting certain formal conditions and so on and so forth. Uh, so there are problems there, but somehow we're allowed to get over those and maybe over the morphological ones and so on. Well, uh, again, no uh, reason is given as to why we're allowed to do those things but not do what amount to comparable things in the case on the, on the semantic side. On the semantic side, there's supposed to be lethal indeterminacy. There is no truth to the question of whether gavagai means rabbit or rabbit stage. But there is a truth to the question about whether, you know, gavagai and kepeki or something are the same word. There's a truth to that question, but not to the question of the, of the meaning. Well, that requires explanation because there are similar, similar problems. And in fact, we have probably better evidence in the case of rabbit and rabbit stage than in the other case. Uh, well, that question again is not addressed. And we might ask why. And again, we have to just try exegesis. And my guess is the one that I suggested yesterday. There's a tendency as you get closer to the traditional mind, the traditional soul, there's a tendency to veer off into irrationality uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so therefore, you kind of presuppose the rational assumption in the case of the phonetics, which is far enough away not to bother anybody. But, you're not, but you start you're not allowed to presuppose the rational steps when you get closer to the semantics. Now, actually, I say an argument is needed, and in fact, one is given at this point. Uh, it's, it's worth, be, to be fair, it's worth saying that. But the argument that's given is the theory of meaning holism. This is uh, a, a notion that, takes, that comes in various strengths, you know, how holistic meaning is. 
uh, the least strength is that, which almost everybody in the field accepts, that the meaning of a word, a word doesn't have meaning in isolation. Okay, a, ver a word has meaning only in the context of a sentence. These are the relevant contexts for determining meaning. So a weak version of meaning whole is, is that only in the context of a sentence does a word have meaning. You first learn sentences and then you kind of abstract away the meaning. Uh, a richer theory is that a word has language, heck, meaning only in the context of a language. Okay. A still richer theory is that a word has meaning only in the context of what's sometimes called a theory, meaning a total belief system of which the language is a part. Okay. Now, Quine actually, uh, crucially, and one of his crucial ideas is this one, that a language has, or a word, any word has meaning only in the context of the theory. That's the extreme version of meaning holism. Uh, and if that's, that could be true, after all. That's a substantive proposal, hence could be true. Uh, and if it's true, then it's correct that there would be a distinction between, that, that if it's true, that would give an argument for the distinction between sound and meaning. Because sound is not supposed to be subject to this kind of holism. Well, we might ask, in fact, whether sound is subject, could be subject. Well, let's take a look at the arguments and see if sound could be subject to that kind of holism. So, for example, take a, uh, there's a recent book on, uh, on meaning holism, an interesting book by uh, Fodor, Jerry Fodor, and er Ernie Lepore, uh, called Meaning Holism. Uh, and they, they ultimately, they don't actually reject the idea, but they, the book is a critical analysis of the idea, so they're not ad advocating it. They're just considering various reasons why it looks plausible and showing problems, problems with those reasons. Okay, that's their purpose, and it's quite an interesting book. Uh, they start the book by saying why meaning holism looks so plausible. In fact, they say it looks even obvious, which is hence you know, setting forth their own project. They say, look, here's this idea which looks totally obvious, but nevertheless we're going to show some problems in it. That's the project. Well, the reason it looks obvious is essentially that story. They say, take a word, like say, take the word bark. Well, obviously it means something different if I say I peeled the bark off the tree or the dog barked. Okay. So therefore, the meaning of a word is determined by the sentence. Okay, we've shown that. Uh, uh, or take, uh, say, flying planes, another example that the, from the literature that they give. Uh, if you put it in the context is dangerous, it means one thing. If you put it in the context are dangerous, it means another thing. So therefore, the meaning of a word depends on the sentence. We've established at least the weak form of meaning holism. Uh, what about the stronger form? They say, well, consider the, f the expression. I'll have to write it in some neutral form. So let me write it in English because we want to be neutral across languages here. I'll write it in English with the quotes around it, meaning abstracting from English. So they say, take the expression Empedocles leaped. No, let's put brackets around it to mean we're abstracting that expression from English. You know. And they say, well, that expression, uh, Empedocles is named philosopher, you know, leaped means jumped off a, you know, jumped off a mountain or something. Uh, they say, if you take the sentence Empedocles leaped in English, it means the philosopher jumped off the mountain. If you take the sentence Empedocles leaped in German, where you would spell this like this, but it's, they say the same sentence, then it means uh, Empe Empedocles loved somebody. Okay. So therefore, we've shown that the meaning of a word is dependent on the language. Okay. And what about the dependence on a theory? Well, you know, here there are standard arguments given by everybody. Uh, people say, look, take the word momentum. Uh, at one time, it meant from whatever it meant, you know, mass time, from whatever it is, mass times acceleration or something. Uh, and at a later stage of physics, it was just given a different meaning. In fact, the definition of it in the early stage turned out turns out to be false in the new stage. So that's a radical change in meaning as theory changes. Or take say atom. It meant one thing to Democritus, and it meant something else to 
Dalton and something else to Niels Bohr and something else to quantum theory. So the meaning of the word changes as time goes on. Uh, so therefore, the meaning of a word uh, is dependent on an entire belief system. That's the argument. Okay. There are various points finessed here, like to say why Empedocles leaped is the same sentence in English and German, but let's forget that. Uh, the question is, <clears throat> how strong an argument is this? I mean, could we, for example, give a theory of sound? That then the argument is, well, look, we've shown, see, once you've established meaning holism, then you've essentially said the study of meaning is hopeless. You know, because if the meaning of a word is going to depend on sentences and languages and whole theories and so on and so forth, then forget it. There's never going to be, it's like a theory of everything. You know. In order to find the meaning of a word, you'll have to know everything. Well, okay, that's the same as saying there's no study. <laughs> the topic is finished. Uh, now we've demonstrated that there is a real difference between sound and meaning. And that's what lies behind all of this stuff. I mean, the radical translation uh, paradigm and everything else is supposed to sort of give you the rationale for the theory of meaning holism. Well, just uh, uh, try to construct the theory of sound holism and see what that would look like. First of all, notice that what do people mean when they say the word bark has a different meaning in different sentences? What's the word that has a different meaning? Well, presumably by the word, they mean the collection of phonological properties. Okay. They would say, the, or maybe the letters or something like that. But the physical, you know, the output side of the word, the signal side of the word is, is what they mean by the word. But that's a funny notion of word. I mean, the word bark in English isn't just a bunch of sounds. The word bark in English is a collection of a bunch of sounds and a bunch of meanings. Okay, that's the word bark. There's a, you know, Saussurian connection between the sound and the meaning. Uh, and you have no word unless you have the connection. So uh, that a word is what I call the linguistic expression, which is just a collection of properties. Some of them are sound properties. Some of them are meaning properties. Some of them are structural properties, like bark is you know, either a noun or a verb, let's say, but not an adjective. Uh, and uh, all of those are property. The word is just the collection of all those properties. Now, if you extract the meaning properties, then you can run through this argument and you can get a theory of meaning holism. But just mechanically, we could do, the, do it the other way around. We could leave the meaning properties and cut out the sound properties. Uh, now it's harder to talk about it because it's harder to talk about a word without giving a sound, but that's you know, just a difficulty. Uh, so we could spell it, say. Uh, and then we could ask whether the, uh, let's call it the uh, non-phonological word bark, meaning bark with all of its properties, but divested of the fact that it begins with a bilabial stop and so on and so forth. Bark divested of the sound properties. Uh, we could say, just as we said that bark divested of its meaning properties has different meanings in different sentences, we could, it has a different meaning depending where it is in the sentence or something. We can say that non-phonological bark has a different sound depending where it's placed in the sentence, which is quite true. If you say the word bark in the beginning of a sentence, you say it differently from the way you say it at the end of a sentence. So therefore, the sound of bark depends on where it is in a sentence. Okay. Thinking of bark now as just the, 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 the thing divorced from its phonetics. Uh, similarly, Empedocles leaped. Uh, if we take this expression, now we have to pick one language, so let's pick English. If we take the entire conceptual structure of the philosopher, uh, you know, jumped off the mountain, uh, and we divorce it from the sound part, we can say that Empedocles leaped um, sounds one way in English and sounds a different way in Catalan. Okay. So therefore, the sound of Empedocles leaped depends on the language. And in fact, we could probably go up to theories if we like. Uh, well, so we've got a theory of sound holism. The sound of a word depends at least on the entire language, which means it's completely hopeless to study sound. We can throw away phonology. There's no hope any longer in, in carrying out phonological investigation because in order to study the sound of a word, we have to know the whole language. That's the same argument. Well, obviously that's absurd. Uh, and the argument is no better in the other case uh, so we have no argument for meaning holism, which doesn't mean it's false, like maybe it's true, but at least that line of argument won't work because the very same line of, the, the argument is based crucially 
on taking a word to be a collection of properties minus the meaning. And if you do that, you can establish meaning holism. If you take the collection of properties minus the sound, you can establish sound holism by the, in the same fashion. But that's just, you know, a trick. Uh, and since we don't take the sound holism properties seriously and conclude that phonology is a hopeless subject because you, have to, you know the whole language or maybe even the whole theory uh, before you uh, uh, study the sound of a single word, there's no reason to take the meaning holism uh, theory seriously, at least on those grounds. Now, again, that doesn't mean it's false. You know, the fact that an argument given for it doesn't work doesn't mean that it's false. Maybe it's true. Uh, what, about the, I, what about the last part, that words change meaning uh, as theories change? Well, that's a notion that's extremely hard to state, even. I mean, when we say that Adam meant one thing for Democritus and something else for Niels Bohr, what exactly are we saying? What is that word, Adam, that was shared by Democritus and Niels Bohr? Well, there's no real answer to that. I mean, you know, they're talking different languages. I mean, they put it in different contexts. It's, it's a very mystical notion. This relates to something I mentioned the first day uh, about the free and easy talk that people give about words changing meaning or changing sound and so on. That doesn't really mean anything much. I mean, you can get away with it in normal discourse where precision isn't very important. But when you try to give a theory, we're out of normal discourse now. We're trying to give a theoretical account of something. And when you do that, you have to be much more careful about what you're saying. And now you've got to give an, a sense to the concept, words change meaning or words change sound. And there is no sense to that concept. Now notice there's an interpretation of all of this in I language terms that makes perfect sense to say that a word changes meaning over time is to say that if you take successive I languages, uh, they differ in some, and you draw a sort of a line, you know, a line through them at that particular word, you'll find that that element has a different position in the, in the system in different times. You can do that. It's a little bit like saying giraffes uh, evolve longer necks. I mean, we can say that informally, but of course, you know, it doesn't mean that there's a thing giraffe which had a short neck once and has a long neck later. I mean, what it means is the distribution of neck lengths was such and such at one period, and the distribution of neck lengths was some other thing at a different period. That's what we're saying when we say that giraffes uh, evolved longer necks. Now, as long as we're not confused about the matter, there's nothing wrong with saying giraffes evolved longer necks. But if some, say, philosopher came along and said, okay, there's an entity, giraffe, you know, and giraffes used to have short necks, and now giraffes have long necks, and a process called evolution took place between them, that person would be going into outer space, you know, maybe enter entering into total confusion. Uh, because all that happened, these are just shorthand ways of saying the distribution of traits changed over time. And that's what's involved when you say a word changes meaning or a word changes sound and so on. Uh, if somebody said, ask the question, is a giraffe now the same as what it was, you know, whatever, whenever giraffes started a couple millennia ago, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, all we can say is, yeah, there was a bunch of organisms then and there are a bunch now and there's a kind of a strange, complicated historical connection between them and that's the end of the story. There's no question as to whether today's giraffes are some version of earlier giraffes. That's not a question. No. Uh, uh, and similarly, to ask whether Adam for Bohr is the same as Adam for Democritus is just not a question. They spoke different I languages. The I languages matched in certain respects, and we'll find certain similarities between them, and maybe those similarities will be enough so that we'll decide to pick a point in one system and say, okay, it's roughly the same as a point in another system, but that's all you can say. It's like giraffes and necks. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the entire question is being posed in a way which doesn't make a lot of sense uh, and is, uh, uh, e uh, requires a good deal of clarification. That's clear how to give the clarification, at least in I language terms. But once you give the clarification, the problem dissolves. You know, now there's no longer any question about whether the word meaning, uh, the word change, it's not the same word. You know, any more than Mount Everest is, it's like the question that I mentioned last time. You pick some mountain and there's an avalanche and a lot of stuff falls off it and you ask, is it the same mountain? Well, that's not a meaningful question. You know, it depends on what your interests are. 
Uh, that'll determine whether it's the same mountain or not. Uh, it's, it's obviously not the same physical object. Uh, if, if your current concerns as to how to individuate mountains are such that they're similar enough, okay, it's the same mountain. Uh, if not, not. But these are questions of decision, not fact. Similarly with the <clears throat> same word. Now, notice that a second point to notice about these examples of the theory holism is that the examples that are given are almost always from natural science. Okay, so it's not, it's not the word, let's say, fall that's given. I mean, let's, let's take a sentence that we use in ordinary, in ordinary English. Even one talking about a relatively technical problem. So suppose I say the missile rose from the ground and then fell back to the ground. Okay, we, we know what that means to describe it. Uh, that's relatively technical talk already. You know, it's not like John loves Mary or something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, nevertheless, notice that the meaning of the words uh, is not part of natural science. I mean, we know in some other corner of our heads. First of all, there's no such thing in the natural world as the ground. I mean, if you ask an, a geologist, say, where's the ground? You know, well, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, suppose I actually say, make it even worse, and say the missile rose uh, toward the heavens. And then fell back to the ground. Well, there certainly isn't anything called the heavens. Okay. Uh, there's just, just went up in the air somewhere. Uh, so the missile rose toward the heavens and then went down to the ground. There's no heavens and there's no ground. Furthermore, rose is wrong. Well, what we know actually happened is the missile, the missile pushed the earth down a little bit. And the earth pushed the missile up a little bit. And the missile being much, having much less mass than the earth, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the difference from the initial position is greater from the missile than, than the earth. But they just pushed each other away. And when the missile fell down, all that happened is they pulled each other. The missile pulled the earth up a little bit, and the earth pulled the missile down a little bit. And in fact, if you really get fancy, what happened is some geodesic through curved space-time. You know. uh, so uh, that's what happened. But nevertheless, we understand all of this fine. Uh, notice that the words of ordinary English didn't change meaning as theories changed. I mean, our th you know, there was a time when people would have said it that way, and they would have meant it. They would have meant there's a thing up there called the heavens, and there's a thing down here called the ground, and the missile went up from the ground to the heavens. That's what, in fact, happened. And then it fell back from the heavens to the ground. They would, that would have been their science. Okay, there was a time when that was science. Right? Uh, now it's not, it's not our science. Our theories have changed radically. Uh, in the scientific part of our minds, we say, uh, as I say, if we're really fancy, we say something about geodesics and curved space-time. And if we're not quite that fancy, we say that the Earth and the, the, the one, ma one uh, uh, mass uh, 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 collection of mass particles and another collection of particles pushed each other apart and then pulled each other back together. Okay, uh, that's it. But the language hasn't changed at all. None of the meanings of the words has changed as, th as theory has changed. And that's quite typical. In contrast, in connection with words like momentum and atom, the meaning has changed. That is, people, you know, what, there is no longer any term in scientific language that corresponds to what Democritus meant by atom. The, the language of science has no such term anymore. In fact, it has no such term as what Niels Bohr meant by atom, because the you know, theory has changed enough so that that notion isn't around anymore. Some other notion is around. Uh, we can say that that new notion is sort of, you know, a kind of a descendant of the Bohr atom, uh, just as today's giraffe may be a descendant of some earlier giraffe. But that's a meta that's kind of a metaphoric shorthand for something much more complicated, for something about the comparability of points in two different systems. Uh, well, the, the point of examples like this is to illustrate that the, the argument about meaning holism based on change of theory 
works for natural science if we reinterpret it rationally as meaning we give up certain forms of theory and we adopt new forms of theory, sometimes using the same word, and sometimes with enough match between them. And there's, there's no metric for this. It's just a matter of decision. But enough similarity between them so that we'll say uh, the new atom is a new version of the old atom. Just like we might say that the mountain after the avalanche is the same as the mountain before the avalanche. But there's no substantive meaning to that identification. It's just a shorthand for you know, helping people uh, know what to look for in the old theory to see where the new theory came from. Okay, It's like the evolution of giraffe next. On the other hand, for natural language, the, the theory of meaning holism just seems flat false. I mean, if we look at natural language, we see, in fact, that the terms have retained all of their old meanings as theory has radically changed. And it doesn't matter how sophisticated a physicist you are. You know, you can be the guy who just got the last Nobel Prize. Uh, and you'll still say the missile rose from the ground to the heavens and fell back to the earth and mean exactly that. Exactly what you and I mean. Because the language hasn't changed at all. Even though the theory has changed totally. So insofar as the theory of meaning holism, the, the big theory of meaning holism, the one that makes meaning theory relative, Insofar as that's intended to be a substantive comment about our language, it just isn't true. Insofar as it's a comment about scientific language, it's maybe true, but only in the sense in which giraffes evolved longer into necks is true. That is a shorthand way of describing some other thing. Now, <clears throat> these issues arise, I'll, I'll come, if there's time later, I'll come back to it, and certainly the philosophers among you at least will know that uh, these questions arise very crucially in connection with contemporary theories of reference, what are called externalist theories of reference, theories that tell you that the reference of a term, like, say, book or table or something, is determined by the way the world really is. Reference and meaning aren't things in your head. They're things in the world. It's called externalist theories. They're very, I mean, they're almost universally accepted now. Uh, Hilary Putnam is, in fact, one of the originators of these theories. They sort of swept the field in the past 20 years, Putnam, Kripke, and others. Uh, Putnam, in talking about the theory, gives the example momentum. He says, look, uh, momentum is a particular thing. They defined it a certain way in the 18th century, and they were just wrong because they didn't capture that thing. Contemporary physics defines it a different way, and you know, maybe they're right. You know. But there's a thing, momentum, and there's a word, momentum, which refers to that thing. And people who were using the word may have been misreferring all the time. So for Putnam, say, there's a real substantive question as to what Adam meant pre-Dalton, let's say. And he says what it meant. Niels Bohr, when he constructed the Bohr model, whenever it was, in 1915 or something, uh, meant by Adam what we mean, even though he misstated its properties. Okay. Now, Putnam argues this on the following grounds. He says, we have to assume this, otherwise we would be forced to say that all of Niels Bohr's statements were false, and all of his beliefs were false. It's as if he was doing astrology. Well, obviously, Niels Bohr wasn't doing astrology. Uh, but if, unless he meant by Adam what we mean by Adam, we can't even interpret his theory in our terms. Right? We can't, in, like, it's as if he was talking Greek and I'm talking Swahili. I can't interpret it because he doesn't have the same words. Uh, uh, so he, he was just talking gibberish, in other words. Uh, and we don't want to say that he was just talking gibberish. You know, obviously, he was talking sense. So therefore, we have to conclude that by Adam, he meant what we mean by Adam. And some of the things he said about Adams were true and others were false, but that's understandable. Okay, so therefore, we have to take this view that says that a word has a fixed meaning determined by the world. Okay, like what a tiger is is determined by the nature of the world. And it doesn't matter what concept we have in our mind. Okay, that we're forced to that in order to 
uh, 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 account for the notion of intelligibility in science. It's basically the argument. Uh, notice that there are a couple of crucial assumptions in that discussion that ought to be brought out and questioned. One is that scientific language is part of language. Assumption one is that talk about electrons and momentum and so on is part of natural language. That is that there's no fundamental difference between concepts like atom and concepts like house. And that's very dubious, as you can see from the case of the missile rising and falling in the heavens and the earth. I mean, that's natural language. Uh, and all the considerations that lead us to consider, you know, that things are really pushing each other apart just don't bear on natural language. That's another part of our minds where we construct sciences. Now, when we construct sciences, we often use the resources of our natural language because that's what's around, you know. But we're changing it. We're changing them in all sorts of ways. Uh, in the natural sciences, we are constructing symbol systems. But those symbol systems can, for example, include calculus, which is certainly isn't part of natural language. They can include differential equations, which aren't part of natural language. Furthermore, in that symbol system that we're constructing, we are trying to impose upon it certain properties. For example, one of the things we're trying to impose on this symbol system is the property that there are words and that these words refer to things, real things, like, uh, you know, atoms, whatever they are. Or, and among those things are what are called natural kinds, meaning, say, liquids, you know, the, the, the kinds of nature, the things into which nature is really subdivided. In short, we want to construct this symbolic system so that it has realistic properties. The purpose of the game of science is to construct a, a symbolic system which will have whatever resources it needs, maybe differential equations, so not language, and will have a relation of reference holding between words and things. It will, and if, if you discover that the word that you've, the concept that you've proposed doesn't refer to a thing, because there is no thing of that kind, then you change the concept. Uh, and uh, uh, the natural kinds have to be real kinds. Like uh, for the ancient uh, scientists, the real kinds were earth, air, fire, and water. Okay, those aren't the real kinds for us any longer. In fact, none of them are. Uh, the, uh, so we've abandoned those. For, for contemporary science, there are no terms referring to what those guys referred to. Because there is no earth, it's not a thing, you know, there's fire isn't a thing, and so on. Uh, we're aiming consciously in science construction to develop a symbol system with realistic properties. Picks out natural kinds, picks out real things. But natural language has none of these properties. In fact, in natural languages, words don't even refer. I think that's just a mistake. I'll come back to that later. It's commonly assumed to be true. But I simply think it's not true that words refer in natural language. That's not the way natural language works. True, people use words to refer. But that's something different. I mean, people use words to lie. But that doesn't mean that words lie. You know, that would be a mistake. Uh, the idea that words refer is a big leap, you know. Again, a leap which comes naturally to people who think about the sciences. Because in the sciences, you're trying to construct words that refer. Also, words in natural language don't have any particular relation to natural kinds. So for, it, it, it again, kind of historically interesting that in discussion of these issues, like in contemporary discussion of these issues, people talk about water. And they say, well, what did, you know, some 16th century person mean by water? Well, what we mean, H2O. They didn't know it, but they meant H2O. Uh, it's, it's very interesting that nobody ever picks earth, air, and fire. Okay. And say, well, what did they refer to by earth, air, and fire? Now, for the ancients, earth, air, fire, and water were on a par. Why do we give the, if you, when you read contemporary philosophical literature, say twin earth literature, uh, why do you talk about water and not earth? Well, the reason is obvious. There's a rough counterpart in the natural sciences to our intuitive concept of water, namely H2O. There isn't even a rough counterpart to the other terms, so you don't use those. But the point is it's only a rough counterpart. There's no reason to believe at all that 
people in the 18th century, or for that matter, people today, you and me, mean H2O by water. I mean, if we're talking as scientists, we probably mean H2O. Uh, but if we're just talking to each other, like if I say I'm going to drink a glass of water, this, I'll drink it. I mean, I know perfectly well this isn't H2O. You know, it's got some H2O in it, but it's got an awful lot of other junk in it. You know? uh, <coughs> so it's certainly not H2O, whatever it is. But yet we refer to that as a glass of water, uh, and not a glass of milk, let's say. Uh, and, and that's correct. Uh, I use the word water to refer to this, even though I know perfectly well it's not H2O. Uh, the reason why in the contemporary literature you get discussions of water and not earth is that there isn't even any rough counterpart in the case of uh, earth and fire and so on. But the right lesson to draw from all of this is that the symbolic systems constructed by the natural sciences are just unrelated to natural language just as the formal systems constructed in formal arithmetic are unrelated to the natural languages. Well, unrelated is a strong term. I mean, maybe they're influenced by them in some respect. But to the extent that they're influenced by them, the reflective scientist will regard that as illegitimate and will try to correct for it. I mean, if your symbolic system happens to be influenced by the language you speak, or some, what's called common sense, and if you happen to notice that, you'll try to overcome it because it shouldn't be. The goal of the scientific language is something else. It's a constructed system aiming at a certain purpose. And the purpose is to capture reality by having symbols that designate and predicates that uh, have you know, predicational properties and so on and so forth. Natural language has nothing like that. And we can see it very clearly when we take the parts of natural language in which we talk about technical, op technical operations and notice at once that we're not using the words in the scientific terms, sense, even if, we're, even if we have to be scientists. So the, uh, there is a substantive theory. I, I went too fast when I said that Quine had no argument for distinguishing the form, the willingness to accept the form of Gavagai from the unwillingness to accept the meaning of Gavagai. He had an argument. The argument was meaning holism, uh, which can take various forms. Uh, the weaker forms, the rel relativity of meaning to sentence uh, and language, those are insignificant. Those are just misleading tricks, because the same arguments would give you sound, would give you sound holism, which is you know, confusing no one. It would just tell us that in a particular I language, uh, a particular I language has the property that sounds and meanings are correlated in some specific way, not some other way. If they were correlated in a different way, it would be a different eye language. It's a triviality. So there's nothing to meaning holism at the lower levels. With regard to theory holism, the crucial one, the one that Quine's really interested in, it's very hard to state the concept. You know, it's just kind of stated in a hand-waving fashion. When you try to state it, it becomes quite hard. You get into these questions of what it means to have the same word in different languages and so on. Furthermore, it's based on an entirely illegitimate assumption that scientific language is part of natural language. And it's based on a misinterpretation of scientific language, which takes things like giraffes evolved long necks, literally, instead of recognizing their, uh, that they're a shorthand for something else. Uh, as to the problem about Neil Bohr and intelligibility, Putnam surely has a point. Um, we don't want a theory of science which leads us to the conclusion that Neil Bohr was doing astrology. Okay, we certainly don't want that. Uh, nevertheless, however interesting a theory of intelligibility in science may be, it's not a basis for a theory of language. It's some other question. And furthermore, as far as I can see, there's a perfectly good eye language and internalist interpretation of the Niels Bohr problem. It makes perfect sense to say Niels, all of Niels Bohr's statements were false literally, but he wasn't doing astrology. Although the statements were literally false because there were no things such as atoms in his system, so the statements were literally false. Nevertheless, the structure of his theoretical discourse was similar enough to the structure of our theoretical discourse, so we can see, we can construct rather natural matches between them. In fact, we can, and having done that, we can even take over a lot of his discoveries and we can make sense of an awful lot of what he was saying, even though it was all literally false. Now, in the case of astrology, it's quite different. It's literally false, and there's no matches that enable us to make it true. 
So that accounts on completely internalist grounds, you know, completely internal to the head, uh, for the intelligibility of Niels Bohr without any strange assumptions about words retaining meaning over time and the ancients having meant H2O by water and so on and so forth. Uh, and in fact, that seems to be probably the right way to do it. Uh, let me give a uh, linguistic analogy, which is much simpler, because linguistics isn't as complicated as physics, uh, which illustrates the point. If you go back about, say, 40 years ago, there was a debate in phonology between structuralist and what were called generative phonologists. They had a different conception of what the basic unit was, you know, a phonological unit. The basic unit out of which representations are constructed. According to one or another, say, Jacobsonian structuralism, a phonological unit was a collection of distinctive fe of features, where the features are things that you can perceive. Okay. You can actually get phenomenal correlates to them, acoustic correlates to them. And a phonological unit is a collection of those. Some, up, some, some other linguist might have had some other conception of it. The generative phonologists were saying, no, a phonological unit is an element in an abstract generative system which appears at a certain formal level. It doesn't have features that you can hear. You may ultimately end up with things that have features that you can hear, but that's not what it is. All right, they were having a debate like the debate between different theories of the atom. Now, let's assume that the debate has been resolved, okay? Say, and let's say for concreteness, that doesn't matter, that the debate was resolved in favor of these guys, which is what I think. But if you think differently, it's the same story. Make it whatever you like. Uh, so for concrete, let's, let's say the generative phonologists were right. Now, does that mean that the structuralist phonologists all along were talking about the units that generative phonologists were talking about? I mean, does it mean that Jacobson was really talking about uh, elements in a, an abstract level of phonological representation? He thought he was talking about features, but he was mistaken. I mean, if you asked him, he would say, of course not. You know. And he'd be right. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't talking about what nowadays people call phonological units. Uh, 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 was he talking gibberish? No, of course he wasn't talking gibberish. In fact, we can make a lot of sense out of what he was saying, and you can take a lot of it over and give some reinterpretations here and there, uh, because there's a close enough match between generative phonology discourse and structuralist theoretical discourse. There's a close enough match so you can carry a lot of it over and reinterpret it and do it in unique ways and illuminating ways. It means the discoveries aren't lost, you know. Maybe everything that he said was literally false, but the discoveries were by no means lost. They just undergo a certain translation into a somewhat different conceptual framework. Now, you know, any linguist looking at this would surely say this was what was going on. They would not say that Jacobson was really talking about contemporary phonological units. Uh, and similarly for, you know, like when I was doing phonology 25 years ago, and I referred to something as a phonological unit, it was different from what people mean now. But I wasn't referring to what they mean now. I was referring to what I thought then. Uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't mean I was doing astrology. You know, but they, maybe some of it's translated into modern terms, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and there's no special reason why it should be any different in the case of Bohr and the atom, or why, or why we should get into crazy debates about whether, say, before Avogadro, people use the word atom and molecule interchangeably, I think. It seems that they use them to mean the same thing. Well, are we really going to have to say that they meant by atom what we mean by atom, and they meant by molecule what we mean by molecule, even though for them the words were interchangeable? Well, that's what you'd have to say on these uh, <coughs> theory, you know, theory holist, externalist uh, theories, but it obviously doesn't make any sense. They thought there were small things around out of the world which, out of which the world was constituted called, you know, uh, uh, indeterminately atoms or molecules. And we don't think that. We think there's two different kinds of things, one of which we call atoms, one of which we call molecules, which are different. And they're kind of descendants of their concept, but descendants only in the way in which a contemporary giraffe is a descendant of an earlier giraffe. Changes have taken place along the way, which allow for certain matches, not others. Well, uh, I'll make a last comment about this stuff. 
and then go on to the next topic later. Uh, the place where I actually want to come back to this in connection with theories of reference, as you can see from what I'm hinting at, I'm going to want to get back to the conclusion that contemporary theories of reference completely misconstrue language uh, because they're based on a notion that doesn't exist, namely a notion of reference that holds between words and things. All theories of reference in Sprague are, ba are based on that idea, and it just doesn't seem to be true. Uh, but uh, although it may be true as the goal for scientific languages, which is another question. The context in which these issues usually arise is the context of uh, analyticity. And that's just for historical reasons. First of all, because it's an interesting old philosophical notion. And second, because it's the one that Quine focused on when he was developing the theory. So the question is, a, a sentence is supposed to be analytic if it's true, whatever the facts may be. That's basically what it comes down to. So if, if some sentence is true, whatever the facts may be, it's analytic. If it's uh, true just because of the facts, it's, it's contingent, you know, synthetic, or something like that. And then there's a big discussion about what the meaning of this is. Uh, now, Quine, uh, it follows from the theories of meaning and determinacy, you know, and theory holism and so on, that there are no analytic statements. There are no statements. A, a, theory, a statement that's analytic is true by virtue of the meaning. Okay, so uh, uh, the statement, if John is dead, then John is not alive, let's say, would be held to be analytic by virtue of the meaning of the terms, meaning you don't have to carry out an empirical inquiry into the world to find out if that's true. You know that it's true because you know what the words mean. That's the idea. But of course, if words don't have a meaning, it can't be that the sentence get its truth value by virtue of its meaning, obviously. Okay. So one of Quine's startling conclusions back in his early articles in the late 40s uh, was that there are no analytics. There's no difference between analytic and synthetic sentences. They're all the same. They're, they're all epistemologically the same. Uh, some of them may be more deeply rooted in our belief systems or something, but nothing else. Well, suppose we want to discuss, I mean, certainly that's not the way people think about it. You know. And we could, since it's a question of fact, we could presumably carry out empirical uh, inquiry on, uh, concerning the topic. Okay. We could try to find out whether, in fact, that's the way people understand sentences factual question. There ought to be a way to investigate it. Uh, and suppose we take uh, this, let's take a slightly more complex example, the kind that's come up in the literature. Suppose I take the sentence, if John persuades, if John persuaded Bill to go to college, then Bill at some point, and I'll leave that out, at some point in the past, intended or maybe decided to go to college. Okay, take that sentence. Uh, and suppose we compare this sentence to a different one. If John persuaded Bill to go to college, then John intended or decided to go to college. Thanks. Okay, uh, suppose we just compare those two sentences. And we give them to a lot of speakers. And we ask them to judge which ones are true. Uh, without, and, w and what would you do to figure out whether they're true? And we make up experiments about that topic. And we know what we're going to find. We're going to find in the first case uh, where Bill in intended to go to college that overwhelmingly people say it's true and you don't have to do any investigation. To know whether John intended to go to college, well, you know, you've got to figure out whether it's true or not. The sentence doesn't tell you. Okay. Given, in other words, we give people, let's put it this way, we give people this sentence. John persuaded Bill to go to college, and we ask them about these two sentences. We ask which one is true. If we say, suppose it's true that John persuaded Bill to go to college, give me a judgment about whether Bill intended to go to college and whether John intended to go to college. Okay, well, everybody knows that unless Bill, in fact, intended to go to college, John did not succeed in persuading him to go to college. But as to whether John intended to go to college, we just don't know. The sentence doesn't tell us. And we could get very reliable results showing 
that people distinguish the sentences that way. Well, those are facts. Facts have to be explained. Uh, how would we proceed to explain them? The way the literature works uh, is kind of interesting. If you look, there is a debate about this in the literature. Somebody says, I think there's a meaning connection in one case and a, just a factual issue in the other. And somebody else comes back and says, well, that's not my intuition. My intuition is they're both factual. And then the debate stops. It's kind of like you know, an impasse. But it's not an impasse. I mean, if it's a, everyone agrees on the facts. And if you agree on the facts, you can consider alternative theories. Well, there are alternative theories in this case. And you can compare them on their merits. The theory that gives you the obvious result, you know, that says that this one entails this one, is a theory which will involve notions like causation. It'll, in fact, say that persuade is a causative verb. It's a causative verb which has a lexical decomposition into a notion causativeness and a notion intention. So it, in effect, means cause to, intent, cause to intend or cause to decide. And then, you know, the people look at some other language and say, yeah, it actually is spelled out like that with a causative verb and has the properties of causatives and... Uh, uh, notions like cause and intend and agency, which enters into this, and all of these notions will appear within a theory of a semantic theory uh, about how concepts are organized and what their connections are, and there'll be syntactic properties about causatives which will have to carry over to this and so on. That's one theory. That theory gives you the conclusion that if John persuaded Bill to go to college, then Bill intended to go to college, but nothing about whether John intended to. Now, what's the alternative theory that we're supposed to compare with this? This is a theory which says it's an one is analytic and one isn't. What is the alternative theory that we're supposed to compare with this? Well, it's kind of interesting. The alternative theory doesn't exist. I mean, what we're told is some sentences are more deeply embedded in our belief system than others. But obviously, that's not going to work here. The sentence, if John persuaded Bill to go to college, then Bill intended to go to college, is not deeply embedded in my belief system. In fact, I don't have any belief system involving that thing at all. Uh, or if you think it is deeply embedded in my belief system, then show me your theory of belief fixation, which leads to that conclusion. What theory of belief fixation shows me that one of those two conditionals is more deeply embedded than the other? Well, there is no such theory of belief fixation. Uh, or some other people, like, say, Paul Churchland, say that the difference is that what we call analytic sentences are more involved in deeply involved in normal inference than others, like logic. Well, neither of these is involved in normal inference or logic, so that can't be right. In fact, we have no alternative theory. There is no alternative theory to the semantic theory which explains the difference as an analytic synthetic difference in terms of notions like cause, intend, agency, etc. Well, we, we now have a funny situation. There's a fact I mean, a class of facts, big, big mass of facts like this. Everybody agrees on the facts. We have one theory to explain them, a theory of a semantic theory of semantic features and so on with fixed meanings. We have no other theory, just hand-waving, you know, belief systems or something like that. And remarkably, everybody accepts the non-theory. Th what has swept the field is the non-theory. The standard conclusion from these disagreements is it's been shown there are, that there aren't any analytic sentences. That's an extraordinary case of irrationality. I mean, however good you think this theory is, at least it's a theory. And you can extend it and you can find evidence for it and so on. And it is universally assumed that it's been disproven by the statement that another theory which I can't construct is right. That's in fact what's happened. And therefore, it is, it is now regarded as one of the best established conclusions of modern analytic philosophy that there are no analytic sentences, that the analytic synthetic divide is artificial. You take a look at any textbook you like, that will be presented as one of the real discoveries of modern philosophy. Well, what, and you know, it's sort of like the bedrock for all further work. Well, what has been discovered is that uh, if you decide to abandon the one theory that works, and to claim that something else works, which you can't formulate, then you get this conclusion. That's what's been found. But again, a rational, naturalistic approach would draw exactly the opposite conclusion. 
Of course, we haven't proven that there are analytic sentences, because in science, you never prove anything. You know, you haven't proven that space-time is curved either. You just got evidence for it. Uh, what we've shown, however, is that there are pretty good semantic theories, just as there are pretty good phonological theories, that explain a lot of things that everyone agrees are facts, like the radical difference between the sentences. And it assigns them the different status, analytic and synthetic. So therefore, on naturalistic, rational grounds, that's what we conclude. To conclude on the basis of this, that the analytic synthetic distinction has been eliminated, or for that matter, even questioned, to even to conclude that the distinction has been questioned is totally irrational. The distinction hasn't been questioned at all. There's a perfectly good theory that predicts the distinction. There's nothing that questions it, and therefore it hasn't been questioned. Until somebody comes along with an alternative explanation of these facts, it hasn't been questioned at all. Well, again, that's a case of in, in my opinion, extreme irrationality. Not in this case so much dualism as, well, maybe so, you know, an insistence that questions about language and mind and so on simply cannot be approached rationally, can't be approached by the rational requirements of the natural sciences, where if you have a fairly good theory to explain certain facts and no theory as a competitor, then the no theory is thrown out and the fairly good theory is tentatively accepted, which in this case would mean accepting the analytic synthetic distinction as pretty well established. Uh, let me basis for my, I just said I believe that words in natural language don't refer. I haven't given any basis for that yet. I'd like to come back and give a basis for it. I just wanted to indicate where I'm going. My feeling is that it's a mistake to think of words in natural language as referring. I'll later come back to why I think that. So I haven't given any reason. Uh, as to uh, scientific language, uh, you could say that scientists use the word atom to refer but I think that that's probably a misdescription of the project of natural science. Now, this again, it's a topic, you know, I'd like to come back to it. But the way I understand the project of natural science, including the project of linguistics, the idea is to try to construct a symbolic system in which, in fact, the words will refer. So if a linguist is uh, trying to construct uh, a system with notions like cause or intend or uh, phonological unit, wherever I had that. Uh, you're, you're working very hard to develop a theory in which the terms themselves will pick out some real thing in the world. And you want to extract yourself as the user. I think that's just the nature of the project. Okay, well, we can talk some more about that. As to the second question, that's a deep question. That's, that's Brentano's question. It's 
the question of intentionality, intentionality now with a T. How can people refer to things? Well, that's, you know, it's a hard question. I don't think the language of thought helps at all in that. Uh, maybe there is one, maybe there isn't. But whether there is a language of thought or, or not, we have the same mystery about how people can refer to things. How can I talk about this table, let's say? Now notice that when we, re if we uh, just to give you a feeling as to why I'm skeptical about words referring, notice that this goes back to Frege uh, in, the, in the modern period. Uh, and uh, notice that Frege had to make up technical terms. Uh, Bedeuten doesn't have the German meaning of Bedeuten. Okay? He made up an, uh, a term. Uh, and the same is true in English. In English, the word refer is not a relation between words and things. It's a relation between people and actions. So that whole terminology of semantics, back to Frege, is invented technical terminology because natural languages have no concepts like that, which is already suggestive that, you know, you're talking about something other than natural language. It doesn't prove it, but it's suggestive. Uh, um, but we're left with the problem of intentionality. I quite agree. I mean, we're left with asking how people refer to things. Uh, however, notice that the way we refer to things is not by picking out words that refer to them. Like, I can give a talk, say, about, you know, the economic situation in uh, Harlem, in some New York area of New York City, and I will be referring to the United States, but I may never mention the United States. Okay. I may never use the phrase United States or any similar phrase. In fact, you can refer to things in all sorts of oblique ways. If we really want to analyze the notion of referring, it's going to go very far from uh, something that people do, the act of referring, is going to go very far from specific use of words. I, mean, I, can, I can be talking about a friend of mine, let's say, and never mention him at all. I'm referring to him, but I'm just talking about some property that he has, let's say. So for, well, to take an example, I, I talked earlier about generative phonology and structuralist phonology. In my mind, I was referring to a friend named Morris Halley, but I never mentioned it. I mean, most of the people here knew I was referring to him. Okay, but I, I didn't mention him. I didn't use his name or anything else. I was, of course, referring to him. And we can ask the question, how did I succeed in referring to him? Well, that's an interesting question, but it surely didn't involve using his name because I didn't use it or using any designation of him, because I didn't use any designation of him. I just referred to a certain debate that had taken place in which a lot of people here know that he was one protagonist. So in that way, I was talking about him. In Brentana's sense, I was talking about him, clearly. And that's what I had in mind. Uh, if we want to add a story about how, in the language of thought, his name cropped up in my brain, we can do it. But I don't see that much is, nothing has helped. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. It certainly is not reference. It's not reference. It's not intended reference. Uh, it's none of those things. Uh, I mean, I, I could talk about it. I, let, let me come back to it. If I, if I don't get back to it, ask, bring it up again. I'd like to get back to it in the proper context. But whatever it is, it's surely not reference. In fact, I think, uh, just again to give you my opinion, f formal semantics or linguistic semantics, the field of linguistic semantics, in my opinion, isn't a semantics at all. It's a form of syntax. Uh, and people are very confused about that, in my opinion. And that's true whether you bring in possible worlds or discourse models or mental models or whatever. All of that stuff is no more semantics than phonology is sound waves. I mean, it's all something going on in the head. You know, it's all completely internal. It's internalist. And if we were accurate about it, we would call it syntax. I mean, when phonologists get down to the level of phonetic form, they don't think they are talking about noises. Right? There's a big step between phonetic form and noises. Okay, and there's the same big step between possible worlds and something outside the head. It's just that people working in semantics just haven't recognized that. And I think it's possible to show it. I mean, I'll come back to evidence that shows it, I think. Incidentally, I, I should say that my own work over the years 
has always been misinterpreted in this way. I mean, standardly, everybody says, I do syntax, other people do semantics. The fact is, if you take a look at my earliest work and up till today, it's the same thing everybody else did. I'm interested in the difference in meaning between John is easy to please and John is eager to please and, you know, all that kind of business. Or what's the difference in meaning between the two senses of flying planes or an afro and so on. It's just that I call it syntax and other people call it semantics. But, and that's what I think it ought to be called. I think we ought to use the term syntax for all of the, everything that involves just mental representations and never gets to the world. So it doesn't even have, there doesn't even have to be a world. You know, it could all be going on in the head. There might not be any world at all. We'd still do it exactly the same way. One more question. Um, you, you said that uh, it's no sense to say that the words uh, and is the same or different from someone else's. That's uh, why uh, you have adopted a, a realist stance. Scientific language. That's true. I do adopt a realistic stance about scientific language. It's the same question as before. I mean, it's a question of how we interpret the scientific project. Do we interpret the scientific project as an effort to achieve not only realism, but even a mapping of it, a symbolic mapping of, of reality? I do interpret it that way. That's, you know, what's called naive realism. And, yeah, I... I think that's right, you know. Uh, but I understand that one might not, you know. You know. Can be dangerous, potentially. And then I saw that plain planes can be dangerous, can be ambiguous, it was a surprise for me. Because I'm making a plan, it doesn't have plain planes can be dangerous if you only speak English. You speak other languages, there are other choices. So it means that when will this variety of languages be taken into account? Because we seem to be working on the level of the deficit. It is, where people say, well, I understand language is Greek, and no evidence is relevant. And I think this is an important point. Well, uh, it's certainly not. For, I mean, it does, see, again, to ask whether flying planes is dangerous, can be dangerous, is ambiguous in Catalan, doesn't mean anything. Because the sentence flying planes can be dangerous doesn't exist in Catalan. The sentence flying planes can be dangerous is a certain collection of phonetic and semantic property and structural properties and that collection uh, that collection of properties happens to be generated by an, the in, one you know the so-called english i languages and that collection of properties isn't generated by the catalan i languages they generate other things now we could ask whether there's some counterpart to them and that's always a matter of more or less you know that's a matter of whether two people it's like asking do two people look alike yeah somehow no you know it's a question of choice uh, they the c comparison of an expression in one language and a comparison in another language is not a matter of truth, it's a matter of decision. That's why translation is an art. You know, because you have to make the decision in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that is aesthetically as well as, uh, correct as well as other ways. It's not a m mechanical procedure, there's no such thing. Uh, but as to uh, looking at other languages, I, I don't exactly see the question there. You know? You take a book like Nelson uh, Ryle. Well, there's an excellent book about English language. Which, which book? Uh, the Concept of Mind. R Ryle, yeah. An excellent book. No, I think it's a bad book about the English language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you can even translate the title. You know, it's not a yeah. It takes a lot of, of energy. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I would say that. You take uh, one sentence, and it's an excellent book. And uh, when you get the page, it means 49, where it says, from now on, I will be rather parochial. Actually, it gets very parochial. 
And this happens to I've just been checking several books, and there's a, a transition between speaking of e language to speaking of English. English becomes the language. That's absolutely not true. That's just like saying that biology is parochial because it talks about Drosophila and E. coli, and it doesn't talk about giraffes and rabbits. I mean, but biology talks about Drosophila, E. coli, nematodes, and so on. Well, why? Because those are the things that enable you to discover something. Now, like when I'm doing linguistics, English is what allows me to discover something. When Karma Bikaya is doing linguistics, Catalan is what enables her to discover something, or English in her case. And people study what enables you to discover something. But linguistics is no more English oriented than any other language oriented. In fact, the first large scale generative grammar was on Hidatsa, and the first generative phonology was on Hebrew. I mean, it came to be English centered, if you like, only by a historical accident. A lot of the early work happened to be done in the United States. So, you know, you use English instead of, uh, you know, Swahili. But uh, uh, by now, probably the most, the richest work is done in the Romance and Germanic languages. Because that's where most of the people are and that's where, I mean, I just came from uh, Norway from the uh, Germanic Linguistics Conference. And, of course, everybody's talking about details of Icelandic and how the two dialects of Swedish differ and so on and so forth. Because that's the material that... Uh, uh, and, in fact, that's the right, the right materials to look at today, like Drosophila is right for biology, are probably not English, but Romance and Germanic. And the reason is that Romance and Germanic offer opportunities that English doesn't offer. English happens, for all kinds of reasons, to be kind of isolated. I mean, it's isolated in part because the English settlers were, ge were genocidal maniacs, you know. So they just murdered everybody who was in the way. So in the English-speaking areas, what's left is a very uniform air thing. I mean, first they wiped out the Celtic periphery, and then they wiped out everybody in North America and so on. So what's left in the English-speaking areas happens to be quite homogeneous, uh, you know, for historical reasons. Uh, the Romance languages and, German and the Germanic languages, it's not that they were less genocidal, they weren't as powerful. So therefore, they couldn't wipe out everybody in the way. I mean, they tried, like the Germans tried, and so on, but they never got around to it. Uh, and so th what's left is a variety of, you know, there's a tremendous variety of closely related languages throughout the Romance and Germanic areas. And those slight differences give you very interesting tests uh, for uh, linguistic principles of a kind that you can't find in the English-speaking areas. And that's why the focus of linguistic work, advanced linguistic work, has in many ways shifted to the Romance and the Germanic areas. But that's like, you know, that's just the fact that science is opportunistic. You look at the places where you can learn something. Uh, and the places where you can learn most now are probably Romance and Germanic. Uh, so, you know, people who are in those fields are lucky. They're in a, there happen to be but they're like biologists who work on E. coli. They're lucky. They're looking at the thing that matters. But English-centered doesn't make any sense. That's just a historical accident. Like, I only speak English. Okay, it was English-centered. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't When by formal languages, do you mean things like Montague grammar or something like that? Yeah, Montague grammar is a kind of syntax, and it has to be evaluated on its merits, like other kinds of syntax, uh, uh, like various theories of phonology and so on. I mean, maybe it has merits, maybe it doesn't, but you have to look at it on its merits. It's not any more... I mean, to say that it's formal is kind of funny. You can formalize anything. I mean, anybody who's taken a course in first-term logic knows how to formalize anything. Uh, it's kind of surprising that, I mean, it's, it's worth noticing that in the sciences, nothing ever gets formalized. I mean, the, about the only field where anything ever gets formalized is linguistics. And people in linguistics think it's really important to formalize everything. It's very curious. You know, I mean, nobody formalizes biology, let's say. Actually, to be precise, uh, in the sort of worst moments of logical positivism, there was an attempt to formalize biology. There's actually a book by Woodger which formalizes biology. I mean, no biologist ever paid the slightest attention to it. Uh, physics is mostly non-formalized. I mean, the parts of physics that are formalized are the kind that are the part that, say, use particular mathematical models. Like if a guy's using gauge theory, 
Okay, it'll be formalized. Uh, mathematics wasn't formalized until quite recently. In fact, if you look at the history of mathematics, not only was it not formalized, but it was just written through with contradictions. I mean, Bishop Barclay, for example, found straight contradictions in Newton. In Newton. Newton's, Newton was mainly a mathematician, and he found contradictions. I mean, he found proofs, and he was right. You know, he found proofs where uh, Newton, crucially, crucial proofs, where Newton would refer to zero in one line as meaning zero, and then down in some other line he would use zero as referring to something arbitrarily small, what we would now describe as a function converging to zero. And those are different things. But he was using them interchangeably, so that's just a contradiction. And he found all sorts of contradictions. That was kind of interesting. Well, um, so Sorry. Define the notion. Entailment, yeah. We may if we feel like it. I don't I, I doubt that very much. For example, this is a case of entailment. And I I don't think we need the formalism of uh, model theory to explain it. We could explain it in the, in the formalism of mod model theory, but it's so trivial, it's hardly worth it. Uh, the point is that, the point that I was getting at is that in the natural sciences, formalization is like experimentation. You do it when you need it. You don't bother with it when you don't need it. You know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, I mentioned before, you don't do more careful experiments than you need, and you don't do more formalization than you need. I mean, you should have your ideas at a point where they could be formalized by known means, but you don't bother doing it. You don't do it in mathematics, you don't do it in physics, there's no reason why you should do it in linguistics. And as I was getting at before, uh, mathematics was quite, mathematics, which is after all the sharpest discipline, was perfectly happy to live with contradictions for years. I mean, mathematics got formalized at the point where you couldn't make progress without formalization. So there came a point where thinking about, you know, a limit as something just very small didn't work anymore. You needed a notion of limit. So then it got formalized. You know, you get Cauchy, Weierstrass, and so on. But up till that point, it didn't get formalized because formalization is a total waste of time. It's a triviality that any child can carry out once they've studied the first semester of logic. Uh, but it's a total waste of time, which is why nobody bothers with it. Sometimes there are non-trivial things. No, well, there's no general answer. I mean, there is work on, say, some of the work on generalized quantifiers probably requires formalization. I think that's true. I mean, if you can, if work, re there's nothing wrong with formalizing when it's needed. If it can give you some insight, fine. If you don't need it to give you insight, fine. Uh, but, you know, to insist on formalization as something that you ought to do makes no sense. I mean, if that were the case, we'd throw out mathematics. If you took the latest issue of the American Journal of Mathematics and tried to formalize the proofs that are given there, it would be a horrifying job. In fact, you know, it might take volumes for every, for every article because of the amount of tacit assumptions and intuitive leaps and so on and so forth. And in fact, up until the 19th century, there was literally no way of doing it. Uh, uh, it is a curious thing in linguistics. There are a lot of, there's, a lot of, there's a big demand in linguistics for formalization, and a lot of things are criticized because they haven't been formalized. And that's kind of like Bishop Barclay. You know, uh, I mean, it's, it's not even that far. It's not that people have found contradictions. You know, Barclay actually found contradictions. Uh, actually, it's, it's historically sort of interesting to see what the reaction was to that. The, uh, uh, there were known problems in early in the classical analysis, what we call calculus. Uh, some of them were straight contradictions. Some were just obscurities, like the notion of, the, the notion of uh, converging to a limit, which is extremely obscure. I mean, when most of us study you know, high school mathematics, uh, and, you're, and you're taught that things get arbitrarily small, it's a very obscure idea. I remember when I was a student, I didn't understand it at all. You know? uh, but uh, most of modern mathematics was developed before that stuff was understood. And it's interesting to see how. 
Uh, there was an early split between British and continental mathematics on this issue. Uh, the British mathematicians, by and large, took the problems very seriously. They were worried about the contradictions, they were worried about the unclarities, and they tried to formalize. The continental mathematicians, like Euler and Gauss and the rest of them, just for, didn't care about it. They said, let's just do the mathematics and forget about the formalization. Okay, someday it'll get formalized. Let's just do it, and we'll worry about the problems later. Well, what happened is that continental mathematics was very productive. In fact, though Newton invented the calculus, almost all the work was done on the continent in the next couple of centuries. British mathematics was, by and large, pretty barren. Uh, and the reason was they were trying to do premature formalization. I mean, at that stage of mathematics, it didn't matter if you didn't understand what you were talking about. It was worth just doing it intuitively and using your intuitive concepts of space or whatever anybody was using. And that's where the productive mathematics came from. Later on, you formalize it. I mean, I've, you know, I've heard phys theoretical physicists say they don't care if their integrals don't converge. Somebody will worry about it some other day. You know, now they just want to work on the problems. Uh, and, you know, there's no reason to think that linguistics is more advanced than classical analysis. Very little. Uh, in fact, it's much more primitive. So the idea that it's somehow important to do formalization in this, you know, small emerging discipline, when it isn't done in the most formal sciences, seems very weird. If, in fact, doing it gets you somewhere, okay. But when people, if you can use mathematical tools, First of all, most of the, first of all, it's very doubt, doubtful that you can, first of all, it's not true that they're using mathematical tools. I mean, the amount of mathematics that is used in, say, Montague grammar is about zero. I mean, Montague grammar is, the, sometimes it's called a branch of mathematics. In fact, Rich Thomason in his introductory book on Montague grammar starts by saying, look, this is not an empirical study. It's a branch of mathematics. Well, in a sense, that's correct, but it's a very odd branch of mathematics. For example, it's the only branch of mathematics that doesn't have a single theorem in it. In fact, doesn't even have an imaginable theorem. What kind of mathematics is that? You know? I mean, this is playing around with symbols. That's not mathematics. So mathematics is an effort to discover truths. To discover truths. That means to prove theorems, interesting theorems. Have you ever heard of a theorem in Montague Graham? Well, yeah, but we know how to define entailment. Everybody who has studied elementary logic knows how to define entailment. If you want to bother defining it, okay. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's like requiring of a physicist that they, do the, that they present their paper going back to the axioms of Zermel or Frankel set theory. I mean, yeah, sort of, they know it can be done probably, but they're not going to bother. You know? And if there's some special reason to bother in this case, we'd like to know, one would like to know why. I mean, look, I, I gave an argument about entailment. Everybody could follow it. Would that argument have been improved if I had filled blackboard after blackboard with model theory? It would be the same argument. No. And in fact, everybody knows how to do it, more or less, if you have to. No. Now, if formalization turns out to get you somewhere, fine. Just like experimentation. Uh, I remember once a rather famous French mathematician, some of you may know, uh, told me, who also works in applied mathematics, uh, once told me that he thought the most elegant physics was the physics that used the least mathematics. You know? uh, I mean, it, you just used exactly as much as you had to use. You didn't use any more than you were forced to use. And that's probably right. You know. Well, the, uh, the wild child question is, is an interesting one. It has to do with critical periods. Uh, the question is whether <coughs> there's a, I mean, most biological systems that we know about, in fact, maybe all, have to develop at a certain stage, you know. So like, uh, say, bi developing binocular vision in humans has to happen around four months old, I think. 
And if it's delayed too long, like if you don't have visual stimulation, it just won't happen. And it can't happen before that. And there's a little variation, but more or less like that. Uh, if you uh, do this experimentally, let's say you take a pigeon and you, uh, I, I don't remember the numbers anymore, but I'll make them up. But if you keep it in a box for, say, two weeks after birth and then let it out, it'll fly. You know, all the stuff that went on up till then didn't really matter. It was just incipient motions, not learning. On the other hand, if you keep it in the box till, say, four weeks, it'll never fly. Uh, the same is apparently true. I mean, you don't do these experiments with humans, obviously, but sometimes it's like a natural experiment. I mean, a kid is brought up in, you know, a splint or something for some reason. Uh, if it's too long, like, I don't know, th two, th two or three years, uh, the kid probably will never learn to walk. If it's, say, 18 months, the kid will be walking normally in almost no time. Uh, well, that's the way things usually work. Uh, does it work that way with language? Well, there's indirect evidence that there is a period roughly from birth up till you know somewhere pre-puberty uh, where everything's going on and probably and probably different different things are going on at different periods like an awful i think i mentioned the other day an awful lot of the phonology apparently is established before you even pr pronounce anything six months old say it's well known that but it's known surprisingly by now that a good deal of the phonology is sort of fixed by about six months. And other things are fixed whenever they're fixed. Okay, then comes the question, what would happen if we, uh, if we, did the, if we had something comparable to the pigeon raised, raised in the box? Or the, chi the, you know, the kitten deprived of visual stimulation? And that's the wild child situation. Well, again, you don't do experiments, so you look at the natural experiments. Uh, the natural experiments rarely tell you anything. And the reason they rarely tell you anything is that when you find a child who's been severely deprived, the child is so psychotic, you know, so many things are going wrong that you don't know what, you, you can't pick out the language part. The most carefully studied case of this is a case of Jeannie, which maybe you've seen, a girl who, to whom they gave the name of Jeannie, who was found uh, in Los Angeles she was locked in a room uh, in an attic, tied to a chair. Uh, her parents were completely insane, you know. And they had kept her in this room, tied to a chair, without any, apparently without any verbal stimulation, all her life, you know. They kept her alive by pushing in pieces of food which she'd pick up and eat and so on. And that's how she lived up till I think, the age of 13. Well, you know, she was discovered by some social worker or something, so they obviously took her away. Uh, and uh, put her in a hospital and tried to do various things. And uh, one of the people who, were, one of the therapists, a woman named Susan Curtis, was a linguist, a student of uh, Vicki Frompkins at UCLA. And she began kind of, con she was working mainly, as a I mean, the main thing was to try to help the child, you know. So the, it was mainly therapy. But in the course of the therapy, she tried to see what kind of linguistic ability she could pick up. Because, of course, they tried to teach her language just so she could get around. Well, it turned out that Jeannie was extremely bright by, say, IQ tests and things like that. And she, immediately, she could do all sorts of things. Uh, so she could do sorting experiments. You know, you sort things by color and shape and so on. She'd never seen anything, you know. She'd just seen the walls of the room, you know. But she could quickly, immediately, without any training, do complicated sorting things. She could make all kinds of complex categorizations. She had, it turned out she had all kinds of musical uh, interests. Susan Curtis, who found this, uh, Susan Curtis happens to be a very good music, um, uh, pianist. And Jeannie, of course, was so psychotic that she was always having fits and this and that. And she found that one of the ways to calm her down was to start playing the piano. But it turned out that only certain musical genres would work, you know, like Romanian folk dances, you know, and not some other thing. Uh, which means that she was able to distinguish musical genres. And not only distinguish them, but they had different meaning for it. Although she'd never heard any music all her life. So she had all kinds of abilities. And uh, she, was, uh, uh, she was a very appealing kid. She was very pretty, first of all, and just a very kind of appealing. And she just made people do things for her. And she fooled people into thinking she was doing all kinds of things she wasn't doing because they got kind of seduced by her, sort of. Uh, and for a long time, and she was, she was able to do it. She knew how to do it very fast. It was kind of amazing to, re, to read the description. I never saw her, but just reading the descriptions or listening to I 
talked to Susan Curtis at length once about it. And for a while, they thought she was learning language. Uh, and the early results, this, this, is, this would be a case of a, a wild child, you know, well-studied case. She was doing something that looked like very much like language. And she was smart enough so that she was able to get people to believe that she was talking language. But when they began to look more carefully, they found it wasn't language. Uh, it was something that had some superficial resemblance to it, but never had the properties of language. You know, it never had grammatical structure, uh, you know, all kinds of things it just didn't have. And she was uh, clever enough and appealing enough and, you know, knew how to manipulate people well enough so that she could get them to think that she was talking language and often communicate with them. But when you began to look closely, it seemed there was a barrier she could never get across. Well, does that mean that she had passed the critical period? Well, it could mean that. Or it could mean that she was so screwed up that something else was wrong. I mean, she, she ended up, uh, I mean, the end result was very unhappy. After a period of improvement, uh, she began to decline. And she ended up in a kind of vegetable state. So, it doesn't say anything. <laughs> For one thing, we don't know. We, we do. The only thing that's known about Jeannie is she didn't get an eye language. Now, whether this is because the critical period had been passed or whether it's because of something else in her complex makeup, uh, nobody can tell. Remember, you know, if a kid li lives for 13 years under those conditions, they're going to be very psychotic. And that it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like trying to learn something about the brain by hitting it with a battering ram and seeing what's left, you know. I mean, you might learn something, but it's not a good experiment. So you can't really tell a lot about what happened. But there is, suppose it's true that she was past the critical period. Well, that would just tell you language is innate. I mean, just we know, for, we, we know similar things about other systems where you can do experiments. I mean, we allow ourselves to torture cats and monkeys. Okay, so therefore there's a lot of information about cats and monkeys. And it's known that uh, cats and monkeys, I mean, you can't test the language faculty because they don't have one, but you can test the visual system, say, or the auditory system or whatever, uh, and a lot is known. Uh, in the case of uh, kittens, say, monkeys are about the same. Uh, if, you, uh, if, you depri if you keep a kitten's eyes sewed shut from infancy up to some period, I forget how long, I think it's a few weeks, some, maybe somebody remembers, a couple of weeks, then they never learn to see. And there's actual physical degeneration of the visual cortex. You know, you do, by now a lot's known about how the visual cortex works. And there actual is, actually is disintegration of the cortical structures that would have been involved in perception if uh, you keep a kitten in blindness for several weeks. In fact, it even turns out that if you deprive a kitten of pattern stimulation, the same thing happens. So they do experiments in which they cover a kitten's eyes with a, with a ping pong ball. Does that mean anything? Yeah, OK. Uh, with a ping pong ball. You know, so you get light coming through, but no, but no, no, no structure. You just get diff diffuse light. Well, that also causes the visual system to disintegrate. So it apparently is the case that pattern stimulation is required to get the system going. Uh, and if you go too long, it stops. Well, does, what does that tell us about innateness? Well, you know, it tells us that that's the way the innate system is determined. The innate system has its very special structure. It picks out lines and angles, motion, it does all those things. But it's not going to do it unless at a certain stage of life it gets a trigger that says, do it. Now, the trigger doesn't tell it how to do it. It does it the way it's designed. The, tri it, the trigger's like, like turning on the ignition in your car, you know. Your car is designed in such a way that when you turn on the ignition, you know, the motor goes. It's not that the motor learned how to go by le looking at the ignition. Okay, and it's the same with the, every system of the body, as far as we know. They all need certain triggers to do what they're supposed to do. Then they do their own thing. Uh, 
the language system is probably like that. Uh, the, the only reason we can't say anything for sure about it is there's no way to experiment. Now, actually, the, the best evidence about this <clears throat> that I know of, since you can't experiment, you have to be clever about it, you know, and there's a lot of clever studies. Uh, the best stuff that I know of is uh, by Alyssa Newport, who's a psych psycholinguist in uh, Rochester, and who's been working for a long time in sign language. Sign language is, works like ordinary language, but it's, easy, it's, it's, a, it's a better thing to study because you can control the input much better. I mean, there's so much spoken language going around they haven't the slightest idea what anybody has heard. Okay. But in, in the case of sign language, the communities are often quite restricted. So you can get a good sense of what information has come to the child, let's say. Okay. Well, she, uh, studied, she studied people who had learned, learned sign language, deaf people who had been taught sign language at different ages. I think the ages were something like, you know, five, ten, and maybe twenty or something. Uh, and she studied them all 30 years after they had learned the language. So they were, say, 35, 40, and 60, or something like that, 50. Okay. Uh, so they'd all had about the same exposure. And they'd been in roughly the same kinds of communities of users. So you could assume that there was, they were essentially comparable with regard to experience. They only differed with regard to the onset of learning. And then what she did was study the level of competence achieved. And there was a considerable difference. The ones who had had 30 years of experience from five years old were perfect signers, indistinguishable from any the best signers. Uh, the ones at 10 years old had some defects. The ones at 20 years old had quite serious deficiencies. Uh, not that they couldn't communicate. You know, there's all kind of ways of overcoming deficiencies. It's just that they didn't really know nuances of the language. Actually, it's very surprising what you don't know. Uh, for example, this man I mentioned, Morris Halley, who's my, my oldest personal friend. We've known each other for 45 years. Uh, he came to the United States when he was 15, so that's pretty early. And his English is perfectly fluent, you know, knows everything. Uh, but when we started to do linguistics together, he began to discover that there are things about English that he just doesn't know, you know. Uh, you wouldn't, you'd never find it out in ordinary life. You wouldn't even find it out in reading literature. It's just when you start worrying about these crazy exotic issues, you know, that linguists are trying to figure out, that he realized he just didn't have intuitions where everybody else did, you know. Well, okay, that's from learning language at 15, you know. And that's, uh, uh, it's the same as uh, Alyssa Newport was able to show it experimentally. And that is evidence for a critical period. It's indirect evidence, but evidence for critical period. Uh, to get tighter evidence will be hard, but only because of the difficulty of carrying out experiments. I mean, if we were able, you know, if we were allowed, if we allowed ourselves, you know, if we were, if we were a bunch of Nazi doctors, say Mengele or something like that, we could answer all these questions very fast, because it's obvious what kind of experiments to do. One case. There's one very interesting case <clears throat> of. Uh, it was studied by uh, some students of Lila Gleitman's. Um, what's her name? Oh, I forgot her name. Anybody remember? It was a student of Lila Gleitman's who found, they found. What they found was it'll come back to me. They found uh, uh, in Philadelphia where this, these people are. They found a uh, family where the parents uh, sp sp had normal hearing, but there were a couple of children who were deaf. Uh, I don't know, some congenital thing or whatever. Maybe they had meningitis or something. Uh, there were a couple of children who were deaf, and they were cousins, so they spent a lot of time together, and they were isolated. Now, at that period, there was a kind of an ideology in treatment of the deaf at one time. 
that said you shouldn't teach them sign language, it'll harm them. You know, it's called the oralist tradition. And in fact, it was held very firmly. You should prevent children from signing. You know, not just don't teach them sign language, but don't allow them to sign. Because the idea is they have to learn lip reading. And it's, it's like minority languages. You know, you've got to learn the majority language. You're not allowed to learn the minority language. It's about the same logic. Uh, uh, and there's some very interesting things about this. Actually, uh, there's a school, in, a well-known school for the deaf in the Boston area, uh, where this was, you know, the firmly held ideology. Now, the first person who studied any of this stuff is a guy who died about 15 years ago named Eric Lenneberg. We were grad students together. Uh, and back in the around the 1950s, he started investigating these questions. And he went to this school, it was Perkins School for the Deaf, it was called. And he discovered something quite interesting that nobody in the school knew. Namely, all the kids were signing. I mean, as soon as the teacher would look back to the board, you know, instead of the kids whispering to each other, they'd start signing to each other. And then when the teacher turned around, you know, they'd put their hands down. So the teachers had no idea that the kids knew how to sign. You know, but they all knew how to sign. And they hadn't, nobody had taught them, you know, they just learned from the last kids there or something like that. So there was a whole signing culture that had gone on forever, you know, and no, none of the adults knew about it. I mean, it's as if, you know, like maybe under Franco, people were talking Catalan when the teacher wasn't listening or something. Uh, that kind of, it's, it's analogous to that. Well, uh, this particular case that was studied closely was three kids who had, whose parents had been heavily indoctrinated with the idea that they're not allowed to sign. In fact, it was so extreme that the parents had been taught by the experts that they shouldn't even gesture. You know, like don't point to things or, you know, don't do the normal things you would do with a child. You know, like hold your hands in your pockets all the time. Uh, so the kids had never been exposed to any sign. That was pretty certain. Uh, and what was discovered when they were about three years old was that they had invented a sign language. You know, they had just invented their own sign language from zero, no evidence. It's the, uh, the paper on it is called Beyond Herodotus. You know, Her Herodotus tells a story about some, you know, pharaoh who wanted, wanted to know what the original language was. So he uh, put a couple of kids off in some island somewhere to see what they would start talking. Uh, and they started talking Phrygian, according to this story. So they decided that Phrygian was the original language. But, so this is Beyond Herodotus. Uh, Susan Golden Meadow is the, is the woman who worked on it. Golden Meadow, yeah, sorry. Uh, and uh, they, 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 of course, studied. I mean, they immediately started teaching them regular sign language, of course, you know, for obvious reasons. But there's a period in there when they could study what they knew. And what they had developed was a pretty normal natural language. That was kind of ergative language, actually. Uh, and it had normal properties. They had roughly the kind of expected sentence length and complexity for kids of that age. And very much a normal language with normal linguistic properties, but developed from zero evidence. Uh, now, that, see, it's kind of interesting to compare that with the Genie case. These kids had triggers. They were giving each other the triggers. Uh, and that was enough to set the thing off. Uh, so so we, th there is a, you know, the evidence is kind of converging you know, to saying that some stimulation is necessary to get the thing going it then goes in the normal way, but it doesn't need any external inputs. I mean, here's a case of language knowledge on the basis of literally zero evidence. The perfect case. It's the only case known like that. <coughs> Invented at some time. Yeah. yeah, that's true. If you go back far enough, there must be some point when some... Well, actually, that's not... Yeah, it's not so obvious, actually. I mean, what we'd have to know is... I'm not sure the answer, how far back sign language goes. See, the point is that people are often unaware that sign language exists, as in this School for the Deaf case. Uh, hearing people are often unaware that sign language exists. Deaf people are usually subjected to one or another kind of prejudice. So they're a kind of, they're a community that's subject to repression. And therefore, what's going on inside those communities, you may not know. You know, uh, uh, so for example, for a long time, it was assumed that uh, American blacks are often totally unintelligible. I mean, in the area of Philadelphia where I lived, uh, it was a, right at a block between a white area and a black area, 
And when I was on, a, say, a trolley car, and a kid from two blocks over was sitting behind me talking, I couldn't understand one word. You know, it was they were talking some totally different language. And for a long time, it was assumed that that was some very restricted code. You know, you couldn't only say, you know, you could only grunt a few things or something. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't until fairly, re you know, disgracefully recently, in the last 20 or 30 years, that people really came to what any sane person should have known, that of course it's a rich language like anything else. Now there are all kinds of things going on in repressed communities that one simply may not know about, just because of racism or discrimination or whatever, and the deaf have always been a repressed community. So we simply don't know whether they've always had sign language or not.